you just do it, it turns out okay. And welcome to Season 8, Episode 9 of Talking Time with Caffeine. My guest has been on the show before with during the uh, after show debate, but reintroduction has never, never hurts anybody, so re reintroduce yourself to my guests. Well, hello, everybody. I am Dapper Dinosaur. I run a channel by that name. Um, I do mostly, <clears throat> sorry, uh, mostly like Young Earth creationist uh, takedown stuff, you know, or responses. Um, I also have some just strictly educational stuff. Um, a video that I have coming up soon is a 3D tour of a T-Rex skeleton going over the names of various bones and such so you can... Um, uh, you know, understand things like uh, if you if you read a description of a fossil of a dinosaur or something, you'll have an easier time understanding what they mean by these things, by the terms they use. Um, I also do a series called Things That Aren't Dinosaurs, where I take a look at animals that people think are dinosaurs, but that aren't. And I tell you why they're not a dinosaur, and what they are, and a little bit about the, the science behind them. I've done crocodilians, I've done plesiosaurs, um... Pterosaurs. Uh, pterosaurs, and uh, coming up pretty soon, I'm going to be getting the script together for uh, Demetrodon. Uh, so, yeah. That one is on the way other side of the family tree. At least the, the, f the first three you had were, were, closer, were closely related. That one's, like, way off in the branch. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Demetrodon is much closer to humans than it is to dinosaurs, as far as um, the cladistics go. Oh. Yeah, you haven't done that episode not in a while. Yeah. And plus, you're also uh, continuing... Uh, oh God. His name's drawing a blank now. Uh, Leaving Young Earth Creationism? Yeah, his yeah. series. Yeah, so Bill Ludlow uh, started a series called Leaving Young Earth Creationism, and um, it, was, it was having people on who were former Young Earth Creationists to talk about their experience leaving Young Earth Creationism, um, you know, how they got into it, how they got out, what the reasons were, um, talking about their feelings about uh, Young Earth Creationism now that they were out and all this stuff. And um, I was going to be a guest on it because I'm a former Young Earth Creationist as I, I mean, your viewers may or may not know, but people who've watched me for a while would know. Um, but I'm very sadly, um, about a week or so before I was supposed to be scheduled to or to, be, to appear, Bill Ludlow passed away. And it was unexpected for everyone, I think, except his family. He kept, he kept it very close to the chest that he was ill. And um, so basically, on the day that I'd more, I would have been there, I decided to have an interview about that anyway, where uh, my friend Dead Kennedy in Space, uh, Kevin, from the Dead Kennedy in Space channel came on and he interviewed me about my leaving Young Earth creationism. And I asked for feedback. I wanted people to know, I wanted people to let me know, like my viewers and things, how they felt about me continuing on to interview other people about having left Young Earth creationism. And I got a lot of support and I got a lot of people saying, yeah, that's that's a valuable thing to uh, do. And um, RJ Downard, who, I think you've had RJ on your show, haven't you? No, I have yet to have him on the show. I've had Jackson Weed on his oh, show yes. a lot few times. Okay. I wouldn't mind well, having I wouldn't mind having him, but I can't never get hold of him. Ah, busy, 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 busy guy. <laughs> he he is a busy guy, but um, he had been collecting data from Bill Ludlow's episodes, and so when he noticed that I was also doing um the show, kind of to like I don't want to say to fill Bill's shoes because I don't think I could do that, but in this small way to t kind of take over for Bill. Um, he started taking data from that series too. We just had our, I think I counted, it's the seventh episode, I think, was earlier this morning. Yeah. Um, or it yes. might have been yeah, sixth seven, or eighth. Seven or, or six, depending on, you know, if if you count mine is, is in that series. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, because you were leading young, or leading old Earth creationism. Right. Um, I do also have an off-topic channel. It's called Top Hats Off. Um you're not very dapper. You're, you're just a dinosaur. Yeah, I take the top hat off. Um, you know, I, I leave the monocle on because otherwise, how am I going to see, right? But um, yeah, it's it's mostly stuff like I'll do gameplay stuff, or um, I've streamed some stuff where I did some uh, language creation because I have a one of my interests is linguistics, but that doesn't come up much on my channel. 
Um, although actually it comes up a surprising amount when you're debunking creationists because they like to get into like, well, if you read the Hebrew here and it's like, well, no, you're, you're wrong in many ways about the Hebrew too. So it does come up occasionally, but, um, also in my chat today, there was some talk about maybe doing a, uh, a Warhammer 40 K themed stream on my other channel. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just it's yeah. randomness, I guess, kind of like, you know, to some extent, your channel, where it's just like, hey, whatever random stuff we got going. Yeah, I, I kind of re I respect people can do two channels at once, because I cannot do that. I cannot keep track of what's on what sometimes. Oh, well, I mean, don't... My Top Hats Off channel is not well-maintained. Uh, uh, there's no there's no upload schedule. There are no series that I feel like I'm, I have to finish or anything like that. It's It really is just whatever I want to put up on YouTube but that I don't want to be on my main channel because it's not on topic. Ah. Yeah, so if you subscribe to Dapper Dinosaur, you're only getting the the stuff that's on that topic. It's to me science and pseudoscience debunk stuff. Um, I did uh, homeopathy, so you know I'll, I'm not sticking to only Young Earth Creationism. It is my primary focus, but yeah, if you subscribe to the other one, it's gonna be whatever random crap comes out of uh, my uh. my streaming software. I guess I guess if you ever stream spore or something, it, it could be like a double dose of it. It'd be science, science and gameplay. <laughs> yeah, uh, that could be. Although spore spores take on um, evolution is a little bit Steve. off. <laughs> well, it's a, it's it's strange because spore actually is more like intelligent design than it is like evolution, because. You can do things like you can swap out parts for completely different parts that don't have to have any basis in what parts you had before. And like um, anytime you go to upgrade your little creature, if we're talking the creature mode, um, you can completely start over by, from scratch with the parts that you have unlocked. And there doesn't have to be any correlation to what you were doing before. Now, when most people play the game, you know, they don't take the time to do that and they do kind of keep a similar sort of body to what they had before. But yeah, Spore is a little, I feel like if you use it too much as an educational game, you can get the wrong idea about evolution. But yeah. um, that being said, it's, it's a fun game and I played a lot of it when I was in the Navy, so. So uh, you, you, I think you mentioned this on your, when I was on your show, but what kind of dinosaur are you again? I'm a Ceratosaurus. Yes, Ceratosaurus is the, uh, it's the basal most uh, genus in Ceratosauroidea, uh, or Ceratosauria, sorry, Ceratosauria, which is the, a theropoda is kind of divided down the middle after you get through some of the very basal theropods. Like you get some very, very basal things like if Herrerasaurus is a theropod, that one. Um, uh, perhaps some forms like, um, oh, why can't I remember it? The thing they got wrong in Jurassic Park, it doesn't really spit. What is it called? Uh, the one that spits. Oh my goodness. Why can't I remember The one that this? killed the fat guy? Yeah. The fat Why? killer. Dilophosaurus. Dilophosaurus might be basal to the split, but once you get into like, uh, or Coelophysis is probably basal to the split too. But once you get into like the mid Jurassic and on, there's this big divide between um, theropods, between tetanurin theropods. And ceratosaurus, or ceratosaurus, or I can't talk, ceratosaurus. Um, ceratosaurus include things like ceratosaurus, the abelosaurus, like Majungasaurus, uh, Thanos, um, uh, Carnotaurus, and uh, also, I've, if I remember correctly, the Carcharodontosaurus, although don't quote me on that one because it's been a while since I looked into Carcharodontosaur uh, systematics. But um, tetanurins include most of the other theropods that you know about. Uh, like Tyrannosaurus and um, all the raptors and, you know, uh, almost every theropod that you can name is probably a tetanurin. And hey, we got Nestle 20 in the chat. Hey, Nestle. Uh, so, are you, uh, so are you on the, has your, uh, you're on the side of closer to transfers where your arms are less functional or your arms still? So, um, well, it's, it's actually an interesting thing about uh, derived theropods is they become more and more um, head dominant and less and less forelimb dominant with the exception of uh, the Manoraptoriforms. 
The one and so the, the bird visiting the bird lineage. Yeah. So manoraptoriforms are um, you. I don't remember the formal definition, but if you go with um, animals that are closer to birds than they are to Tyrannosaurus rex, that you're basically at manoraptoriforms. Um, and so outside of that group, there's this tendency for a lot of uh, theropods over time to reduce their forelimbs. Uh, where Ceratosaurus is, is still at the point where forelimbs are pretty useful for clutching prey. So Ceratosaurus could do things like um, run up to an animal, grab onto it with its arms, grab onto either side, and then bring its uh, jaws down for a bite. So it can still use them to restrain prey. Um, it's not going to be, you know, playing the violin or anything on these arms, but they're still very functional. Yeah. And then you, but when you get to ceratosaurs that are very advanced, like uh, Carnotaurus, its arms, it's not even clear that it could move its arms at all. Uh, and, so you, um, yeah. So, so, oh, go ahead. So, so, so are you, are you, are you expert, uh, expert on dinos like Erica's on, on primates? Oh, uh, I would say that Erica knows more about primates than I do about dinosaurs. Um, I am a interested layman. I I do a lot of reading about the subject, um, and I also I've been sort of blessed with a a good memory for trivia. So, um, yeah, that's that accounts for a lot of it. But I have not actually been to school for vertebrate paleontology or biology. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I would say, but yeah, overall, um, if you want someone who's actually an expert on her field, Erica is much more of an expert on her field than I am. Sure. And she might be nice and deny it, but she is. Uh, uh, the Nestle wants to, wants, to, she wants to come in. Yeah, I recently had Tony Reed come when they're coming in too, but he had to cancel last minute. It, sometimes I like to have three people, two people. Some people are fine sometimes, but sometimes, you know, I don't know, is this me or sometimes you get a lot of dead air of two people sometimes? I mean, it doesn't bother me. Well, maybe you, eventually. I don't yeah, you do. You do. You, you're the one. Eventually, wow. But yeah. Oh. So, like, so, I. Oh, go ahead. It's so like, like I mentioned on your sh I asked him and hit, and you and him today, I don't think you answered or not, but since you became an, uh, like, to believe in evolution, not believe, I guess it's that word, believe it, but accepting evolution, like, did you, any weird cousins that you, that you learned about? Uh, for, for Ceratosaurus? Um, or for any, or anything, really. <laughs> uh, so some things that I think are surprising include the ones that you mentioned, like you mentioned that, um, humans are, at humans and dinosaurs are more closely related to tuna than tuna are to sharks. That is definitely true. Um, the split there is, um, you have osteichthys, and you have. Um, I'm gonna screw this up, aren't I? Um, that's that's chondrichthys. Yeah, osteichthys. That's the bony fist, and chondrichthys yeah. is the the cartilage. Right. So I'm waiting for some caffeine to kick in, so I'm a little bit fuzzy around the edges here today. <laughs> yeah. um, I woke up pretty early, and I um, I did my stream, and then like I crashed pretty hard right after my stream. And then I had to set an alarm to make sure that I was going to be here for this one. So forgive me. I'm going to have a few brain parts here and there. But uh, yeah, so sharks are on the chondrichthys side and uh, tetrapods are on the osteichthys. And tetrapods are all the things with four limbs or that are descend descended from things with four limbs. So all your reptiles, mammals, uh, lys amphibians, um, all the things that are basal to those like um, uh, like temnospondyls and, and things like that. Uh, those are all tetrapods. And so uh, that's an interesting one. Um, you also had mentioned that fungi are closer to animals than plants, and that's true. Um, one of the big things that uh, connect fungi to animals is that um, is the use of chitin. And chitin is the stuff that uh, your fingernails are made of. And so um, the cell walls of fungal cells are actually made of chitin. So every, every uh, fungal cell is, is surrounded by a, a sheath of essentially a fingernail. And uh, it's also interestingly one of the reasons why it's hard to overcook mushrooms. So one of the nice things about mushrooms is you can basically add them at the beginning of any recipe and they're never really gonna overcook unless you burn them. Uh. Uh, and so one of the reasons for that is that uh, chitin doesn't break down until it gets very high temperature, 
And so mushrooms tend to hold on to a lot of that uh, structural integrity that plants tend to lose when you overcook them. So even though you're a meat eater, do you, do you eat mushrooms? <laughs> Uh, well, I, you know, I've learned in my 150 million years or so to, to broaden my palate a little bit. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. I never, I've never really been a fan of mushrooms except for in Mario. <laughs> well, um, I mean, mushrooms are a thing where it's situational. There are not every meal is going to go well with mushrooms, but I'm a pretty big fan overall. Um, they're, they're versatile and they add a nice, uh, almost meaty texture to things. So like um, if you're trying to go with like a meatless meal, which by the way, if you're a human, you probably shouldn't eat meat with every meal. I'm just going to go out and say that as my, I'm not a doctor and do not, if you need medical advice, go consult your physician. However, I'm going to say probably don't need meat every time you eat. Uh, but if you like the, the, the texture that it adds, you can just add some sauteed mushrooms and say uh, carrots and onions to like a bowl of rice. Okay, It'll yeah. be pretty good. Cooking with Dapper Dino. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that could be a segment for your for your top off channel. <laughs> <laughs> top hats off cooking with Dapper Dino. Um, yeah, I don't do too much live cooking. I don't think I've ever done live cooking. Uh, although, actually, you can see my stove in one of my videos. And if you watch carefully um, in one of the episodes of Big Bang and the Creationism, or Big Creationism and the Big Bang is what it's called. Sorry. Um, I filmed a pot of water boiling on my stove and then moving it off of the stove so that it would cool down. And I know it sounds like a weird thing to put in there, but it actually does fit in with the um, with what's being talked about in the video I'm responding to. Uh, oh, so that... You can get a little insider view of, of my stove. <laughs> you can see my electric range top with its red hot glowing uh, little burner. Well, not even, they're not even burners. I don't even know what you call them when it's not a gas stove. Uh, Heating element, I guess. Uh, uh, at Benthoven, every time I cook, it's live. Well, that's, I wonder if that means he cooks live food. And of course, Benthoven is my co-host, who's in your chat, for um, my Kent with Bent series, which is a... Um, when, you, when you get drunk and listen to Benthoven. <laughs> yup. Um, so the interesting thing about that is that uh, we started listening to Kent Hoven together, Bent and I, um, well before I ever started doing Kent with Bent. And it was mostly uh, Kent Hoven debates that we were listening to. Um, and yeah, that's we would have that's fun. When you, that's when you decide, I want to I want to debate him too. Well, that is actually part of it, yeah. Um, but we would just have fun, you know, like making fun of how bad he, how bad the arguments he was giving were. And then... You know, so that inspired my debate because suddenly uh, Bent Hovind and uh, a few of, or one of my other friends who um, wouldn't watch it as often with us, but they were like, oh, so when are you going to debate uh, Kent Hovind? And at first it was just kind of like, ah, ha, that would be fun. But then eventually it got to be a thing where like, no, maybe I should do this. And so um, one day I just called him. I called Kent Hovind. And I was like, hey, you want to do a debate on whether or not birds are dinosaurs? And uh, yeah, and then we did that debate. And uh, for a channel with essentially no views and no subscribers, it did pretty well. And uh, it was sort of the catalyst that got this, the channel to actually be something with actual viewers and content and stuff. Because I had made the channel a while before that and put up like two videos. And then I just hadn't done anything with it since then. So in your debate, how... I was like, just the other people who debate him too. How much of his talk was actually about birds or dinosaurs? <laughs> um, so in his initial, so he he likes to do openers and then he likes to go second. In his his opener, almost none of it touched on whether or not birds are dinosaurs. He went on about uh, Charles Darwin's biography. Uh, he talked about uh, abiogenesis. He talked about the Big Bang. Um, and yeah, it, he went all over the place except to the topic of whether or not birds are dinosaurs. Uh, the closest he came during his opener to saying anything was just giving his common designer argument. But by framing the, the debate as are birds dinosaurs, I explicitly, even in my opener, said, I'm not here to talk about whether or not birds evolved from other non-bird dinosaurs. Um, 
Instead, I'm here to talk about whether or not birds meet the taxonomic definition for dinosaurs. And so, you know, we talk, I talked about how, you know, Kent agrees that humans are vertebrates. Why? Well, because they have the thing that you need to be a vertebrate, which is a backbone. You have, or, well, vertebrae, which isn't one bone, but still, we called it a, a backbone. And so, well, what are the things that you need to have in order to be classified as a dinosaur? Well, there are these, these, and these. And birds have those, so birds are dinosaurs. And that he had no way to to handle that because fundamentally Kent Hovind doesn't know what a dinosaur is. Yeah, the Gis Gallop thing. Uh, me, uh, when the, Eric and Tony were on my channel, we renamed it as the Hovind Hustle. Yeah, I've heard a few people use that. Is that that was you, huh? Okay, I like that. And uh, you know. I was going to say no disrespect to the late Dwayne Gish, but some disrespect to the late <laughs> Dwayne Gish. But uh, yeah, Hovind has been using that, oh my goodness, for a while now. And it is, he's slippery. Um, I don't know if you ever saw um, the Professor Dave Explains debate or any of the videos that uh, Professor Dave made after that. Yeah, I think I've, I, I saw some of it. I was like, a, I, I, I mentioned this in your thing. I was like, yeah, I was Let's we could have some time channels in some of these debates, like the skip the Ken Hilden part. I probably heard it <laughs> over every time he debates. Um, so one thing I will do sometimes if I want to see his debate with someone else is, um, like, I came to the conspiracy cats debate late because I was busy or something, and I tuned in, and it was about halfway through. And so um, I just, whenever uh, conspiracy cats was on, I would play it at normal speed. I you know went back to the beginning, and then every time Kent was on, I would just rush it to times two. Because not only does Kent speak slowly enough that I can understand him on times two, it means I get to skip through all of his very, very repetitious spiel. I, I, I think you mentioned this in your when you were doing your series on the Big Bang series. Thing, okay, question for you: Did Kent mention the Big Bang in his debate about? Dinosaurs more than the Big Bang people actually mentioned the Big Bang, and they're. Like, <laughs> um, I wouldn't say it was quite that bad. Um, I don't actually remember, if I'm being honest, exactly how much he talked about things like the Big Bang. But he, if I remember remembering correctly, he did go into his, you know, oh the six different the six different definitions of evolution that no one calls evolution except for him. Um, so, but yeah, it was. He certainly spent more time off of topic than on topic, at least in the first half of the debate. Um, once he realized that I wasn't letting him get out of this and I wasn't going to be baited into talking about the Big Bang or abiogenesis, and that I really was going to be talking about taxonomy, he he was sort of trapped into going into taxonomy and showing how little he knows about either taxonomy or dinosaurs in particular, despite calling himself Dr. Dino and running a... I guess it's like a cross between a campground, a theme park, and a cult compound called Dinosaur Adventureland. Like, I don't know exactly what you'd call that. It's it's a Does weird. Does he have two of, of those now? Like one in Florida and one in his new new thing? Or? So the one in Florida was seized um, by I believe the state of Florida, or it might have been the IRS. Uh, I know some government group seized it. Um, and also I believe they destroyed most of the buildings and quote unquote rides because they were not up to the local building code. Building um, code. Who needs that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't want your buildings destroyed by the government, you do. Um, like, well, like, like he could afford it. He wasn't paying taxes. Well, that's, <laughs> that's true. He was not paying. He wasn't, he bragged for a while. Like, Oh, I haven't filed income taxes in 20 years. It's like, well, I mean, it's risky, like, uh, but it yeah, doesn't that like compare him to like the uh, uh, guy name. My, my, my brain's going dead right now. Oh, Al Capone. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting thing about Al Capone is, um, despite the fact that he was obviously a, a liquor runner and a gun runner and he'd ordered numerous hits and whatnot, the one thing the government finally got him on was tax evasion, and that's why he ended up in jail. Now, of course, he didn't spend very much time in jail because he died of untreated syphilis not that much longer after. So, yeah, but that's it is a similar thing with Al Capone. Of all the things that he's done, the one thing that both Al Capone and Ken Hovind got caught on were, were tax evasions. Yeah, I don't know if you ever watch the old Batman cartoons. 
Um, it's been a while, so but, I, I might not remember this. I, I, but why well, there's this one segment where Joker had money, and he says, "Batman, please, no problem. IRS, no, thank you." <laughs> He's like, Joker is like, pay, pay, trying to pay his taxes. Like the yeah, IRS, I'm not paying <laughs> them. Well, so one thing that I find funny is that the um, it actually is in the uh, IRS code that you owe money on any income that you've gotten from illegal means. And so I always wonder, like, do they actually expect, like, drug dealers or hitmen to be like, well, I got paid this much for assassinating someone or selling little kids heroin or something. I, I'm always curious as to what the people writing the law actually picture. You're like, but, uh, how'd you make this money? Uh, I earned it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Don't worry. Got, um, cut. <laughs> and Vandal, so this is from Nestle. Yeah, Kent thinks that dinosaurs are just big, scaly lizards, hence the name, not knowing that even crocodiles are called... So yeah, it's... Kent's argument that dinosaurs are lizards, which he seems to legitimately believe that there's that... that dinosaurs fall within, like, the taxonomic category of lizard. Yeah, I, I think it's because... Well, me, it's... It's, I think it goes back to the naming, naming thing, you know? Yeah. They named it Terrible Lizard, so it must be a lizard. Yeah, essentially that's his argument, is that it's it's etymology. It's like, well, the name means Terrible Lizard. It's like, I, I know what the name means. People didn't know that. People, people named it back in, in the uh, 1800s. They didn't know very much that, that we do now. Well, actually, even when it was, was coined, so Sir Richard Owen is the one who, who coined the term Dinosauria, and he knew... Richard Owen was was a, a gigantic jerk, and he was uh, he was a creationist. And in fact, he committed academic fraud in order to push creationism on several occasions. However, he was not enough of an idiot to think that dinosaurs were actual lizards. How? But he was stuck with trying to use Greek and Latin because that was the standard for naming, uh, you know, taxa. And I mean, Greek only had words for animals that they knew about in, you know, the antiquity. They didn't know about dinosaurs in antiquity. At least they didn't give them any particular name. So, yeah. And, yeah, the, the Jackson chameleon is a dinosaur if you give it a few hundred years. Um, so it's funny because I've actually been thinking about com doing a, an anatomy comparison between a Jackson chameleon and a triceratops scale, scale to be about the same size. Because the line that that Hoban uses is that the Jackson chameleon is is a mini T or triceratops, and he bases this on the fact that the Jackson chameleon has three horns. Oh, two and, uh, and because and human, and humans live for hundreds of years, like in the right. and everything else. Yeah. So according to the Bible, you know, Adam and Eve lived to be nine hundred or whatever, and so obviously, if da if a Jackson chameleon lived to be nine hundred, and it's like, no, that's that's not how that works at at all. Um, and so you can just look at the skeleton of both animals, and they are vastly different. The only way that you could confuse a lizard with a dinosaur is if you don't know anything about the anatomy of either. Um, and it's it's just blindingly obvious. You can look at just their limbs, their uh, the, their pelvic girdle. You can look at their pectoral girdle. You can look at their ribs. Uh, you can look at their skull. You can look at their teeth. I mean, every single aspect about these animals is significantly diff different. Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned this. If you text on me, I mentioned this when I was on with Bill. How the it, it was in this too on your on your series on your series, but how at least for school books, school books aren't always up to date with the latest. Tech, school books aren't always up to date with the latest. You know scientific findings no they're not and like when i was in school in the 90s they still talked about well one the five the five kingdoms you know mm -hmm. it was like malaria uh protist fungus plant and animals you know because now we know there's like the domains now they were even though the domains had been found 20 years earlier, it was updated yet in textbooks. Yeah. When I was getting into high school, domains were just filtering into textbooks. Um, and you could see sort of the beginnings of domain type thinking in earlier stuff. But now, I mean, um, at this point, scientists have largely given up trying to rank taxa the way that uh, Linnaeus did. 
So yeah. you're like, oh, what's a kingdom? What's a phylum? What's a class? Where do we put these things? And now the answer is, they're all just clades. As long as we know that it's a clade, it doesn't matter where it fits in uh, 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 in, in this ta- in this ranking. Yeah, another thing I'm going to like the two that like like the vertebrate the vertebrate classes back in the spinal school. They, two of them are out. They two of them aren't even exist anymore. The the fish and reptiles. You know, they had fish, reptiles, amphibians, yeah. birds, and mammals. But now the reptiles in the fish area is totally pretty much useless now. Yeah. Well, once you so um. Back when the Linnaean taxonomy system was still sort of the, um, it was still sort of officially in in force. There wasn't this strong insistence on uh, monophyly in named taxa. So a taxa could be paraphyletic. It usually couldn't be polyphyletic, but it could be paraphyletic. So a paraphyletic taxon is like the old version of fish, right? So it includes sharks and it includes tuna but it doesn't include snakes or humans or uh, turtles or anything like that. That's paraphyletic because the common ancestor of a shark and a tuna is the same as the common ancestor of a shark and uh, a chimpanzee, right? Yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of like how last week I mentioned with Erica, new, new world and old world monkeys are monkeys, but we're not monkeys. Right. <laughs> right, that would also mean that monkey would become paraphyletic because it excludes some of the descendants of the common ancestor. So under Linnaean taxonomy, paraphyly was broadly tolerated. Uh, polyphyly wasn't. When people discovered that uh, taxa at the time were polyphyletic, which means that it, it would include animals that weren't actually terribly closely related. So like if your taxa were like salamanders and lizards, because they both have sprawling limbs and they kind of have that wavy sort of walk to them, that wouldn't be allowed under Linnaean taxonomy. But um, yeah, paraphyly was. But now where the, the phylo code, which still hasn't really been finished, but it's finished enough to use, uh, the phylo code is the new standard that biologists have really uh, adopted. And under the phylo code, a taxon has to be monophyletic to be valid, which means fish isn't a, isn't a valid taxon. It means reptile. If it's a valid taxon, then it has to include birds. So either birds or reptiles, or reptiles aren't a thing. Yeah, well, I guess it it, it is. It, it's I guess it's only valid if you only going for ray fin fish as, a, as its own taxon. Or, uh, or... Well, one of the things is that we already have names for all these clades, and that's like a few really none of them are fish. So fish is is not a word that really gets used in I biology think, anymore. I think I think what that brand is called that clade is called. I know I know we're we're the lobe fin side, but uh, that's Sarcopterygia. Yeah. Or, or it starts with an A, I think. Or I think it starts with an A. The so ra- the other, the non, the raven fish are Actinopterygia. I knew, I knew it started with an A. Pronouncing has never been my thing. <laughs> well, it's also not the easiest thing to remember. But um, yeah. So within Osteichthyes, the two main divisions you get are Actinopterygia and Sarcopterygia. Sarcopterygia includes things like lungfish, uh, coelacanths, tetrapods. Those are basically the surviving groups of uh, Sarcopterygians. And Actinopterygians includes all your things like tuna, salmon, trout. So uh, I, I guess that if you only ever had a fist clay, that would be the, that, them, the only pure fist clay to be the arc. So you could call it Actinopterygia, um, but then most people still want to call lungfish and coelacanths fish. Sure. So what I would say is there's this other concept called an evolutionary grade. And this is a group of organisms that are grouped together because of similar traits that are basal and that excludes later members. And it's not taken to be an actual clade. It's just a, it's a group. So for instance, um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about the mammal like reptiles and it doesn't include mammals. Well, and they're not really reptiles, but you could, you could think of that as a grade. There are things on the mammal side of the anap or the uh, synapsid diapsid split. Well, it's actually the synapsid seropsid split, but we yeah, can simplify it a little bit. I know that's I, that's weird learning about that. You know, I, you, originally I thought it was the synapsid diapsid, but the diapsids, diapsids are like buried deep within the, uh, sur- the seropod. Sauropsid. Sauropsid, yeah. Yeah. So sauropsid is a slightly wider group. Most of the sauropsids that you've heard of are, in fact, diapsids. But there are some animals that are um, anapsid within that. And, and when I say this, I mean in terms of their actual skull morphology. Like you have some anapsid-grade sauropsids. You have um, 
you even have some animals that are outside of this split. Like there are some animals with what's called a uriapsid skull that are in like different categories. And the uriapsid condition has evolved convergently in a few different places. So it's a bit weird there. Um, but yeah, there are more things on the reptile side than just diapsid. And for a while, there was some question as to whether or not um, uh, turtles were diapsids. Yeah, or if they were anapsids or diapsids. Yeah. I hear yeah. And so um, recent, recent genetic studies, as well as paleontology, has put turtles pretty firmly in the diapsid side. Uh, we've discovered things that are clearly related to turtles, but that actually do have a diapsid skull. And so it's not clear uh, which temporal fenestrae closed first in turtles or whether they, they both closed more or less simultaneously. We don't have great transitional forms for the, the changes in skull morphology. We have some pretty decent ones for the development of the plastron and the carapace, which the plastron is the bottom shell and the carapace is the top shell. So we, we do have some good transitional forms there, but the skull morphology is a, it's a bit hard to track. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is just that, I mean, a plastron and a carapace is sort of easy to fossilize, whereas a skull is less so. Yeah, like and like like we're synapses, but we don't have that visible, at least that very visible hole in our, in our skull anymore either. So one thing you can do is um, if you, so put your forefinger on your temple. Yeah, I, and I, then I, your I your thumb on your towards the the back of your jaw, and if you clench your jaws a little bit you'll see there's this muscle that goes from your temple all the way down to your jaw. And uh, that's your masseter muscle. And that's the muscle that passes through the synapse in a synapsid. And in fact, that arch of bone that, you know, the synaptic arch or whatever, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head because my human anatomy isn't as good as my everything else anatomy. <laughs> but um, that's actually the remains of a, a jaw synapse. And so that's that structure on you. In mammals, it's been kind of modified to no longer be a hole through the middle of the skull. And one of the reasons for that is that um, more primitive, or I should say basal uh, synapsids had a medial uh, attachment for the jaw muscles. So their muscles passed through the skull to the inside of the jaw on either side. And mammals, as they moved their, uh, their angular and serangular bones back into the ear, the attachment site flipped over to the lateral side of the jaw. And so that's one of the reasons why rather than going through the middle of the skull, it now has to go around the outside. And hey, what's up, Eric? Yeah, I, I've been, I've been watching, yeah, I've been watching uh, uh, Aaron Ra's uh, series, you know. Oh, the systematic uh, classification of life, I think, is that what it's yeah. called? And I have learned a that there are a lot more uh, lines between synapses and mammals than I, than I originally thought there were. Oh yeah, yeah. Mammals I, are they're buried deep within synapsid. Um, because I knew about uh, the uh, synapsids, the the therapsids, and the sci the cyadonts, but yeah, there's like so many more. Yeah, well, and that's one of the, the reasons why it's getting to the point where people then have to say, hey. Why are we ranking these clades? Like, why is this taxon being assigned a, a class or an order or a family? Because um, there's no way to rank them. Like, is is Therapsida a bigger or a smaller clade than Diapsida? I don't know. How could you tell? There's one thing I, I did notice. I I think I can, well, on the show I compare I compared uh, it to before I I knew about all this. I compared them to like. Uh, geometry, where, you know how like a like a a, re, a square is a rectangle, rectangle, not all rectangles are squares. Mm -hmm. But it's like, well, all mammals are all mammals are synapses, but not all synapses are mammals. Right. In fact, um, really, it's hard to say. Well, first, one of the things you have to worry about when you're trying to say like how many which synapses are mammals is what do you mean by mammal? So one of the problems we have is that. Um, Oh, some of the traits that we use to identify mammals don't preserve well. So for instance, um, we basically have no preserved uh, evidence about when uh, milk production started. We can just infer it from jaw structures because we can see did this we, juvenile- from, from what we know, the mammals we have alive today, like the monotremes, the marsupials, and the placentas. Right. So um, it's, it's a little bit tricky. And so one of the things that a lot of people have uh, defaulted to is 
it's a mammal if it's a crown mammal. And so that gets into the question, well, what's a crown group? So a crown group is the ancestors of the extant members of a group and all of its descendants. So if you're, if you shared the common ancestor between all extant mammals and you could say between say humans and the platypus, right? Yeah. Their common ancestor is the crown group ancestor for mammalia. So anything descended from that is a crown mammal. And so I think most paleontologists have sort of defaulted to crown mammal as their definition for mammal. And everything else is a, you know, like a mammaliform or a mammalomorph or something like that. And so you get to these, but even then it's a little bit complicated because you get to like, okay, well, what about say a multi-tuberculate? We have some evidence that they had very, very specifically mammalian traits like uh, ear pinnae, which aren't even in monotremes. So are they crown mammals? If so, where do they fall? Are they closer to the placental mammals? Are they closer to the monotremes? And it's, it's not really clear in some of these cases. Uh, speaking of monotremes, you hear something like a kind of funny about my pat my past before I learn more about cladistics and stuff. Uh, I originally thought that we were more closely related to birds, you know, <laughs> because of the or because of the tectal platypus. I thought hmm. when I was when I was younger, like you know that oh oh we came from we came. Our, our common ancestor, Duck with Black Foot, they're like, like a bird, they lay eggs. So we must be related to birds. We're bred in this. Well, I mean, we are related to, well, humans are related to birds in I that know, they're but, both amniotes. But, 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 but more, but, my, but that's a little bit more distant related than I right. originally thought. Also, uh, Nestle20 says that uh, he had, saw a re recent article that puts varanopids and parareptiles within diapsida. Um, <clears throat> I would be very interested to see. What evidence was given that varanopids are are diapsids? Because um, that is not something I would have predicted. But I mean, I'm I'm willing to be convinced. It would be a very interesting. Do you know Do you know about varanopids? No. I, they, I so they look superficially. They they resemble uh, verandid lizards, like monitors, like a like a water monitor or a komodo dragon or something like that. Um. But when you look at their morphology, they are definitely not um, varanid uh, lizards. So I would be interested. It's not the it's not a group that I know a huge amount about. Um, but you know, I would be very interested to see that. So you should uh, you should tweet that at me or something. Oh yeah. So if you speak of yeah, I I I went to buy, buy Jackson's book and it and. It comes out next. My get my paycheck again. You get you you going to you going to get it or you already got it? Um, I haven't quite gotten it. I'm thinking about getting the Kindle edition because it's significantly cheaper. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a a Kindle account. I only have a. You can get a desktop app. As far as I know, it's free. Okay, I can try that. Let's do that. Yeah, I have. I do have a Barnes and Noble version for for Nook, but unfortunately, it's not it's on Nook yet. So yeah. If I launched any of early amnios and infinities of parareptile and varanopidae, varanopid from the Carboniferous Nova Scotia reveals evidence of parental care in amniotes. Um, I actually wouldn't be surprised if there was some uh, parental care in varanopids. Uh, one of the things about being an amniote is that um, amniotic eggs take a lot more resources to produce, and so it pushes amniotes much closer towards um, uh, R selection than K selection. Because if you look at like um, amphibian grade animals, animals that can just, you know, put out a few thousand eggs into the water, fertilize them, stick them to some plants, and then leave, uh, those end up using a lot less resources. But when you have to start doing things like putting in a yolk, and, or in the case of a lot of animals, putting in an eggshell and all this stuff, that becomes resource intensive for each egg. And it's why, um, as a rule, amniotes show much more parental care than most, uh, say, less amphibians or fish. Oh, uh, I mentioned this earlier. It was, it was good time. It was good timing too, since you're on the show today. Like, did you and you and you, and you even mentioned this on, on your show on your channel and your thing today? But how they found the remain like what the possible remains of the fossilized possible DNA in the yeah. hadasaur. So it's so it was a hadrosaur, if I remember correctly. I know it was an ornithopod. I believe it was a hadrosaur. 
Um, and there are these preserved cells that you can see under a microscope. And uh, when they applied, so you know, when you're when you're looking at, and Ben Tobin knows even more about this than I do, but when you want to look at cells under a microscope, you usually have to apply certain chemicals to them to stain them, and different stains will bind to different uh, chemical signatures in a cell. And so when they applied some stains to these fossilized cells that that are used to bind to DNA, they bound to the sort of dark central region of these cells, which is what looks like a nucleus. And so that is preliminary indication that there may have been DNA in there. However, I mean, it's still not clear that it's DNA. Having a, having a stain bind to something on the cell isn't proof positive of DNA. It's a very good indicator. So I am going to be, I think, appropriately cautious before I go announce that we just found dinosaur DNA. Yeah. Um, oh, and the chicken source? You want me to go into chicken source? But yeah, that's too. What's that for? Oh yeah, and uh, it's probably. I think it was, they said it. It was like built upon the uh, already studies that the Mar Mary made earlier, ten years earlier. Yeah, well, if Mary Schweitzer hadn't found um, osteocytes, things that are consistent with red blood cells, or whether or not they are, is still a little bit up in the air, um, and collagen. Uh, fibers, basically. If she hadn't found any of that, I doubt anyone would have even looked for cells in this preserved hadrosaur bone. But um, I guess that goes to what, what we mentioned last week on uh, either either no, not last week. It was with uh, last year with with Jackson and Tony, where different science tips, knowledge built up on each built up on each other. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, and I think that's actually a really good example of it where Mary Schweitzer makes this rather astounding discovery. And at first, even she doesn't believe it. Right. So if you hear her talk about the process of making this discovery, she went to uh, Jack Horner, who's her at the time, I believe he was her boss. I don't know if she's, she's still working for him, but he was her boss and sort of her mentor. And she was like, it's, this looks like collagen and osteocytes, but that's impossible. He's like, all right, we'll prove it's impossible. And when she couldn't prove it was impossible, that's when she, you know, started writing about about that find. And then when other scientists, because you know, initially the response is, "Well, that's impossible. You're wrong. This isn't osteocytes. This isn't collagen." But when other people had problems disproving that they were in fact osteocytes and collagen, then people started saying, "Well, hey, maybe we can find this type of material in other fossils." And so now we have this discovery, which now we're saying, "Well, maybe we can get scraps of DNA." And uh, we're still a long way off from Jurassic Park, and I don't think we're ever going to get to Jurassic it, Park. But. Yeah, I don't think that either. But it would be cool if we could, if we could take it with not the, but actually map the genomes of the dinosaurs and stuff. So we actually we can we can compare where they do land on the. Yeah. Oh, and you'll find that unsurprisingly, their closest for living relatives are birds, and that their next closest for living relatives are crocodilians. Like, there's not going to be a, a shocker there. I guarantee it. Uh, well, I know that much about. I'm a, in the dinosaur family tree themselves where oh yeah oh uh, that that'll actually probably be a, a little bit trickier because it'll be pretty easy to establish the gross relationships between dinosaurs modern birds and modern crocodilians but yeah. i am skeptical that we'll ever get enough to say resolve like um like exactly how does the the family tree of say albertosaurine tyrannosaurs go yeah i don't think that's ever going to be recoverable because i that's too bad because, like we, like we know, like 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 on our, like a, like mammals in our family tree. Once we get, like some of it, some of it was like totally shaken up once we, once we got the the DNA thing where we thought where originally was one thing. We we found out there was totally different side of the family tree. Yeah, that like, that does happen sometimes with um everything really, like um it was for a long time based on morphological studies assumed that uh, chiropterans, which are bats oh, yeah. were some, bat, some bats were close to, to us and they were the other bats. Right. Right. They were assumed to be uh, a sister group to the archontans, which is primates plus colugos. Um, so and then, yeah. Uh, and then like, uh, what was, was there? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Then there, there was the hippo whale connection. <laughs> yeah. That was another one that was, I think, a little bit surprising. Although um, 
it, it has actually been known for a while that there are some skeletal links between uh, Cetacea and Artiodactyla. And that's one of the reasons why some people are now using the word Cetardiodactyla. It's like a portmanteau of Cetacean and Artiodactyl. I don't like it. I just prefer to call them all Artiodactyls, and Cetacean can just is a, is a subgroup of it. And I don't know that there's any official word on which word is the, the quote-unquote correct. But um, I don't like Cetardiodactyla because it implies this division between Cetaceans and Artiodactyls, which is not taxonomically valid. Because, mm -hmm. um, like, no one's going to look at, say, giraffes and cows and pigs and be like, oh, they're, you know... They're set artiodactyls. We just call them all artiodactyls, but nested well within that is cetaceans. So I, I don't like this push to try to merge the two words. But I'm not in charge of any of that. So, um, yeah, I do want to talk about the uh, the chicken saurus though, because that's okay. a fun topic. Um, right. So do you know about the chicken saurus? I do not. So. Um, Is it Jack Horner? I think it's Jack Horner. Has this idea to use just a chicken genome. And essentially chickens have all of the, the genes to make all of the more uh, basal dinosaur structures. Like they already make a three fingered hand. They have genes for teeth. You could fix their broken enamel gene to make them have actual real enamel on the teeth that they would grow. Um, you can switch back on the genes that fail to switch on that would continue the tail on to become a long bony tail instead of having the short pig style. And so his idea is what if we just make these relatively minor genetic tweaks to a chicken and then we will get an animal with three separate fingers, all with claws, with teeth, with a dinosaur like snout and with a long bony tail. And essentially what you have at that point is just something that anyone would look at and be like, well, okay, well that's, you know, that's essentially just a dinosaur. Um, so I do think that it's probably very possible. There are, however, some, there's some ethical issues. So biomedical research has, and this would you know count into, into that to some degree and um, genetic engineering research and stuff has some pretty strict ethical controls in most countries. And one of them is that uh, generally speaking, you cannot take uh, embryos that have been significantly tampered with and let them come to full term. Uh, so I I don't know where he could get that done. Uh, and I haven't looked into the ethical issues enough myself to say whether or not I think it would be an ethical thing to do. Yeah, plus we had to make sure if they did do that, that it born, then, then we had to make sure it, it was passed on the next generation too. Otherwise, you know, it'd be a one generation thing. Uh, well, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be uh, heritable because all of those would be changes to the DNA at the basically at the zygote level. At that point, any mutations at the zygote level are going to be germline mutations. Well, I guess it would have to also be if, if those ge genetics, it would be if, if those traits were more dominant than recessive too. Um, yeah, I, I have some good reason to think that they might end up being dominant because um, most of it involves restoring a broken gene. And so, um, people have a misconception about how gene dominance works. They'll think that, oh, only the dominant gene gets expressed and the recessive gene doesn't, right? Well, that's not actually true. I mean, it, it, it's, sometimes it gets hidden in the thing. Right. So it's, it's actually the case that both dominant and recessive genes both get expressed. It's just that when there's a dominant gene, what that ends up meaning is that its expression becomes the thing that's more obvious in terms of the, uh, the actual animal. So for example, um, you know, Gregor Mendel and his pea plants. He was the guy who kind of determined Mendelian genetics and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so one of the, one of the genes that he identified was a wrinkled versus smooth gene for, um, or alleles for pea plants. And so if you had a homozygous pea with two wrinkly uh, pea genes or alleles, I keep mixing them up, but whatever, uh, you get a wrinkly pea. And if you have one that's heterozygous for smooth and wrinkly, you get smooth. But the thing is that the difference here is actually that there is this particular protein that uh, helps prevent desiccation in the pea. And the, the smooth um, allele produces a functional version of this protein. 
And the rinker allele produces a broken version. It doesn't, essentially just doesn't help, doesn't retain water inside the pea. But when you're heterozygous, enough of the correct functional protein is made to make the pea smooth. But that pea plant will still make the non-functional version of the protein. And so the reason I think that these many of these genes would, or these modifications would end up essentially being dominant is that uh, in most cases, you're essentially switching back on a protein that essentially wasn't made or was made in a way that was defective in the bird. And so if you have half defective and half functional um, proteins, the functional proteins are going to do their function and you're going to see the function. And so if, it, if that function is grow teeth, well, you're going to get teeth. So there actually is reason to suspect that um, the changes. Now, I'm not a geneticist. I, this is just my my layperson sort of uh, feeling about this. But I think there is actually good reason to think that if we made a chicken saurus, that the chicken saurus alleles would actually be uh, a dominant. Oh, cool. So yeah, uh, we might actually. Chris, Chris, we can. Chris, then we have to start feeding them. Uh, maybe more meaty things and actually green and stuff because you know that well you know chickens actually eat a lot of meat already i did not know that yep chickens um they eat a lot of insects they eat a lot of worms they eat mice oh, they'll eat uh, each oh, other I, I did not know mice i knew they eat maybe worms they'll eat they'll eat baby chicken they'll eat chicken chicks that aren't theirs like yep like 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 some animals hey you, 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 you don't have my genes get, get out of here if they're hungry enough, they will kill and eat each other as adult chickens. So yeah, chickens actually do a lot more eat, uh, meat eating than people realize. Cause you know, we see someone go in to feed the chickens. They always toss them grains. But um, if you toss some chicken scraps, like I know some farmers and they, all their kitchen scraps go to either a, uh, a compost pile or the chickens. Again, they're showing, they're showing, they're showing their uh, thrapsid lineage me your lineage oh theropod there yeah God damn yeah it. <laughs> it's all right yeah yeah as td lane says chickens are omnivores and they are terrifying they are they're they're vicious predators when they have a, a hankering for some meat um yeah it's it's one of the reasons why um you get problems in your barn with rats and mice because there's you know people put grain in there but you don't tend to have problems with rats and mice in the chicken coop because the chickens will kill and eat them. So again, going back to dinosaur ancestry, when we were, when we were little shrews and stuff and dinosaurs ate us. <laughs> so like, we remember <laughs> we're going back that way. Well, to be fair, um, even in the Cretaceous, there were mammals or mammaliforms, depending on exactly how the shake up comes out that could eat, smaller dinosaurs and certainly would eat dinosaur eggs oh, yeah. so it's it's always been a little bit more complicated than just oh dinosaurs were big and ate mammals and mammals were small and had to run and hide uh yeah. you know the cretaceous had mammals the size of dogs yeah but i always i always joked one time that that's why we eat chicken and turkey now for for, for, for revenge <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> like oh yeah and uh, actually i um Every once in a while, when people ask you know, about my favorite dinosaur, I, I go with turkey because it's delicious. And then people say, well, isn't that like cannibalism? It's like, I don't know. Is it cannibalism if you eat a cow? I mean, that's the kind of relationship we're talking about here in terms of relatedness. Like, yeah, the, the, it's like, is that really cannibalism? I mean, even, even being theropods, like if you look at the divergence time for different theropod clades, I mean, we're talking like, you know. 150 200 million years in some cases you're not that far separated from a cow as a human sure. your separation from a cow is like 80 million years you're more closely related to a cow than a ceratosaurus is to a turkey yeah uh nest nestle mentioned this back here a little bit but yeah about the dog and stuff but i guess with so the different selections artificial natural and select, sexual i guess some of maybe some of with both those, like some, maybe sometimes the, the what was the recessive gene might be become more pronounced because that's what either that's what it takes for either for survival or that's what we that's what we as humans want to breed out with them. Well, so with the the one of the big differences between artificial and natural selection is that in artificial selection humans tend not to take into account every single possible detail 
Whereas natural selection just does by nature, you know, anything that causes the animal to be selected against will end up being selected against. Whereas humans can say like, oh, look, this puppy is adorable. I don't care if it's going to get hip dysplasia as an adult. I'm, it's going to be the one that I breed with. Um, or, you know, these, these squished face dogs are cute. I don't care that they can't breathe. We're just going to breed them. Uh, and so you can get these very strange and essentially deformed animals with selective breeding that are very unhealthy. But because humans are so good at keeping them alive and getting more of them, they just keep persisting and breeding. And that's where you get things where like um, show German shepherds basically can't walk anymore. Pugs can't breed any, breathe anymore. Uh, huge amounts of larger dogs have big problems with hip dysplasia. And um, it's basically because humans, they can't keep all of the stuff that could affect the health of an animal in mind when they're doing selective breeding. Whereas natural selection just does it without trying. Because yeah. you can't try to do anything. It's not if, a person. If you if you if you if you can so if, if you can like survive the, survive to have kids and you're okay you're okay. Yeah, and uh, Eric Virtaler, um, if you debate Kent on whether birds are dinosaurs, uh, that would be great. I would love to watch that. Let's see see if he's learned anything since your debate or. Oh, I guarantee you, he hasn't. Uh, yeah, he definitely hasn't. In fact, actually, I've been trying to get a debate with him, but he has been tightening the rails or the reins on um, who he will and won't debate and where he will and won't debate. And so um, I'm expecting him to not actually accept the debate with me and Erica because Erica and I are trying to set up a debate with him where we both, both she and I, debate him together. Originally, we wanted to debate um, Kent and Standing for Truth together. So they would be on one side, the two of us would be on the other side. But uh, Kent Hoven seems to, one, not know who Standing for Truth is, and also, two, think that he's not a creationist. And so, like, he was just so baffled by the concept that I just dropped it. And I was like, he's he doesn't even understand what I'm asking, basically. He's like, we need other creationists besides me? You're like, what? <laughs> right, yeah. But um, I would... Um, I would also, yeah, I would really like to see what Eric said. And I think that the reasons that I, he's probably going to not end up debating me might not apply to Eric. So, oh, um, yeah. yeah. Plus, plus, you said mentioned that he wants the docs. He wants like all, all your information for you too, like your your address, your social security number, your faces. Uh, I mean, that's an, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but he does want people's full names and their uh, and actual photos. And um, I sent him my first name, which he already knows. And a picture of my avatar. And um, I, I said, you know what? This was the, the name and uh, picture under which I debated Ken Hoven the first time. I think that would be perfectly sufficient for a subsequent engagement. So, um, and I do want to point out, uh, I know that Nestle 20 um, had mentioned it, that it is also true that natural selection can do things that are not super oh. great for the animal. Can you like, so you want to send the link? You can if, you're, if you get, you know how to get hold of him. Um, I th am I following him on? All right, let me copy the link and see if I can find him on Twitter. Yeah. So I remember reading a book. Uh, I forget it was. I think it was one of the. I forget if it was if it was uh, Dawkins or Bill Nye, but I remember reading this article or chapter about these difference between natural and sexual selection, where they they were breeding like guppies or something. And they, they put they put one set of guppies in a in a pot in a little river or pond with no predators. The other one they uh, put with predators, and the ones without predators had more colorful spots for, for breeding for like breeding with the males had more colorful spots, so they could be seen. But sexual selection for the females. Yeah, I remember that study. But the uh, the ones with predators had more camouflage; they could hide from the things will bounce out between the two things. Yeah. I just, uh, uh, Nestle 20, I just sent you a, um, a DM on Twitter. So you should have the link at this point. Um, yeah. So check, check your Twitter DMs and there, there you go. Yeah. I, I, I think I read, I think I saw a video about this. The best way to explain, I, I that explain it was, was natural selection is the way to, to get, survive to the breeding age and once you get hit, once you hit that time then the sexual selection gets you gets you to the gets you to the 
to breeding? Um, there, there is some truth to that. Uh, there really isn't much sexual selection up to um, up until breeding age, but um, it's also the case that um, natural selection doesn't isn't just a binary selection, right? It's not just oh, you were selected against, so you didn't breed, or you were selected for, so you did breed. There's this concept called differential reproductive success. So if you have 20 kids and the other guy has five kids, well, you were more heavily selected for than the other guy. And so if your descendants keep having more kids, oh, and we got Nestle 20 in. What's Hello, up, man? Can you, can you hear me? I can. Yes, I can hear you too. Great. Well, I have to first to say, like, I uh, I, I have followed you like, for quite a while now. And uh, I, th I think I, I am one of your first subscribers because... I think so, I, yeah. I came. I, I like your. I, the first video I saw was you explaining about uh, why pterosaurs were not birds. According oh, that's to a really old one. Yeah, <laughs> that's that was. Uh, was that like what? Right after the debate? I don't know. I don't know. Like it uh, might have even been before well, the back. debate. Yeah, I that's think it was a... before. I think it was before the debate. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Like, that was... I, like I le like I learned from you that I I, I didn't I, I didn't know that. Pterosaurs walked on their knuckles. I don't know. I didn't know that. Yeah, but they do it in sort of the opposite way to the way that apes do. Because you know, yeah. apes apes curl their hands in, right? And so they walk. Um, depending on which kind, they either walk on the first set of knuckles, like that are actually connected to the hand, or that next set up that are like the, you know, the the joint between the medial and proximal yeah. uh, phalange. Whereas pterosaurs actually walk on the underside of their knuckles. So if you were to put your hand flat down flat, yeah, <laughs> kind of like you were trying to crack your knuckles against a desk or something. So where your hand is going to rest, that's the part of the anatomy that uh, pterosaurs are walking on with their forelimbs. That's really weird, yeah. Yeah. Well, pterosaurs are just, they're bizarre. Yeah. Everything about a pterosaur is just weird. Uh, their heads are weird. Their torsos are weird. Their, their spines are weird. Their feet are weird. Their hands are weird. It's... Like if you uh, want to see a freak show, just check out pterosaurs. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it appears that like pterosaurs, like that the body plan is so modified for flight. Like everything is so modified for flight mm -hmm. that it, it, it actually appears that, that no pterosaur went flightless. Like there are lots of birds that went flightless over time independently, yeah. but pterosaurs mm -hmm. apparently they didn't ever do that. Ever. Yeah, I, as far as I know, there's never even been a hint of a flightless pterosaur. Yeah. Um. Now, part of that could just be that there weren't too many instances where that niche wasn't already filled with the niche mm -hmm. that they might have taken had they become flightless. But it's actually very true that pterosaurs were much more highly modified for flight than even birds are. Well, yeah. well speaking of, of that, oh, two things real fast. Opposite topic, Ross can say, but like, like Eric said, most people found you because of the flat earth thing or something. Uh, yeah, so I was on, uh, so FTFE, uh, Craig, who has a, a channel, you know, I, I think most people here probably know about it. But um, one of the the bigger breaks that I got in terms of subscriber count was that um, he did a uh, he, it's his series that he calls Stupid Humans. And I was the his guest for the first episode. He usually has a collaborator on for it. And usually it's the collaborator who already produces um, content about that topic. And so his topic there was um, young earth creationist stuff. So there was stuff like did humans live with dinosaurs and stuff about the flood. And so, um, yeah, I, I collaborated on that episode. It's pretty good. If you, by the way, if you want to go check it out, like I think it's called um, stupid human thinks dinosaurs live with humans on FTFE's channel. It's a, it's a pretty fun episode. I liked it. And I got, I think I got somewhere around four ish hundred subscribers in the, the day and a half after that. I, and then uh, there were a couple uh, sub drives from Steve McRae. He helped me out a little bit yeah. there. Um, and those two things together probably result in uh, probably 600-ish, maybe more of my subscribers. Yeah, yeah. But when, I, when I subscribed to your channel, you just had four videos. Yeah, that probably sounds about right. Because I remember yeah. you coming in on some of those really early ones. Yeah, I might be the only one who probably, I'm not positive, but I, I, I might be, I've, I'm the one that I found you via Eric. You came on my channel with at the first after show. Like he's like, can, right. can Dapper come on too? Like, okay, sure, why not? <laughs> That's how I met you. <laughs> and that was a that was a fun time. And uh, by the way, to 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 talk about some of the chat is Benthoven says I found Dapper when he showed up on my aircraft carrier in the Navy. That is that is correct. I'm the first and last ever dinosaur that served on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> uh, well, unless you count, unless you count. 
uh, oh, I mean, aircraft carriers. Let's, let's do kind of like pirates on pirate ships. Then it's not really aircraft carriers. <laughs> it's also not really the U.S. Navy either. Uh, as far as I know, that I don't remember the New United States ever actually having chartered, uh, uh, essentially pirates, because um, it was actually a common practice in the 18th century to have government sanctioned piracy. So you would give someone a charter to go, like if you were. If it was the British Navy, you'd give some guy with a ship a charter to go attack and sack, say, Spanish vessels. And as far as the British were concerned, it wasn't a crime for him to attack and steal from Spanish galleons. Uh, but as far as I know, the United States never did that. And even if they had, those people weren't technically parts of the regular Navy. So, that's for uh, benefits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. But I, I don't think the United States ever did that. They weren't big into the. Like, look, I'm not going to be here and be like, oh, the United States is great and stuff. I'm not a big defender of many of the things the United States has done. However, I can say at the very least, I don't believe they ever uh, condoned or chartered pirates. So you're lucky. Like, I, I am Dutch. I don't. I have like a bigger problem with that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. There was a lot of uh, uh, the, the Germanic countries in general produced a lot of pirates for a long time. But it was not as big of a thing in um, really anywhere in England. There's not a huge history of English piracy until you get to the 18th century. And um, I don't really know why. The, uh, the Anglo-Saxons came to, to England and they just kind of seemed to lose interest in doing all of the, the raiding and all that stuff in a lot of other places. Like, oh, like, oh there's, there's no one here to fight. Let's just settle down here. Yeah, it was, it's weird because, I mean, if you look at like the culture of Anglo-Saxons, like if you read like uh, Anglo-Saxon literature from the 8th century or something, it doesn't really read much differently than literature that you're getting out of other sort of at least nominally Christianized areas in um, Germanic speaking countries. But there really is a big drop off in their willingness to go out and just raid other countries to get stuff. And I don't know what it was. Maybe they just found England sufficiently farmable and with sufficient mineral wealth. They just didn't bother. I don't, I don't really know. It would be an interesting thing to, to have someone do a study on. I'm probably not going to do it, but I guess, I guess like back when the Vikings were a thing, they were around for a while, then they just like chopped off on, on the raiding parts. Well, I mean, the Vikings took over that they, they were doing a lot of raiding. Um, in fact, actually uh, a lot of English, there's a surprising amount of English um, vocabulary and grammar that actually ends up coming from Old Norse and not from Anglo-Saxon. So, yeah. like um, the pronoun like, "they." Yes, like like for like I think for like for some some of the early English kings before the Norman invasions were were were, Vic, were from Dane Vikings. Um, I don't know of any that were actually ancestrally Danish or or Viking. Well, can I can I can knit or something? Um, can that for his name? Oh, yeah, that that might be the case. I don't. Remember. Yeah, I used to study. I used to. I, I used to make a big. I used to study English monarchy genealogy. Ah, uh, well, and so like um, some some interesting things is, and one of the things is that that not all of the interaction between the Anglo Saxons and the Norse were wars and raids. There were actually a fair few um. Norsemen who just settled down and became farmers in uh, Northern England. And we get from them certain words like, uh, you know, the pronoun they, them. Yeah. That's, that comes from Old Norse, not Old Anglo-Saxon. And, and the ancestors of those farmers, they say, no, they will never reach Valhalla. They will never. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, sorry, guys. But instead, they just got to, you know, eat more regularly and not have to kill everyone. Yeah. But um, also the English word are for the, uh, the plural form of the verb to be also comes from Old Norse. And so we get these these weird little uh, Norse influences in, in uh, Old English. And interestingly, um, you know how German has this weird little bit where the uh, the third person singular feminine pronoun and the third yeah. and what is it the is it the second person plural pronoun same essentially sound essentially the same? Yeah, I I learned uh, uh, German in high school, but I dropped it after I had the chance. So I, I don't uh, I'm not an expert on German language, even though well, I'm Dutch. Uh, I believe it's those two that are the same pronoun. English had a similar problem where the third person feminine pronoun 
and the third person plural pronoun were identical in, in Anglo-Saxon. And it's thought that that's one of the reasons why Old English picked up the word they from Norse is to c stop the confusion between she and they. Um, so, yeah. Well, speaking of languages, another thing like, about crazy this and some people, a lot of people compare the evolution of language like the evolution of animals into the tower. Like, this is like the Tyler Babel, where everything was created mm. one day. That, yeah. Like the animals were created in one day, things were created in day. How language has actually slowly evolved through, through the years. Well, one of the things that makes, I think, it easier for people to believe the language thing is that um, we haven't been able to really well establish any um, connections between the, the biggest language families that we have. Like, no one can find a common ancestor between Indo-European and Semitic or, uh, you know, afro yeah. or even just Afro-Asiatic if we want to go bigger than Semitic. Um, like, what's the common ancestor for Proto-Indo-European and uh, Afro-Asiatic? I don't know. Maybe there isn't one. Or maybe there is, but it's just so long ago that we can't really recover that. So, but what it means, though, is that in order to believe in the, the Babel story, you have to believe that much sooner than a reasonable divergence time for a lot of these languages. These languages were just created whole cloth. Or you could say that, um, you know, so if we assume that the Tower of Babel was what, like 3,000 years ago or maybe 4,000 years ago. But the thing is, we already know that many languages from that time period are related to each other and they're parts of modern families that we know about. Yeah. So did God just create a bunch of Semitic languages that look like they descended from Proto-Semitic and then a bunch of... Um, Indo-European languages that look like they're all descended from Proto-Indo-European. Well, that God created the Italic, uh, which looks like which conveniently looks like a fish tetrapod transition. So yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's just there to, to he's just doing it to mess with you. Yeah, to yeah, test yeah. to test your faith. To test your faith. Yeah, yeah actually, that probably goes. It might even go back to further back. You know, to speciation. You know, sometimes it wasn't genetic. Sometimes speciation is just. Uh, language barriers. A bird can tweet different tweet, different tweet, and not, not be able to breed with his other neighbor birds anymore. Yeah, that is that is sometimes how um, speciation can start. Um, it's just a difference in behavior. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, um, one interesting thing is, uh, you, do you know what cicadas are? The the giant insects that come out every every once so, so often. And, yeah, they make a racket, and all you can hear for the whole summer is just cicadas buzzing at you. And they'll see again, again for 18 years. Right. Well, they so um, mm -hmm. different populations of essentially genetically identical cicadas have different uh, breeding cycles. Because the, the breeding cycle of a cicada goes, okay, you have adult cicadas. They breed, and then they die. And that's all an adult cicada does, is it finds a mate, it breeds, and it dies. And then the eggs that they lay hatch into little grub-like worms that then go attach themselves to tree roots and spend years just growing and feeding off of tree sap that they get from the roots. And then they morph, metamorphose into adults. But they, each species has a certain number of years that it spends as a grub. But if you say have a seven year cicada, what if you get two populations of cicadas that are both seven year cicadas, but they come out on different sets of years? So they have a different seven year cycle. Well, how are they gonna breed together? They can't. And so if anything like that happens, you suddenly have two species that might be genetically essentially identical, but because they have a different breeding cycle, now they're never going to breed again. And you're going to get divergence in the genetics as mutations in both groups bring them farther and farther apart genetically over time. And so, yeah, even simple behaviors like when do you breed or what sound do you make when you're trying to attract a mate can cause these barriers to uh, reproduction. I've always also wondered, like, like, like speciation, like, like how 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 much of of our like evolution history in general it was our 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 ring species, but the that some of the the rings are cut out, uh, rings yeah. the rings are cut out. Yeah, well, ring species is one of those. It's a great concept, although I don't. It's it's, it's it's like it's like the ideal gas light. There is no I ideal gas, but it's right. like a it, it describes a thing that is useful. Like yeah, right. yeah, more, more easy, more easily understandable than the actual thing. Right, because one of the problems is that think, the things that might become a ring species tend to get broken up before the ring can really complete itself. 
Yeah. So um, I said it's like maybe gaps in the in the ring. Yeah. Too. So there are examples of things that are almost ring species, but they don't technically quite meet the idealized definition. So um, have there ever been any real ring species according to the actual, you know, like ideal situation? Probably not. But certainly uh, things like that have happened. And sometimes you can get really simple things like why are chimpanzees and bonobos different species? Basically, because neither of them like to swim, and a, a okay. water, a river started flowing between them. Yeah, I, I, I made that joke. I made that joke last week of Erica, like, because because they don't like water, they don't like swimming. Then we're not yeah. Ch chimps. <laughs> yeah, it, it was basically like, oh man, I could mate with those those other chimps over there, but I just don't want to swim there. So I'll just mate with the chimpanzees on this side of the river, and then suddenly, you know, a few hundred thousand years later, you have two different species of chimpanzee. Well, one side we have Vikings, the other side we ha we have hippies. No, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Uh, the the bonobos aren't aren't as um, peaceful as people would. Oh, like oh yeah, they are. Into that, the, they are the the women are the dominant, dominant dominant. Yeah, they do have a they do have a big change in that. Um, the female bonobos tend to be uh, dominant over males, which is the opposite of what happens in uh, chimpanzee groups. Yeah, we went to that last week too. It would happen if a, a female bonobo met with a male chip and these are they're both like they are both dominant ones like like no like no, yeah it probably wouldn't work well or, or otherwise other the other way too if if a if a if a male bonobo met with a female chimp and they are both like the recessive or the the passive ones yeah that that would probably be a more peaceful encounter yeah um like like the like talk about that uh, chip and she say like oh, feminists. Like uh, they, they will see, they will see the, like them. Like, uh, no, what are they doing? Like, yeah. feel, like a ma matriarchy. No, I, I don't think it would be very ethical, but it would be <laughs> interesting to see what would happen if you put some bonobos and chimpanzees in a shared enclosure and let them interact. Like, what would actually happen? Because in some ways they're very similar, and in some other ways, especially behaviorally, they're very different. So I would be interested to see like how would they recognize each other and things because both groups have been able to interact with humans in a socially meaningful way. But then again, humans are much more um, conflict avoidant than chimpanzees are. So I don't, I don't know. It would be an interesting emphasis, emphasis on more. Well, not yeah, enti not, not entirely, but more, right. <laughs> more conflict avoidant yeah. than chimpanzees. For instance, um, humans, when they get into a d disagreement tend to be unlikely to rip each other's testicles off. Yeah, chimpanzees on the other hand, unlikely, unlikely, <laughs> right, right, unlikely. But um, yeah, humans are humans are actually for as violent as they are, which is considerably. Um, those when you pesky, compare them to chimpanzees, the pesky laws we have, you know, right. Mm. Humans still tend to be much more likely to to seek out peaceful resolutions to conflicts than uh, chimpanzees are. Um, and we do it with sticks. Not fish. Well, yeah. Well, that's. <laughs> I think that's actually one of the reasons why humans are more conflict avoidant is because um, humans can fashion weapons that make them much more lethal than they otherwise would be. Uh, whereas chimpanzees tend not to do that. They just tend to fist fight. And granted, they're stronger than humans are, but that's matched by the level of strength of the other animal. Whereas with humans, you don't know what that guy has as far as weapons go. And there might be one of his buddies b hiding behind a hill with a javelin. You don't know. And so um, I think that really high risk for very serious injury or death with, with uh, human on human conflict is one of the reasons why um, in fact, when humans are set in areas where they don't have any particular, uh, you know, laws to keep them in check, they don't end up just going out and killing each other. Like we have, there have been examples where people are in situations where they don't have any pre-existing social structures that are already imposed on them. Like you get people who end up sh shipwrecked or something and they have to survive. And this is actual things have happened. They don't end up going every man for himself, kill the other guy before he kills you. Yeah. Humans tend to actually be much more peaceful and willing to negotiate than that. Yeah. Um, and I do think that's one of the reasons is conflict also, between also, humans can yeah, it's be- also, so It's also interesting. Oh, sorry. Like I was- sorry. Oh, Go ahead. No. It's also interesting to see like uh, hunter-gatherer societies are tend to be a, a lot like more egalitarian than you would, might expect. Yeah, they like, actually yeah. they do. Um, it's they well one of the reasons for that is um, 
humans are good at adapting to the need for division of labor, but when your technology is at a hunter-gatherer level, there isn't really that much labor that needs to be divided up for specialization. Where yeah. division of labor becomes really important is when you get um, to the and point where no one start, person could effectively do all of the things that the tribe and group needs. And when we start settling down more and staying in one place. And, right, well, um, that's, that's the kind of thing that things like farming and being able to settle down into a particular area, you can only do that at a certain level of technological sophistication. And we're like, we don't need everyone to be a farmer. Like, we got to right. It's one, right. it's one. It's one interesting. Like I, like uh, I read something about this. Like uh, the one of the interesting effect about uh, transitioning to a, uh, like uh, how do you call it, a uh, from hunter gatherer to a farming society, like uh, agriculture, it it creates a need for like uh, like something like marriage because yeah. now now you have now you have like a, like a one man owning a whole bunch of land and I, I have all the food and now I need to like uh, when I. And that creates like a family structure now, right. and also like a more like a uh, hierarchical, hierarchical society. Yeah, yeah. Back, to, back to the weapon things real fast too. I mean, like I said, I with Erica's last week about how the Neanderthals they survived. They were there. They were, they were more upfront, short range things, and, and we were and we were like, oh. Maybe if we throw from a distance, we don't get we don't get hurt as much. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's it's true. Uh, humans are. I mean, it's not true that no other animals throw things, but nothing really has the precision or um, just accuracy of. Oh, hey, the daily atheist. Hello. Uh, yeah, humans are unmatched in their level to project force away yeah. from themselves at a, at a considerable distance. Pretty much everything else, if you're not within striking distance, it's probably got nothing on you. And I, I think it has to do with our uh, waste. Like uh, when you look at Neanderthals, they don't really have like a waste than, than that we have, like a, a very thin. They they do I have mean, a much yeah. more sh a much shorter yeah. um, waist. Their their chest is much more barrel shaped and it takes up a yeah. larger portion of their torso. But then again, I actually I don't remember. I think there have been some spears of um, Neanderthals found, but overall they are much more robust than um, Homo sapiens. Yeah. And they they were known to survive some pretty horrific injuries. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I again like I, I wonder if if the Ninja Falls or even Homer the, the Homer Rectus that weren't that we weren't descended from survived if we would be like they would be on a community of themselves or we'd have them in a zoo or something. Oh um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, so one of the things. Um, it makes it easier when there's as big of a gap in terms of uh, you know cognitive function as there is between humans and almost every other animal. Like um, really only the great apes and maybe dolphins get close. And even then they're really not that close. Um, I think that uh, you know a, a homo erectus would be much closer to a human cognitively than a human is to a chimpanzee. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think humans so you get like historically this distinction between brutes and people well, and brutes well, are the animals that can't really talk or, um, yeah, well, we promise we all we can also be racist and stuff. So, you know, yeah. Well, even then though, um, even at our most racist periods, we tended not, there, there, there aren't really too many instances where you can find someone who was literally having a human in a zoo. There are a few here and there, but it was, it was very uncommon, even at the, the height of racism at the height of the uh, British empire. Yeah, like there were there were a few instances of Aboriginal Australians that had been put in an exhibit. Um, there were of also, course, of course, it's all it's all the fault of Darwin and uh, the, the, right. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. no one was a racist until Darwin. Um, there are also a few examples of people taking tribes folk and exhibiting them more in like a freak show environment than in a zoo, or like um, like the Roman Coliseums and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it really is pretty uncommon for there to be human zoos in human history. So I don't know. It's a, it's a weird question about if, if there had been a, an extant population of Homo erectus in historical times, what would Homo sapiens have done with them? And so it's also like, interesting. Yeah. It's also interesting to know that like that the humans that we, we, those who are still left are like very close. Like we, we get all this thing about other human races, like black, white and brown and such but we are like one one race actually yeah human genetic diversity is fairly low and the, yeah, that, yeah. the gross morphological characters that humans use to d divide each other into various racial categories 
are fairly minor from a genetic standpoint. Yeah, and but, they are also continuous, like they form a uh, clinal relationship instead of like a the actual box division. Right. It's, it's easy to look and say, oh, there's a bunch of races if, say, like, uh, like let's say you show up in, say, I don't know, um, like some European country, like, okay, so you show up in England or France or Denmark or something and you see, okay, well, here's like a Somali immigrant population. We well, yeah, obviously they look considerably different from the, the native population in the area. But if you were to walk from Somalia to say France and look at what the native population looked like in every single place you stopped in, it would be a gradual transition without any real break in what the people looked like. It's just when you take people from wildly different places in the world and stick them together that, yeah, you get to see these stark differences in uh, yeah. phenotype. But if you were to walk between them, you wouldn't see these abrupt changes in phenotype. Oh, God. I, I, I hate when I have a, have a thought and I wait and then the, the time I get done talking. Oh, like, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, my, I lost my thought now. Oh, so, I'm sorry. About, about human races or about uh, like you were talking about both maybe uh, chimpanzees oh, 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 races uh, oh, oh no yeah the different races and genetics uh, I think it was like seventy thousand years ago we had we had the Balneck event or something yeah it's, oh yeah the, 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 the Doba eruption I think uh, right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it was yeah. somewhere around 75, 70, 000 years ago yeah but I like to think about how 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 genetically similar yard or ours because of that it's imagine if the flood was real <laughs> we had that genetic bottleneck and there were only eight people yeah. actually that that reminds me of one of my pet peeves with young earth creationists because they're like oh look y chromosome adam that was that would be adam right <laughs> it's like no that would be noah yeah exactly the uh, fact that you think it would be adam means that you don't understand what y chromosomal adam is yeah Although, although I, I I have to note like uh, the like the Toba genetic bottleneck theory is not really uh, like widely accepted. I I I think like it's it, there are some who propose it, but there are also like others who say ah uh, it's not really substantiated. So maybe there may be a bottleneck, but there may not be, and and it, and it may be related to the Toba eruption, but it may also not be. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not super firm, but humans do have an unusually low like humans have yeah. less genetic diversity than chimpanzees do. Yeah. And and so it's, it's not, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think it has more to do with like uh, rapid uh, migration from Africa. When, when you have rapid migration, then you carry well, less diversity from that, uh, that point on. That explains why non-African humans have less genetic diversity than African humans. Oh, but yeah. even when you add in all of the African humans to the non-Africans, you still don't get as much genetic diversity as you do in just uh, pan troglodytes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So, and, and yeah. Sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And you said you mentioned that how with uh, with with quote like with Noah being like a similar Adam, some people would would say that his wife would be Eve, mitochondria Eve, but that would only be the case if 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 their if if their sons married their sister, Larry married their their full sisters. Right. Yeah. That would all. Yeah. So the fact that young Earth creationists can't consistently get right the difference and who would actually be Y chromosomal Adam if their ideas are right, just goes to show you that they just, they just don't even know what Y chromosomal Adam is. And they only, they really don't know what uh, mitochondrial Eve means. And um, they also don't understand why evolution would predict that every species that has ever existed would have a, an analog. Now it's going to depend as far as Y chromosomal Adam as to whether or not you're using um, X, Y sex determination. So if you're using like VW sex determination, then you're going to have a, a different kind of um, setup. But at least all mammal species that we know of would have a Y chromosomal atom yeah. and, and, and a mitochondrial Eve. And that uh, wouldn't be... Yeah, yeah, the, the, the I, serial mammals. I think, I think like monotremes have a different uh, sex determination. Oh, that might be. I'm not sure. I, I made a joke once that the real mitochondrial Eve would be that first eukaryote that, that, that kidnapped the mitochondria DNA. Well, mm -hmm. that, would, that would be the case if you're... So the thing is, uh, mitochondrial Eve is usually something that's defined for a particular species, but you can generalize the concept or you can make the concept even smaller. So you could say, well, what's the quote unquote mitochondrial Eve for all people of European descent? You could just sample all of them and see, okay, well, what's the, the haplogroup group they all fall into? And, you know, you could get a smaller group than that or um, something like that. 
And also, so that, also it may be very difficult because then you have to define who is descendant from Europeans. Like, how do you right. like? Yeah. Yeah, because there's always going to be some amount yeah. of. Uh, oh yeah, yes, yeah. Mitochondria, female lines, it, it's a bigger group or it goes back further than the the Y chromosome group. Right. Well, I I gave an example I think in one of my videos, and I was like, well, suppose that um, you know. Everyone, let's, let's say that, you know, Elon Musk gets his way and humans colonize Mars. And it just so happens that all of the, the women who end up colonizing Mars all fall into a particular haplogroup is for mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Now, the woman who originated that haplogroup would become their mitochondrial Eve. And if we assume that there isn't going to be, you know, interbreeding between Earth and Mars after this point, you know, maybe there's some disaster that happens. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's and they, they speciate into another species. That species is going to have a different mitochondrial Eve than the rest of humanity. Yes. And so this mitochondrial Eve isn't some first human woman that existed and was created de novo. She would have had other women who lived with her. She would have been a part of a population that included females. There was a whole breeding population. It's just that she is the, the, the last or the, the most recent I guess, female the, the, line ancestor for all humans, her, who you can sexual, trace. Sexual selection. Well, it doesn't more. even have to be sexual selection. All that it means is, if you if you take every single female human today, right now, and you trace back to their mothers and their grandmothers, and their and you always go back and you never cross over to the male line, so you always get the female ancestor and then their mother and then their mother. Every single woman on earth gets to that person. That doesn't mean they don't have other female ancestors. It just means yeah. that those other female ancestors that weren't mitochondrial Eve that were existing at the same time as she didn't result in their ancestry through purely the female line. Yeah. And a similar thing happens with Y chromosome Adam. So if you go to your father and his father and his father and his father, and you do this for all the males on the planet, you get to, uh, you get to Y chromosomal Adam through only male descent. Well, like I said, like, like I said, said usually the but the males essentially combine earlier than the female ones most of likely most of the time. Um, I I don't know. That might be a possibility. Oh, oh, oh. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. But yeah, the, 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 the joke I I made up one time. If you know the monkey thing, you know if you listen for monkeys and stuff. I'm I'm not sure I know this joke. Oh, you know, it's crazy to say if we if, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Oh, right, right. Well, well Martian thing, craziness on Mars. We like if we came from Earthlings, how come there's still Earthlings? Yeah, they, I mean it's the same argument. It's yeah. it's a ridiculous I one. They actually do that if, there, if, there, if there's a craziness on Mars in a, a thousand million years. Like, like well, I mean, if, 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 have... if Americans came from British, then why are they still British? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. Like we we have an example here. So, you know the white population of the United States and Canada came from Europe. Well, we also have a European in the room. How did he get here if, if Europeans turned into Americans? Like, well, they didn't all go to America. I should have exist. Yeah, apparently you're, you know, yeah. that's like, you, you prove creationism. Okay. Yeah, personally. I can, I can, <laughs> creationism, I'm already saying that in a thousand years. If we gave them Earthlings, I think they're still Earthlings. Right, yeah, it's, it's a... And to be fair, a lot of the more sophisticated, uh, quote unquote, sophisticated creationists don't use that. Like you're not going to catch uh, like Ken Ham no, no. Uh, or anyone from like the Discovery Institute saying that that old chestnut. They they know better than that. Um, Did you find out by now or is, is it still going on? I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the first part of your sentence. I think that, that old thing has is, is died out by now. No, it is. It hasn't like people still say it, but they tend to be yeah. sort of the um, the less well-read creationists, not the ones who run the big um, organizations. Because yeah. uh, while creationism is almost entirely inward-facing, they don't like they don't engage with the scientific community really at all. Like, like you know, um, you know, you know, standing for truth, right? Uh, like, mm -hmm. like I, I, I haven't, like I haven't heard him say that exact argument, but he has some really stupid shit of uh, like. Like, I've, like I like I mentioned in one of your hangouts that he believes Kent Hovind's claim about the the trilobite, with, you know? Oh, the they're still. Thing. Oh, the, yeah, the they're um, Yeah, man. Uh, Vandalia, do you know about Kent Hovind's thing about there might still be trilobites hanging out in the ocean? 
Yeah, I think I might have heard of it, but I really don't pay attention to much what, what consists at the time. Like, I mean, you, there's you, you probably shouldn't. It's probably better for your health that you do I mean, <laughs> you don't pay attention to it. Um, so he likes to go on about how there might still be living trilobites, and his evidence for this is the existence of giant isopods. The problem being that isopods are, I mean, they're they're about as unrelated to trilobites as you can get while still being an arthropod. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it's basically like saying, oh, you know, there might still be. Um, it's, there it's, might, it's like it's like calling a horseshoe crab a crab. Yeah, it's exactly the same amount of distance. Um, yeah. Like, if, if we go with more familiar animals, it might be like saying, you know, um, basically mixing up a horse and a frog. Yes. There's there's just so little commonality between a trilobite and an isopod, and yet he's just like, oh, well, you know, they're both bottom-dwelling segmented organisms. Maybe they're the same thing. Like, no, there's... Just so much wrong with it. In fact, horseshoe well, crabs are much more closely related to, to trilobites than they are. You, to... When you when you ask him, well, what is it, what, what exactly is a trilobite, and he says, well, well I, I have to do some research on that one. Well, well yeah, <laughs> because yeah, he doesn't he doesn't know what anything is really. Speaking of, of arthropods and insects like that, they stupid things. They beat us. They beat us. They beat us both the land and the air. They 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 beat us the land and they beat us the air. Yeah. Well, they um. The arthropod body plan is extremely adaptable. Yeah. Um, Evolv evol evolvability, extremely high. Yeah. And so it's it's really not surprising that they would be the first animals to really make it big on land, as well as the first ones to get flight. Yeah. We had the user, ter pterosaurs, the dinosaurs, and, and bats. We had to use our, we had, we had to modify our arms to be wings. They got yeah. the special. So it's it's actually even not clear um, what yeah. parts of the insect became the wing. That's actually one of the bigger mysteries in um, in evolution right now is what what is an insect wing? Because if you look at insects that are uh, basal enough to not have wings, you get things like uh, silverfish. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything that looks like it would be homologous to an insect wing. So it's still a really big question. What Where did insect wings come from? And there are a bunch of competing hypotheses, but all of them have uh, some really big problems with them. So yeah. I, I don't know. I would, it's if you're into entomology or just evolution in general, I would say uh, look into where do insect wings come from because it's a, it's really it's, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting and very mysterious. And yeah, arthropods do rule the world to some extent. Yeah, like I like a uh, of course the the trilobite claim of Kentovan is like. Uh, Oh my like, god! Bu 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 bullshit. But I like I, I actually wish that trilobites are still alive because we could learn so much about them if they are oh, still yeah. alive, and it wouldn't disprove evolution even if they still are around. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they almost certainly aren't, but yeah. it would be really cool. The last of them died in the big the big Permian extinction. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Trilobites are an index. Trilobites as a group can be used as an index fossil for the Paleozoic. Like they, they were they, they, they were declining in diversity even before then and like there was only one family left in the permian but yeah. then then they met their end at, at the end of the permian yeah they actually yes. went through a few um periods of decline in, in biodiversity uh, yeah. a few a few times but yeah it was the the end permian that really killed them off but um his and I don't know exactly why like were they restricted to like one niche or something I mean the in the permian or something I, I don't know it's it's not entirely clear. Um, one thing is that if the the formation of the Siberian traps really are the thing that caused the end Permian extinction, which seems fairly likely that that was the big contributing factor. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that that kind of eruption would do is it would significantly acidify the ocean, and trilobite shells are made of uh, calcium carbonate. It's the same stuff that um, like clam shells are made of. Yeah. And so it also, would become also the ice. The ice are rock basically. That's the yeah. Way, basically. That's the way it, yeah. So it's entirely possible that the big problem was that trilobites just in that chemical environment simply couldn't actually deposit um, the chemical makeup of their shells into their carapace. And so yeah. without also, also, carapace. Yeah. Also no sponges, like there were no coral, oh, no, 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 maybe sponges, but there were no coral reefs for like millions of years. Only like yeah. new coral reefs were formed after the Cretaceous, I think. And it's, it's for similar reasons because um, Basically, when the ocean is sufficiently acidic, you can't lay down shells. Yeah. You can't form shells. And so um, coral are basically 
coral are basically jellyfish that never become free swimming. Cause you know, a jellyfish, when they reproduce, they produce a polyp, which is a, a little stalk with some tentacles at the top. And then new jellyfish will kind of just bud off of the top of the stalk. And so each um, polyp will form a few of those. Well, a coral is basically just a jellyfish polyp that never produces jellyfish, but they also have evolved to lay down uh, this casing of calcium. But when the ocean is sufficiently acidic, they can't do that. And so they just are forced to survive as just a polyp, which is possible. Polyps can survive as sessile filter feeders. I mean, uh, and that's basically what an anemone is. Mm. Uh, an anemone is but basically just a shell. coral that doesn't make a shell. But the shelled uh, cephalopods survive the uh, and permanent ex mass extinction, right? Like like, like the, uh, the nautilus yeah. and and the uh, ammonites and such. Yeah, and it's not clear why. Um, it could just be that they found some non-acidic area. So one of the things about mass extinction is uh, there are always some pockets that don't really feel the full effect of this. Mm -hmm. And so it could just be that they managed to hide some place where that was effective. Yeah. Um, it could also like maybe, be maybe like maybe they were like pelagic, like free swimming, and the twilight were more like at the, at the bottom feeders, like right. like that. Yeah. It's although it's not clear how bivalves made it through. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's things is and that I've been trying to find out more information about the, the lesser extinctions. You, you hear about the big five, but you 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 really don't you don't advertise the little little ones that much. Yeah. 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 Every, everyone knows the big meteor impact, but nobody, yeah. knows, almost nobody knows about like the, the, the Devonian extinction or the uh, or, or, or the extinction well, and the Permian extinction. Well, yeah, those are the to the I knew about those now. I learned about the Jurassic extinction, but I recently learned about the uh, the carbon the carbon Permian one or the mm -hmm. rainforest. The rain, uh, rainforest. Like, it, it, I don't think it's a, it's one of the big five. I think right. It's it's no, one of the minor extinctions. I think it's one of the smaller ones. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah, and that, that that one wiped out most of the amphibians, paraphyletic par, 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 group, and it, it, amphibians, and yeah, and that's why we don't have the giant dragonflies anymore. <laughs> also, yeah, oh, but, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's why we don't have griffin flies. Although a smaller griffin fly, I think, would survive just fine today. Also, also yeah. one, 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 one nitpick, the, the, the giant dragonfly isn't actually a dragonfly. Like, if you yeah. look it up, it's, it belongs to a different order of insect. Yeah, that's why I, I went with griffinfly. That's the common name that they're known yeah. by, at least in English. I don't know what the common name is in other languages. Even though I don't mention it, I think, I think probably the first mass extinction was probably the the oxygen one that I know of. I don't know if the mass extinction or not, but it's, a lot of things were... Oh, the, the, yeah. the, ox the oxygen catastrophe, yeah. yeah. Like... Yeah, it, it, that radically changed the face of the biosphere because, um, yeah. you know, uh, before that, almost everything is anaerobic. Yeah. Although, then, uh, although I, don't, I don't know if you know him, like, uh, do you know, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, Nick, Nick Lane? Like, he, he wrote uh, a book uh, called uh, uh, the, Vital, the Vital Question, and then it talks about, like, the origins of life and the origins of eukaryotes, which is just also a big mystery. And he, he mentioned the, the oxygen catastrophe, and he says there was actually no evidence that it, it occurs. Like we, we, we sort of into, like uh, infer it because, of course, oxygen is dangerous to anaerobic life. And, the, and before oxygen, there was mostly anaerobic life. So there must have been an extinction event. But yeah. he says, like, well, basically, the, the bacteria could have survived in still in pockets where there is no oxygen. So. Which they still do. I mean, there's yeah. still lots of uh, anaerobic bacteria. In fact, if you hear, if you hear someone getting oh. uh, Botox injections or dying of botulism, yeah. Okay, yeah. The, the botulin uh, bacterium is an anaerobic bacterium. Yeah, oh, and TJ makes a good point too. The, the, the dinosaur thing, the, the beginning of the Triassic was an extinct event and then Triassic, Jurassic was one and then, then skip the one to uh, the, the KT boundary one. But no one ever talks about the Jurassic Cretaceous thing. Because things something died there too. Well, I think the reason that these lesser known extinction events don't get as much press is because they weren't nearly as as uh, radical a change up to the scape of the uh, the organ like the landscape of what life was around. Yeah. So like, um, which major animals didn't make it? Like, which major groups of animals that people uh, yeah. can name didn't make it from the Jurassic into the Cretaceous? Like if if you look if you look at America, like uh, oh first there were uh, uh, carcodon carcodontosaurs, I think, and then they were replaced by tyrannosaurs, and well, both are, both are still big 
Terapod, so not not really much change. Not really much change. Of that, are are you Jurassic or Cretaceous? Jurassic. Ah, uh, so so you so you you didn't make it the Cretaceous one. Yeah, uh, Ceratosaurus is most well known from the uh, Morrison Formation of sort of like Midwest North America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, although there are some Ceratosaurus specimens from Europe too, so. Uh, Ceratosaurus is sometimes thought of as a as a particularly American dinosaur, but that's not really true. It's certainly. Uh, 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 oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, is, is this also your actual favorite dinosaur species, Ceratosaurus? No, no. My favorite dinosaur species is uh, is uh, Meliagris gallopavo. Yeah, the the turkey. Hmm. My my favorite is, and it is it's it's, it's I, I hate it actually. It's so basic, but my favorite is T Rex. It's just hey, you know what. There's absolutely nothing wrong with T-Rex. Okay, T-Rex is so, so basic. <laughs> I get the reason that T-Rex is such a popular dinosaur because T-Rex yeah. is just awesome. My yeah. favorite my favorite used to be Al- my favorite was Allosaur. Allosaurus, yeah. Allosaurus is pretty cool. The T like the um, T-Rex with the, with the, with the arm. With like also, arm. and T-Lane says Meganura is the proper name. So Meganura is a uh, a genus name, but there is a wider group of animals whose scientific classification I do not remember. But they're very closely related to dragonflies, um, yeah. and Meganura was a member of that group, and I yeah, don't remember its official scientific name. And it's also interesting to note, like the like the like the, the quote dragonfly type, like the two winged, and they 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 are like the, one of the earliest uh, uh, offshoots of the uh, insect uh, uh, clade. So that they they retain like. The, the, the very primitive, or, or I should actually say basal traits, like they, they have two wings and they cannot fold. And later insects evolved the ability to fold their wings. Mm-hmm. So now, now, now they have four wings and they can fold. But then, then later insects evolved like like the uh, beetles. They, they modified their front wings into uh, co- covers, basically. Mm-hmm. And some insects, like the flies and mosquitoes, they, they evolved... Mm-hmm. They modified their hind wings into these uh, halters mm-hmm. that they are called, and they and that's, and that that is how like they they are sensors. Yeah, they're that, basically yeah. for balance. Yeah, for they, balance, uh, and that's that, that, that's why it's so hard to, to catch a fly because it, they, they use these stocks to like really be really agile and know their orientation during flight. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of different errors and stuff. It, uh, I learned about these things. It, it's not really until you get past to the 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 crisis we start breaking down even more errors. You know, like like the period. And, and so, humans. one of the rules of thumb is that the closer you get to being a, to to humans, whether temporally or or uh, morphologically, the finer a distinction humans like to make. Yeah. So that's why you can get creations getting away with saying that uh, frogs are a kind, but that uh, you know. Mm. Um, you you won't catch one of them saying that oh well you know parasodactyls are a kind well, why there's yeah. there's way more diversity within frogs than there is w- within you know odd toed ungulates and you know you know Ray Comfort he he calls bacteria a kind right yeah which is a, a <laughs> absolute like if a bacteria can be a single kind then humans can be in a, the same kind as an amoeba as a fungus and a fungus yeah. 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 yeah, or a, or a pine tree to go with the the <laughs> pine tree and elephant, the same kind. Yes. Right. Yeah. According to to Ray Comfort's apparent definition for kind. Um, but as far as uh, the length of geological periods, uh, one of the reasons why they get shorter as you get closer to the present, as a general rule of thumb, is that um, these ages were primarily identified by people based essentially on counting strata, and so um. Mm-hmm you have more surviving strata as you get younger and younger, just because mm-hmm. there have been fewer subsequent erosion events. And so if you look at um, a column of sediment, on average, newer um, newer formations are going to be a bit thicker and more likely to appear. And so you, it's easier to identify uh, different ages within the newest uh, strata than it is within the older ones. Also, it, there is just that fact that... Um, there's this bias that humans have towards making finer grade distinctions the closer something is to them. Yeah, I recently heard the term, uh, I forget what's the period it was in, it was like the Mississippian and the, and the Pennsylvania 
periods. I forget what's what. So that those are um those aren't periods. Those are stages. Formations. Are they, are they formations. Well, no. they they're not quite formations. They are stages oh. in um. So each period. So you have epochs, right? Yeah. So like um. So epochs are the big biggest thing. You have like the Archean epoch, the Proterozoic no, 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 epoch. No, 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 they are not called eons, I think, right? Uh, oh, yeah, maybe it is eons. Yeah. There's a lot of names. So what yeah. most people know are the periods, right? You know, the Jurassic yeah, period, yeah. the Cretaceous period. Those are um, grouped into eras. So the, Jura the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, and the Triassic are all in the Mesozoic era. You know, the Devonian, the Silurian, uh, the Cambrian, those are all in the... Um, Oh no! Why, why can't I think of it? The Paleozoic era. Then everything after the Cretaceous is in the um, that has a few different names, but Neogene is one of the things. It doesn't matter. But each period itself is broken down into stages. So it's a Pennsylvanian stage, and stages are are smaller than periods. And even within a stage, uh, it's usually not a universal thing, but you'll get local subdivisions. So within the Pennsylvanian stage of say North America, usually there are subgroupings in there to represent different environments in North America. And then you'll get different groups within the stages if you go to say that same stage in Europe or Africa or Australia. Uh, yeah, also, uh, it's it's Eon, like you have the, like the Phenozoic Eon and you have to, like the, the Cenozoic yeah, okay. era, the era, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, one, one nitpick, one nitpick, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I, yeah, I there I, are so many different terms for these different kinds of things. It's, yeah, but I, I forget. It, was, was that the current? Was that the Permian or the Carboniferous? The Mississippian and the Permian and the Pennsylvania. I think Mississippian is in the Carboniferous, right? I'm not. I, I would be. I would honestly have to look it up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mississippian is in the Carboniferous, and the Pen, and the Pennsylvanian also. Yeah, that's the one thing we, we got. We got to do here. We we got to we actually look things up and study things instead of assuming things. Like, oh. Right. Yeah. Like instead of just going with whatever comes up first. Like yeah, I would I would look at it at a chart. Just saying that's yeah. what, what my my Bible book says this. So got right. Yeah. Also, one one somebody in the live chat says that one creation is called all snakes are kind, and I think they they have to do that because of course they talk about the. Uh, the big evil snake who convinced Eve to bite the apple, <laughs> like, uh, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they, it transformed into like a, a legless snake. Hey, I think of snakes and, and lizards. Do we know snakes are lizards? Do we know which lizard the snakes are most closely related to, or is it? Ooh. Yes. We do. Yes. I, yep. I think I think there's also a big debate about that. Like snakes were either descended from burrowers or they were descended from like swimmer, swimmers. Yes. So it's not clear exactly what the impetus was for losing legs in the first place, but we do know which modern lizards they're most closely related to. All right. And that is varanids, like um, like Australian goannas or water monitors or komodo dragons. Those are all the varanid lizards. And one one way you can tell if they're closely related is if you look at um. Varanid, they have a forked tongue that they stick out like a snake does, and then they bring it back to a special scent organ that is at the roof of their mouth. And that's the exact same thing that snakes do. And also, varanids, uh, they either have vestigial um, poison glands, or in some cases, they actually have functional poison glands yeah. that secretes poison down a groove on the tooth. And the groove isn't entirely enclosed like a snake fang is, but it's still there. And then the next closest group of lizards that are the, the sister group to varanids and snakes are the group where you get the Mexican beaded lizard and the Gila monster, which are again, venomous snakes or it, lizards. Sorry. Venomous, it, it, yeah. Um, and then, the mosasaurs are in that fa family. So it's not clear if mosasaurs are closer to varanids or snakes, but they are within that group. They either yeah, branch from, from uh, monitor lizards or from snakes. Yeah, and I, 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 I also think like uh, mosasaurs are also fa fairly closely related to like snakes and varanids. Yeah. yeah, they are. They're within that. Uh, the, the common ancestor of varanids and snakes was also almost certainly an ancestor of mosasaurs. Okay, can, you, can you imagine mosasaurs actually being venomous also? Like They, they may venom. well have been. <laughs> Holy shit. It's, <laughs> it's entirely possible. Um, if, if they weren't OP enough. <laughs> Right, yeah, they're gigantic, horrible sea monster lizards. Yeah. And they may well have been venomous. Um, but then, interestingly, once you get out, if you want to say, well, what's the sister group to the um, like the Mexican bee lizards and the varanids and the snakes and I guess the mosasaurs, 
you get to iguanas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so iguanas, uh, snakes, varanids, um, those venomous sort of North American, like Southwest North America um, lizards, they are all in a clade that's fairly well established. It's not 100% there yet, mm -hmm. but uh, the clade is called Toxicophora. Yeah. And then basically we get to what the... It's, it's, it's mostly supported by genetics. And I think like the morphological camp of like scroll made systematics, uh, more points to another clade called Sclerolos. I can pronounce it uh, entirely like... It's not it's a different clade. Like, yeah. And you, have to, you have to look, look it up. Yeah. As a rule, um, I am much more inclined to trust uh, genetics than morphology. Me also. Like I'm more... more Leaning towards uh, the genetics, yeah. Because and I, I, oh, sorry, sorry. It's like, is ahead. there a difference between uh, cl uh, clades and ph phylogy, or is it the same thing? So, is cladistics it? and phylogenetics, uh, there's a lot of overlap, but phylogenetics is specifically looking at uh, the genetics of organisms. Yeah, yeah. And um, they use a lot of very similar yeah. techniques. Cladistics, like, well, cladistics uh, takes all data, like morphological or and or uh, genetics. Yeah, and. Um, as a rule, though, it, when there is a conflict between the morphological um, reconstruction for a, a family tree and the genetics, genetics has a tendency to win out unless there's some extreme reason to suspect that it's not the case. Like with, like, like, like maybe like with fossils where we can't have, we don't have the genetics yet. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Taco says I want a pet mosasaur. So here's my recommendation: get a uh, a varanid as a pet that likes to swim. There's a whole bunch of different species many of which are of a size that is reasonable for you to keep in a house. Um, but do be careful if you get a varanid as a pet. They can leave a pretty big bite if you're not careful. And um, while they are very intelligent for a lizard, that for a lizard is in there for a very good reason. Because yeah. the most intelligent lizards are significantly dumber than any um, dog or cat you're going to own. Yeah. So. Also, also, also Debbie, like you, you mentioned about the, like, the forked tongue uh, and, and the connection between the snakes and, and uh, varanids. Mm -hmm. But uh, like according to the Toxicophera clade, the, 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 the forked tongue is not really a like a monophyletic group. Uh, it probably right? it may or may not be. Um, although, so the fork itself probably is uh, something that's a, a convergent trait because it really is just a separation because the tongue is already divided down the middle, and all you have to do to have a forked tongue is just get rid of the tissue that physically forces the two sides together. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as I know, the I think it's called a Jacob's organ. I might be misremembering that though, but it's the actual chemoreceptor at the roof of the mouth. That I believe is actually the um, a shared derived trait is having that um, that scent receptor in the um, on the roof of the mouth that is actually being used by the tongue, because you can also get scent information from a non-forked tongue. It's just that the fork allows for a greater amount of directional information. So if the scent is stronger on the right side of the tongue, you know to turn right. Yeah. Um, so it's it's pro it's very well much more likely that the fork is actually the um, the conversion trait, but that organ itself is probably uh, ancestral. Although mm -hmm. interestingly, um, a lot of paleo artists reconstruct mosasaurs with forked tongues. Oh yeah. So okay. is is it, is it known like whether mosasaurs are closer to varanids or closer to lizards or maybe? Like sister to both or something? I don't, know. I don't know. It's not entirely clear. Um, one of the problems is that um, a mosasaur skull, especially a, a basal mosasaur skull, looks almost exactly like a varanid skull. But that's also what you would expect for a, a snake, very yeah. basal snake. So you're you're looking at this and you're like, well, it looks like a basal varanid. It's like, well, okay, but so would a basal snake. So I, yeah. I and it's and it's also like uh, it's also also interesting to note that uh, like many of the snakes and varanids they also swim a lot like they, of, yeah. they tend to swim like uh, and also varanids also have like like they are almost like endothermic well not to me maybe not in, like actual endothermic but they are they can have like a very high met metabolic rate mm -hmm. the varanids yeah and uh, actually one interesting thing is when you look at a varanid swim and you look at a snake swim they swim in essentially the same way Oh, yeah. They both have a, an anguilliform swimming motion. They don't use tend to use their uh, their limbs, mm -hmm. and so you so anguilliform is where you you basically have the whole body kind of undulate. The head moves, and it, usually the the undulations get more uh, pronounced uh, posteriorly. But on, you have that whole whole body undulation that happens with both sea snakes, 
um, snakes that are terrestrial, but that do swim frequently like anacondas uh, and also uh, varanids, many of whom swim yeah. quite frequently. That's why even, you even, get... And even some iguanas, like they, they are also toxicoferrans, although a mm-hmm. bit more distantly, they also, like so, some of them also swim. Like yeah. the uh, like the marine like the black marine iguana that that uh, Darwin also described in his voyage. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, speaking of, of different families, where you, oh, this is more of an opinion that these are different opinion things here. Where do you, uh, well, scientists or you, lie on the whole the whole new division of dinosaur thing? Oh yeah, uh, ornithoscelid. So uh, yeah. Yeah. I am. The, the consensus has certainly not shifted to ornithoscelida. No, no, yeah. Um, it's, it also hasn't completely disregarded ornithoscelida. So for those people who might not know, the um, there was a paper, what was it, two years ago? I think it's yeah, 2017, yes. Yeah, okay, so I guess maybe... Bar- 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 Baron at all. Two and a half, three years ago, maybe? Yeah. I don't remember exactly what month it was or anything uh, like that. I think, I think some late summer, I think, uh, if I remember yeah. it correctly. So we'll go to, we'll say two and a half just to r- roughly yeah. estimate. Uh, there was a paper released where um, a new uh, morphological uh, cladogram was developed for Dinosauria in which uh, Herrerasaurus was taken out of Theropoda and put into uh, a clade with sauropods. And then Theropoda was actually united with Ornithischia, which are the animals like uh, Stegosaurus or uh, Triceratops. Triceratops. Yeah. And those were actually put together in a clade that was then called Ornithoscelida. Although I don't know why they named a new clade because that clade has an identical definition to Dinosauria. So really what they found was that sauropods and Herrerasaurus weren't dinosaurs. But that's a minor complaint I have about the paper. Although I, th- I think they did it because people would get upset that sauropods are no longer dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, uh, but every definition I've ever heard for dinosaurs... Like, like, be, like people get upset about Pluto not being a planet anymore. So why, how would they react if sauropods are not dinosaurs anymore? <laughs> I know, I know. But the thing is that once a clade is defined, yeah, it's that's the definition. That's why um, phytosaurs can't be archosaurs anymore. Because Archosauria yeah. is generally defined as the the common ancestor of uh, basically the Nile crocodile, and I think it's the pigeon and all of its descendants. Or the duck. <laughs> Might be the yeah, duck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, you could call it a cro- cro- crocodile car, so I was never seen a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, one common definition for dinosaur is the common ancestor of Triceratops and the pigeon. Mm-hmm. And all of its descendants. So birds are actually now a fairly common thing that's used in definitions for um, archosaur cladistics. But if you define, so the, the the definitions I've heard for dinosaur are, you know, you always have two animals and their closest, or two organisms and their, you know, their common ancestor and all those descendants. The animals that I've seen picked are um, iguanodon and megalosaurus. I've seen passer, which is the pigeon, and triceratops. And I've seen triceratops and tyrannosaurus. But if Ornithoscelida is correct, then all of those exclude sauropods. Sauropods wouldn't be dinosaurs. But the thing is that um, subsequent attempts to reconstruct a similar tree have met with mixed results, depending on which characters are used and exactly how the uh, matrix comparing them is uh, constructed. Um, Also, there has been some question as to whether or not the specimens that were used to conclude uh, trait states for some of the animals in the... um, in the analysis mm-hmm. were sufficient to actually can make a conclusive determination of the trait state for that taxon. So there are some problems with the paper. It's not a bad paper. It doesn't, yeah. it's not, none of the problems are fatal for it. Definitely. However, they bring it into enough question to say that there really isn't sufficient evidence to adopt this new yeah. um, family tree. Let's well, think about yeah. science. It's uh, ever you say evolving. It's yeah. never. Well, yeah. And you know, it's, like I said, there isn't enough to completely reject the hypothesis either. It's still a valid hypothesis. Yeah, it's that, just currently, I think, more weakly supported than yeah. the traditional view. Okay, that, 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 that's, that's, there's one good video uh, by Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. I don't know if you know about yeah. that. Like the, it, it, it goes over the paper like really, really well. Like uh, it, it notes that they like used two different traits, even though they actually could be considered the same trait. So they actually weighed the same trait twice sometimes, yeah. for example. Like, like, such details are 
like what makes the paper pro problematic. But it's still, it's still an interesting hypothesis. Right. But yeah. of course, the creationists might say like, oh, if you cannot tell whether Triceratops is closely, more closely related to a T-Rex, then it is to like, then the T-Rex is to like the like sauropods and ha, ha. it's all it's all all arbitrary. But of course, yeah, you have yeah. To, to bear in mind that the earliest dinosaurs, like the earliest sauropod, looked a whole yeah. lot like the earliest Ornithischian and and, and also the earliest sauropod. Right. Yeah. And then you then you get Chilosaurus. Yeah, what's yeah. Chilosaurus? I don't know. Yeah. Like 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 how some birds relate the birds relate this diet some dinosaurs. The, Birds are, are, are closely related to some dinosaurs, and those dinosaurs are related to other dinosaurs. Yeah, also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, bir birds are much more closely related to, say, T Rex than T Rex is to Triceratops. Or even uh, Ceratosaurus. Mm -hmm. Like, Ceratosaurus is much more distantly related to T Rex than T Rex is to a bird. Yeah. I, like, people, like, people consider, like, creationists consider like uh, Archaeopteryx to be a true bird, like a fully completed bird. But if you if you like to find bird any more broader than Archaeopteryx is a bird, then Velociraptor would be a bird because because Archaeopteryx is so far away from the the birds that you know, such as the Velociraptor might be an actual bird if you well, bro if you just broaden the definition just so more. AIG has taken to identifying Microraptor as a bird, and Microraptor yeah. <laughs> Microraptor yeah. isn't just in the same family. As Velociraptor, it's in the same subfamily. Yeah, they're, all, they're also they're both Velaptus. I can't talk. Velo, Velociraptorine dromaeosaurs. Yeah. So if Microraptor is a bird, then guess what? So is Velociraptor. Yeah. I think the other big thing I I learned recently is I don't know if it's true how how people are with that was is that as if as if the the three domains of life. There's only two domains of life, and and, and we're not sisters played of, of archaea. We might be actually be Ar archaeas inside archaeas. Uh, uh, so I, it's hard to say, really. I I actually hold to the uh, like the ring of life uh, model. Like it says that like when when eukaryotes formed, they are basically like a mix between ba uh, bacteria and archaea. So it's not it's not like eukarya as a whole, descendant yeah. from one or the other, like it's it's okay. a mix between the two. Yeah, like, like we, we we got our like uh, a lot of genes yeah. from archaea. But we got also a lot of genes from bacteria via our mi mitochondria, yeah. basically. Yeah, with the uh, gen what's it called uh, the horizontal and the, and the, and the symbiosis, and yeah. also also yeah. also a lot of horizontal gene transfer, but also mainly endosymbiosis. Yeah, mm -hmm. those those two things make it much more complicated. They're yeah, very basic. Yeah. You get, you get the down there. Life. I think the two main things, either the the Wusi tree or the Ecoc Ecoc tree. I can't pronounce them. The like, Luca the Luca. Oh. Not Luca. Not, it starts with a W. Like Wusi had the three domain one, and the Ecoc one was the two domain one. Well, even under most three domain models, uh, Archaea tends to cluster closer to uh, Eukaryota than it does yeah. to the rest of. Uh, yeah, the, the, we're, more, we're more sister to Archaea, but the other one is we're, we're within the Archaea one somewhere. Yeah, well, I, I think it's it's one of those things where we're at a point where there's so much transfer of genetic material and so much yeah. endosymbiosis yeah. going yeah. on yeah. that no. you can't really form that nice little branching tree at the at the very yeah. end. Yeah, like, like, like cladistics doesn't really work with bacteria much. Like, yeah, like, may, maybe some groups, like you have like the prote the proteo bacteria and the gamma. They probably speciate yeah. a lot faster than more. Well, the thing is, what's a, what's the a species for a bacterium? Yeah, so, it doesn't. It, 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 there is actually no species in bacteria. Yeah. It, it doesn't really exist, actually. So, humans yeah. humans give them like arbitrary definitions, like um, like let's say you have uh. What is it? Uh, e. coli. Like they have some morphological um, characteristics that are common to a whole bunch of very closely related bacteria. And if a bacterium is within this, you know, genetic group and it has these morphological characteristics, then humans just call them Ascaria coli. Yeah. Why? Is it, is it, is it, oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. Why? Because humans like to name things and put them yeah. in boxes. That's why. Okay. This is one of the things that also Nick Lane also talked about in his book, the vital question about the origins of eukaryotes. Like, like he says that like the reason why eukaryotes have, have sex and, and have also uh, like sometimes two sexes, 
and then only only two ma at maximum. Like there are some who have no sexes, of course. Like actually, quite a lot of eukaryotes don't have sexes, but they have only ma at maximum two se sexes, and they. Um, and, and the reason for that is because they have mitochondria, basically. It's all about mit mitochondria, because one provides <coughs> mitochondria, and the other doesn't. And the reason for that is, is really technical, but the reason for that is because the something about the, the mutations, like you, you need to have only one source, otherwise something weird happens. And, the, and it doesn't really work, apparently. Cool. Well, what's like that? Well, I... The, oh, sorry. What was I say? I was gonna say it must like to talk talk forever. Price of chat is up soon. It's been two okay. and a half hours. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I do want to point out one quick thing though, that, which is that there is a major group of uh, eukaryotes that has a tendency to have more than two sexes, and that is. I think mate, and then you mean mating types, yeah. Well, so the difference between a mating type and a sex basically comes down to are the gametes physically distinguishable, and yeah. It's true that in uh, mating, oops, sorry, I just dropped something. That in mating types for fungi, the uh, gametes tend to be physically identical. Yeah. However, because they are chemically distinct, and you need a fungi of different mating types in order to produce viable uh, new offspring, I would say that the you're, you're sort of making you're splitting hairs between the difference between a mating type and a sex. A sex is basically just a kind of mating type. No, it's, 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 uh, no. <laughs> look, you need different sexes to, to breed. You need different mating types to breed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the differentiation between sexes also includes chemical differences. Like, yeah. sperm isn't just a tiny ovum. There are chemical differences between spermazoa yeah. and ova. So, but um, I, I I do think it's it's interesting that um, fungi have a tendency to have a multiplicity of mating types, which functionally there's really not a big difference between a sex and a mating type. I know, I, I, I know also, uh, so sexes are a special type of mating type. Right, exactly. I, I wonder what would happen if, 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 uh, they, might, they might do, they might have it, I'm not sure, but if, if, if plants and fungi had sexual selection. <laughs> uh, sexual selection seems to be pretty strongly correlated with an ability to um, choose sexual partners. Yes. And since neither plants nor fungi have the ability to choose sexual partners, it's probably not a factor. Yeah, um, um, it may be it may be true with like with orchids, like you have like a, an orchid that, that, that really looks like a bee, and it's basically it's an uh, oh no, not not a bee, but like that 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 types of or, or orchids that, that attract insects by basically right. mimicking yeah. mimicking a mate. Like they, they they think oh it's a mate, I can mate with it, but I, it's yeah. just a plant, just, just a plant basically. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that like, it, like like back in the wind days, like the, the wind pollen, like oh, I don't like I don't like I don't like that 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 flower looks ugly. I'm not gonna land on that flower. Yeah, it's like yeah. A, basically a, a blow up sex doll for the for the insects. Um. So yeah, if we're if we're gonna wrap up, I guess I don't have a huge amount of stuff that's that I have to announce or anything. Um. Tuesday is another Kent with Bent. It's uh, Kent with Bent 19. Uh, I believe we're calling it Requiem for a Hovind, <clears throat> which is in the, uh, the the thumbnail is going to be based on the Requiem for a Dream poster. Well, one of the movie posters. Mm. Um, then there's going to be uh, a scripted video coming out Thursday, probably another scripted video coming out Saturday, unless I have on uh, uh, Leaving on Earth Creations, which currently I don't have anyone lined up for. Um, and then, of course, the Tuesday after will be yet another Kent with Bent. Hey, any, vol any volunteers? Any volunteers want to be on the chat right now? Want to be uh, on, his, on his show? Yeah, if you're if you're a former Young Earth creationist um, and you're watching this, uh, my email is the dot dapper dot dino dot yt for YouTube oh, shit. at uh, gmail dot com. You can also find that email on my about page. Um, so it's, it's hidden under the, you know, this email is for business purposes only, but contacting me to be on, uh, leaving young earth creationism is a business reason to contact me. So, oh, and Ben Hoven volunteers to be on Kent with Ben. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you need volunteer, me, volunteer for tribute. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> hey, I'm free too. So if you need me, if you need me a drink of Kent with Ben too, so in the future, sometime in the future. All right. Um, I, I don't know. We, we try not to have guests on all the time because it, there's often a bit of crowding when they, we get three yeah. or more people. So I'm not yeah. sure like whenever, whenever, whenever you have an opening. Right. 
next time that we're we're open for a guest, um, I will definitely make sure that you are in the mix for our choices. Sweet. Um, we've had Erica on before. We've had uh, Cheshire Vic on before. Um, I who, who have we Eric, had anyone else? Was Eric on? I know Eric was on a series of live streams that I did about, but it wasn't Kent with Bent. It was um. Ugh. Will will can't get asked to ass in that one. Um, I don't know, Taco. Um, I kind of hope not because I don't really want to see that. But you never know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll definitely keep you in mind as um, cool. someone mm -hmm. to have on as a guest. But like I said, we we try not to have guests too yeah. often. So uh, one, one of the things I, I one of the last things I want to mention was like uh, I also mentioned in the live chat like Kent Hovind once called a Zoglodon or a Bacillosaurus, a Mosasaur, mm -hmm. and a Dinosaur. Yeah. Mosasaurs are not dinosaurs, as we have established. They are <laughs> lizards. And, and uh, Bacillosaurus is neither a Mosasaur nor a dinosaur. It's a well, a mammal. So yep. Kent, is, Kent is fractally wrong on that. Yeah. Fractally and, wrong. Yeah, he, it's, it's amazing how badly wrong <laughs> he can get certain things. And that's why I like Kent with Bent, because, you know... I had to hang out and just drink and make fun of Kent Hovind because he's just laughably bad at his job. So when is your next uh, dinosaur episode? Not uh, things that aren't dinosaurs? Uh, right now, I'm not sure when it will be scheduled. I am. I just got really done with like the planning stages. I'm going to be writing a script um, probably this week. <laughs> or, well, <laughs> I mean, next week, I guess, because it's Saturday. Have you done? Have you done like the pseudo succulents, or have you? Or have you not done that? So uh, my crocodilians episode uh, covered a lot of pseudo succia. All right. So um, I took it as an opportunity to, to kind of branch into pseudo succians in general. So we did um, a lot of. I, I talked about the lot of succians, rau succians, uh, sphino succians. So so uh, so um, I did Sauropterygians. Oh. Um, I included them with plesiosaurs, basically, because yeah. they're really plesiosaurs are really the only well-known uh, <laughs> yeah. Like no one knows what a placodont is. I um, do. I do. Well, okay, <laughs> fair enough. You do, but you are not most people. Uh, so yeah, I, I did go into though that there are um, in my plesiosaur episode. I went into the fact that there are in the Triassic there were other non-plesiosaur Sauropterygians. Um. So mm -hmm. I might go more specifically into groups of Sauropterygians, but at first I'm going to cover a lot of the, the bigger groups. So like when I do um, Demetrodon, I'm also going to cover other Pelicosaur grade synapsids. Yeah. And then and Dicynodons, and di di or now how do we call it again? Uh, well, there's Cynodonts and Dicynodonts. Yeah, so those, are, yeah. those aren't the same group. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I also meant uh, Dicynodonts, like the, like the tusk, tusk beasts. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, I, so I might do Dicynodonts someday. Oh. Yeah. So, so Ness, you have anything? You, you have videos that you make, or you want to advertise anything? Oh, well, I, I, I have a channel, but I don't uh, do a, a whole lot on that. I, I made one video on nuclear energy. Like I, I don't know, I don't know about R and Raw, right? So I'm, I'm a big fan of this, and I, uh, like, I, I saw one hangout he had, and I just had a question, like, oh, what do you think about nuclear power? And he said, well, I'm, I'm pretty much against it. He says, but then, hmm. and then, and then, and then uh, the uh, guest of that thing hangout says, well, well, maybe you can make a video about that and show Aaron where he is wrong about, it. And, and so I made that video on my channel. If, if you're against nuclear power, chances are you're seriously wrong about nuclear power. <laughs> um, I. I have worked in the nuclear power industry. That's what I did in the Navy. And um, it is by far the safest and cleanest form of energy. And I'm not even just like renew, like it's not technically renewable, but it is much safer and much cleaner mm -hmm. than wind or solar or hydro. Well, but with a bit of ingenuity, it can be renewable because you could potentially extract like uranium and, uh, yeah. and even thorium from the ocean. And it's it is basically uh, practically infinite, and it it, it it gets even more new because, of course, the uh, the uh, ocean floor is turned over by the plate tectonics, and that releases the yeah, uh, yeah the, uh, like the uranium. I would say that it the time scale on which nuclear energy would run, would continue to have you know harvestable raw resources is similar to like the life scan, lifetime of the planet. Yeah. So. While you can say, well, is it technically renewable? Well, I mean, in the most technical sense, maybe not. 
but there's enough new fissionable material mm -hmm. on Earth that we could probably go the entire, you know, a realistic habitable span of Earth as a planet and still really be able to have um, fissionable material that we can use. Yeah, and, I, and I think we should not, not put so much emphasis on renewable because like biomass is renewable technically, but right. it's, really pollu it's really polluting. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I mean, even like solar is associated with a lot of pollution. Just mining the materials are is polluting and um, solar panel wastes are ter is terrible for the environment. It's absolutely yeah. atrocious. And wind uh, towers disrupt uh, bird migrations. They're, I mean, they're, there's a lot of disruption from wind. Even um, hydroelectric causes disruptions to the, uh, yeah. you know, the ecosystem around the river and the fish and all that. So yeah, like when, yeah. Like when I when I says, all right. So think of the bigger of the, of the worst nuclear disaster, and think of the worst renewable power disaster. Which one? Is, which one is worse? Well, of course, the nuclear. Well, no, the the worst like disaster is is the, the Ben Coyote Dam when when the the Chinese Ben Coyote Dam broke. It killed yeah. like more people yeah. than Chernobyl, even. So yeah, yeah. It's actually of course, of, course, of course nobody knows about that, but everyone knows about Chernobyl. Well, the funny thing about Chernobyl is that most of the people who died, died trying to do things that were essentially impossible, like cool off the reactor. Yeah. If everyone had just left, no one would really, only if very few people would have died. Yeah, it would have, you could have, the Chernobyl incident could have had a death toll in like the dozens if people had just run away. Yeah, and also, and also take uh, take uh, like uh, iodine tablets very soon. Of course, they, they were also late with that, so then, then yeah. you have thyroid, thyroid cancer. But yeah. even then, even then, the, the death toll might might be like uh, in the like thousands at its at its highest. Well, yeah. Although I don't want to turn this into a, a second. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, sorry about, <laughs> sorry about yeah. that. Sorry about that. We could bring sorry that. Uh, we could do that in a future episode. But as for sorry me, that, yeah. uh, next week I'm I'm taking a break from this. Taking a break from the science sciencey stuff, and we're gonna be talking about. Uh, game the Phoenix Wright series games, Justice for All. If you, so if you ever heard of that game and you're interested in the Phoenix Wright series, you might want to you might want to go check, come check it out. Other than that, I'm just recording I'm just I'm just recording some other some games and stuff and other other random things okay. like food, food reviews. So, so you guys have like a catchphrase you say at the end of of your of your things? I just remind people that I'm the dapper dinosaur. Uh, mm -hmm. And I and I say, as always, never stop learning. And enjoy the randomness. And uh, uh, in, 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 in relation to nuclear right. power. If you just do it, it turns out okay. Everyone, we're back for more Talking Time with Kathleen, the only podcast where we talk about whatever, try to keep a topic, we, we usually don't. It turns out okay, everyone. everyone. Oh, oh uh, hey, that's the future of Doom. <laughs> You've got the watch page up. <laughs> yeah, I thought I muted it. One second. Two of these people I've had my two of these people I've had on my show before, but one hasn't been on. One's a brand new guest, so I'll let's introduce them one at a time. Oh, I think he's still busy muting the. Oh. No, I got it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> there was. I heard, turns out I had two of them open I only muted one of them <laughs> uh I guess I'll go first I'm I go by Sphincter of Doom uh I, I was a nuclear technician in the Navy I uh, afterwards I got my degree in chemical engineering and after that I worked in industrial gases mainly producing producing cryogenic atmospheric gases <laughs> well I go by the name of Nestec 20 but you can call me Ness for short and I, on related to this topic, I made a video about nuclear power once, which is one of my only videos on, this cha on my channel. So if you are interested, please check it out. Check it out. Yeah. Last but not least. And I'm Dapper Dino. I've got a channel, mostly talk about evolution, paleontology, debunking creationism, usually young earth, but not always. And uh, yeah, I was also, a nuclear technician in the U.S. Navy, and uh, that's why I'm here to talk about some nuclear power stuff. So, we, we, we two on the same ship or different, different, different? Same areas? ship. Yeah, we were on the same ship. Different ah. departments, but or uh, divisions, but whatnot. And with with uh, 
with bit hoven too yes is it like a, sh a ship or a submarine or what? it was an aircraft carrier yeah. it's a big boy and y'all played battleship just kidding. we did actually I, I did play some battleship while i was there <laughs> on the ship that is literally true So, um, what we're, what is our topic, Vandalia? Yeah, it's a, it is the different sources of energy and the pros and cons and why some people are against it and people are for it. And uh, well, right I mean, now, oh, sorry, no, sorry. Wait, wait. So, sorry, like right now, like mostly on Facebook and stuff. As I mentioned in the pre-show, like, like everyone's making a big deal that the, that this some kind of key line. First of all, the key line pipeline being canceled is like the end of the world. Some for some people, at least, is that true, or is it just that people making a big deal about it? Well, it's certainly not the end of the world. It will drive up or keep energy costs rising in certain parts of the world, uh, primarily the U.S. Um, so it, it will, will do that on its own, but the thing is there are other things that could be done that aren't being done that would then lower them again without causing the environmental hazards of the pipeline. Things like yes. expanding nuclear, which to be fair, the Biden administration has made some motions towards uh, being open to doing, but currently that's uh, all talk. I haven't seen any new plants being authorized or anything like that, so. Yeah, I mean, there's not, uh, uh, even even politicians that say they're for nuclear, I've seen mostly lip service the last you know fifteen twenty years. I'm like yeah, <laughs> but well, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's still early in his administration. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's nine and a hundred days yet, so we we have three and a half years to go. <laughs> well, let's just say this: I, there's a long history of politicians making pious noises about getting us on uh, cleaner energy, and then mm -hmm. one doing nothing useful or two just making matters worse. so and that's a bipartisan problem so i'm not expecting a, oh just because you know that the democrats took office and they're more environmentally conscious really not expecting a whole lot but I'm, i would be very happy to be shown to be wrong in that assessment speaking of, of environmentally stuff uh you think people are don't like nuclear energy because of that chernobyl thing that, what 20 years ago or 30 30 years ago at this point that the reason people don't like it for other reasons uh, it's, it's a big that's a part of it. Well, it's, it's certainly a big part of it, yes. Yeah. Three Mile Island happened before Chernobyl, and so the public perception of nuclear power in the U.S. had already as was definitely on a souring trajectory before Chernobyl. Chernobyl was just kind of a second blow. Fukushima definitely yeah. was really bad timing because we were kind of like expanding. There's like a nuclear renaissance, some people were saying. Yeah. But the, the problem is, is that Chernobyl was the worst nuclear disaster in human history, but what people thought happened and the extent of the damage well, is worst unintentional nuclear disaster. We're right. That's yeah. true. Yes. Uh, okay. The, the new, the worst nuclear disaster from nuclear power. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you, you, all, you also have like, uh, of course, before nuclear power, you had nuclear weapons, and that is actually the first thing that people have associated with the word nuclear. Yeah, it's still the case. Yeah. It's still the case that people think that you could do something to a nuclear power plant to make it explode like an atomic bomb, which you you can't. There, no. The only way to make a nuclear power plant explode is to pack it with explosives, and then it's not really the power plant that's exploding. You're just making explosions inside the power plant with explosives. Yeah. Yeah. Was and, more? I mean, so the, the main reason why this can't can happen, or at least one of the main reasons, is that nuclear fuel is about five per five to nine percent like high purity nuclear fuel is still only nine percent uranium 235 whereas nuclear fuel for weapons is 40 to 80 percent there's just not enough fissionable material to to create that but there's there's yeah. other reasons too just beyond the design of the plant but yeah was it just because the that country at the time was it Russia or, or something that they didn't have safety they were very safe or something they didn't care about safety 
Well, it's a combination of a few things. Uh, one is that their reactor design, which used, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was moderated with liquid sodium. It was a graphite. Uh, no, it was, it was graphite. So, yeah, it was graphite. Yes. graphite. Yeah, yes. I'm thinking of something else. So, one of the things about graphite is um, when it gets okay. warmer. Uh, 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 so, sorry, in the meantime, can you, can you uh, like stop screen sharing that? But like we can all be equally sized. <laughs> uh, oh, that's like on Vandalia. Vandalia. So, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> The thing with uh, graphite is that um, as it gets hotter, it gets better at capturing and then re-releasing neutrons. And when that happens, the neutron is released at a lower energy, and it's called a slow uh, neutron. It's, it's, not, it's a little bit misleading to actually think of it as traveling at a different speed, but it doesn't really matter. It has lower energy is what matters. I, I think it's called it's, it's like a thermal spectrum, right? Yeah. It's all, they're, also, they're called slow or thermal, uh, thermalized neutrons. Yeah. And so as graphite gets warmer, it gets better at doing this. So it captures more and more of these uh, neutrons. And these are the neutrons that are most likely to cause fission. So of course, as your power goes up, that means more fission is happening because that's how you're getting your power, which is then heating up your graphite, which then means more neutrons get captured, which means your power goes up, which means your temperature goes up, which means your graphite gets warmer and it's a positive feedback loop. Now, the way you control this in a reactor like this is you have something loaded with a, what's called a poison, which basically will absorb neutrons and then not re-emit them. Well, there's, so, another, there's another okay. way it's controlled as well. Cause they, well, you can also cool it, but. Well, no, the, what I mean is like the, the coolant, it was designed to control a void coefficient, which kind of helped. Uh, but yeah, the, also the way the, the rods and the, the, uh, the fuel rods and the control rods, they were actually coaxial. So as you pulled in yeah. one, the other ones uh, came out, but. so. All of this adds up to basically, if you're not careful with this reactor design, yeah. it will just get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until basically it runs out of fuel, which is going to take a while. Also, there was also an, another uh, positive feedback loop caused by water. Like water is uh, they is a, like in the graphite moderated reactor, it's a, uh, a poison. It absorbs neutrons, so it will slow down reaction. But when it it heats up, it, it uh, when it's steam, it it uh, becomes less neutron absorbent, and then it will yeah. speed up the reaction. So yeah, another positive feedback loop. Yeah. So um, now, as far as I know, all currently operating uh, reactors have the opposite effect. When their moderator gets warmer, it gets worse at uh, moderating these neutrons. So yeah. as modern reactors get hot, they actually self-correct and limit their own power because the warmer they get, the worse they are at thermalizing neutrons. Okay. Yeah, which it, means, uh, it, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, which, which means in order to get them to melt like that, you have to do things to them. You have to like remove cooling, or you have to like complete, completely withdraw your control rods, which are usually you know made of some kind of poison material for the reactor, things like that. You have to do something actively. You can't just yeah. ignore your warnings and then it will melt. Like in, in the, in the re most reactors that we have now today are like they, they use water as both the coolant and also the moderator. Like they slow the yeah. water slows down the neutrons. So when you so in that, in that case when the water boils, it doesn't slow down the neutrons anymore, and then and you have a negative uh, feedback loop with that regard. But in the in the Chernobyl reactor, the moderator was the, the graphite, and that means that the water is only a coolant and when it and also a poison. That's, that's, that's the main difference between the, the uh, reactor at Chernobyl and the reactors that we have today. Now, the RMBK reactor did have safety systems integrated, but what happened with Chernobyl was they were going to... They, they, the reactor is particularly unstable in, in trying to control at lower powers, so they were trying to uh, devise another way of operating that gave you more control. But to, do, to test that, they had to override the safeties. And then... The, the the morning crew was briefed thoroughly, but then there was lots of delays, and it ended up going to the swing shift, and they didn't get a proper briefing, and then things did not, unsurprisingly, did not go as planned, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. there was a, there was a massive radioactive steam explosion blew the top off the reactor vessel. There was no containment dome. The the force was so much it actually atomized what was expelled, just spreading basically radioactive dust. Um, yeah. And uh, so, and the fuel, the fuel basically vaporized, and also the, the like the water in the reactor turned in no, not only to steam, it, it also turned probably into like hydrogen and oxygen, and then it ignited, causing a hydrogen explosion. And that's mainly the 
the explosive force that, that blew off the lid of the Chernobyl reactor. Yeah. So, so Western reactors, or they, they knew the, the flaws in the RBK reactor. They all had the various designs that the adapter went over. And another thing yeah. that also a uh, feedback mechanism is that as the fuel, if you if you allow for some expansion of the fuel, as the fuel expands and gets hotter, that also reduces the cross section for absorption. But it's yeah. and uh, so they knew the flaws of that, and then they so they and also temperature transients are more slow than pressure transients so if you have if you're if your control is with a negative coefficient of reactivity for pressure but if you lose containment there's an enormous change in reactivity yeah. <laughs> and it's uh so it's it's just it was much more unstable i mean co further compounding the fact was that the government was like everything's fine so they didn't evacuate yeah. the, right. the, 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 the firefighters yeah, the firefighters yeah, yeah. were neither properly equipped nor trained to deal with this kind of issue which and so it was just it's it's the worst case scenario and almost none of those factors are were present in western yeah. reactors then and they're definitely not in present in uh, is, is it like a, today. it's an important point to remember like chernobyl was really the perfect storm of bad design bad practices and also like a series of bad decisions that made this accident possible to begin with. Like it's like if you read into the details of how what exactly happened and how it happened, like it's really yeah, it's the perfect storm basically. Like <laughs> And how was that different yeah. from the was that different from the Three Mile Island you talked about earlier? So Three Mile yeah. Island was an interesting so what so what happened was is that there was a relief valve that was stuck open, but the condition the state of the relief valve was not directly indicated on their boards there was it was solenoid operated so you only had it, it was only indicated that whether the solenoid was energized or not so the operators it seemed as if the sol the relief valve was shut based on the condition of the solenoid but their water level in the reactor vessel was kept going down so they kept they were fighting conflicting indications for hours until the new shift came on and then realized hey we should look at this by then it had uh, basically expelled a lot of reactive coolant, mostly into one of the other spaces uh, on, on site, but some of it went into the atmosphere. But Three Mile Island really only exposed people for about the equivalent of a chest X-ray within 10 miles, and then obviously yeah. much less out. Yeah, but the thing the is, despite being the worst nuclear incident on U.S. soil by a lot, it also harmed essentially no one. Yeah. It, it, it did render the second plant uh like we can't really use this anymore yeah it's, it's, a, big, it's, a, it's yeah. a big mess it's a big mess to but deal with the, the reason yeah. why three mile island resonated with people so much is that 10 days before that the oh, china yeah. <laughs> syndrome a disaster movie based on a nuclear accident had come out and the, the china syndrome was the conditions that led up to the disaster were were somewhat similar to um through my island and that you lost cooling and people didn't know and there were conflicting indications but china syndrome was it's going to get so hot it's going to melt down through the through the earth to china which isn't at all what would happen no <laughs> but uh so but after through my island jane fonda decided to go around the country and extolling the the vices and the horrors of nuclear power while also right. promoting her movie. Yes, <laughs> and, I, 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 like in my video, the video that I made about nuclear power, I actually have a, a picture of her on my video, like with her standing on like a podium explaining the uh, like anti nuclear uh, movement. And such. Yeah. I, I I hate Jay Fonda to this day. Just. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Jack Lemon, uh, well, I think I don't think he was really in, like involved in that kind of campaign either. But uh, it's 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 unfortunate. And regulations, like after Through My Island, the regulations ramped up, and they mainly increased. And they, they uh, uh, estimates I've seen that anywhere between doubling to quadrupling construction construction costs of nuclear plants with no measurable increase in safety. <laughs> it was lots of ratcheting, like oh, you need forty percent. 41% more steel because of this little thing, but it's no, it's no safer than it was before. Yeah. Little There's also like another insignificant difference between the, like the uh, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Like Chernobyl didn't have a containment vessel. Like their, mm -hmm. their reactor was basically only like a, like a biological shield to keep the radiation from like damaging humans. But for, apart from that, there was no 
secondary containment to keep anything in if anything got out. So it was it was basically a, a, an airplane hangar. Like it wasn't yeah. really. Ma- <laughs> and Fukushima, a lot like there was a similar, somewhat similar. Like there was an explosion inside the vessel, and like there was a radioactive material release. But Fukushima had a containment vessel, so a lot of the really more dangerous radioactive stuff, like strontium ninety, didn't get released to the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, Is Chernobyl? Can people go there back there yet? Is it still actually? Um, the government told everybody to leave, and then some people are like, "This is our home." And they, within a year or two, they moved back. Like, screw you! And the government was like, "It's not really worth it." They, there are people who live in there today, and actually, yeah. because there's there's a smaller human presence, wildlife has flourished. Yeah, this is also um, co- this is also something I covered in my video. Like Chernobyl basically functions as a wildlife reserve now. Ba- basically, functions yeah. as it. <laughs> so it. So you would get a higher dose of radiation if you if you live there, okay. and if there was a, a significant population, then there would statistically probably be a higher cancer rate. But ultimately, it wouldn't be uninhabitable. You could live in in Chernobyl, and sure, it would increase your cancer rate a bit. But you know, okay, it's yeah. not gonna it's not yeah. a death zone. Also, also, it, it like like it, it would kind of increase your cancer, but compared to like the pollution in cities that are normally found, it is actually exactly exactly worse. Uh, in, yeah, the, in the, the air pollution in cities. So, yeah. so it, would, it would actually be better off in Chernobyl than like living in Detroit. And that's that's mainly because lung cancer is far more deadly than thyroid cancer. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, what you said remind, reminds me of that one show from a few years ago, After Humans. Like, wild, the, the wildlife, wildlife will, will always prevail even if humans aren't there to take care of it. <laughs> they overpower us. <laughs> Yeah. Nature's, nature is power. But one of the more interesting takeaways from Chernobyl and a little bit from Fukushima as well is that people, you know, governments that either are sensitive to public perception or they're just just as a, um, misunderstood about nuclear, the dangers of nuclear power as the general public is they tend to have overly conservative responses. Uh, one, one, one that I remember was in Scotland, uh, some of the rain – that actually made it all the way to Scotland was partially irradiated and irradiated the grass, which the sheep ate. Scotland was like, okay. Oh yeah. And then they basically, they basically just destroyed every sheep farm in Scotland, even though oh. the, the, even, even though the, the amount of dose that one would have gotten from consuming this sheep wouldn't have statistically increased your chance of cancer. They were just like, Oh, it's a detectable amount of radiation. And they just ruined a whole bunch of family farms and really just the availability of food in general. Yeah. Like I've, I've seen, I've seen a professor Philip J. Thomas like go into like the the, the statistics between the uh, the cost benefit analysis of like deciding to like ruin all these sheep as opposed to the uh, the, the the risks of the radiation, and he says that it it wasn't worth it at all. Like we shouldn't have done this at all. <laughs> there was yeah. no there was no benefit gained from this decision. The same thing with Fukushima. There was an evacuation once there was, you know, notification of the accident, and they evacuated, you know, like a lot of people in the surrounding area. But a lot of these individuals were elderly people that really shouldn't have been moved, or at least were more in danger of being moved. And the evacuation, I, if I remember the estimate correctly, led to about uh, uh, several hundred to eleven hundred people killed or yeah. from that. And so the the fear of nuclear very often leads to hurting more people than the threat of nuclear itself. Yeah, it's also an interesting thing to note, like you, you have the, what's, what's called the Chernobyl Forum, which is like a, which is like a collaboration between the UN and all, uh, like many different scientific experts who go into like the damage to Chernobyl cause. And one interesting line that comes from the forum says, the mental health impact of Chernobyl is the largest public health problem unleashed by the accident today. So it's, it's not the radiation, that's the biggest problem. It's the fear, basically, mm-hmm. that comes yep. from the accident. Yeah. So, um, if I remember my, my term correctly, n- nuclear the nuclear power they use fit they use fission, not fusion, right? Yes, yes. fission. Yes. Although, although yeah. f- fission reactors are technically also nuclear reactors, but, 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 the, but the ones that we have now are all fission, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Give it ten years, and we'll have fusion. I'm sure. Yeah, the, 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 that's, that's what they said 10 years ago, too. <laughs> that's what they said like 50 years ago, man. We've yeah. been 10 years away from fit, from fusion reactors for decades. I've, I've, yeah. I've always heard it from particle physicists that fusion is 50 years away and always will be. <laughs> yeah, basically. That's the, that's the power the sun uses. <laughs> yeah, yes. and the reason why it's so difficult for us is that the sun kind of cheats 
with gravity and the, the the temperatures inside uh fusion reactors on earth are an order of magnitude hotter than like at least the surface of the sun because you have to overcome the uh the coulomb bearer the, the electromagnetic or electrostatic forces that are keeping the nuclei opposed and since you can't cheat with gravity you got to add more heat mm-hmm. and uh that's where all the energy sink goes into and that's why it's largely mm-hmm. not uh viable right now yeah, yeah in order could... to fuse them you have to put a lot of energy in it but if, but if you do put too much in it then the energy gained from the fusion event will not will be less than the amount you put into it so it, it won't be any net gain eventually but you yeah it's it's a tricky situation with that but vision is easy vision is like really easy like yeah. e- even there was like actually a natural vision reactor that occurred on or like somewhere in west africa there's a little deposit where like uh, over a billion years ago, there was like like a highly enriched uranium deposit that went critical for like a, a few a few hundred million a few hundred thousand years. <laughs> a natural na- natural nuclear reactor on Earth for like thousands of years. So, a little jo- jo- little joke, kind of joke here, but if we if we if we ever made a fusion reactor, we, we could sell we could sell the leftovers to uh, balloon blo- balloon factories. Helium. <laughs> Although you could fuse helium too, but yeah, uh, he, he, it's interesting because helium is uh, is incredibly. It's actually a uh, what's the what's the what's the word? Like? It's it's a strategic ele- like element because. Yeah. Uh, oh no! What I mean is like it's it's an element that's actually partially controlled by the government, and mm. uh, and it, there's very little helium in the atmosphere. Most of our helium comes from natural gas. Uh, there's certain natural gas veins that there's a slightly higher than average amount of helium, like five, maybe three to six percent. There's a big helium plant in Texas. They actually have like six, seven uh, natural gas pipelines converge to this single helium plant in the middle of Texas just to get a little bit of helium. Yeah. Well, well, it was also like they like they switch from I think they switch from hydrogen to helium because of what. That blown, blown up in the thirties. The Hindenburg. Yeah, was that full of hydrogen before? Yeah, hydrogen is a bit more buoyant than helium, but it has far too much, or too many trade offs to be worth it. At least as a, yeah. at, least, at least for what being the, buoyant but very very flammable is not a great trade off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So, uh, so that's the. So, what's the pros of nuclear energy? We talked about the cons a little bit. Right. The pros of nuclear energy is, compared to any other energy source, per unit energy liberated or gained from it, it kills fewer people. And then this is throughout its entire lifetime, mining, refining, construction, maintenance, decommissioning. It kills fewer people. It pollu- it, it creates uh, fewer uh, CO2 equivalent. It takes up less land. It takes up less raw materials. It has the highest capacity factor, so it's the most reliable and the least in need of storage. And it's arguably the most efficient as well. Yeah. The, 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 um, efficiency, it's that's debatable, but yeah. <laughs> um, but that's really because of that's because we use light water reactors and not fast yeah. reactors. But uh, it, it really comes down to the energy density of nuclear, like the physics of nuclear power, like fusing right. or fissioning, and like atoms is way, you release way, way much more energy than you get from like chemical based reactions. One, one thing that is often overlooked is that you, it's easy to look at just the operation of a plant, but yeah, you have to consider what goes into the means to harness that energy. So you have to like. For other sources, every single source, you have to mine more steel, more concrete, more silicon, what have you, to get the same amount of energy harnessing. And that means more occupational fatalities, accidents, more CO2 being emitted by your equipment, uh, more transport of that material, what have you. Yeah. And this is, a, this is an interesting thing, like, like, our, like uh, our risk perception is, like, really, really bad. Like, we... Mm-hmm. Like we tend to like uh, be really scared about like terrorist attacks even though like generally the risk of dying from a terrorist is really low and also we tend to freak out more about plane crashes than like car accidents even though play air travel is like safer than traveling oh, by uh, your, your your car yes <laughs> and yeah. uh, but but and if you and if you take the same approach to like nuclear power like nuclear power is actually safer than, than 
rooftop solar because people fall from rooftops sometimes and e even taking it into account more people die per unit of energy produced from rooftop solar compared to nuclear yeah. power <laughs> so it's uh, like yeah. yeah in fact yeah. um the second deadliest is hydro and it's only and if you, if you in, in the U.S., it's I think it's like maybe hydro is five times as deadly. But if you look worldwide, because of major dam collapses in China, it's yes. it's much it's like fifty times as deadly. But it's still less deadly than wind or solar, just because of how diffuse the energy sources are. Right. But, like, uh, it's also interesting to see, like, a, like when you make the comparison, I don't know, like, oh, per unit of energy produced, nuclear kills less people. But then people will take, but yeah, but nuclear still produces the single b biggest accidents so it's still too risky but when you look at like hydropower but that's not true biggest, even yeah yeah, yeah, the, bad, yeah it, the, the single biggest counts. accident is yeah. the, the the chinese dam so yeah yeah so the uh, estimates for total uh, uh deaths from chernobyl about three dozen people died from the accident and the response uh but then from like long-term cancer exposure and it's the estimates are very wildly it's like four thousand to ninety six thousand and that's largely because over time it's hard to distinguish. Well, you you got older, you get more cancer, kind of thing. Yeah, but, it's, I, I, but I think it's. I'll just go ahead. So I will I will make the point. After so yes. Oh, yeah. but the the Bankau dam, dam collapse in China killed one hundred ten thousand people and displaced millions more. So yeah, and yeah. Uh, but but a more I think a more resonating example for the public would be just like look at plane crashes. That uh, when a plane crashes, you have hundreds of people die. But yes. they're so they're so f more infrequent that overall, per mile traveled, it's safer. But you, right. you had uh, something else to say, yeah? Uh, like, about the like the estimation about the like can uh, the cancer from like uh, the radiation release from Chernobyl, like that is that is not confirmed. Like uh, these are like estimates based on like the yeah. uh, L the LNT model. Mm -hmm. But but uh, and, and, and like when you calculate the like the low dose exposure to like a very large population, you get like a few a few thousand or ten thousand the most. But it would be more accurate to put it into percentages. Like how how, how much is the risk for you to, to die because of exactly. the exposure? And, and and when you put it in in percentages of increased mortality, then you get you can you get a number like less than zero 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 two percent or something like that. Yeah. Uh, of course, nuclear. Um, is it? Uh, doesn't. Of course, of course, of, of course, if you apply this, the zero point zero 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 two percent to like eighty million people, then you then of course you get you get tens of thousands of people. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's, why that's, the, that's the that's the reason yeah. for the like the large numbers. Yeah, you want to you want to look at rates, and ultimately you're trying to get energy from these. So how much? What is what is the cost? Be it materials, human cost per amount of energy you're getting out of it. Yeah, and your question about nuclear is that did that they have the same problem as oil and coal is that there's limited supply of it. Like in the that is highly okay. debatable. Uh, so there's about enough uranium in the crust right now to power uh, the entire world. Like. The entire world for about 230 years at current cons or consumption using light water reactors if i remember this is it correctly mm -hmm. but there's enough uranium in the ocean which currently is not economically viable to uh to uh extract it to power the entire world for 60,000 years but okay so we have but there's three times as much thorium in the crust as there is uranium and thorium uh has lots of advantages over uranium as a nuclear fuel. okay so we right. so it's not like so we do have a not say unlimited supply, but enough supply of it for yeah. We're for, right. We're not running out in the foreseeable future, no matter what. Yeah. We do. So nuclear. Also, also, I think I think like if you extract uranium from like the ocean, it it gets eventually like refilled because like the ocean, like of course the the crust is continuously recycling and it releases the uh, thorium and, and uranium into the ocean again, right? So it, it's technically renewable, as well. Even if it isn't technically renewable, it's definitely sustainable. Yeah, uh, for the long term. In fact, by the time we're really, if we if we switch to primarily nuclear, by the time we're running out of uranium, we probably would be reaching other problems, like or we'd be colonizing other planets. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and yeah, perhaps we would have invented uh, fusion eventually in in the in, the, in ten thousand yeah. years. <laughs> now there is no, no ten thousand years will still be about tenish years away from fusion. <laughs> this is how it is. Well, you know, hopefully, the, well, hopefully. Say, we'll be we'll be speciated by then to, to our new 
I, I think we'll have a Dyson swarm before we'll have fusion plants on on the planet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so there is one thing you can't go 100% nuclear because no. um, you can't go 100 because you'll have a lot of redundant capacity and you'll have your your capacity factor actually goes down if you have too much and. If if seen like what happened in France and South Korea, it seems like eighty percent is the inflection point. Once you start going past eighty, your capacity factor starts going down. Uh, but it's still, I mean, it's ninety two percent right now, and then followed by geothermal and hot, at eighty five and ge- hydro at seventy five. Where wind and solar are both below fifty. Solar is yeah. the worst. It's at twenty five. Thermal solar is twenty three. It's like. It's like a pet project in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay, like every, every like it's, it's like a really really ironic. Like every time a solar or a wind power plant gets built, there's always a gas pipe nearby it because you need the backup for the for the uh, for the gaps in in the capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's move on to the the energy created by when the when the land was ruled by amphibians and insects, the carboniferous carbon coal. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I mean, it's well, much more dangerous and polluting. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's, it's like uh, we already mentioned, like the uh, like the comparison between the uh, amount of deaths per unit of energy produced between like like uh, nuclear and uh, coal. Mm-hmm. But another way to put the benefit of nuclear, like if you calculate the amount of death caused by coal per year, then you would like you in order for for nuclear to match it. You would need a Chernobyl level event every few weeks in order to match yeah. what ha- what is happening with coal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, world. yeah. I remember. I remember. I think if I remember the, the statistic correctly, anyway, is we could have a Chernobyl event every year, and nuclear would still be so, like yeah. the, the safest yeah. energy source. Yeah. When I think of coal, bad coal, I, I think it's. I think it was the Pennsylvania that coal. I think it's Pennsylvania. It might be wrong, but I think it's Pennsylvania that the, coal, the whole coal thing caught on fire and still on fire today. Um, well, Pennsylvania. I believe there is a place, yeah, that the town has been abandoned basically because it's there's been a coal fire raging under it for decades now. Hmm. So it, it should be noted that the fossil fuels are very energy dense, and it was kind of a necessary evil to transition into what oh, yeah. we have the modern age. It greatly, oh, it, on net, it greatly improved the quality of life of humanity. It just at a great cost. As technology is advanced, we can maintain and increase that quality of life without enduring that cost anymore. The climate change notwithstanding, transitioning away from fossil fuels has a lot of great positives because air quality will improve. Uh, coal plants uh, expose people to more radioactivity than nuclear plants right. because right. because all of, the, all of the trace uranium and polonium isotopes in the coal just go out with the ash. Uh, this, is, this is also a point that I made in my video. Like if you, like uh, nuclear power plants are heavily regulated and they aren't allowed to release a number of like uh, radiation into the uh, environment. So if we apply the same regula- regulatory standards on coal, then the coal, all coal plants will be shut down because of the radiation release alone. <laughs> So, so like if you if you if you are scared of the radiation, go after coal, not nuclear power. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, that's one of the things people forget is that um, it's not the case that fossil fuels aren't radioactive. They are. It's just that that's not the source that, that we're getting more from. We're yeah. burning them for chemical energy, but they're still radioactive because stuff from underground tends to be radioactive. So, I hear. The, I hear the pro coal people are like we now have clean coal. What is, what is that about? <laughs> clean coal is significantly cleaner than old dirty coal. I think it's about <laughs> only thirty to four percent, forty percent of the emissions of coal back in the day. But it's still dirtier than even natural gas. Yeah, right. I think, yeah. I think well, 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 clean coal like things are, things are like I think the uh, nitrous oxides mostly, or like or maybe the solid uh, particulate matter. But still, but still, it releases still like. CO2 and maybe even small uh, gas particles too. So, yeah, if I remember uh, correctly. Now, na- natural gas, like if you're going to do fossil fuels, natural gas is probably the way to go. It does yeah. have issues in that it's primarily methane, which is a stronger, which it does have a stronger um, a radiative forcing effect uh, on, on the heat of the atmosphere. 
but it does its residency period in the atmosphere is much lower because methane reacts with all sorts of things. CO two doesn't, but nonetheless, it's it's over it's overall cleaner. But yeah. it, it's, it's also harder to store than solid coal. So, and, and you can also like you also like the contrast is it like it's like one of the so-called renewable sources like biomass. The visual what I mentioned during the off-air part, like. Like technically, you can say that like biomass, like burning the wood from forests that you uh, like cut from, it's it's maybe renewable in the sense that it will eventually grow back. But of course, burning forests takes a shorter time than it grows back. So the, yeah, the right. CO2 that we will release from burning forests will still be in the air for a long time. And it, and it actually and it actually it, it releases more CO2 because wood is less energy dense than even coal. So it it releases more CO2 even then. But of course, the argument is eventually, in like in a hundred years or so, the forest will grow back. But yeah, yeah, like eventually the forest will grow back and then they'll decompose <laughs> to become oil. Like everything's renewable. Then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, on a long enough scale, yeah, basically everything is renewable. However, <laughs> we are not entirely operating on those scales. Did yeah. people still suffer from was it was it old thing Cole Myers lungs? That what it was called? <laughs> There is uh, so black lung has a has a really the scientific name for it is the longest word in the English language. It's pneumono ultra microscopic silicovaciconiosis, which is just a fun thing to know. But uh, yeah, basically silica dust from mining coal gets in, and silica dust just basically cuts up your lungs. And uh, you, if you're if you're a mo if you're a coal miner, you don't really re you don't your your lungs don't have time to heal and. It, 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 it wrecks you. Uh, coal, uh, coal, coal, really, mine, coal mine sh uh, sucks really badly. And that's well, why also, I well, also, like the coal dust has radioactive traces as well. And much like smoking, because polonium is an alpha emitter, so it's stopped by your skin. But if you inhale it uh -huh, and it's yeah. inside your lungs, then it's just going to be immediately irradiating your lungs. That's, and that's and why I had the, the canaries okay. down there back in the. Well, no, that was mostly for chemical things. Um, oh, yeah. Canaries are usually there because uh, with their high metabolism, they go through gas exchange very quickly. And so if the air quality starts to dip, canaries will fairly quickly die, uh, much more quickly than humans. And so if your canary dies, that means that the air quality is getting low and you should get out because eventually oh, you're going to lose consciousness. Carbon monoxide. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, 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 they're using your canary cousins. Like <laughs> so, and it's not just carbon monoxide either. It can also be just lack of oxygen because um, if you don't have a mind that's well ventilated, as you breathe in it, you're going to be actually depleting the oxygen. And if, like I said, you know, if there's no new air coming in, it's just going to, the carbon dioxide is just going to build up. And Man. your canary will die much faster from carbon monoxide, from carbon dioxide, uh, from natural gas, because natural gas is also toxic in high enough concentrations. So, um, basically, anything that's going to kill you. Will kill a canary faster in terms of air quality. Yeah, and also, 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 this may be a point, that, a, a counterpoint that somebody will bring up, like, oh, what about mining uranium? Like, well, is it also, is it also dangerous? But yeah, like, like, like it is. yeah, it's, it's dangerous. But, but, like, in proportion, uranium, like, you only need a little bit of uranium because of the energy density, and yeah. then it's, it's like, it's like really negligible compared to like coal, mining for coal, even though coal is more, much more common than uranium, like the sheer. The sheer energy, energy density makes, pretty, I mean, pretty much makes up for it. Yeah, there, there are no safe, completely safe mines. Yeah, right. All, like, all mines are going to have injuries and problems. However, coal is amongst the most dangerous kind of mines out there. And yeah. e even even if, for example, you know, every every material was equally safe to mine, if you have to mine more of it, it's you're, you're going to have more accidents. So, like, if someone brings up, oh, mining uranium is dangerous, like mining coal. Well, so is mining silicon. And aluminum, and rare earth metals, like all the things you need. And yeah, we we don't have an option that doesn't involve mine injuries for humanity. Yeah. We have options that can mitigate how many we have, and nuclear is a huge one. If yeah. we could vastly reduce um, coal mining, and really, we could probably move entirely off of coal between yeah. natural yeah. gas and other renewables yeah. and um, nuclear. We probably don't actually need coal ultimately. I do have a question. There's also no good argument to make. Well, coal, no good argument. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, coal has 
uh, uses other than burning. Like it is used uh, uh, significantly in steel production, although there are low co- lower carbon steel manufacturing techniques that are being developed. But I mean, it's definitely better than just straight up burning the coal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. Have a question about coal real fast. Um, uh, how I don't know if you guys know this or not? How come in the carbon so they they it created coal instead of, instead of the regular f- fossils? Like with other, other periods, why was that the coal uh, period? Um, well, so I don't go ahead and stuff. You, you, well, you're no more than, than this. So basically, um, there's. A, do you know what peat is? I th- think so. So peat is uh, what forms at the bottom of um, anoxic, in anoxic conditions in swamps, right? So right now in Ireland, there are some extensive peat bogs that are that exist, and um, essentially what happens is when you have a lot of plants living in an area for a very long time, uh, they'll start to do things like <clears throat> deplete the soil from, of a lot of nutrients and oxygen and whatnot. And that creates this situation in which things don't really rot as they sink into the swamp. And that will turn into peat, which still contains all the various uh, you know, biochemicals. And as they break down, they'll start to turn into the kinds of chemicals that you actually get in things like uh, coal and oil. And then over time, the liquids can get squeezed out and migrate as oil and the solids will end up sticking around as coal. And the reason the Carboniferous has so much of this is because um, it was extremely uh, wet and high oxygen. So there was just a lot of life everywhere. Um, just the total biomass in terms of macroscopic organisms was just enormous. And uh, it's also though not the only place we get coal. There are coal beds from other periods of uh, geological history. like. There are uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous yeah. uh, coal beds. I, th- I think that the reason why like most of the coal comes from the Carboniferous is because like that is when like uh, liglin, like uh, the the chemical for wood, first appeared, and that is also when like organi- other organisms didn't have the, ca- ca- have the ability to like digest. Wood. Yeah, that's an important thing too. Yeah. Now, if nothing can digest wood, it's going to turn into coal, and very yeah. few things could digest wood when it first appeared, basically. So it's a it's a perfect storm of just the right climactic conditions, the recent evolution of a particular chemical that no one was eating at the time. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's like it's like how we use plastics. Like we have suddenly made a lot of stuff that nothing can eat, and now it's like all going all over the earth, like and, and sit, just sitting there, and like until something shows up that can eat it. <laughs> well, it probably but, will eventually like like the like the bacteria that got nylon eventually. Maybe it'll yeah. be, yeah. be a plastic plastic eating bacteria. Or, or there was or, also, I believe, a bacteria that eventually metabolized a good portion of the oil that was expelled from the BP disaster as well. I can't yeah. remember. I don't think it was manufactured. I think it was just. Although, it, maybe, it may have existed yeah. just in the ocean, and like we didn't really see the effects until we saw a big spill. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not sure of the details there. Yeah. Although, I, although I wouldn't count on like nature solving our own problems. True, right? Yeah. Well, I guess because it, it, so, sometimes we're too we're faster. Nature can can adapt. Sometimes, I guess. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Also, 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 nature, also, nature also has the capability to like really wreck the environment. Like, like like the the carboniferous like was also not really a good thing that happened. Like when you have like a really high oxygen and low carbon, you can uh, get like a really cold ice ages and also like really pretty bad wildfires because the high oh, oxygen yeah. concentration in the atmosphere, oh, yeah. right? They, they, so, they yeah. mentioned that in the walking with... And big walking, insects, big insects, walking with, no, walking no. With, <laughs> yeah, walking with monsters video, if you, yeah. saw, if you saw that, the yeah. fires, like lightning fires. Uh, yeah. You would say the dangers of natural gas. Is that where in the old days, the, I, I also have several about that where a river, a lake, or something was, was, was there. Methane and sulfur, and it, it could everything in the lake when it, when it released its thing. That that, that is. I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. sure. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure. Uh, I'm, I, 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 I think you referred reference to something, but I'm not. I'm not familiar with the reference. I, 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 like I refer to like the, the documentary Gasland, like where they see like uh, gas explosions from like lakes. Yeah, like maybe yeah. For, for fracking, from fracking maybe or, or not. Yeah, uh, Maybe not fracking, but also this like natural, naturally thing. Like I don't know, I, it's just thing. I forget where it was it was called, but there was this lake and something 
like some kind of gas was released into the lake. And it oh, I, I think I think I know what you mean. Like there, there's like lakes in like Africa that, that sits beneath, like up, above, like a uh, something that, that releases uh, like CO2, and the CO2 stays at the bottom of the lake, but some so like a landslides that like, causes it to like, like be released in like in one huge per, like uh, surge, and then it's yeah. It, it chokes everything nearby, basically. Yeah. All, all the, a, a cloud of carbon dioxide. Oh, so that's carbon. That's not methane or anything like that. That's carbon. I, I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's methane. No, I think it's just okay. carbon dioxide. But still, like a high concentration of carbon dioxide is still deadly. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it heavier than oxygen. It will displace all the oxygen in the local area. Yeah. Yeah. And it also. Uh, sort of, it also tends to um, react with water to form car carbonic acid. And you, like you have like a, like a accounts from like survivors who were like, like choking on air and like they were like uh, like the like like uh, painfully like I think the the lungs were like turning into acid like basically on the, on the inside because of the high concentration of carbon dioxide. So yeah, of course when you breathe in higher amounts of carbon dioxide, then your blood uh, pH will uh, become dangerously low too yeah. yeah which also will by the way lower the ph of those lakes too which is why even when such lakes are not actively venting they're still not exactly great places for most organisms to live uh, so uh talk about actually talk about the dangers and thing of oil next oil, oil, oil from history like oil was originally they got originally got got by hunting whales before they found them underground uh, whale oil is a little different, uh, but funnily enough, uh, whale oil was rendered essentially obsolete with the invention yeah. of kerosene, at least, the, or, or not the invention of kerosene and making it efficiently by a Rockefeller, but that's, yeah. that's a different oil, yeah. The oil industry did, to some extent, save whales from going extinct as a group. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, 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 it's again taking like compare like the lesser of two evils at some at some points in history. Like for example, at some point coal, as you as you said, coal was a good option when we first found it, uh, as opposed to like burning uh, forests again, <laughs> right? Yep. So yeah, yeah. The, the hopefully the history of humanity will end up being finding a convenient but not very good energy source and then eventually using it to find a better one and adopting yeah. that one until the next better one comes along. Okay. Right now, we're in a weird spot, though, where the next better one is blindingly obvious. But a lot of people don't popular. want to adopt it. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I, th I think, I think, I think, like a, like one, like one. Uh, I've seen like one uh, promoter of nuclear power, like making the analogy of like when humans first discovered fire. Like there were probably a few people who were like, no, fire is dangerous. Please stay away from it. And then uh, like, but yeah, but it, it keeps us warm and it uh, cooks our food. And then the ones that, that rejected fire were extinct, and the ones that accepted fire, like they they moved on. <laughs> so right, and we are now with the nuclear power in almost the same way. So yeah. I, I think uh, the, the main reason is what Ness kind of touched on earlier is that it's it's essentially risk perception. You see a windmill, you see a solar plant; they seem very innocuous. You don't you didn't yeah. see everything that went into making it. Even a, even a hydro dam is pretty static and just spitting out some water through its. Uh, but you see a nuclear plant, even in its cooling tower, building out all this. They think it's smoke, but it's just steam yeah. because CO two is colorless. You can't see CO two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and then also like the negative associations in the past, but like the whole human first thing is very um, like for me. It's just like whoever's saying that is either very malinformed or just tone deaf. Because if it's humans first, then why are you uh, favoring energy sources that kill more people? Yeah. It's, yeah. That is. I I I I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar. I I, I hate pr to bring this name up, Helen Caldicott. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with her. Mm, I'm not. Somebody. I know, like, like she's like a like one of the leading anti-nuclear activists, and she uh, like she's really anti-nuclear. But she and she promoted using candles in the replacement of light bulbs. That's a terrible idea. That's yeah. directly putting. That is directly pumping carbon dioxide into the air in a way that light bulbs don't do. Light bulbs, <laughs> it, an incandescent light bulb, is going to cause way less carbon dioxide emission than burning a candle. It's not even a competition. And if you use like an LED, 
it's going to be like an order of magnitude less on top of that because they use so much less power anyway. It's look, guys, use candles for accent yeah. or if the power goes out. But if you also, think you're also, helping the environment yeah. by burning a damn candle, you're crazy. Also, also she, she said she said that the Fukushima was like uh, many times worse than Chernobyl, and that more uh, people died at Chernobyl than have died from the Black Plague. Uh, those are patently false. Now, yeah. Fukushima so is like yeah. this is flat Earth or creationist level wrong. Yeah, like Fukushima was many times worse than Three Mile Island. Uh, that's that's true, but. But right many now? times worse than not really very bad at all is so, so, still not actually all that bad. Let's yeah, also, 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 during presentation, she, she used like this like chart of like the cloud from Fukushima coming to like the US. So oh which, which, has been, which has been debunked since 2011, and she's still using it many years later. So if, <laughs> I, remember, so if I remember the black play correctly, so according to her, Chernobyl and them killed killed more than a third of third of Europe's population. <laughs> well, she would she probably is trying to mean in absolute numbers. So she probably wouldn't say that, but still it would mean that it would have had to have killed millions of people. And it yeah. didn't. It even if we give very, very pessimistic uh, estimates, it's very hard to get it to have, having killed even a thousand people. Uh, uh, my, my my quick Google yielded the Black Plague in absolute numbers kill uh, estimated twenty five million deaths. Yeah. So she's she's off by at least two orders of magnitude. <laughs> at, at least it's yeah. probably more like three. Yeah. Um, but no. So Fukushima deaths associated with the accident, the nuclear accident itself, no one died from the explosion or anything like that. There is one death that has been uh, oh, yeah. associated with exposure to radiation. But if you you can actually live in the Fukushima exclusion zone, and while you're exposure would be higher than what is average for background radiation, you wouldn't exceed the annual exposure limit for a, uh, for a radiation worker. Yeah. So you, you, you would actually get more radiation exposure if you were like an, uh, an airline pilot. Oh, well, a lot more in, in most cases. Yeah. Uh, airline pilots actually are supposed to a fair bit of radiation. That's one of the more radiation intense jobs that even so, exists. So does, although, although, a, 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 although a counterpoint may be like, oh, it, 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 like it's different from getting cosmic radiation uh, as opposed to like the uh, the the isotopes, if you get the isotopes in your body and it can bioaccumulate, but even then, it's still difficult to get the accumulation from like in the in the vicinity of Fukushima. It's not really like yeah. much if there. You're, if you're a smoker, you're gonna get you're gonna get about two to three times more. If you like, a, I think it's like a pack a day or half a pack a day. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna get two to three times more the annual. Uh, limit for a radiation worker. If you're an astronaut, you'll get three or four times as much. Yeah, it's, and it's also like in space. And it's also like uh, like when, when somebody is like anti nuclear, but they go out in the sun, like in the sun, without any sunscreen for like days on end. <laughs> Look, right. there, so do you know what Grand Central Station is in New York? No, I do. So it's a it's a large granite building, and it is um, <laughs> very fancy, and it's. Uh, one of the biggest terminals. It's sort of a hub for the uh, the subway system, or for those of you who are oh, yeah. uh, maybe other parts of the world, the underground. With, with, with the big clock in the on the yeah. like uh, yeah, I remember yeah. That being inside of that gives you a higher radiation dose per unit time than being in any operating nuclear reactor plant will. I I, I can go one better. There's a there's an area. Uh, I believe it's in Iran, maybe it's Iraq, it's, it, or maybe it's Pakistan. It's somewhere in that area. Central Asia. Yeah, and I know it's not India, so it doesn't, it's not that far uh, east. But um, uh, the the background radiation, the natural background radiation, is like it's like three hundred microsieverts a se or per hour. I think it is. It's like something crazy. It's way higher than anywhere else in the world, and they do not have higher cancer incidence rates uh like higher than average at all in fact there is a little bit of evidence although it's uh limited where they kind of tested people from this area to see uh their, their bodily responses to, to when exposed to more ionizing radiation and they're they actually fared better than other people <laughs> so yeah. it's and that so i'm not saying that like radiation is good for you yeah. but the, the the limits that we have for exposure to radiation are over like overwhelmingly conservative. Uh, so, oh yeah, by far. It's, like, it's, it's, it's interesting to point out that the, it, like the common understanding of radiation among the public like is really really bad. Like 
like when, when you when you hear when you give when you say radiation to somebody they will often freak out and uh, and when you and when somebody learns that that like the iphone emits radio waves and the, <laughs> the five the five the five g scare recently about, about covid 19 oh my god controlling, oh my god. Our, controlling our brains like, yeah give us the virus. it's also it's also also thing like when i was making my video on the nuclear power i found like a a Greenpeace website which explains, quote unquote, explains radiation, <laughs> and it's and it, and it lists like a few types, and it says, oh, you, you have like heat radiation, and you have solar radiation, you have nuclear radiation, and nuclear radiation is bad because it can cause oh. damage, but heat radiation and solar radiation cannot cause damage. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. Let me <laughs> let me go stand naked in the sunlight for a few minutes yeah. and see how much damage is it caused. <laughs> uh, PSA, don't I, do that, people. Uh, when, uh, when, I, so, when, I show, so, when I showed a screenshot from that page, I also showed a screenshot from like a sunburn. Yeah, and it's. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and the thermal radiation can't hurt you? Yeah. I'm sorry. Have you not heard of just being burned? Stick your hand yeah. in a fire if you don't think thermal radiation will hurt you. Uh, so, so uh, when I hear uh, natural disasters and stuff like that, a lot of people think about oil spools and stuff. Mm hmm. I mean, there's never been a nuclear spill like that. So even in Fukushima, where um, radioactive isotopes were released to the ocean, oh, yeah. the actual measurable effects in terms of like detriment to people or ecosystems were essentially zero from that event. Yeah. How um, dangerous are oil spills? Extremely. I mean, it depends on their size. Obviously, if you if you take you know an eyedropper and you put four drops of oil in the ocean, nothing's going to happen. But the big ones that we hear about, like the BP oil spill in the Gulf or the um, Exxon Valdez. Yeah. yeah, I mean that can kill a huge portion of sea life for just a gigantic area. It's um, also it's, dangerous to traverse for mar yeah. maritime travel. And does, yeah, does, does, does it also impact like the food chain? Like uh, it blocks sunlight and maybe mm -hmm. fears with like phytoplankton, right, in the local area or, or not? Yep. yep. Uh, well, it, because uh, oil is one, it can it it's so there so are also toxic, also toxic, it toxic that will like, form. It's toxic. Yeah, it's toxic. Yeah. It blocks out light, not all of the light, but it does block out light, which will cause problems for photosynthesizers. Um, it's mechanically problematic. So um, things like seabirds that land in an oil slick yeah. will have trouble taking off uh, from there. So it causes just, even if you ignore the, the chemical problems, it's gonna just cause straight up mechanical problems for a lot of sea life. Um, it causes mechanical problems also for humans traveling through on boats and whatnot. Cause you know, your boat isn't designed to run through oil, it's designed to run through water, which has different mechanical properties. I know, shocking. Uh, yeah, it's, they are some of the worst disasters that happen in terms of ecological disasters. Now they yeah. tend not to have a huge cost in human life, um, which, I mean, I guess that's a, a positive. Yeah. <laughs> not too many people yeah. tend to die, but they're still, I mean, the economic damage they cause can easily reach into the multiples of billions of dollars. Like the BP oil spill, ruined a lot of people's livelihood just based on the fact that it ruined their fishing businesses. I mean, it's oh yeah, it's a pretty serious problem whenever one of those happens anywhere. Didn't that happen like right, didn't that happen around the area right after near Katrina happening around the same time? Uh, it was a few years later if I remember correctly. Okay. But it was a similar area, yeah. yeah. Like, one of the, one, like, as Ness pointed out, like the perception of the danger is nuclear. I, it's, the public can be forgiven for not really understanding yeah. it because one, yeah. it's I, I don't, I don't blame the public. I blame the, our edu educational system. Yeah, the units are completely not intuitive. What's a Becker roll? What's a Sievert? Right? Yeah. So, but yeah, the education is really been mostly misinformation from a, co a an oddly uncoordinated but odd bedfellows effort by both fossil fuel companies and environmentalists. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really. Uh, I, I remember like. Like uh, one, like uh, I don't know if you've seen the uh, documentary uh, Pandora's Promise. Maybe, are you familiar with that? Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like it, it shows like a pamphlet from like a uh, like a go 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 solar, not nuclear, and it was sponsored by a oil uh, company or something. Like it's like yeah. Oh, I I see I see where your biases are from. Hmm. Basically, <laughs> outside of a few places, one of them being like the Sonoran Desert, another one being like parts of like the Atacama desert or something, solar is going, building a solar plant is the same thing as building a natural gas or oil plant. Cause you're going to have to have one of those 
to make up for lean times in the solar energy production. Yeah, so there, mm. solar is solar is not competing with fossil fuels. It is helping the expansion of fossil fuels because there are virtually no places on Earth where you can go totally where you can even make the majority of your power from solar with it. Yeah, with yeah that, I, I see that. Yeah, it's because solar. I see all these people articles about solar energy. It says, and go solar, and then you can sell your excess energy back to the plant. Oh, that does work in some places. Where I live, that works. But it okay. doesn't work in most places. Oh. Unfortunately, though, I do have to get going. Thank you very much for having me, um, and I hope that you guys have a great talk going forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So one of my favorite things from Pandona's Promise, my favorite moment in it, is there's this one instance where they're, the documentary is looking at a, like an anti-nuclear protest, and one of the guys, I don't think he was, I think he was part of the, the protest, he goes like, hey, it's, it's, it's like a snack break, and he starts handing out bananas. And <laughs> so... A, uh, so in in the the, the, the nuclear uh, industry, there is banana for scale because bananas are a nice way for yeah uh, because there is there is so there's a small percentage of the of the potassium in bananas is radioactive. It's potassium forty, which is where we get almost all of our argon. But uh, so that is a is a nice way of scaling the dosage you would get. I think it's 0.1 micro sieverts. I think that's what a banana is. I, I might be wrong on on the, on the unit there. He started just he started handing out bananas. And it was just like, wow. Th those people will probably get more radiation from eating that banana than they will from the, being outside that nuclear plant protesting yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's also it's also a thing like like if you use the LMT model to like to estimate the uh like the, the number of people dying from Chernobyl, like within the 80 year period from the accident. You, you get like a figure of like uh, like 20,000, something like that. But if you use the same calculation to calculate the worldwide death from bananas, from the radiation from bananas using the LMT model, you can you get a higher figure than Chernobyl. <laughs> Which is... well, that, that's, how, that's how the LMT model seems to work a bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but so, uh, I wanted to say one one quick thing, if it's all right. So the the, the point that Dapper made about you know solar. So the largest power plant in the country is a nuclear plant. It's the Palo Verde nuclear plant in Arizona. It's in the middle of the desert. It has no natural cooling source. It's actually cooled by treated sewage water. Mm -hmm. It's 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 three. It's like three point nine one three point nine gigawatts. It's three reactors. If you and in the whole site takes about four thousand acres. Security, uh, they have like two weeks worth of you know water storage, uh, and uh, if you took that entire footprint of four thousand acres and turned it into a solar farm, you would get about one eighth of the amount of power produced annually than that plant produces. It's it's not a small difference. Like nuclear is just slightly better. Like the, the diffuse and unreliable nature of solar is. I think solar is utility grade solar is just awful in like every way. It's the dirtiest, it's the deadliest, it's the least efficient, it's the least reliable, it's it's horrible. Now residential grade solar. It might, have, it might have some use it might have some uses like in like really high desert environment, maybe. Yeah, like where where other energy sources might not be, you know, yeah. you, you can really utilize as well. Uh but um now residential and it's, grade it's really good and it's really good in space. Without clouds, <laughs> right? Have, yeah. So I mean, I, I don't have any problem with rooftop solar, uh, other than the fact that, like you know, okay, you're now taking advantage of space that's already occupied, but you can't rely on that. That's just for your home. Yeah. If, you have a, if, if you have a, if a you know a skyscraper apartment that has ten thousand people in it, but its footprint's only a city block, yeah, the rooftop's not going to be able to power. It might be able to power a floor or two, and that's it. Also, also, like like the Depper mentioned, like if you if you produce um, like a, an an uh, a oversupply of power from your rooftop solar mm -hmm. and, and and sell it back to the grid, that actually might not be a good thing necessarily because when you when when many many people like overproduce electricity and sell it back to the grid, then the, the grid gets, can get overloaded and you have a negative electricity price at a, yeah. at, a, at a given time. Which, which, which means the price of electricity can go up and down and up and down during the day, depending on how the weather is. It also requires uh, significant upgrades to the grid in general. So it, yeah. those 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 kinds of costs are not often not captured by levelized cost. So, it, go ahead. So, so, so I just the dapper before he left. How, how does how can if, if it's if it's not that much energy and stuff? How, how do you 
how do people sell the energy back to the, the grid if, if that them in the house? Well, the the idea is that um, when you're not home and it's daylight, like you're at work, most of your like you know you're not really you're probably not running your air conditioner unless you have pets. You're not running the heater. You're not running most of your devices or lighting, but it's generating mm -hmm. power. So you'll be feeding uh, stuff towards the grid when you're not really using it. Uh, peak hours are usually between I think if I remember correctly, it's like at least in the U.S. It might be different in the Netherlands. It's like six basically when people everybody gets home from work, turns on all yeah. their lights, their devices, turns on their AC or their heating, and it's like six. I think to 9 I think speedy, I think speedy is typical for most uh, like uh, industrialized nations. Yeah. The, yeah. Six, Assuming like the, the the standard work day like nine to five kind of thing, it's like six to nine p.m. Where if not everyone is home, like more people are home during that time than at any other point in the day, at the same time. And, and that, that, that's when demand uh, becomes really high. Yeah. Not only that, but the one thing that I think is often overlooked as well is if we let's say we just uh, with an expansion of electric vehicles, uh, material bottlenecks notwithstanding, uh, is that now charging vehicles overnight, that's going to shift when the, where the peak is. And it's going to get further and further away from daylight hours or, you know, mm -hmm. or, or right. peak wind hours as well. And that's where, like, personally, if, if, I, if, you, if you were to ask me, I think we should do 60 to 80 percent nuclear. For for the grid, depending on you know the size of your country and the like, where you can build them and everything, and then geothermal, which is very dis very dispatchable, and then tidal. Tidal is nice in that it's kind of like wind, where it's intermittent, but it's predictable, uh, and you can it's much easier to engineer around that. So so what's what's biomass energy? Uh, it, I, it, it, dep it depends on that exactly like biomass is just en energy you get from like biological material so you okay. get you can have you can have biofuels from like uh like uh, uh like like your leftovers of your crop like if you have if you have like corn and the leftover leaves you can like put it in like a a, a bioreactor to, to make alcohol and then supply and supplement it into your like car fuel, okay, but mo most bi biomass come comes from like burning wood from forests, okay. and and that and that, and that's basically burned in like, the, like like it's basically burned in also like coal plants basically. Like you can use coal plants just as easily for for wood. If I'm not mistaken, you can just put the the, the, the wood chips in it instead of coal, and then yeah. it functions the same way basically. Okay. Although, 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 it, 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 although it produces more CO2 because it's less right. energy dense. Yeah. And you know more about biomass than me, so correct me if my, this analogy, this is how I'm understanding it. It's so it's kind of like we could burn coal, but instead we'll, we'll burn we'll one word. It's kind of like saying we could burn natural oil, but instead we'll just burn bunker fuel. Well, we won't refine the oil at all. Or we could burn gasoline or kerosene, but instead we'll just burn pure oil, which is not refined. So, you're, mm. is, that, is that an appropriate analogy, or is that not really? Accurate? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I, th I think that the, the thinking is like forests they grow back, and then it's more renewable, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah. So you're 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 using you're using biological material for 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 your fuel instead of like fossil fuels. Yeah. yeah, I saw this. And, and, so, and, so, and sometimes, like, I, you can also see here that bio, biomass is also contained in the figure, and biomass is even deadlier than natural gas because biomass is also, like, highly pollutant. It, it's released, like, like in wood, it, wood doesn't only contain carbon. It's not pure carbon. It, it's also, like, a lot, a lot of nitrogen. And when you burn that, you release, like, nitro, nitrogen oxides, pollutant mm -hmm. into the atmosphere, which, which is really, yeah. Uh, yeah. it, it, it causes a lot of issues for health. Oh, yeah. So what does this mean, deaths per TWH? That is oh, uh, terawatt hours, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, so, it's, it, so it's per unit energy. And uh, I mean, worldwide, we'd probably measure it in petawatt hours. The terawatt hours are usually with the scale you see uh, for larger industrialized yeah. countries. Although, although I, I have to stress, like, so, so, like there are other, other figures that, that put nuclear power, uh, like, uh, uh, slightly higher than uh, solar and wind. I, I've but, seen those yeah. too. Those are the ones that uh, don't account for the full life cycle. So when you count for really mining, refi so for, so a lot of, so a lot of it is uh, for a lot of deaths from solar are from installation and maintenance. Yeah, like you know, especially rooftop solar, and same for wind. But when you account for the fact that you have to mine the silicon and you have to 
you know, you have to deal with cadmium tilloride and thin film photovoltaics. Like that, that that's where a lot of the other uh, uh, comes at. This, yeah, this is, is there's a lot. Yeah, this is again it goes back to the point that that was making. Like, uh, oh, like we, like when you see like a, a, a rooftop solar and a, and a wind uh, wind turbine, people will go like, oh. Uh, well, what harm can it possibly do compared mm -hmm. to nuclear? And this actually is something that I addressed in my video. Like, my video was actually aimed at a person called Arne Ra. Like, he, he, ah. had a, he, had a, he had a conversation with somebody else, and I asked him what his opinion was about nuclear power. And he basically was like, well, uh, I, I really am concerned about nuclear power, and uh, I, I think we have better options, like, for example, uh, wind turbines. Like, what... What can possibly go wrong with wind turbines? And I, in my video, I actually showed a accident that happened in my own country where like a wind turbine caught fire while two people were on top of it and they died. Yeah, it, it, it so can go wind, wrong. So are yeah. wind tur turbines the same as windmills? Wind turbines are like windmills. Windmills are usually, the wind is... Uh, it uses is used to capture to create mechanical work. Usually, like yeah. you know, to to mill something, often corn. And the, and the Dutch are very very experts in that. Ah <laughs> uh, yes, wind and uh, you are very very famous uh, for windmills. Wind, wind turbines are uh, they turn the, the the energy into electrical energy. So there's a generator on board. Yeah, and uh, that's 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 the, like, that's the like, like I don't know if you remember like for, for, like a long time ago you had like from these tiny turbines on your uh, bike that you like uh, if, I don't know if you remember that like if you uh, power your the, light yeah, power, power yeah. your light yes on, on your oh, bike yeah. yes and, and that, that's basically a, a dynamo and if you spin it the dynamo it creates electricity it's basically in, inside the wind turbine too all, all, yeah. all, all, but, but of course a larger a lot larger than that so windmills another, something that's um uh the deal with windmills and solar in particular is the environmental impact that's often unseen is windmills kill a lot of birds now the counterpoint to that and it's a fair counterpoint is yeah. that cat, domestic cats kill far more birds than windmills and that's absolutely true it's like an order of magnitude more but the kinds of birds that cats kill are often like songbirds or pigeons whereas the kind yeah. of birds that windmills kills are like the bald eagle and the spotted owl like they're yeah. large often endangered birds yeah. And uh, don't, don't, forget, don't forget the bats. Like bats are also oh, really yes. affected by by wind turbines. Yeah. So and, and, uh, yes. yeah. And, and bats bats are an underappreciated aspect of the biome as yeah. well. They are they 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 stay they, they are they spread seeds. They're insectivores. They get rid of a lot yeah. of. Pests. And there's also and also apparently like wind turbines also apparently interfere with uh, like insects like bees maybe even too like uh, if, if mm. I'm not if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, but it's, 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 it's anecdotal. I of course I've not actually seen the studies, but still. I'm not sure how bees navigate yeah. through the air. I don't know if they yeah. it's based on yeah. wind currents or magnetic yeah. lines no, of force like ours do. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if this is true, true or not, or some, some rumor someone started, but like when there a lot of people, but windmill talk, they think about our ex president saying it causes cancer or something like that. I think. No. <laughs> well, you, windmill, yeah, you, the operation yeah. of windmills themselves doesn't cause cancer, but just like anything, if, you, if you're making steel and concrete, you're releasing CO2 and you're going to have some uh, carcinogens released like that, 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 that does happen. So he, I don't know wh what the basis of his argument was, but the windmill themselves, the, be living, no living near a windmill will not increase your chance of cancer other than the fact that there's probably a gas plant nearby. <laughs> but um, yeah, so he's, he, he didn't say enough for me to really say how wrong or right he is yeah. other than the fact that, Having a living next maybe, to him, maybe itself. it was like maybe it was like confusion. Like, like if I like I am really like I don't like Donald Trump. Like I I think he's like really um, not not the smart guy. <laughs> right? I'm not a fan uh, but, yeah, no. But but uh, if I if I lent him some benefit of doubt, maybe it was like referring to like solar power containing like cancerous heavy metals. Maybe I don't know. Which and the same goes for uh, batteries too. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, and then that's really for me. Like, I would take one thing that was really frustrating me about the the the, the pro renewables movement is that they're focused so much on wind and solar when those are your worst choices <laughs> for produce. Pro like, if it was geothermal and hydro and tidal, and I'm like, okay, ge geothermal is like right up there with nuclear in terms yeah. of safety and efficiency and and it's much more dispatchable. Yeah, Iceland is really, really lucky with that. 
Oh, absolutely. And there's a, there's a big geothermal plant in California, which is nice. And there's increase. It, it used to be the common wisdom that there were only a few places where you could really build a lot of geothermal at scale. But as mining techniques have improved and as the price of electricity has gone, it's actually becoming more increasingly pro uh, more profitable to explore deeper sources of geothermal uh, mm -hmm. heat. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, the potential is that you could maybe build geothermal almost anywhere in the U.S. Hey, I, that's, I, a, yeah, hmm. that's, that's a lot of what the, the, the pro-oil people were saying. Is, is like, look at all the jobs oil creates and look at all the, uh, the, the, the batteries to go for it, for electrical cars and stuff. Well, I, I I think you mean look at all the jobs that are created by renewables, right? Did you mean? Is that that's, what you meant? That's what, that's what, that's what, I'm thinking what they're saying. <laughs> oh well, so uh, I I I haven't heard. So oil does like everything creates jobs, and, but um, it's actually funny because from an efficiency standpoint, yeah, the one that creates the mo the fewest jobs for the same amount of energy is is the most efficient one because ever because all the human capital that if, you, if you're going to tie up much more human capital in producing the same amount of energy that means you're producing less of something else yeah. and, and, and nuclear has is the most efficient in that regard fossil fuels it really comes down to power density that's why fossil fuels also produce less jobs uh for the same reason and, and, and also and also like like like, like when they make the uh, I, I mean when they make the point about like oh this creates more jobs but i i don't think the point of energy energy production is to have a lot of jobs. Like it's it's like yeah. like it's, it's like it's basically like farming, and I don't think farming should be like uh, the, the the occupancy of like a lot of people from the public. So it should mm -hmm. be like really it should be really small and high high, high energy mm -hmm. dense, and, and not, yeah. not many people should be involved with it. So it's yeah, not, so it's not the, the point. The point is not jobs. It's the point is just energy efficiency and and no, and, and as less less uh, impact on the environment. That's the point of it. Like the the idea that we should go for renewables because they create more jobs is the Luddite argument. Like yeah. the, Luddite, the Luddite argument during the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, 80% of people were farmers. Now it's right. 3%. But right. all that human capital was freed up to make other things. It's kind of the core catalyst to the Industrial Revolution is by industrializing, you now are getting making more out of every unit of human work. To improve people's lives, yeah. uh, and and the, the dams are things that create hydro energy, right? Uh, dams can, most of them do, or or not, I don't know if most of them do, but dams don't necessarily, but they often do. Yeah. And also, but, like uh, I, if like uh, one of the thing that I want to make maybe point out is like. Like, uh, like we have we have discussed about the fear of radio uh, of radiation and nuclear energy and how it makes like for example in Fukushima they like when the accident happened they uh, they they did the uh, rushed evacuation that uh, made, like killed a lot of people and didn't really save any lives which is really bad because of the fear of radiation but there are there are also effects all over the world like for example Germany decided to like shut down. Like right. most of its nuclear power plants, because of because of Fukushima. Although they are already before Fukushima, they already planned to phase out on on nuclear. But because of Fukushima, they accelerated their phase out of nuclear power plants, and the gap, the, the cost by the uh, phase out of nuclear power plants was filled in by fossil fuels because it, because mm -hmm. the renewables couldn't be uh, filled in as rapidly as they wished. So they had to look for other other options and. They didn't want to be dependent on Russia for like uh, gas, so they had to, they, they dug up coal in their own country to fill in the gap. <laughs> so there's also an interesting study that there's also an interesting study that uh, looked at, at the damage from the decision and it showed that the phase out of nuclear nuclear power plants got, uh, led to a increase in mortality of like uh, 1,100 people per year because of yeah, the, the, uh, the, yeah. the carbon intensity of their grid increase. Yeah. Well, sitting there right next door is France, who's like majority nuclear. And he's like, doo, doo, yeah. doo, whatever. Yeah. Bonjour. <laughs> so do dams cause a lot of problems by backing up water? Or it, it depends on the dam. Like the like the Hoover Dam, uh, that's an like that formed Lake Mead. That's an artificial reservoir. So that is so, so it's rainfall, snowfall, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it might even be pumped for all I know. But uh, and then here in Washington, Washington is eighty percent hydro. hydro. And uh, it's 
I've actually been in meetings with like some of the power utilities, and they're talking about you know when when they have to buy power when snowfall and rainfall is lower, like in the summer, and when they sell power back in the fall and the spring, uh, all the way down to California. It's it, it's interesting. So hydro, the problem with hydro is one, it causes it it just it, it it can very much disrupt ecosystems. Uh, yeah. If you're it, uh, and it has a higher carbon footprint per unit energy than nuclear or wind, and I think geothermal as well. And it's, but, all, and also, it's also actually a higher risk. Like one nuclear power plant or one uh, dam can cause more damage than one power plant or for a nuclear power plant, yeah. Potentially. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. Like, like, so like it's, if, it, yeah. if it breaks in the water yeah. at one time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but we we have we have many examples of like for example the Chinese dam like the the Ban Chao dam as I think it's called and also like it was, it was also a famous example in like in like um, uh, somewhere in like uh, Austria maybe or maybe somewhere or maybe somewhere else where there was like a dam broke and uh, like a whole village was basically flooded in like overnight really really bad yeah so uh, so I would say that yeah. hydro um existing hydro we don't we should we don't really have a reason to dismantle it the carbon footprint from all the concrete and steel is already yeah. done and it's now I, I, I think i think yeah still the benefits outweigh the the damage yeah 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 so i mean i, I would i would not advocate expanding hydro uh pump storage sounds nice but there's a there's a limited area like a number of places yeah. where it can be used <laughs> use that scale people like to say oh there's pump storage it's like you can't really get as much as you think out of it as many places as you want. Now, yeah, I, it's, 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 I, I like, a, I like, a, like, a, for example, the one thing that might save like uh, the renewables mm -hmm. of our wind and solar is like uh, efficiency storage of like you you can store the excess energy you get you can get from the day when solar is really high active and you store it and then you use it during the night, for example, <laughs> and then and then hydro power can be used as to store energy that way. But like I, I like how they calculate it. Like, like you in, in the US, you would need more water than the US consumes in like an entire year or so to, yeah. to be able so, to store store enough energy that way. So like like so like Dapper mentioned before he left, like solar is more for individual houses and stuff, not not communities or cities. So the, the the advantage of residential solar is that you're not taking up more space. You're just your roof is just there why not just make use of it kind of thing and you can supplement your own power consumption but to rely on it for utility grade solar to just power everybody or to, uh, and it's important to remember that a, a significant portion of the energy grid is powering industry it's powering factories it's powering chemical plants they they don't have roof bloop uh, you know uh, footprints big enough to power themselves from their own solar and they they're, they they operate twenty four seven so unless you want to greatly expand storage which itself increases cost and increases uh, uh, carbon footprints then th you you really shouldn't be relying on solar now now thermal solar is interesting in that it's usually a liquid salt and you can actually yeah. store it and then use it later but thermal solar the problem is that it takes a huge amount of land, and it's still very inefficient. What is thermal? So what is that? So I thermal solar. So thermal solar is. Uh, so what it does is it uses the the heat, instead of using the light and exploiting the photoelectric effect from solar, it actually uses the heat. So you, you often see this is you see this large tower, and at the top of which is a vessel usually filled with like some kind of liquid salt, and then it's surrounded by a bunch of concentric circles of reflecting mirrors that just focus it right into that vessel. Kind of like a big yeah. magna, uh, uh, so kind of like a, a, a concentric And occasionally, and occasionally they might, they might produce a flying uh, fried uh, bird in the sky. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. If birds get too close to the tower, they'll hit, get hit by multiple beams and they may yeah. in fact ignite, yeah. So thermal solar is, is uh, does that. And the, 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 it does have the advantage over photovoltaic solar in that you can kind of control when you can utilize it, but it takes up so much land, and it's it's just very. And ultimately, you're just then using that that liquid salt to, to run a steam generator. So it's still very. If it, it's actually less, it is. It has a lower capacity factor than photovoltaic solar as a result. Yeah. but it, 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 it looks basically, cool. It, it, it basically <laughs> trades. Uh, it trades efficiency for like more flexibility because you can you can buffer the uh, like the amount of time you can use the electricity. Like for example, like even when the sun is down. You still have some heat in the salt stored for some time, 
but then of course the efficiency the efficiency is low because then you convert heat into steam and then steam into electricity but with, with photoelectric you, you convert the elect like the the energy from the photons directly into electricity, which is much more efficient. So, so you you can't get solar. In like, is there any way to get moon moon panels from moon <laughs> light or that? Well, I mean, you joke. So, but there is so space based solar is a concept. The yeah. problem is is that there's there's two main problems. There's the material. Well, actually, there's three. There, one is the cost of getting it into space. Two is the. Uh, the fact that uh, it's difficult to maintain because now you're ex it's exposed, it's exposed to cosmic radiation, it's exposed to micrometeorites. And the third one, which is really the biggest one, I think, well, no, it's not the biggest one, probably the cost to get it. The, the third one is transmission. So you can't have like, just a big extension cord, you know, several miles into space. So you have to transmit it down through microwaves, which immediately means now you have, it's, you're only getting about 20% of the power. And now you have this giant microwave pointing down to a collector which hopefully wildlife or, pl or aircraft don't fly through. So, I mean, that, that, that's the biggest issue. Now, Dyson swarms are a little different in that they're orbiting reflecting mirrors. So you could try to use kind of like the, the thermal solar aspect from orbital mirrors and two, two collectors. I don't think that's really economically viable yet. It's kind of a sci-fi fantasy thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe one day, but... Uh, uh or, may, or maybe, I mean, I, this is just me speculating now. It's like if we had a, like space stations, that because the light is, there's, there's less attenuation from the atmosphere, you might be able to get moonlight to help power them. But I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't I, that's yeah. just, yeah. that's probably just sci fi fantasy stuff. Yeah, you mentioned geothermal energy. What is that? So, geothermal energy is when you basically tap in, there are water tables that are close to, uh, I was going to call it geothermal vents because, it, but radioactive decay and tidal heating leads to heating various parts where there are there, there, there's water. Like Yosemite is a perfect example. Like you know geysers and stuff. Okay. And deeper down, you see more of that, and it's also hotter. But uh, the deeper you go down, the more issues you run into from heat and pressure. Like underwater so, geysers and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, so geothermal exploits that where you now have this heat. It's either, it's either very hot water, sometimes it's even steam, and it's it's brought up to the surface or just below the surface, but it's usually the surface. And then it's just, that's used to run steam generators. Oh. And uh, I, I can't speak for every geothermal plant, but I imagine it's for anywhere that, you know, has a sizable investment is that they can also, that, that water eventually runs out, right? So they will also pump water back down in because uh, to then get heated and then I, I think I think they maybe they have a cycle like the, the steam that they, they use to gener to run the, yeah. the turbine they, they it, it gets cooled somewhere and then they run it back into the uh, yeah, into the earth yeah it's I think they, they have to they have to treat the water and they have to remove like sulfurs and sulfurs and stuff oh, like I, that I think they do that before they send it to the generators from a metallurgical okay. standpoint but also, there's, also, there's also interesting there's also an interesting thing about like the radiation aspect of it like people are worried about the nuclear waste from like power, nuclear power plants but i have seen that geothermal also produces nuclear or, or radioactive waste because of how it comes out of the ground and uh, makes this uh, and, and and it takes up uh, radioactive material with it too yeah yeah those vents isn't that really some people think that the first life was down there and where the vents were I was different. This is a different topic, I think. I can think like if um, like, uh, there are of course many different ideas, but my from what I've from what I've read, it's most likely the the hydro hydrothermal vent that is found in like deep sea areas. The the uh, the white smokers. It's my bet for the origin of life. Okay. It's off topic, but it's all, all those things yeah. got my what's well, something in my mind. I maybe maybe think, maybe do man something to say. I I I. I Want to refer him to Doom instead of Sphincter? Look at it. <laughs> anyway, no, you, you you call me, uh, if it's easier, you just call me Josh or <laughs> or whatever. Like, because it's, it's it's a fairly long name and it, it's got a weird like Sphincter. Yes, no, Sphinct. Like that's a that's kind of an odd <laughs> syllable to pronounce. So, uh, if, if Josh is easier or Doom right. or Doctor Doctor Von Doom, have like an opinion on like the the origin of life, maybe like. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like, like, oh, I, I know that thing from the thing. I, 
get my brain like goes to there automatically. But anyways, yeah. So that's where so that's what thermal energy is. So I so I just want to do any of our viewers have any questions? They want they're wondering I don't about. I think there's well, one a lot of people watching. It. I mean, I yeah. I have the the stream open on mine. I might be one of the ones that's watching. Yeah. Uh, might, if not, you just always ask questions later in the comment sections. But anyways. Um, if you want, I, I, I think I have a, f a photo of one of a, a thermal solar plant, if you're interested. Sure, you can screen share it. Let's see here. Uh, Let's share my screen fast. Huh? Let's see. So, oh, may maybe in the meantime, I, I, I have some notes uh, ready for like sure. the conversation. And so, and some things that sure. I, uh, we, did, we didn't, we, we okay. didn't touch is like... Uh, one of the, one of the uh, good uh, argument in favor of like nuclear power is like, as we have discussed, the uh, the uh, like the like how how little people it kills per unit of energy produced, and the, actually Na like people at NASA have calculated how many people or how many lives has been have been saved because of nuclear power, and th 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 this is about like two million, uh, s s uh, at least to the point of 2013. It's probably probably a lot of more more people by now. But still, two two million lives have been saved because of nu nuclear power. So, what countries do nuclear power the most? Why not? Uh, Korea and uh, South Korea and France okay. are the, are the are the biggest uh, grid penetrations. Scotland mm -hmm. used to be almost either it was either plurality or a majority until recently. They shifted away towards wind, which I mean, wind is definitely better than solar in that regard. It's slightly more reliable. It doesn't kill as many. It doesn't pollute as much. But it's still, I think, Scotland should just stuck with nuclear and expanded into tidal a little bit. And I believe, I believe, I saw a video, an engineering video, where there is some advances in, in like basically tidal turbines that were being uh, tested in the Netherlands, if I recall correctly. Mm. And it was kind of cool where they they uh, they did so the, the turbines will uh, can can sometimes deter wildlife from getting near, which is I, I guess it's better than just you know, disrupting like so, but it's to, to not to not affect their breeding grounds and their feeding grounds, they spread them out in a way where it didn't affect them significantly. And then I always wondered, like, well, what about like wildlife and stuff building up on the turbines themselves? They 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 coat them in a compound where once enough moss or whatever builds up on it, it it has enough weight where it just sloughs off. So yeah, I, yeah, I'm I'm really skeptical about like. Putting generators down on the on the water because the maintenance is like a nightmare. Yeah, that was, that was the one thing where I mean, they were the the capacity factor was only like forty or fifty percent, but it, they admitted it. A lot of that was they they, they took them because it they basically they, they just draw them up vertically. Sometimes with a at first it was with a ship, and then they had I guess some sort of mounted pole where it could be brought up because you obviously had to pull it out of the water for maintenance. But a lot of that was. Just, the reason why it was so low is because they were bringing up more often than they otherwise would under normal operation because they were prototypes and they were getting data on, you know, like, oh, is it actually, are the water seals working or, you know, what, what have you. And I, I, I don't, I don't disagree that it may be too much, but uh, there's, all, there's another kind of hydro that I can't remember. It's not, it's not like a hydroelectric dam. It's not tidal, but it has something to do. Water mills. Mm, I mean, no, it was something done in the Netherlands, if I remember right, or maybe it was in Denmark. Oh, I think uh, it's like they, they they are like planning to have like a uh, like po pumping water on like a huge reservoir that they built, basically. I think, right? Mm -hmm. Or not? I'm I'm not sure. My memory is uh, failing me. I think it's, I think it, I think basically basically functions as a giant battery. I think, perhaps. I don't know if we have to look it up. Denmark, uh, hydro dam project. Maybe the will put something up. Let's see here. I, this this particular solar plant. I don't think this thermal solar plant is the one in mm -hmm. Mojave. Uh, this. Let's see here. The one in Mojave is the Ivan Paw plant. Which one? Which the see this one uh, the, uh, i also remember like about what the mojave, uh, 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 about the mojave desert and like i think it's also the one important point to bear in mind is like 
when people uh, promote renewable energy or renewable powers, that they they often are like environmentalists. But like renewable energy take a lot take a lot of land, so it's, it's pretty environmentally destructive. Even in deserts, like you have in the Absolutely. Mojave de- in the Mojave Desert, you even have like very rare plants that they had they had to cut them down in order to build the uh, power plants there. They also had to move all the tortoises. They were protected yes, species, so they, they had to move them. So yeah. they just pull them out of their burrows and some uh, several hundred died including the land because they didn't like they didn't yeah. you know they either weren't properly handled or uh they just some i i don't i don't know the whole story but they, uh, like, yeah but but in clearing the land just for these plants in here they had to clear up hundreds maybe thousands of acres and a bunch of endangered species died <laughs> yeah if if, if, if if this was was regarding a nuclear power plant like oh or like like if, if, if it was in the news like oh we, we we are planning to build a nuclear power plant but we have to move these endangered tortoises environmentalists would have gone nuts i would I guarantee it environmentalists would have gone nuts but of course since it's a solar power plant everyone would stay quiet yeah, at the at yeah. the uh, at the at the risk of sounding a little salty about it, environmentalists, uh, they don't they want to they want they don't want just to subsidize renewables with tax dollars. They want to they also want they're perfectly okay with renewables being subsidized by the lives of poor and working class people, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which it sounds really like grim but th- their entire idea was you know, should get away from fossil fuels because it's killing too many people it's like well i mean yeah it will create a lot of low paying boring monotonous maintenance jobs yes <laughs> for the low for the lower class well Where not just that but also like all yeah. the you know poor people that are having to mine cobalt and silicate yeah. in, in asia so uh, let's see. Here's a and also and also the, the and also the wa- the the waste from like solar panels. They they need to be reprocessed, and of course it will most most probably end up in like electronic waste piles where they where poor people go in and they take out the like the electronic stuff and poison yeah. themselves with the uh, things. Yeah. So I, I changed this. Uh, this is and, the power. And, compared, and, and, and compared to nuclear power, like the, the, the waste from nuclear power, yeah, yes, it's, it's dangerous, but it's very small. And, and all of it is contained. All of it. Yeah. So this is the Palo Verde nuclear plant in Arizona. So these are all you know massive cooling towers. Here are the reservoirs. These, these are all, for the most part, these are all three isolated plants. They're just on the same site. They might have a few cross connects. They have separate departments, divisions, all that stuff. And then... Yeah, so this right here is the containment dome for each, and this is where the, the containment dome is where the reactor compartment is, and where that's where the reactor vessel, uh, the reactor compartment. So th- this is also important thing. So for those who may not be aware, so uh, there's the primary and the secondary and the tertiary aspect of the plant. The primary is where all the radioactive stuff is. It's where the reactor vessel is, the core. It's where any kind of pressurizing vessel is, the pumps that circulate it through the core, and also the the steam generator which where the core the coolant the heated coolant goes through to then boil off the steam which then dries the turbines in the secondary system the secondary system is where the energy is actually harnessed and all the support systems you know oil water steam all that and then the tertiary system is pretty much just the cooling system and the cooling system then after the, the steam is boiled goes to the generator and then it's recondensed by water through this coolant uh, the, the the cooling system and then it's then pumped back into the steam generator. So it's a close. There's there's two cir- closed circuits, yeah. and then now the, the the tertiary system can be a closed circuit, but it's almost always no. It's it's almost always an open circuit for ships. The it's the seawater. The seawater goes through, goes through the condenser, and then for a lot commercial plants, it's almost always a cooling tower. The cooling well, the, the, well, the cooling tower isn't what the water goes through gets heated taking on the heat from the from the condenser and then it goes to the an evaporative cooling tower which then cools down the water back before it gets recirculated and it, i where i used to work uh i worked at a cryogenic distillation plant and we had we had evaporative cooling towers there too and in washington uh because of the because of the humidity uh and because of thermal layers you would sometimes get the cooling tower plume grow right over the highway and some people are like 
some people kind of freak out over it. Like it's just steam. It's 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 not even a high temperature steam. It's not going to hurt It's hydrogen. It's hydrogen monoxide. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah, but like 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 at night with the, when there's already fog when there's freezing fog and then you see this plume go over like it actually is quite a cool to see. But if you don't know what 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 that plant is and you look at it, it just it honestly looks because it has big uh, uh, cooling tower uh, distillation towers. It kind of looks like an oil refinery <laughs> because it's got cooling towers and distillation towers. But it's really just it draws in the air, compresses it liquefies it and then distills the air into its separate nitrogen oxygen argon and, and it's, it, it, it is carbon neutral we, we uh, it's carbon neutral the, the process is carbon neutral because we pull out the carbon dioxide from the air because it'll freeze in the process and then we then take that carbon dioxide and put it back into the air because there are it's just, it's just not economical to store it and we're it, we're not putting more carbon dioxide in the air. We're just putting that carbon dioxide that we don't want to use back, kind of thing. And uh, we take the water too, but nobody cares about that. Uh, speaking of nuclear waste, a lot of cartoons in the eighties and nineties talked about how it damaged the environment, like Captain Planet and The Simpsons oh. and stuff. Oh uh, well, Captain Planet was for mm -hmm. kids. <laughs> for a reason. Uh, so The Simpsons absolutely, I think, has done some help to re at least reinforce the perception that nuclear power is unsafe. But really, when you think about it, if someone is incompetent as Homer in this fictitious scenario, still, like, the, when the nuclear plant isn't blowing up, it isn't creating all sorts of problems. Now, obviously, because of Mr. Burns, like the three-eyed fish. It's going, it's going critical. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the point. Good yeah, count. it's going. <laughs> it's going critical. Oh man, I I've lost count of how many times I face rolled on that. So, um, so criticality is uh, in nuclear physics is a very means something very different. It essentially yeah. means that however many neutrons are being produced from the fission are are being used up in the fission reaction to create fission are also the same number of neutron the number of neutrons that are being created from the fission reaction. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's it's a steady state kind of thing. If it's so, when you start up, you have to be super critical. You have to actually make more neutrons than than are being used, and yeah. you can you, you control the rate of the action with the control rods. It's usually hafnium, but not always. Um, and once you reach the once you reach the 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 point that you want to be at, then you bring in the rods to be steady state. I mean, and if you don't, if you want to do a controlled shutdown, then you, then you bring the rods in even further, so then you're subcritical. Yeah. Um, and if there's some sort of accident where uh, the core might get too hot, or you or or, or to drill, or like there's lots of reasons. If you're, so, the 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 lifetime over the lifetime of the core, because poisons are in, put into the core, and and also um, uh, fissionable uh, radioactive decay products also accumulate in the core. The the there's a there's a zone that you're allowed to operate temperature and pressure based on the lifetime of the core. Uh, and if you're if you're running into the risk of falling outside that zone, then there's various safety mechanisms as well as manual inter intervention to scram the reactor, where you just you basically just you, you release the clamps on it, and they're usually magnetic clamps, and then spring uh, gravity will bring it down. But it often springs assist in the speed. It's really fast, also. Oh, it's 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 for the for 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 humans, it's essentially instantaneous. And, and, but uh, this is also the one thing one thing that ha that happened in Chernobyl. Like Chernobyl also had control rods, but these control rods, like we really moved in very very slowly to uh, stop the reaction. So, but all it's one of the things that make Chernobyl really really a bad design for a reactor too. Yeah, the the, yeah. the, the, the Chernobyl design. Like now, I should say, I know Canada has a reactor design. It doesn't use a graphite moderator, but it is like the the, the negative coefficient of reactivity for pressure. Uh, As it can, can do, right? Yeah, the can do. I don't know much about it. Uh, so, but I, I, from what I understand, it just doesn't like it doesn't use a graphite as a moderator, which is the bigger. Yeah. Uh, but uh, oh, no, no, it, it's a. Uh, I think it's moderated by heavy water, right? Oh, uh, that that I, that does sound familiar. Yeah, and uh, I mean that makes sense. Uh, I have some note notes ready. Like I've I've seen I've, I've seen a list of different types of nuclear reactors. Some are heavy water, and some are light yeah. water. Yeah. So uh, again, I guess Kenny Hornrickson has a question. I don't know what is he referring. 
Oh, he's, oh he's, he's, a, he's a flat earther. I think you can just ignore him. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, um, um, so, is, so is nuclear waste dangerous? Or that people, uh, okay, this? so there's many different kinds of nuclear waste. So there's long-lived waste and there's short-lived waste. And so the short-lived waste is like, you know, they have the, like... The, the fission products. And the, 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 so, the fission products are the short-lived waste, yes. Yeah, so strontium-90, uh, cesium-137, they last 30 years or less. Uh, they're not like so. Nothing's perfectly safe, but the but it's like the the used fuel, like the plutonium and the uranium. Well, not the plutonium, but the the and uh, the 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 higher higher actinides. Those la those are those those last. They're radioactive for a very long time. But yeah. uh, you they're actually let's see if it, oh, is it in this? They're, they're, they're less. They're also they're also less dangerous because like. Because and, because and they're you, they're almost always uh, gamma emitters yeah. instead of because so there's three types of ionizing radiation at least, yeah. or from from radioactive decay there's alpha beta and gamma and in, in descending orders those are how, how much energy is from it so alpha decay is basically a helium nucleus uh, beta decay is an electron or a positron and gamma is well it's a gamma ray a gamma is the lowest it penetrates the most but it also is the lowest energy. It's not good for you. And this picture does not show, like, Palo Verde, like many nuclear plants, stores their waste on site. So after they, they'll, they'll basically put them in these large, after they, they keep the the, fuel, the rods in large pools for, I think it's, it depends on the plant and the design of the rods. But, you know, for a couple of years, they have large, they have huge yeah. pools and, and until once the rods are cool enough. And they, it, still, it, still, it still contains the uh, highly radioactive, short-lived uh, uh, fish, fission products that, that, that still generate a lot of heat. So they have to be cooled in oh. ponds for like a few, ten, few decades, right? So is, is there I think there it's five, five to ten years. Um, uh, but so it's anybody who's got waste for anything else or is it just so, useless? Well, it's not that it's okay. So, nuclear waste can be used in, in a small amount. Of it is is used in nuclear medicine. Uh, yeah. And uh, actually, like, we, have, we have like in my country, we have two uh, nuclear plants. Like one produces electricity, and one is uh, like a really important medical uh, yeah. radio nuclear nucleotide uh, or nucleotide generator. Now, light, yeah. The light water reactors which were chosen. Like so, the, the reason why we use light water reactors, which produce a lot more waste. And there is, uh, is, is the, I, I would argue the main reason is Admiral Rickover. Admiral Rickover was essentially the father of the nuclear Navy. And he chose the light water reactor because it was much more space efficient. And like it, it, it was safer than a boiler, uh, boiler water reactor because it's a pressurized water reactor. And uh, it was mainly for submarines. Now, submarine space is a premium. And that's why he chose the light water reactor. Uh, the, uh, the light water pressurized reactor. And so... Though they produce, they're not very efficient. They are not the most efficient <laughs> at all. So, sure. roughly ninety to ninety-five percent of the f of the usable fuel over the, over the core lifetime is not used in light water reactors, and that's just fuel that didn't get used. It's not, but you can still call it nuclear waste because it is radioactive and it's not being used. But it, that that much of that fuel can be recycled into MOX fuel, which is like a combination of uranium and plutonium. Although it's becoming not really economical to do so anymore, but it can also be used in the fast reactors. Uh, fast reactors are basically breeder reactors. Instead of relying on thermal neutrons, they actually more they use fast neutrons. Yeah, without without the moderators, like 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 moderators are used to slow down the neutrons to the to the thermal spectrum. But in mm -hmm. fast breeder reactors, you, like you just let the neutrons loose, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. What, so and for me, the uh, so I, I'm not. Are, are you familiar with the integrated? Oh, you, you probably are since you watch a soft hand orders from us, the integral fast reactor. I think uh, for, I've heard of it, yes. The integral fast so the, reactor. the integral fast reactor was developed in the 80s. Uh, and it's, it's, so it's a breeder reactor. It's a fast reactor, but it was designed with safety being numero uno. And uh, so instead of having a coolant loop, it has a coolant pool. And it, this, and the, the fuel is designed, like the core is designed, designed geometrically where the fuel has far more room to Oh, excuse me, to expand when it, when heated. Uh, and the result of this is that you can, uh, the fuel can expand as it gets heated to the point where it can actually cr creates a much stronger, like we, we talked about the negative feedback loop for, for heat. Uh, this is, it's much stronger in this one. And they actually tested it. This was in the eighties. They had a working prototype and they designed and built a working prototype in less than four years, which is, 
faster than any commercial one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, and, and what they did was they, they put it through some paces. They tested it. The, the, the conditions were three mile Island, which, and then it, it which was, it, and it shut down just fine. Cause essentially what, what happened in three mile Island was basically the core damage that occurred was because the, um, the core got exposed and because uh, the, the, the was, it was no longer covered in water. And then the radioactive coolant also went into the, the, the people's faces inside the plant. No one died, but, 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 um, and then they also did one for Chernobyl. And then they also, which is difficult to simulate. So it's, it's hard to capture everything that happened that yeah. made Chernobyl go wrong. But then there's one. Oh, are, one are, are, you tell, are you telling me it's difficult for Chernobyl to happen again? <laughs> like it's, uh, it's, it's I, point, I have yeah. long, I have long argued that the conditions for Chernobyl don't exist, didn't exist in Western reactors back then. And they certainly don't exist now. It's just can't yeah. happen. Like, yeah, it's, even, it, like it's, it's ridiculous. Like it's a, like when people say like, Oh, we don't want another Chernobyl. Please stop. Like, but you know, but it's really a very rare event. I guess. Yeah, it's I mean, I like it to happen again. Now you could say I don't want another Fukushima, but yeah. where? But so they also did the Fukushima. Well, they actually did a test called All Station Blackout, which is what happened at Fukushima. Now they didn't like they didn't say we're going to predict. They obviously didn't predict well, what happened at Fukushima. But All Station Blackout is where you lose all utility power. You lose yeah. all power from your steam generators. Your diesels don't start any batteries you have, like you have zero power to pump coolant uh, through any of your heat exchangers. So any, and uh, and they did that, and they all station blackout, and then they also disabled any kind of manual interventions and disabled all of the, the safeties, like for scrams and stuff like that. So this is the worst case scenario. Nothing can save you, right? And they just saw the temperature go up and up and up, and then it reached an inflection point, and shut itself down. Hmm. And, uh, and that's a, that's like, yeah, so it was it was it, it cannot melt down. It was it was designed that way. And there's also liquid uh, salt reactors yeah. that can't melt down because it's already molten. Yeah, but uh, um, molten salt, molten salt uh, lift, lifter. Yeah, uh, lifters, lifters are like a. Uh, I, I often dream about lifters. No, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. but the, but um, the other thing that they did was they also. Oh, I mean, maybe from that, yeah, I have a question or. Oh, oh. Maybe. Uh, it, 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 there's also the, it, because of, because of yeah. the integrated uh, aspect of it, it's integrated in that they reprocess the fuel on site with electro refinery. So over the core, over the lifetime of a particular core, it produces no long live waste because 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 it's, partially because it's a breeder reactor and partially because it reproduces the fuel, and also because now you don't have to redistribute the fuel for processing elsewhere. It mitigates the effect of uh, potential for proliferation, like if it's something gets stolen or anything. This, this, in my opinion, answered the three primary political concerns of uh, over nuclear power, and environmentalists still opposed it. The program was near its completion, and Bill Clinton killed it uh, in '93 on recommendation from his energy secretary, who was an ex-fossil fuel lobbyist. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, oppo they, oppo they oppose nuclear uh, energy because of the problems, and they oppose any solution to the problems. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, nuclear energy would work on a flat Earth, although you might have to have spend a little bit more energy in pumping your water. Um, <laughs> now you, you mentioned that the nuclear plants re, re, uh, produce that steam and not carbon dioxide or, or monoxide. In the, in the, uh, yeah. So what you're seeing here, uh, so this, these are evaporative cooling towers. How they work is a lot like a, it's a lot. It's kind of like a swamp cooler, like uh, scaled up. So you'll have your returning uh, uh, stream. A hot stream after it's taking the heat out where it needs, and then it goes to the top of the tower, and it basically sprinkles down, and then you have forced air that draws air from the bottom, forcing it up, and this causes some of that water to evaporate, and just like when you sweat, it takes away even more heat away from you, leaving the water that doesn't evaporate to actually go down in temperature, and it goes down into a basin, and it's pumped back into the cooling loop, and what you're seeing there is steam. The, the, the steam that, that, that's the steam evaporating. Okay, so is that like like the coal plants that reduce the carbon monoxide? So coal power. plants have cooling towers as well, but they also have uh, they also uh, you know have towers that pump out. You do not yeah. CO two is colorless. You can't see CO two. You can see smoke. So if you see if it's if it's if it's black, it's probably just the burn the ash from the burning of the coal. But okay. uh, coal plants also have cooling towers. Uh, okay. So you'll, so you'll see both uh, both there. Yeah. You, you only you only see these like these white. Uh, oh, like oh, I, I, I don't know how you can describe the shape, oval shape, like these cooling towers. But 
bit cool power plants. You also see like these uh, just cylindrical, uh, small, short, like uh, tall, uh, tall towers. That, that, the, the hyper, yeah, I think they're called the hyperbolic ones. Hyperbolic, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, the ones the ones you see in the Simpsons is that's the, that's the classic design. Uh, I think these ones, what they pro, what, what I would imagine is they're probably most of it's underground. Uh, I'm I'm just guessing because I I, I I I I but it might be for like a an air clearance thing. It's like because then you can have helicopters fly over them mm. and not have to worry about that kind of thing. But I mean, yeah, this 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 plant here supplies about a third of Arizona's power. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I, think, one plan. I think I think one issue that we haven't touched upon is like the concern about proliferation of nuclear weapons from nuclear energy. Maybe that we can is, talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, they're pretty tightly controlled. I think I think it's still over. Like, so nuclear weapon, dirty bombs might be an issue, but pretty much nobody has, except for governments, have the capital to refine fuel to the point where they can create a nuclear, like a, like an atom bomb. You can create dirty bombs, but but thorium yeah. is thorium is like if we can get thor- lifters to work, can't melt down. Thorium isn't even fissionable. Uh, it's uh, you actually have to basically convert it to a fissile material in the process. Which I mean, unless you're going to take over the plant and then yeah, yeah. I, th- I think I think this, like, this, the scenario is it's uh, like uh, environmentalists like to spin to like uh, oh there's a terrorist who can infiltrate a nuclear power plant and steal the fuel <laughs> rods like a, like a Mission Impossible mi- uh, scenario maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so nuclear plants have their own security on site, and they often have their own firefighting on site. the The reactor compartments are in basically in lead. Com- Reactor compartment is like everything. It's, it's like I can't speak for every plant, but it's like a foot or two thick lead that just surrounds it. So it's just massive door with all sorts of locks. Uh, unless you're going to be somehow cutting into the reactor compartment, Mission Impossible style. Mm-hmm. Which good luck with that. I no. The, the, the bigger I, I think a bigger concern than that would be sabotage. Sa- like sabotage. Yeah would be a bigger concern than trying to steal uh, nuclear fuel. If it's going to be stolen, it's going to be stolen in transport. It's not going to be stolen from the plant. I, 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 aren't containment buildings like uh, built to withstand like a plane impact even like, so that's, that's how strong they are. That's, that's what I've read. I can't, I can't speak for everyone. Uh, but the, uh, the certainly uh, the newer ones have, and I believe the older ones have been upgraded to meet that standard. They are, you're you're not gonna <laughs> sabotage would come from inside. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess no. I, I don't think you, the, even but, bombing it. Yeah. No, like, but, but I've also like I've seen only like a professional website. Like I'm thinking it's a governmental website about like uh, it concerning about nuclear power. Like it also it also has a page on like uh, dirty bombs and it notes that dirty bombs aren't particularly more dangerous than normal bombs. Although. The only difference is that people would panic a lot more from dirty bombs. That's a significant I, I, difference. I believe, I mean, you're definitely going to get, you're basically, ex, you know, expelling a lot of radioactive material, but. Yeah. But also, the, the also they, 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 they do know that it's, it's very difficult, even with the bomb, it's difficult to spread out solid waste from nuclear power plants. So it, it, will, it will be min, still maintained in a very small area. Still. That is the thing that's often overlooked is that nuclear waste is almost all solid. Yeah. Which is easier. It's easier to control. You can't have a spill from a solid, and like, oh yeah, if a dump truck falls over or whatever, it's easier to pick up as well. It doesn't, you know, immerse itself with other fluids, you know, and, yeah. and gases are the gases are the hardest. Yeah, but the, 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 the symptoms, like showing the glowing green liquid, nope, it's uh, like solid. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Uh, not even not even glowing. I think right, it's not glowing. Uh, if you go to uranium mines, they are there are. Like if you shine a black light on uranium, like oh, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a little phosphorescent, but it's not like it's not glowing like it is in the cartoons. No, it, it can't be used as a light source. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the other thing about nuclear waste is that yes, nuclear waste we, we produce we, we, in our current with all these light water reactors, we still we, we produce uh, more waste than we would need to. But in seventy years, roughly of uh, all the hundreds of nuclear plants operating at any one time in the US, all of this unused fuel that will last millions of years can fit inside of a football field if stacked three meters high. 
Like yeah. it's a very small amount of waste. that's very easy to control, and it's much. It's it and and what's nice is that oh, it's it's radioactive. Okay, well yeah, but we have shielding, so. Yeah. Also, like also about, about the point about your like fast breeder reactor that, that it, it can use uh, nuclear waste as as more fuel. So basically, we have like a, a, a huge fuel repository which can last for like I don't know how long we can last on just the waste that we already have. That that actually is not only for our use our our, our waste, but also we um some st some statistics indicate that. Increased nuclear energy proliferation leads to more dismantling of existing nuclear st weapon stockpiles to use as fuel because yeah. it's already it's already refined. Why would we bother refining I, more nuclear fuel? So let's just take what we have here. And this is also one of my my main points against the uh, the nuclear weapon argument. Like one of the the main things that addresses the or that have that has addressed the nuclear arsenal is using it as fuel for nuclear power. Like that, the, mm -hmm. the, the only thing we can solve it is either by burying it deep, deep on the ground, maybe, yeah. like, or, or keeping it forever in a, uh, in a in a storage and maybe we'll use it someday, or we can just get get rid of it forever by burning it up in a power plant. It, that's, it, that's, it, that's, that's the most sensible solution to the arsenal of weapons we have. Yeah, I, think, and, I think we have a question or something from, from, your, from your neighbor to the south. Uh, what's the question? Oh, it says here in here in Belgium is plant. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess it's more of a comment, but I would I would, I would agree that it's a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, like if you, uh, it's one thing to say no more expansion of nuclear. If you're for shutting down nuclear plants that you know aren't leaking, like shutting down the Three Mile Island was recently shut down, and the the two plant was shut down a while ago, and that should have. But if you have a perfectly fine operating uh, nuclear plant, like the one in uh, Diablo Canyon in California, where California would just refuse to renew the license. That's just a horrible idea. It's efficient. Yeah. It's clean. It's already been built. And the same thing in Vermont. Bernie Sanders helped oh, spearhead yeah. the shutting down. I can't remember the uh, the name of the plant. And I remember, I remember many years ago, he, Bernie Sanders, when he was on the, if he, maybe he's still on it, when he was on the Energy Committee, he said 99.99% safe is not safe enough. It's like, that means that no energy safe is safe enough. <laughs> <laughs> like that, 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 that's like if, 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 if any risk uh, assessment guy like lost its goddamn mind over that statement, I think. Like, like yeah. it's uh, like, it, it, I. Like people lose their minds over nuclear power. Like I, I, I've had a conversation on like in the comment section about one, one thing, and I say like you seem to have like a, a zero risk bias. Like you, and, and and I think it's a bad idea. You need to look at at it more like a, a rational risk assessment or risk based assessment. But then he comes back with yeah, yeah, yeah you're sure I have a zero risk. Uh, Bias against nuclear. That's that's how it's supposed to work. Like, no, it's not how it's supposed to work. Is that like is that like saying Lysol kills ninety seven percent bacteria? So don't use it. Well, it's more. It's it's I, I, it's really more that people. What, pe what people. It's it's the Nirvana. It's the Nirvana. I can't talk. Nirvana fallacy where yeah. they like so they want they want people are interested in unicorn versions of their preferences and then they don't even hold. The, and then, then they hold the competing alternatives to the same sta the standard of this fictitious version of it, and because frankly that's just easier. Like I, they've they've come to the conclusion this is a satisfying conclusion. They like this, they're convinced, and then they kind of rationalize not having to look further into it or not having to change their mind because that not it's difficult for people to admit they're wrong. It's also and also in in general people tend to favor expediency. They they have their own personal and professional lives. They worry about more. They don't want to think too hard about stuff, and politicians exploit that. Yeah, it's also like uh, like uh, about like about Bernie Sanders. Like uh, I like if if I were American, I would have supported him because like I I more or less align with this with this political. Of course, of course, I live in the Netherlands. Like we are all mostly left wing compared to the Americans still, but uh, I really disagree with Bernie on. His stands on nuclear power. Like I, I don't know why he is even like this. Okay, like he's, 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 he has also like a really rich stance on like GMOs. I, I think like there's also there's also a thing with the left wing. Uh, yeah, so yeah. The, the left observation of the GMOs is like I want to. F I, I don't. I, I feel icky about having to read labels, and I'm okay with poor people starving. Yeah. 
<laughs> to not just to do that. that that's really what okay, it I, boils down to me for me. <laughs> like I've, I've, I've recently I've recently seen like a, a, a very funny meme. Like there's there's a couple going in a grocery store and they see, they they took, take out something and there's a huge number of labels like gluten free, natural, all homemade, all all uh, healthy and so and and after reading like twenty labels all over this thing and they ask, oh, is it organic? And they don't, they don't see it organic, and they just, they just drop it. Like, nope. <laughs> oh, like... I, I saw another joke about meme joke about about GMOs, Ooh. and it had a picture of pigs and cows and and corn and stuff. And it, it said everything 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 we eat GMOs, <laughs> genetically it's modified. Because yeah, it just depends on the manner of genetic modification. <laughs> but uh, maybe maybe that's how we could improve the the uh, the perception of nuclear power. We can call it gluten free and organic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I would, I would see a restaurant. It's, 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 like, it's made by stars. Exploding. It's, <laughs> it's, it's natural. Yeah. Like, so uh, yeah, that's okay. the thing that I really, uh, this, this, this common little chest in it, like, oh, uh, we have the sun. It's, it's sending all this energy. Let's just cut out the middleman. Like, look, all energy on Earth comes from either a nuclear reaction or, or gravity. <laughs> Tidal heating or tides or you know mm. or, and radio and it's not just although although, just, although even just, although even even the hydropower is still comes from the sun because you evaporate water and then it comes down in the reservoir still yeah yeah like absolutely and then but you also have radioactive decay in the crust that yeah. you know partially uh, does geothermal but so, it's all so why, why don't we cut out the middleman and just use we can't directly harness gravity but it manifests in tides and it manifests in and tidal heating and then also nuclear reactions because yeah but um is, is, people like to say like all like you know enough energy hits the earth in this amount of time to power the entire world for like yeah but it doesn't really matter how much energy is hitting the earth because the, the sun's energy is effectively is effectively unlimited but the means to harness it isn't. And that's, so now it's immediately a question of trade-offs, raw materials, land, where you can, where you can use it. Like what, what, there is one nice, what, one of the nice things about fossil fuels as well as nuclear is that your fuel source, you can mine it in one place, ship it off and use it where it needs to be used. You can't ship sunlight. You can't ship wind. You got to build where it is, and no one's building wind term, uh, turbines. The only, way can, the only way you can ship it is like via like high voltage lines, but then you will also decrease its, its efficiency because you will some you will lose some of its power during the transmission. And right? also, solar produces DC, which has to be inverted. Also, another advantage of thermal solar, I forgot to mention, thermal solar can produce AC, so you don't have inversion losses. Mm. But uh, but yeah, uh, photovoltaics produce DC, which is great to charge. You, you, it's great for charging batteries, but you'll either you'll either be inverting it into the grid directly or inverting it after the battery. So yeah. also, bat also battery storage also loses some of its efficiency because you, you, you cannot store one hundred percent of the energy in batteries, right? So it will it, mm -hmm. and yeah. also and also and also extracting the energy back from batteries will also lose some of its energy too. So it's like no, like like a, like a like a renewable 100 renewable grid on like batteries is like a Rube Goldberg electricity <laughs> grid. Yeah, why, why why are we adding all these extra steps? But, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you all, did you all have a solar power calculator in school? Yeah, I mean yeah. that, that kind of gets back to adapter stuff or for localized stuff to supplement yeah. something because those batteries those, those solar power calculators often had a battery as well. It wasn't just like it only works when there's light. But uh, yeah, like so. It, so, power density is king. It's why nuclear is so effective. It's and it's not just effective yeah. in efficiency, but it's also effective in its use of resources, including the human cost. Yeah. Power, but, power, but, power density is. Not, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. But one thing that I really gets me is people are like we're just gonna make everything 100 percent renewable. Like you are not going to have at least for any time soon maritime shipping or air travel be powered by batteries yeah. it takes up way too much space it takes up way too much weight you're gonna, you're gonna need either a nuclear powered ship and there are like prototype nuclear kind of like unconventional nuclear reactors kind of like what are used in satellites for to power planes but likely you'll need hydrogen yeah Hyd hydrogen and nuclear because unlike personal transport and unlike being connected to the grid like you know rail systems Sp uh, volume and weight are much more critical factors there, and batteries just can't cut it unless yeah. unless you're. And it, even going with like the like, you know Tesla's new semi truck, but they didn't disclose the weight of it empty because 
you need uh, it, it's spec it's speculated that the battery is going to be a couple thousand pounds wow. <laughs> and, and and it's important to remember that at least in the u.s and I, i'm assuming there's something similar in the netherlands there are dot restrict weight restrictions for any kind of transport and that no, uh, with a standard three axle tractor trailer, it's eighty thousand pounds. So, and if it's in a, every amount of weight you add that isn't cargo, is money you're losing, and also potentially more trips. Yeah. So, I, I, I expect that the, that, the, that the air travel will be the last technology to be decarbonized yeah. because because like liquid fuel from fossil fuels is is really the best thing you can have for for a plane to power a plane right so or, or you or you need like a very efficient way to generate or to make synthetic fuel from natural like uh, renewable resources well even even if we got another reason why batteries aren't are are not long for air travel is let's say even if we got power density of lithium ion batteries to be comparable to jet fuel most of the jet fuel is stored in the wings wings need to be flexible You can't put solid batteries in yeah. there, which you know, because they they have to be tear resistant. They also be able to they have to be able to flex, and so it's it, so you're going to give up cargo space, yeah. and yeah. it's. Uh... <laughs> well, speaking of, of car driving cars, can what can nuclear power be used to power cars? Is, is it always going to be fossil fuels or, or batteries like Tesla? You can have small scale, like so satellites, they basically are powered by radioactive decay batteries. And like, it's like the, the, the yeah. But, so the, uh, the, that, the TRGs, right? TRGs is called. Yeah. And so that's a possibility. I don't think it's a, a, a good use of the resources. Um, It also would make proliferation like a huge like oh we just got all these hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of cars yeah. all with nuclear fuel in them. Also, you could also make the argument to you like everyone has like uh, liquid uh, propane in their car or, or like liquid fuel in the cars and they can use it to make Molotovs basically. Like uh, it's also <laughs> also oh, you can yeah I, you I can also use the argument. <laughs> I'm interested more. So uh, hydrogen is the most power dense by mass of any of all yeah. the fuels after uh, other, other than uranium, which isn't really, it's not a fuel you burn, but of the combustible fuels, hydrogen is the most uh, power dense. The problem is of the health hazards, either it's flammable or it has to be stored in, uh, in a cryogenic state, which cr creates problems too. Yeah. Um, but also, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very, very difficult to store it. Also it's, it's not the liquid in, in its natural or it's, most of, like in the in the in our atmospheric pressure yeah yeah i mean so we had a hydrogen storage tank uh we're on at the cryogenic distillation plant because we had to use hydrogen we combusted hydrogen to free the last few traces amount of oxygen from our argon stream because because the boiling point of oxygen to argon are actually very similar so distillation is usually not enough unless you have a much more uh extensive distillation column which isn't always worth it depending on the scale of your production and yeah. so that's what we uh so we had a hydrogen storage tank and we get regular deli regular deliveries and it's a it's a it's a double walled tank because and but it has to have a vent on it like the hydrogen will just be venting off constantly so it, but the, the, there have been like ex there's exploration and there's two problem uh, obstacles that hydrogen needs to to meet one is the primary way by which we in produce industrial hydrogen is steam reformation of methane which does produce co2 mm -hmm. And you, you basically produce, uh, you produce, if I remember correctly, you produce one mole of CO2 for every three moles of hydrogen, of diatomic hydrogen, which is, so it isn't terribly polluting, but combusting hydrogen produces no CO2. So it just produces water. Uh, so, but there are advances in electrolyzers. If electrolyzers can become efficient enough where we can just vaporize water or, or, or not vaporize water, but we can separate hydrogen and oxygen in an energy efficient way with mostly clean energy, that can be the hydrogen storage but then the other yeah. the other issue is the hazards so there's advances in like you know if hydrogen cells which suspends it in platinum or palladium but those are rare earths so you know they're not rare earths but they're the supply of them is not great where i don't think you could really scale it to automobiles or anything uh but there's also like trying to jelly it kind of like um napalm where it's less volatile like where so it still it can burn but it doesn't just spontaneously ignite yeah. uh, like it can. If I, if, I, if, I, if I were to imagine an ideal future, it's like where, like everybody just, just uses like uh, electric rails, like uh, which, which goes through everywhere. Like, like basically everyone rides a train, nobody uses a car anymore because cars will be obsolete. 
Right. But of course, this is, this is a very different future, for very, very distant. That I don't think I will be able to see my I think, life. I think, I think for personal transport that would work, you would still need like trucks for deliveries yeah. and stuff yeah, like that. I well, actually, no, that, that, maybe not necessarily because you could, you could have drone deliveries. Maybe. <laughs> well, you saw, you did, well, you're going to have freight level drones. I don't know. Yeah, it's I, like a I, drone carrying an ISO container. Well, that reminds <laughs> me of a video I, I, I saw somebody said one time. They, they, the difference between Europe and America and stuff, other countries is they, they said in, a, in Europe, the car was built around the city, and in America, the city was built around the car. Well, I don't know how accurate the first statement is, but the second one is absolutely accurate. Urban sprawl is a big, is a big thing that, because we have so much more space per person that Europe does, and I mean, that also is one of the main reasons why it's difficult to integrate uh, uh, public transportation in city in, in in U.S. cities because they're just more spread out. Yeah. Like a, like, like a like a like a, 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 a an American integrated rail system like like the one that Europe has, or at least my country also has like a like a very like with, with trains you can get anywhere in the Netherlands, but in the, in America it would be very difficult to do. I remember when I was looking at colleges on the East coast, I, I looked in Baltimore and then I was like, I'm going to go look, check out schools in Boston. I just took the train and it took so long and it was like, I should have just, I could have just driven or flown for mm -hmm. about the same price. I also, but, like, like, the car is also, also faster here in the Netherlands. Although train is maybe more reliable because you have traffic with cars. So yeah, that's true. Still, that's that's yeah. very true. And I mean, it's easier to it's it's easier to add cars to a train when there's rush hour than it is to add lanes to a road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't have I, I don't have any personal opposition to public transportation. It's just that the mm. U.S. is much more spread out, so it's a bit more costly. But also, local governments are always like, you know, helping. Like, you know, there's corruption. That like the thing in California is a complete boondoggle. High, they're supposed to have high speed rail from LA to San Francisco. Now they scaled it back from m m like Monset to Bakersfield, and it's and it's ten years later, and it's not even close to complete. And it's just, I don't trust it to be properly implemented in the U.S. There's there, there's uh, not that it couldn't be properly implemented. Yeah. So I, I I think it would be a I think it would be a project that, that takes like a century or maybe even more. So speaking of, uh, to have, to have like a, a, a like a rail system that goes from the east coast to the west coast, even. Yeah, I've seen like the ones where there's a big one that goes along the west coast, along the east coast, and then like basically along the Gulf Coast, and then from I think L.A. to New York, one that kind of loops around the Great Lakes, so you can, you're essentially connecting Detroit, Chicago, you mm -hmm. know, Boston, New York, kind of thing. I've seen those, and I think one also might go down kind of like along the Mississippi, connecting Chicago to Houston. Yeah, I think most of the trains I see now, at least in my area, are more are more cargo trains than passenger trains now. Well, that I mean, yeah, because uh, it, it's all about the ISO container. The ISO container is one of the best inventions in the 20th century. Like it almost, it might rival the trans, uh, the the uh, not the trans, the, the transmitter, uh, because it greatly reduced the cost of transport and trade. And it's you can take it from the the, the cargo ship to the train to the semi and deliver it right to the guy, and you don't <laughs> and, and there's and you just track what's in what and ISO containers are awesome, but uh, yeah, personal like trains are just too slow, and like, I think that's what it is. Like Americans are just like, well, you know, I, I my take my train ticket from Baltimore to Boston was like I think one hundred and fifty dollars or something. I was like, I could have probably flown that. So, like, it, so, so there's it? a, but I did it because I was like, you know, I'm not really in a hurry, and I've never been on it. I've never taken a, okay. a, a cross state train ride. This might be like a charming thing, and it, it was all right. But I mean, so why is it? I'll say, I'll say, more popular, but more used, like in like Jap in Japan or China or, or Europe. One, they're very more popular. Popular. I, I, this is what I think. Uh, the, 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 the population density is a big reason one, and they also they got into it early. So people are, you know, they're accustomed to it. They they have efficient systems. They're on time. They're so on. They're they're so more likely to be on time that some of the train companies in Japan, where if there is a delay, they will give you an officiated like or you know a notarized note from the company 
to explain why you relate to work. <laughs> like they, 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 they it, it's just a well developed and well established thing. Whereas in the U S we ne- like ever since uh, the co- the automobile became prominent in the fifties when er- almost everybody can, uh, could afford one urban sprawl happened. And now we're just kind of in this uh, hole as it were, where you just don't want to, it's difficult to transition away, but people are increasingly moving into cities you know, not not just like the cities are growing faster than the rural areas, but people are increasingly moving into the cities and the metropolitan areas. So, I think there's definitely potential there. Yeah, my city, my the, the city, the, the county where I live in has like a big exclusive bus network of buses everywhere. Buses are cool. Uh, but the buses. The, the problem with buses is that um, they can interfere with traffic. Like you don't want to. Like, it, I, what I think would really help traffic is Americans need to embrace the roundabout uh, <laughs> and, I, 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 and, yeah. and to a lesser extent, the double dime, diamond interchange. They're building a few of them down, down in the, the South. U-Bahn. The U-Bahn. <laughs> the, the U-Bahn? I'm not familiar. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's a different, a different thing, maybe. What is know. the U-Bahn? I'm not I, think, I, think it's a, I think it's a ger- the German word for roundabout, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. Okay, because uh, yeah, roundabouts are great. I love roundabouts, yeah. and I mean, so they they help with traffic flow. They reduce accidents, and when accidents do happen, they're less severe because they're not head-ons or T-bones. They're glancing blows. They're at lower speeds, or, or they're either glancing blows or or rear ends, but they're at lower speeds. And like, so the, the part of the problem is that nobody like some Americans just aren't used to it, so they get confused by it. But also. You know, local politicians don't want to have to pay <laughs> pay to upgrade. Like, ah, stop sign will work. So, uh, stop, uh, it, it, sounds, it sounds like a joke. Americans are not used but they're used to this complicated thing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like an insult. Oh, yeah. feel, feel free to insult Americans. Yeah. Americans are, yeah. are very, Americans are they they want all sorts of things from their political systems, but they they refuse to engage with them. <laughs> so they, then they wonder why all this corruption happens. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, mm-hmm. it's a big mess, and I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I've heard about round. I've heard about r- roundabouts. I mean, we're, the di- uh, that diamond things are newer. So are the double diamond, newer. the double diamond interchange addresses a different issue. So one of the bigger issues, in, especially during rush hour, is that on ramps and off ramps get crowded at where well, you, you know you, you get off the highway and then you're waiting at the light. To turn left or right or whatever, but you're but you're waiting. So during rush hour, that traffic actually builds up into the into the interstate, and rush hour also builds up on a, on the afro as well. So the idea is to get more throughput at those interchanges. And what the double diamond interchange does is that when you get t- towards if you're on the overpass part, you actually switch lanes or switch the side. So the right on the right the right let, let's say northbound versus southbound. You're approaching going northbound. The northbound lane you'll go through an intersection prior to the overpass. And now the northbound lane is on the left side. So if you're going to turn left to get on the highway going e- uh, west, you don't have to wait for cross traffic from, from southbound. So it reduces collisions there. And combine that with, you know, spill lanes are a thing everywhere. And uh, so it, it's ma- it mainly reduces collisions. It doesn't have a huge, it has a small impact also on throughput, but by reducing collisions and, and, it uh, it well collisions obviously slow things down too, and pe- and pe- and people are who are wary of collisions. They're going to be um, more conservative in when they choose to turn as well, and or when they choose to merge. So double diamond interchanges are pretty new to the U.S. They're, they're um, there's some other kooky ones I've seen that are almost like a kaleidoscope kind of weird interchange of the highway that theoretically is you know two three times better but it's just like that it sound looks like an engineering nightmare and ve- probably very confusing if you're a tourist <laughs> okay yeah if it, i could, I could like we, we have lots of uh, intersections on the highways in my country which we call like if you t- literally translate it we call it the knot point like they are almost like knots in like mm-hmm. a uh in oh, the like the clo- uh, no, no, yeah, not, clo- not, not points we call them clover leaves here but yeah Hmm. I think, I, yeah, I think they, they, they kind of they kind of look like clovers, yes. They kind of look like clovers. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and the problem with clover leaves. leaves, yeah, yeah. And the problem with clover leaves is that, um, like you you come around to merge on to the highway, and there's a very small window to merge, and yeah. in that same window, there are the, the the traffic with whom you with which you'll be merging. Some of them want to get off, 
And if you don't get on, if you don't get onto the highway enough, you're going to go back onto the off ramp. The the on ramp and off ramp are basically on, uh, connected in the same road. You have that very small window. Like so, a big loop. So you're one a big of loop. so the off going or the ongoing oncoming traffic. Oncoming. Uh, the, uh, one of the like it, it, during rush hour, this creates a huge like bottleneck, and it's just awful. And it, so roundabouts at normal intersections, and then double diamond interchanges at the overpasses. It, the key, the key problem is is throughput, and people are. Yeah, that's yeah. And that, that that would help reduce pollution too. Yeah, hey, they, they less, said less, less uh, um, uh, rush hour or not not less rush hour traffic, but uh, less slow traffic. We're just sitting yeah. bumper to bumper, yeah. idling in lane and burning gas. Yeah, the guy that's seen the roundabouts thing said that it would reduce. They don't use traffic lights; they use roundabouts. Well, only traffic lights. well, yes and no. So there's there's roundabouts, traffic's and traffic circles, and it depends on which country you're in because. The GPS will sometimes call it traffic circles, and they'll call it a roundabout. In the UK, at least, and again, maybe it's maybe the US is just the rebel here. Um, in the U- I know in the UK, a traffic circle is actually a set of a, a group of roundabouts, each of which, in between which, you're controlled by traffic lights. Okay. And then here in the US, there's really no distinction because I have yet to see anything like that. I've seen some multi-lane roundabouts in Canada, which are kind of cool too. But the few roundabouts I've seen up here in the northeast, and a few uh, in, in 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 or not or northeast, but northwest as well as the northeast, uh, almost all of them are uncontrolled single lane, which is still great uh, because yeah, I love roundabouts and I want more of them because mm-hmm. I hate commuting and I hate traffic in general. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know if is that distinction one that exists in in the Netherlands, Ness, or, or are uh, they uh, the, the, the what between between the what two? The... Uh, so as I understand it, in the UK, there is a distinction between a roundabout and a traffic circle. In that, a traffic circle is controlled by lights. It's actually a set. It's actually a series of roundabouts in between which are controlled by lights. Where a roundabout is just a circle, one. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think we have like uh, the. The former, like between the traffic lights, we only have like one. Like if you have a roundabout, like a like a circle, there are no, are uh, usually no traffic lights. Well, like well, I, that, I mean. They kind of yield signs or stop signs. Uh, typically, it's a like you yield to the to the traffic in the circle if you're going into the circle, and then because of the the nature of the roundabout is is that everybody goes into the circle turning right, and everybody exits the circle turning right. So that way you've you've eliminated except, except, you, except in the UK. <laughs> oh right, yeah. okay, that's true. So everybody <laughs> enters the circle turning in the same direction, and everybody exits the circle turning in the same direction, uh, whichever uh, direction that your traffic tends to flow. <laughs> but yeah, so that 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 cuts down on collisions. It cuts down on any kind of. I don't know where they're going. I hope they're signaling, like you know, because. If you're waiting for someone to turn left, but maybe they're going to turn left, they're not going to signal, and you, or you got to wait for the light because you're you know, that kind of stuff. Like, like especially um, like America is sometimes you can turn right on um, red, sometimes you can't. Uh, so the, so, do. Yeah, I actually, man. So the default in states is that you can turn right on a red light. However, my experience in New York City, I didn't know this was the case in New York City. Is that the ex- that's the exception where it says. You cannot turn right on a red unless a sign says it's okay. So I first time in New York City, it's like 2 a.m. I missed my turn because it's a bunch of alternating one-way streets. Oh. So I, I turn right to turn around, and I immediately get pulled over, and it's like a $200 ticket. I'm like, uh. In, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, we, like, it's all, like, we don't have that. Like, if, if it's red, you just stop. You, can, you cannot go or t- turn anywhere if it's red. Um. You have, I guess, you're, then you have something in between yellow, uh, red, and green. Uh, yeah, yeah, yellow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So oh, oh, orange, maybe a bit of. An yeah, I, I think. So well, the, it, the intersection where I, I live is you can turn red on on you can turn red, <laughs> red you can turn right on red unless there's unless somebody's crossing the crosswalk. Uh, that is kind of debatable because it's important to remember that pedestrians are you're required to yield the right of way to pedestrians, but. You don't have to wait for them to. I don't think you have to technically legally wait for them to clear the entire crosswalk. <laughs> and like, if a pedestrian just 
oh. goes out. Like if like <laughs> if they don't have the like you know you, it's okay for to, to walk kind of thing. But that, that, that's that's a little murkier. But in Washington, <laughs> Washington State loves its arrow lights. We have right red arrow lights as well as left arrow lights. We have blinking yellow arrow lights, and essentially is you can't. Oh, turn. We, we have we have those all, all over. Like uh, like yeah. so, some, sometimes you go into a lane specifically for one direction. If you wanted to turn right, you go oh. into this lane. And if you want to go straight, you want to go on this lane and you want to go left. Oh yeah, yeah. We, 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 have, we, yeah. Have turn only, we have turn only lanes, but I mean, in like, let's say you're at an intersection where you could turn straight or right. Some of them are uh, red arrow lights. Now, usually a red arrow light is, is kind of weird in that it's like a stoplight, but you're basically, you're coming off the highway or somewhere and you're merging onto another street. And your only option is to turn right, but you still have to yield the traffic. So they don't want to put, they want you to come to a complete stop. They don't want like a, a yellow light for you to just burst through because mm -hmm. I guess yield signs or a yellow light, they'll just, it's too many accidents because <laughs> when there's a yield sign, people aren't, are less likely to, to look. And, very interesting. Uh, Although I, I do, I do have to go almost uh, soon because it's, it's like really okay, late yeah. here now. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, dark, oh, yeah, wrap this up soon. But yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, before before we go, I just want to say one thing about dark lights. When I was learning how to drive back in the in the late nineties, there's this one intersection that really drove me crazy because it was it was it was one of those intersections that had only one light. It was like one two sides were yellow, the other sides two were red, and so I'm kind of partly colorblind. I can never tell which one was which. I'm like, is that the red light or the yellow light? Because instead, you know, instead of going up and down like three lights, you, you can tell the top one, bottom, and middle one. Only one. I'm like, God, is this the yellow one or the red one? I can't fucking tell. You ha you haven't lived until you had a ground level highway you're on the street that you're going. You cross the highway, so you cross the, uh, the first the, the right side of the highway going, and then there's a second stop in between the highway, and then the, then you turn left or go straight to go on. So many accidents. <laughs> Those are controlled intersections now. <laughs> highway 58, hand 14. So, so you guys have anything you want to advertise at your channel before we go? I don't really have a channel, so yeah. I, I, but, uh, I have a channel, not much, but I do have one video. As, as I mentioned before, I do have one video where I express my opinion about nuclear power. So if you want, if you're interested, you can check it out. Cool. Yeah. Just, uh, just, just my, just my, Google my name. It's very, it's very unique. So you'll probably find my channel. Yeah. Hey, link, link, oh. link me, link me that that video in the description. I'll, I'll put in the oh. in the description. I will do. Although there's one thing I want to mention, like I, I have some notes, but there was one thing I want to like to mention about one fun fact. There was one time when uh, Greenpeace like made a pamphlet, but they accidentally put out an, an early draft. And in the early draft that they put out accidentally, it, it says, uh, and I quote, in the 20 years since Chernobyl, since the Chernobyl tra tragedy, the world's worst nuclear accident there have been nearly fill in alarmist and armogenist fact out here. <laughs> what? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That, that, if you, if you that, up, that like, sounds like be... that sounds like it was uh, it was made by fossil fuel companies and fed to them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, like, it came really from them. Like it, they explained it. Like some somebody was making a joke and they. Send it to one person, and they and the one person didn't look at it, at it closely enough, so they send it out basically. So it's oh man, that's a, it's really that weird. Warms, that warms my heart. Yeah, uh, I, I will, I will, I will put in the link in the chat for my video. Give me a minute. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about this, or I mean, I've, I've, yeah. Or, or or something else like I I'm kind of a stats nerd on a couple topics like I'm an econ nerd. Yeah. Uh, I did I did a I like to, I like to about talk about healthcare systems like I don't know well, the whole nature of your channel what you do and don't yeah, like discuss, go, but, I, but. I, I, I thought I thought I thought anything from this political Dr. Seuss Kingdom Hearts okay. I've gone everywhere on the spectrum video games Dog Naropa visual novels I've done it all so. Let's talk about the the legacy of Mega Man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll or, 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 or Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, yeah. So like anytime, anytime you have a topic to talk about, you're always invited on the channel. Yeah, uh, I, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I I was kind of hoping to hear from that guy who I guess was like a pro oil guy. I wanted to see what he had to say, but <laughs> I guess he couldn't make it. All right, well, uh, so. 
you have any you have any closing statements that you you want to any closing statements? Uh, you no one you should not be afraid of nuclear. It's not going to kill you. It's safer than you think. And yeah, if you if you're for renewables, just don't be for solar. Like it's if anything yes. else, <laughs> just don't be for solar. And don't don't be for biomass. Particularly yeah, like bio, biomass is the worst in my opinion. Or at least some form of like the, like biofuels. Like if you like use waste to make alcohol and supplement some alcohol in your like gasoline, maybe. Mm -hmm. But like like if you if if you, if you use wood for like yeah. in power power plants, no, no, it's not a good. Yeah, maybe we, in the future we can do a part two and, and Nesk actually uses notes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like like we, we 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 did cover a lot of the notes that I went uh, that I had, so it's not it's not really a problem. No. Cool. Anyways, as I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm. Bye. If you just do it. Hey. It'll turn out okay. Finally, we're back to the science after the after politics and and radio apps. <laughs> we're back to the thing you all love. <laughs> Glad you didn't bring me on for the politics, because man, I, there's a reason I don't do that on my channel. Neither there's a reason I don't do it either. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, today we're talking about oh, stupid short cord. We're talking about <laughs> short cords, everybody. I hate them. <laughs> today we're talking about dinosaurs, and I figured if the right person asked about dinosaurs, then a dinosaur. Yep, that's me. I'm a dinosaur. Um, I'm Dapper Dinosaur. I feel like probably most of you will know who I am. I know so we have uh, Bent Hovind and Eric Gerthaler who have both appeared on my channel, so they definitely know who I am. In fact, uh, Bent Hovind, no relation, is of course my regular guest host. Uh, we will be doing our next episode of our regular show, Can't With Bent, tomorrow. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I had been on my show a few weeks ago talking about his 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 music career. I know. I was there. That was all. That was a really fun stream. Um, <clears throat> Actually, another person that you had on um, recently will also maybe be joining my stream, although probably not because it's one hundred percent goblin free stream. So, you know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She she sang a Christmas song. <laughs> mm -hmm. But dinosaurs, though. So, what do you what do you want to know about dinosaurs? Well, I guess we, first of all. When did when did we discover that they that they existed? So it's actually kind of a complicated question. Um, there's reason to think that humans have been finding dinosaur bones for millennia, and um, <clears throat> the question then is, well, did they recognize them as dinosaurs the way we do now? And the answer is not really. Um, I mean, they had the idea that these were obviously the bones of creatures that had died. Um, and some of them even recognized that the bones had since turned to stone and that this was not, uh, you know, just a normal bone lying about. Um, but generally speaking, until fairly recently, the idea of extinction wasn't really not a thing that people understood. Um, people generally thought that either <clears throat> the Abrahamic God or various nature deities or just the um, spontaneous generative powers of nature would produce um, organisms such that they didn't always have to reproduce, you know, biologically, and that this would keep essentially all types of creatures populated. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, generally speaking, until the idea of extinction really took hold, which wasn't until the 19th century, um, the idea of extinction didn't really occur to people. So people thought that these were creatures that must still exist somewhere, maybe not where they are, right? Because people recognize that, you know, we don't have the same animals everywhere. So, you know... Um, like say uh, the Romans had menageries and they brought in exotic animals to fight in gladiatorial arenas specifically because they were exotic. So people have known for millennia that not everything exists everywhere, but the idea was if you found a bone, it had to be a thing that's somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know it's not, I'm not dinosaurs, but I heard that, that people used to think that like mammoth or elephant skulls were like cyclops or something. Uh, so that is, so it's not clear how true that legend is, the idea that, because, um, you know, if you look at an elephant skull, there's one very obvious hole right in the center of the face, and it kind of looks like an eye socket. Um, and unlike humans, who being, um, you know, monkeys, basically, uh, 
in common with all other monkeys, humans have, you know, enclosed eye sockets. Whereas most other animals actually, or most other mammals, I should say, don't actually. Most mammals don't actually have a full ring of bone around their eye. They just have little arcs that come up um, essentially from the cheeks. Yeah. I don't want to get too technical. But um, <clears throat> so it does kind of look like a, an eye, but we also don't have any real historical accounts of someone finding a skull, declaring it to be obviously some kind of giant one-eyed man, mm -hmm. and then going with it. Although interestingly, we do have a, an account from, I believe, the 17th century of someone finding, in fact, a dinosaur bone. It was a dinosaur femur. It was the distal end of the femur. And assuming that it was a petrified giant scrotum. Uh. Which it was not. It was, in fact, the distal end of a femur. Uh, but the distal end of a dinosaur femur has these two kind of globular bulges where the, uh, the knee interface is, basically. And so it does kind of look like that. Um, so... You know, but um, <clears throat> when we really start recognizing that dinosaurs are a distinct thing is with the rise of actual paleontology and um, sort of a, an attempt to continue on the systematic classification of mo both modern and ancient organisms that was started by Carolus Linnaeus. And so the big names there would be like, um, well, obviously the biggest one is uh, Sir Richard Owen, although he is... Um, it's kind of a dick, if I'm being honest. For, so Richard Owen was not, not a nice guy, but um, <clears throat> he is probably the person who did the most actual work classifying uh, ancient organisms in a systematic way. Even though he was a bit dishonest, he was still actually very good at, at doing that. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's kind of unfortunate that we had to credit so many taxa from, with him, or for, Sorry, so the description of so many taxa to him, um, because really, I'd rather, I'd rather not be him. But we also can't forget Mary Anning, who was a, an English paleontologist who was tragically underrecognized in her time, but she was the discoverer oh. of a great many, uh, especially marine fossils in but, England. But, along she with, a, oh, oh, sorry. but she was, a, but she was a girl, and we don't, we don't give girls any credit. Uh, so it's, it was two things. One, she was a girl, and two, she was not from a uh, a wealthy or landed family. So even if she had been male, she still would have had an uphill fight, although she probably would have been recognized eventually. Unfortunately, being female, she was not, despite the fact that many of the people who were members of the Royal Society and who were writing papers on paleontology would regularly consult with her. I mean, they would, you know, they would uh, correspond with her via letter or have meetings with her. Um, how exactly was Richard Owen a jerk? Okay, so Richard Owen was a, a jerk in a number of ways. One, um, he was very willing to uh, excoriate people who disagreed with him in uh, fairly harsh for, you know, mid to late 19th century terms uh, in very open publications. Like he would write in newspapers or publications of the, the Royal Society just excoriating people for disagreeing with him. The blogosphere but, of yesteryear. Basically. But the thing was, he was also willing to straight out lie about organisms to make his ideas sound right. So, <clears throat> uh, for instance, he he made up differences between humans and other apes in order to make it seem like humans weren't apes. He just invented parts of ape anatomy that just weren't didn't actually exist. And it's just that for these reasons, humans could be easily separated from apes. Um, he also never really accepted the fact that Archaeopteryx, after it's a specimen with the skull was found, actually had the skull that it did because he had firmly predicted beforehand that it would have a normal bird skull with a beak and, you know, the, the very long premaxilla with the relatively short maxilla and, you know, all that stuff, the, the reduced um, temporal fenestrae, all that stuff. It was like, oh yeah, it'll just be a regular old bird skull. And then they find it and it's basically the most dinosaur skull that's ever been around. So just basically dinosaur. Uh, but he is the one who came up with the word dinosauria. Um, before him, what we now think of as the two main groups of dinosaurs, Ornithischia and Saurischia, were recognized as groups of animals that were fundamentally similar in the same way that like mammals are fundamentally similar in many ways. Um, but he realized that there were in fact uh, various anatomical features that connected both Saurischia and Ornithischia. So he pointed to things like um, <clears throat> uh, the shape of the fourth trochanter on the femur. Um, 
he there were a whole bunch of things like the the perforate or extensively perforate acetabulum, which is the the, the part of the hip where the femur sockets in, um, things like that. Uh, the fused nature of the sacral vertebrae to the, to the um, iliac crests and to each other. So um, he recognized that there were all, a lot of things that united this entire uh, group of organisms. And so he called them terrible lizards, uh, not because they're lizards, uh, but because he knew that they were reptiles because you know, he was a good anatomist. And so um, one of the biggest things that you can use to tell a reptile from, uh, say, a mammal is the number of bones in the jaw. So, yeah, yeah, in a, yeah, speaking of lizard and stuff, you could you could tell, like, the way he, one the like I, I think it's in the park. Some I think it's in the still in the London Park. His, his original versions of what dinosaurs look like. Well, <clears throat> to be fair, those aren't just Richard Owen. Although he probably wouldn't object too much to any of them. Um, but if you go to if you go to or look for uh, pictures of the Crystal Palace Park uh, dinosaurs. Uh, it actually includes animals that aren't dinosaurs. It has some ichthyosaurs and some pterosaurs in there too. But they are, oh, shall we say, wildly inaccurate. Uh, but even then, they actually, they still don't really look like lizards. So if you look at the, um, the iguanodons or the megalosaurs that are in there, those being the first two officially described dinosaurs, megalosaurus and iguanodon, um, they still have upright limb postures and they, they're not sprawling. Um, they are dragging their tails and they're quadrupedal, which we know um, Iguanodon was mostly quadrupedal. It was probably able to run on two legs, but it's a little iffy, but Megalosaurus was definitely not bipedal. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah, those are, those are pretty inaccurate, but um, he, use the word lizard because he definitely knew that they were closer to reptilia. But the other thing is, you know, when you're naming things in um, Greek and Latin, there's only so many words that convey reptile that you can possibly use. And the Greek word that roughly translates to lizard is one that has been used from that time and up until now to just describe broadly reptilian kind of things. Kind, um, of, like, kind of like how like one of the whale ancestors is also a quote, lizard name? Yeah, Basilosaurus. Uh, it's Greek for King Lizard or King of the Lizards. Um, and that's because it was originally misidentified. And it originally, um, when it was found, there was the idea that it might be a Mosasaur. But then more of it was found and everyone was like, oh, no. But that name had already been published. Yeah, and I mean, one of the rules is, once a name is published, unless it's found to not actually be a valid taxon that you're describing, the name sticks. It's there for life. Right. Um, there have, there are some exceptions to that rule, but, um, basically everyone, and I mean, everyone essentially has to forget the name for about 50 years and use a different name. And then the new name can stick, but that has happened very few times. Although one of the most famous times was Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh. Tyrannosaurus Rex original name was not Tyrannosaurus Rex. It was much worse. I don't remember it, but it was lame. And trust me, we're all better off for having it be Tyrannosaurus Rex. And wasn't like one of those things, actually, another one like, like a Microraptor or something like that it had a different name. They thought it was something else. And they think, oh, that's the time, but then the time they discovered it was already named something else. It was too late. Uh, kind of. So Microraptor was named before um, most of the later finds that had the uh, extensive integument structures, which is essentially just, uh, its feathers, because it had very well formed and well developed uh, flight feathers. Um, and so, some previously there had been the prediction that there might have been a four winged stage in bird evolution. Uh, and this was for a number of reasons. One is that, um, actually, the biggest reason is that uh, if you look at a bird's feet, you know those, those scales that are on there? Those are actually stunted feathers. They're feathers that basically just don't grow right. But certain mutations can actually get those feathers to grow back. And um, that was a common mutation that people liked to encourage in pigeon breeding because, you know, it made, or also in chickens too. And in both cases, it made, you know, fluffy footed birds. But the interesting thing was the, the feathers, while they didn't really form a wing, they were asymmetrical like the flight feathers on the actual wings were. And so since by this time we'd already noticed that there was some develop, there were things like atavisms and um, ontogenetic similarities to the actual evolutionary timescale, 
uh, or not time scale, but uh, development of organisms. That ontolog while ontology didn't recapitulate phylogeny, they were related. You could reconstruct aspects of phylogeny through ontology. So um, those things together made people think that maybe there was a four-winged ancestor to modern birds. And uh, it, the initial animal was proposed and called Tetrapteryx as a hypothetical, which means four wings. Unfortunately, it would have been nice if we could have called Microraptor Tetrapteryx, but when it was found, it was just an un at the time relatively unremarkable small veloc Velociraptorian uh, dromaeosaur, and so no one really knew that it was so spectacularly feathered and in fact had four wings. So, oh well. Also, the, the, off topic and stuff, but then, then or, or trying to describe, but then like calling it terrible lizard. I guess it made like some creations, like like your like one of your favorites, like Kent Kent Hovind, mm -hmm. like think that 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 lizards actually grew up to be dinosaurs. Yeah, it's okay. So the only way to think that dinosaurs are lizards is to know nothing about either group. Um. You really, you, you just, it's its really, really wrong. Uh, so the number of skeletal differences between lizards and dinosaurs is almost too normal to count. I mean, you can start at one end of the animal and work your way to the other end, and you won't, you will just keep finding things. Like the um, lizards actually close off the, Oh, I want to say it's the superior temporal fenestra, but I'm, it might actually be the inferior, and I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, they have a a parietal foramen. Um, they entirely lack a uh, antorbital foramen. I mean, they have pleurodont rather than thecodont teeth. Um, there are characteristics of the uh, occipital condyle in dinosaurs that don't occur in lizards. Uh, lizards have sprawling limbs, whereas dinosaurs have, you know, the uh, the upright limb posture more similar to mammals, at least superficially. Um, the acetabulum of lizards isn't uh, perforate. They entirely lack a caudal femoralis longus muscle and the attendant fourth row canter on a femur. Uh, they have different numbers of toes. <laughs> I mean, it's virtually everything about a dinosaur is different from everything about a lizard. There is virtually no similarity between them. They are about as different as any two animals could be while both still being reptiles. It's just n not the case that anyone who knows anything about lizards could confuse the two, which is one of the reasons why Richard Owen created a new classification. He could have just said, oh, they're just lizards and put them into the already existing lizard taxon, but he didn't. And he didn't for good reason because they're not lizards. Uh, so, so at least he knew that much, I guess. <laughs> oh, Richard Owen was a genius. I mean, he was a very, very smart. I, 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 I would say, say knew that much. I mean, at least he knew that much to like separate them at least a little bit. Oh, actually, he separated them fairly, fairly significantly. Um, the 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 category of archosaurs was still not really well understood at the time, but he definitely had them as their their own entire um, order inside. Uh, the class reptilia. So he, the only connection he would draw between lizards and uh, and dinosaurs was they were both reptiles, and that's as far as he would go. And of course, you got to remember that at this time, uh, everyone was still very much using just the Linnaean uh, taxa. People weren't even really doing like super family and subclass and what. Yeah, it was still things. the basic seven, not not the three hundred we have today. Uh, well, at this point now, most. Um, most taxonomists are just basically being like that. There's no point in worrying about whether something's an order or family or, or whatever. We'll just give, we have clades and we give them names and who cares what the quote unquote rank is. Cause the ranks are fundamentally arbitrary. There's no reason to say that this is a family and that's a super family. I mean, you could just say they're all one family. And then what used to be a family is now a subfamily. In fact, that happened recently with um, Gekonidae. So it used to be that uh, Gekonidae included the uh, Gekoninae and um, Eublepharinae. But now Gekoda is now a superfamily. This happened in like the last couple of years. And Eublepharidae and Gekoda, uh, Gekonidae are now different families. And like 
I just found that out recently and I was like, well, that's new. Thanks for changing everything guys. Yeah. Especially when I guess when what we thought was two similar fa two side by side families were actually a family inside of a family. <laughs> well, well, yeah, it's, but the thing is, what is a family? It's, it's just a group of similar genus, or actually, you can say it's a group of similar subfamilies. What's a subfamily? It's yeah. a group of similar uh, genera. Yeah. It's a genus. It's a group of similar species. Up until down until species, there's no actual definition. You can just call whatever group, whatever rank that you want. Like there's, as long as you keep the nested hierarchy with the same shape of nesting that is actually borne out by the data, what rank you put a particular clade at is meaningless. So. Hi, Maya. Okay, Kenny Hornickson has says on a question, and I would like an honest answer. Do dinosaurs disprove the Bible? I don't. I don't think so. Well, I mean, they certainly just. There are certainly some interpretations of the Bible that are incompatible with the evidence that we get from paleontology, geology, <coughs> bio, biogeography, uh, all, essentially yeah. most of science. But, the, but actually, uh, sorry, sorry, I interrupted you fast, but being a dinosaur in the Bible, you know, you know how they say dinosaurs were on the ark and they're in the flood? At least, uh -huh. least Ken Ham does. Well, if you imagine the flood was a real thing, right? Mm -hmm. Pretend it was real. Okay. Um, in the, in the, uh, one of the things, well, in the chapter, I what chapter it was, but you know how Noah released a, a dove to find the olive branch thing? Yep, and he released but, a raven too. Yep, dove, dove and ravens are birds, birds are dinosaurs, so dinosaurs were on the ark. Yeah, I mean, that that is true. The story does actually name two dinosaur species as being on the ark. But yeah, um, so paleontology just kind of wrecks the entire flood narrative as a real thing. In fact, it's not the only thing it does. Um, basically, all of reality says that, no, there was never a, a giant flood that covered the entire Earth. Um, but you don't have to interpret the Bible in a way that requires that to have been a literal event. And in fact, most Christians don't. Most Christians do not believe that there was a literal flood of Noah, at least not in the sense of a global deluge that covered the entire Earth. Because Maybe just, that's a it, local area thing. Maybe. They I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of different interpretations that you can go with that are reasonably consistent with um, Christianity or Judaism, besides the or Islam for that matter, since uh, Islam tends to share a lot of those stories, including uh, Noah. All right. So back to the animals again. Uh, so we, I, I guess, dinosaurs' journey start back in the thing where they split from us in the amniote division. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> the most recent common ancestor between dinosaurs and, say, mammals would, in fact, be the common ancestor of all of amniota. Um, and so the, the biggest split in amniota is between uh, sauropsida on one side and synapsids on the other side. And uh, sauropsida is more or less what we now would call reptiles. Um, it, it's funny. For the longest time, I, th I thought the split was, was synapsis and diapsis, but diapsis are, technically aren't. Uh, clade until later on. Yeah, so one of the problems there is that um, we have these groups that were called anapsids and uriapsids. And um, it wasn't clear for a while, just because we didn't have enough data, um, exactly how they were related to other amniotes. And it turns out that they actually nest closer to diapsids than any of them do to synapsids. And also, many of the animals that we thought formed clades, like uh, anapsida or uriapsida, don't actually form clades. They're actually essentially uh, sauropsids with varying and convergently uh, evolved skull conditions. So uh, basically, a whole bunch of animals that we thought were basal to the um, reptile mammal split, or might have been on one side or the other, actually ended up being on the reptile side. And that ends up being sauropsida. But um, dinosaurs are, in fact, also diapsids, which means that they characteristically have two holes uh, behind the eyeballs that are used primarily for jaw muscle attachment. Um, and then within diapsids, the major divide, and this is, I'm skipping over a whole bunch of intermediary yeah. obscure clades, 
but basically the big divide is between archosaurs and lepidosaurs. On the lepidosaur side, we have things like um, uh, lizards, um, uh, sphenodons, um, snakes. Uh, well, snakes are lizards. Yeah. Um, we've also got some things like um, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. Uh, no, plesiosaurs are actually closer to the archosaur side. Ah, those have been new today. Yep. Well, at least that's the current. Con that's generally the current consensus. It's a. It's still a bit of an open question, but uh, there's a, a fair few things that push them towards the archosaur side. One of them just being the, um, so uh, plesiosaurs are actually stem turtles. They're actually close, more closely related to turtles than any other living thing. And most genetic studies are recovering turtles as closer to archosaurs than lepidosaurs. Uh, and also um, another big one is that like archosauromorphs before mm -hmm. them, uh, plesiosaurs have thecodont teeth, which means the teeth are set in sockets. So like unlike uh, lepidosaur teeth, which were generally pleurodire. Yeah, I, I remember when people uh, th th thought people thought that turtles were a whole. Were they used to think that turtles were the anapsid branch or something? Yeah, it turns out nope. Turtles are in fact diapsids that um, have convergently lost the um, the two temporal fenestrae. Kind of like kind of like how we did almost. <laughs> Well, kind of. So your zygomatic arch is essentially made of this. It is, in fact, made of the same bones that the uh, uh, temporal fenestra of synapsids was made of. It just it doesn't open into an interior cavity of the skull. Uh, instead, uh, it's it's sort of like that opening has been kind of like shoved sideways. And yeah, it's a it's a bit weird. But uh, what are you gonna do? Uh, yeah. So then, so, yeah, Archosaurus splits primarily into Pseudosuchia and um, Avometatarsalia, with dinosaurs being on the Avometatarsalian side, and, um, and it, crocodiles and alligators and their relatives on the other side. And then from there, pterosaurs branch off and yeah, dinosaurs split, branch off. Yeah, they split off the pterosaurs next, and like, and they like they they got to the air first. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, after insects. Oh yeah, but they were the first. Uh, they were the first vertebrates to fly. Um, next, of course, being dinosaurs, in the form of birds and uh, various relatives of birds, and then finally the mammals got into the uh, bunch sometime in the late Cretaceous. Like we, we like we like late 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 comers. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> to be fair, birds didn't really start to dominate until it sort of. There's no middle Cretaceous, but like. You know what I mean when I say like in the middle of the Cretaceous. It's not a formal period, but like you know, late early to early late Cretaceous. <laughs> That's really when the birds really start dominating the skies. And um, one of the reasons, though, that bats managed to do so well because you got to remember bats are one of the most successful groups of mammals. There are bats on uh, every, essentially every continent uh, except Antarctica. They're on almost every island. Uh, in some islands, until humans got there, they were basically the only mammals. Um, and so they're, but they're so successful because they're primarily um, nocturnal, whereas birds are primarily diurnal. And this is actually a, a pretty long-standing split between uh, mammal and dinosaur behavior. For most of Earth's history, that since it's had both mammals and dinosaurs, dinosaurs were much more dominant during the day, and mammals were much more prominent during the nighttime. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why um, dinosaurs. Well, modern birds, even ones that don't really need it, all tend to have pretty good color vision, whereas most mammals either have no color vision or are dichromats like dogs. Yeah, I, we mentioned this a few a few months ago during the the Paleozoic insect race episode, but both uh, pterosaurs, dinosaur birds, and and bat mammals had to had to modify their arms to become wings for the insects didn't have that issue. At least most of them didn't. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> with evolution, you're always kind of stuck with whatever your ancestors had and you have to do something with it. Um, and even in cases where it looks like we're evolving entirely new structures, like arms and legs out of like a, a wormy body, if you actually look uh, into the genes and the embryology and whatnot, you'll actually find that the beginnings of arms are already present in the genetic structure of very primitive um chordates like um, amphioxus and things like that. And so you really are stuck with whatever your ancestors had. And so when it comes to uh, tetrapods, it's like, okay, well, what are you going to fly with? 
While some lizards have managed to do a little bit of gliding by flattening out their rib cage, but that's not really going to get you power flight because there aren't a whole lot of strong muscles attached there. You could try using your legs, but then the more specialized legs get for locomotion, the worse they are at locomoting on the ground. And that's pretty important to be able to move around on the ground. You don't have to be great at it necessarily, but you've got to be at least competent at it. And so <clears throat> basically that leaves, well, I guess the forearms. And so um, what, it's, it's one of those things where like there really isn't another option. But one of the interesting things is that the way that every tetrapod group that has evolved flight has done it has been wildly different. So uh, in all cases, it uses the fingers as a big supporting part of whatever the flight surface is. But in pterosaurs, we're using uh, digit four, your ring finger. Some people call it a pinky finger, but pterosaurs don't actually have that many fingers. So, uh, and it's hugely elongating it and making this really complex uh, system of intercrossing uh, supportive tissues and collagen fibers and muscles and really um, quite a complicated membrane, all just hanging off of one finger and then uh, still using those limbs for locomotion on the ground, which is why the um, sort of the proximal end of that finger remains really robust and the hand itself, like the metacarpals and whatnot, still remain pretty solid part of the, uh, the animal's anatomy. It's because that was weight bearing. And it's also, they were taking off primarily with their forelimbs. They weren't jumping with their legs like birds are. And then you get bats who do a four limbed takeoff and they have each finger has a patagium, which is relatively simple compared to a pterosaurs, but you know, they, they're stretching it up between all the fingers. And then dinosaurs having already evolved feathers use them for the airfoil. And then to help keep the airfoil relatively stable, they fuse the fingers into a nice solid clubby hand thing. And so that's this kind of conversion evolution where we, we all have a different, pro we all have the same problem to solve. And so we come to superficially similar answers, but because evolution is contingent and not repeatable and doesn't have foresight, the actual end is always different. Oh, uh, also off topic. Um, where did your channel's protector Godzilla branch off from? So I'm actually going to go a bit uh, controversial with this one, although I do happen to know that Aaron Ra tends to agree with me on this one. Um, <clears throat> I actually think that Godzilla is probably a therapsid, which is a relatively derived member of uh, the synapsids, which means he's actually much closer to a mammal. And I base this off the fact that um, he seems to have uh, heterodont teeth. So he tends to have like canine teeth and incisors, and then some kind of post canine teeth. I, they're not really differentiated into like uh, premolars or molars, but like they're not the same as the incisors or the canines. He also tends to have ears in a lot of incarnations. Like um, yesterday I saw um, Godzilla 2000, the first of the Millennium series uh, Godzilla films. And he has very prominent ears in that. But even if you go back into most of his Showa incarnations, especially Shodai Goji, the, uh, the Godzilla suit in the first Godzilla movie, you get little ears poking out. Um, and then in, um, in the Millennium series uh, about Mechagodzilla, the Kiryu saga, starting with um, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, you actually do see a skull of Godzilla, which is supposed to be the skull of the original Godzilla, even though the sizes don't match up between those movies. But, you, you know, we'll retcon that a little bit. But in that, you actually see that um, Godzilla has the characteristic dentary squamosal jaw joint rather than in a, a um, articular quadrate jaw joint like most reptiles do. And basically the only things that have a dentary squamosal jaw joint are very derived therapsids. So very close to mammals. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say that um, Godzilla is much more mammal than he is any kind of reptile as he's portrayed in most of his depictions in the Japanese uh, Godzilla movies. Now, um, if you go to Shin Godzilla, who knows? It's a crazy fish monster radiation thing that evolves constantly. So, I mean, all bets are off with, with um, Shin Godzilla. But if you go to the American uh, Godzilla from Godzilla 2014 and Godzilla, uh, King of the Monsters, the, um, the legendary MonsterVerse Godzilla, they actually have produced um, skeletal drawings. And in that, he actually looks much more like an archosaur. Yeah. Um, but his feet don't work like a dinosaur's foot. They actually work much more like um, 
like a Poposaur or something like that. So much more of a, a pseudo Sukian. So I think the Godzilla from the MonsterVerse is probably some kind of pseudo Sukian with um, very derived feet in order to help it stand. Yeah. But you look at that skull and it's very classical basal archosaur. And is it true that no one talks about the 98 version? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> um, Eric says, did dinosaurs roar? Uh, the research I did indicated no. Yeah, probably not. Uh, so roars are a very distinct uh, mammal sound, and the mammal hyoid bone is relatively uh, strange in order to accommodate it in the animals that do roar. Um, I'm sure that dinosaurs made threatening calls that were easily audible to their rivals. Um, but it's probably much more like the sounds that you're getting from birds or alligators. So you could probably get hisses, uh, screeches, uh, tweets, rumbles, maybe some tweets. Yeah. I mean, tweets are usually not a threatening behavior. They're usually um, a social interaction thing, often a, um, a mate seeking behavior. So if we're talking about like um, territorial, like sounds to establish territory or to threaten rivals, uh, that probably would have been much more to do with things like um, deep rumbling, sort of an infrasound sort of thing that you got going there, or sort of screeches like you might get in um, like an angry bird who's not happy with you. Um, Anyways, so, speaking of di uh, di dinosaurs and mammals, before we get to the actual cl clade, there's the, uh, there's these things called like Dino forms and, and dino morphs, dinosaur morphs, dinosaur forms. Yeah, so those are basically organisms that are closer to dinosaurs than they are to anything else. And if most people were to see one, they would simply declare that it's a dinosaur because for most practical purposes, you, you couldn't really tell the difference. Um, in fact, if you were to time travel back to the late Permian, and look at the actual dinosaurs like Coelophysis and dinosaur morphs uh, like, um, well, I can't say Ligurpiton anymore because that's not, uh, so I guess I'll go Lagosuchus. So in case you didn't know, Ligurpiton was recently um, discovered to in fact not be a stem dinosaur, but to in fact be a, uh, a stem, sorry, well, a dinosaur morph, but actually to be a on the, the pterosaur side of the split. So it's actually a closer relative of pterosaurs and dinosaurs. So, but anyway, we'll go with like Lagosuchus or something like that and you were to look at those two animals, you wouldn't readily be able to say that they're completely distinct, and this is totally not a dinosaur, and this one totally is. And that's because at the time, actual dinosaurs were barely distinguishable from uh, their not-quite-dinosaur relatives, which is how this is sort of the thing you expect with evolution, right? As time goes forward, things get more and more distinct because they uh, diverge more and more because they're no longer mixing their genes. Yeah, yeah Eric brought that up, too, when we are talking about the primate primate migration that that the primate the, the clay between primates and primate morphs was like, like very blurry mm -hmm. yeah it always is when you get down to the base of these trees it's like um i remember I, i've read some things about people who do uh parasodactyl research in the very early um eras where parasodactyls are first diverging away from artiodactyls and um it's very frustrating because basically only tiny differences in the shapes of the molars can be used to distinguish rhinoceroses from horses. And I'm, I'm using these terms kind of loosely, like equids from rhinoceroids. Rhinocero I think that's the right word, whatever. Uh, actually, there's rhinoceroidia, so rhinoceroids. So, but yeah, it's very tiny. If you look at the whole animal, basically at the time, a horse and a rhino would basically just be the same thing. They're just eating a slightly different diet. And the same thing is true for the earliest probos proboscids, like, uh, you know, the elephants. And uh, the early Serenians, or you know, the dugongs and manatees and whatnot, their very earliest members are almost indistinguishable. Um, how disappointed are you that we don't really know how dinosaurs sounded or how they socialized? Um, I mean, it would certainly be great to know, but it's one of those things where I'm happy with how much we're learning right now, and so I am. I tend to focus on the new stuff that we're learning, and not so much the stuff that would be cool, but it's not like that we're going to find out anytime soon. Um, and uh, so I'm not, I, I can't say I'm disappointed. I would be excited if we found stuff about that. Oh, and we do actually have some socialization information. Like we have a uh, collective nests and um, we have track ways to indicate herding behavior in certain, um, certain organisms. 
So we know a little bit. Uh, and also, of course, it's not clear how much we can generalize bird vocalizations into dinosauria, but it's, it's something, right? At least some non-avian dinosaurs probably had vocalizations that were more or less like birds. And um, of course, the other thing is we also don't know much about the early vocalizations of Pseudosuchians. So the other template that we have are alligators and crocodiles and caimans and, you know, gharials and whatnot. Um, but we're not sure, are, are their vocal structures more derived or more basal compared to those of birds? And the answer is, I don't know. It's probably less derived than birds because bird syrinxes, which is what they used to vocalize, are very, very unusual as if you survey, you know, tetrapods in general, whereas alligators and, and crocodiles, not so much. But that could be a thing that was uh, sort of a it convergently went to a more basal seeming condition, like maybe. So um, the chances are that most dinosaurs had a sort of cross between you know, crocodile type sounds and then a little bit on the, the birdie side, but probably not as complicated as actual modern birds could do. Like they probably couldn't be singing a, a really complicated song like, you know, modern passerine songbirds. Yeah. Uh, but uh, off topic, but Eric's question made a good point of, of the past dinosaurs thing where people used to think dinosaur in the past where people used to think dinosaurs were totally different than what they really are. I, I, I used to books from the 80s where they, they talk about that dinosaurs were, like, were, were slow and stuff. And also Jurassic Park, you know, made dinosaurs more famous, I guess, but they also brought up a, little, a lot of misconceptions about dinosaurs too. Yeah. Well, I want to. So, real quick, I'll just answer this question that's on screen here. Uh, T. Rex will almost certainly win. Uh, I usually give it to the higher mass dinosaur, but um, Spinosaurus jaws were not for fighting large land animals. So, um, whereas T. Rex jaws were. So, normally, I would say whatever animal had the higher mass is just probably going to win. Uh, but this is one of the few exceptions. Uh, T. Rex is probably going to win against Spinosaurus. Sorry, Jurassic Park three. But um, I'm sorry. What was your question earlier? Oh, but like how books and movies and stuff. Oh, like right, right, right. So um, around the 80s, uh, there's this animal called um, Deinonychus is uncovered. And it's actually the animal that the Velociraptors are based on in Jurassic Park. Um, Deinonychus is just not as cool a name as Velociraptor. But if you actually look at the Velociraptors, or sorry, the Deinonychus skeleton, it's much more similar to the animals in Jurassic Park than a Velociraptor's uh, skeleton is. Um, and so they're basically just scaled up Deinonychus. But um, <clears throat> it was, the, the people who, who discovered it just looked at the skeleton and it was this very leggy animal. And in particular, it had very long metatarsal bones. And those are the bones that go from your heel to the, to the base of your toes and run along the length of your foot kind of. And, um, one of the things that you can do in modern animals that walk on their toes is called digitigrade is the longer the metatarsals are compared to the, uh, the fibula and the tibia or the tibula, if you're Nephilim free, who doesn't know anatomy well enough to not know that there's tibula isn't a thing. Um, so the shorter the, the tibia and the, and the fibula are compared to the metatarsals, which are then longer, um, the more likely it is that this is an animal that can sprint really fast. And so, <clears throat> uh, Velociraptor had the proportions of a sprinter. Like this was not a slow, um, this was not a slow plodding lizard-like animal. And it had these uh, front claws that were great for grasping and clutching and bringing prey into the chest. And it was very clear that this was an active animal that was running around Mongolia. Or not Mongolia, sorry, Deinonychus is, I'm still thinking Velociraptor, Deinonychus is North America. So running around North America, which is another reason why, they, by the way, they find the Velociraptor in Montana. It's because, again, Velociraptors in Jurassic Park are actually Deinonychus, which is why you can find one in Montana. But anyway, um, so yeah, this was clear. This was really just running fast and very active. And so this kicked off this new idea about dinosaurs in the 80s, and it was called Dinosaur Revolution, where we realized that dinosaurs were not plotting cold-blooded things that had more in common with an alligator than they would have with, you know, an eagle. Um, 
And so uh, Michael Crichton took all of that information in to some degree. I mean, he got some things wrong, both accidentally and deliberately in his book, um, as well as some things that he just made up that I can't say are wrong. Like in uh, in the book Jurassic Park, um, Dilophosaurus doesn't spit, but it has a venomous bite. And I can't say that it didn't have a venomous bite. I mean, it's not clear how we could know from the the fossils. So maybe it did. I don't know. Um, and then, you know, Jurassic Park, the movie in the 90s, basically brought everyone the cutting edge paleontology of the 80s. Um, but then it just kind of stagnated as a franchise. It didn't really go anywhere. And so now paleontology has largely moved on. And um, for a while, it was taking the public a really long time to catch up with more modern uh, paleo art. But now I think that enough books have been using more accurate reconstructions that I think most people realize now um, that, you know, Velociraptor looked more like an eagle than it did like a lizard. Um, you know, that basically yeah, uh, the yeah, animals probably, probably weren't probably, shrink wrapped. Yeah, probably a little smaller than they, they were the thing. Yeah. So I think the public perception is, is slowly catching up. And um, apparently in the next uh, Jurassic World franchise movie, a different company will be also producing dinosaurs and they will be producing dinosaurs that were much more uh, authentic, if you will. So apparently we're going to be seeing some more fully feathered dinosaurs from a different company in uh, Jurassic World, what's it called? Um, Dominion or something like that? Uh, were, were, is that the one where the dinosaurs were now in the real, with less in the real world? Like yeah, the yeah. Movie, the last movie, like, like that little girl, that little clone girl released them out into the wild. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also, if you could bring up Scott Duke's uh, question, I think I want to talk about that. So which dinosaurs should be featured in movies that are right now being overlooked? So um, I honestly think that basically you could name anything that isn't prominent in movies because the movie dinosaurs, we all know which ones they are. Right now it's T-Rex, Velociraptor, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, um, and Brachiosaurus. And that's about it. But like there's a bunch of other cool animals out there. Like um, like, uh, like, 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 like your version? Well, yeah, Ceratosaurus has... I, Ceratosaurus is in Jurassic Park. It's in one scene. It is not a very accurate rendition. Um, not that my Ceratosaurus is the most accurate, but it's a lot better than Jurassic Park. But um, I'd like to see some more Ceratosaurus. Um, I'd also like to see some Titanosaurus, like Titanosaurus or Argentinosaurus or Alamosaurus, which despite being found in Texas, wasn't named for the Alamo. And that still bothers me to this day. <laughs> um so some titanosaurs would be fun. Uh, also, I think we're missing out on um, just the uh, amazing cuteness of the uh, Alvarosaurids because they're these they're these relatively small uh, dinosaurs that specialize on eating ants and termites, and they generally only have one claw, and they're just adorable. Like if you've ever seen an ard wolf, an, an ard wolf yeah. is. Is technically it's a hyena, but it's also one of the cutest animals you're ever going to find. And part of that is because it's a tiny hyena that specializes in eating ants and termites. And basically, Alvarosaurids were just the ard wolves of dinosaurs. And they're adorable, and I want them to be in more stuff. Um, I also think that uh, pterosaurs are given really bad treatments in movies. They're almost never um, fluffy. They should be fluffy. They should be covered in pycna fibers, uh, which are similar to Proto feathers. They might be proto feathers. It's a little bit unclear. They're, maybe they're proto, proto. Maybe they're proto proto feathers. Proto proto feathers. I mean, I would just call that a proto feather, but it's just not clear if there's a, a homologous filamentous integumentary structure between pycna fibers and, or like an ancestral one between pycna fibers and proto feathers. So it, maybe it, they it, are. Maybe that, they're not. Is that like like down on the baby bird. Uh, it's similar to down, although down has multiple strands that come off of a single follicle, and pycnofibers seem to be a single strand per follicle sort of thing. But they do have distally branching bits, which is similar to stage two protofeathers. So um, it's it's one of those things where like there's we need more data, we need a lot more because it's not clear right now. But yeah, so now I know that this is technically not dinosaurs, but I'm going with sort of like archosaurs in general need that need more love in movies. So like, um, I would like to see more accurate pterosaurs, uh, no perching on their hind feet. Stop doing that. Pterosaurs couldn't do that. Um, 
Uh, so have them with pecno fibers. Stop giving Tyranid on teeth. The name literally means toothless wing. And then you put teeth in it. Like, come on. Um, I'd like to see some other pterosaurs in there, like Quetzalcoatlus or other uh, as darkids. Like, um, I mean, any of them really. Uh, but Quetzalcoatlus is probably one of the, the coolest. So yeah. Um, and then maybe some other like, like let's get some Thalassodromids in there or something, right? Because there's a lot of really cool pterosaurs that just get no love in. Um, in uh, movies and TV, um, so or pterodastro, like the the filter feeding flamingo pterosaur that might have even actually been pink for the same reason that uh, flamingos are pink because they ate the same diet. Um, so yeah, I would love to see a, a pink pterodastro like just sitting there as a background creature in a Jurassic World movie, just uh, you know hanging out next to some sea, uh, some flamingos. Filter feeding some krill out of the out of the brackish water in an estuary. That'd be cool. Well, because of the archosaurid brands, basically on the terrace, or at least uh, it might be on the, the, the crocodile side too. But but particularly mainly at the pterosaurs and dinosaur brands, via natural selection, somehow they started uh, you do, doing a two-legged thing instead of a four-legged thing. Well, so. The propensity for hind limb dominant movement actually goes back pretty far into um, the base of archosaur. So um, one of the most basal archosaurs is Euparcaria. And um, it's so basal that it, it's not clear if it's Pseudosuchian or not. It probably is-ish, but it's very basal. And even at that point, uh, while it was probably a quadruped most of the time, it could at least run on two legs. We have really good reason to think that it could. And uh, many of what were formerly thought to be uh, quadrupedal rausukids actually turn out to be at least uh, facultative bipeds, which means they could walk on two legs if they needed to. And many more of them actually were probably uh, habitual bipeds, which means that their typical stance is on, all, all, uh, is on just two legs. So um, this tendency towards bipedalism is actually very, very early in archosaur uh, lines. And um, you can even see it just with the muscle attachments on the hind legs. They're always much more substantial on, um, on the hind limbs than they are on the front limbs. Now, this is not unusual. Many animals are hind leg dominant. Um, many mammals are hind leg dominant when it comes to locomotion. Um, but also, archosaurs had heavily muscled tails, which helped pull the center of balance back towards the knees rather than being up in the torso, which also helps. So um, it's really not just the dinosaurs went two-legged. A lot of archosaurs went two-legged. And then oh. many of the ones that were two-legged, other than dinosaurs and pterosaurs, ended up kind of going away. And, and, but, yeah, but, uh, but then uh, like, like, like how some, some lizards and mammals returned to, the, returned to the sea, got their sea legs back, some of the dinosaurs got their front, front legs back. They did, although it's interesting because you can tell that that is not... That they, they are descended from bipedal organisms. So, for instance, um, now this isn't easy to do because people usually get dinosaur feet wrong. But if you look at um, either a skeleton of like a Triceratops or another Ceratopsian or a really good reconstruction, it has to be really good, you'll actually notice that like the feet don't actually face forward the way that a mammal would. They're actually kind of off to the side so that the palms face each other a little bit. And um, the, the lateral digits, so, you know, digits, you know, like a uh, three and four and whatnot are way off to the side and they tend not to have claws because they're so off center that they're not really supporting any weight. And then you get other things like um, front digits were such a hassle for sauropods that eventually sauropods just lost all of the digit bones. And so they were just walking on a, a fleshy pad on their metacarpals. And they just don't even bother with phalanges, forget phalanges and except for the thumb because they had a little spike there. And in fact, even really late um, sauropods like the titanosaurs that I mentioned, they lost even that little thumb spike. So yeah, even the quadruped dinosaurs, like because they're uh, descended from bipedal ancestors, the way that they walk on all fours is weird and kind of stupid, <laughs> if I'm being honest. It's like if, 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 like, if humans went back to being bipedal, I mean, not bipedal, I mean, quadrupedal. Yeah, it would it would require a lot of weird changes, and we would probably not be very good at it for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, we got from Eric. Why is it that YEC do sermons on dinosaurs when old Earth creationists and theistic evolutionists don't? Uh, when you type in dinosaurs and the Bible on YouTube, you <coughs> sorry, 
you get YC propaganda. Uh, it's because in order for YC to be true, they need to explain the apparent lack of non-avian dinosaurs in the Bible. Uh, and so they just make up things about them. Whereas um, when you get to old earth creationists or theistic evolutionists, I mean, there, there's nothing for them to explain. Why aren't animals like, you know, Brachiosaurus or T-Rex in the Bible? Because they were already extinct by the time the Bible was written and had been for billions of years. That's it's that simple. There's no reason for them to talk about dinosaurs in the Bible any more than there is for them to talk about trilobites in the Bible. There's just no reason to expect dinosaurs to be in the Bible. In fact, when it comes to non-avian dinosaurs, there's no reason to expect them to be in most books. I mean, uh, <clears throat> what cities in the contiguous U.S. have the best dino displays? So I can't say for certain because I haven't been everywhere, but um, the, the museum in Houston has an excellent paleontology wing. It has, um, I think it has like three Triceratops and two T-Rexes and it has a Deinonychus. And um, it's also got a lot of great non-dinosaurs. Um, and basically as you follow it through uh, from the entrance, as it kind of swoops around, you go through the entire Phanerozoic um, and even a little bit of the Archaeozoic, the little late bits of the Archaeozoic. Um, so I would highly recommend uh, Houston. Um, the Museum of Colorado is pretty good. Uh, it's got an Allosaurus, it's got a Stegosaurus, it's got a nice uh, Ceratosaurus skeleton, or not skeleton, uh, sculpture outside near the parking lot. Um, it's got it's got a very very nice Brachiosaurus mount. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, it's also got some nice uh, displays about uh, muscle reconstructions and the evolutionary relationships with various dinosaurs and things like that. Um, it's also got a few inaccuracies, like it's still got a Stygiomoloch um, reconstruction labeled as Stygiomoloch, even though that's now a junior synonym for um, Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, but it's still a very nice reconstruction, and I, I don't find any faults with it other than the labeling. I mean, it's still a good juvenile Pachycephalosaurus. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty nice. Um, the Museum of Science in Boston is just, it's pretty good. It's got a, I would say recently, but it was, you know, like probably like 15 years ago, but updated T-Rex um, model. Uh, I believe it has a Triceratops. It's pretty good. And a few other smaller dinosaurs. Uh, I don't remember. I know that there's a uh, museum in Phoenix that has uh, what most people would call Tarbosaurus, but they have it labeled as a Tyrannosaurus, which is not wrong. It's just not typical. There is still an open question as to whether or not Tarbosaurus is really a valid genus. Uh, but it also has a Triceratops. It has a, a Protoceratops. It has, it has some Iguanodontia. I don't remember which one. But it also has a Quetzalcoatlus, some reconstructions of Pteranodon Sternbergi, not Longiceps. So not the Pteranodon you're probably used to, but it is Pteranodon. Uh, it has some Ornithochirids. I don't remember the exact genus. Uh, but it also has some replicas of the um, the Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx, as well as the uh, the type specimen, the holotype for uh, Pterodactylus, if you like that. It also has a Camarasaurus mount and a Camarasaurus femur that you can actually touch that's the actual fossil. So there's that. Um, let's see. Other contig I think that might actually sum up pretty much all of the big... Well, of course, there's the Smithsonian, right? It goes without saying the Smithsonian is amazing. I don't remember exactly what's in there, and probably because it's changed since I was there. I haven't been there since. Yeah. I haven't been there in probably 17, 18 years. So, I mean. Well, at, least, at, least been, at least you've been there sooner than I have. Last time I was there, it was, it was, the 90, it was November of 93. Oh, yeah. I was there a few years after that. So, um, it's great Washington trip. I think I might have been there. Actually, it might be 20 years ago now because it was probably somewhere around 2000, 2001. Yeah. A funny story about that, off topic, funny story about that. When, when eighth grade trip, I was at, we were at, at the Vietnam Memorial at, at the time. I was watching the thing. I saw, I saw, I saw class leave. So I, I, saw, I, saw my, I, saw my, I saw the class leave. So I started following them around, started leaving them with them. And, I, and after uh, two, three minutes, I realized, wait a minute, I don't know anybody. I don't know any of these people. In, in the <laughs> Oh man, yeah. So the Smithsonian, of course, is is amazing. Um, now, if you want to go a little bit outside of the contiguous United States, um, the the museum uh, in Vancouver is excellent. Although I actually really like its its Pleistocene displays. It's a really nice woolly mammoth and whatnot. 
And of course, um, I don't remember which, what the museum is called, but there's a museum that has uh, Black Beauty and that's, I think, in Alberta. So if you're willing to go into, you know, like British Columbia or Alberta, head off to Canada, which granted you can't right now if you're in the United States because of horrible, horrible, horrible events. Um, but yeah, eventually I imagine that border will open up again and Americans will once again be able to, to travel into the great white North. Um, but yeah, there's some great Canadian museums. Um, and of course, you know, the British museum, if you want to go even farther afield has really great displays. It has some very famous mounts, although some mounts are historical and so have not been updated in a very long time. So take some of the older mounts in the museum with a, a whole heaping of salt. Um, and then Ian Chen says, have you heard of the thesaurus? It's a dinosaur with an extensive vocabulary. I've heard of that. Uh, but, uh, cause I, so are, are dinosaurs still considered uh, the two main branches of what we call bird and lizard hip, or is it more complex than that now? Maybe. So um, <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, a rather controversial paper was published proposing that um, Ornithischia was a valid taxon, but that Saurischia was not, and that in fact theropods formed a clade with uh, Ornithischians called Ornithos Ornithoskeleta, sorry, it's, I, can, I always mispronounce that one, and that sauropods actually were a basically branching group that um, branched off before that. Now, this has been controversial, and it has met with mixed support from other studies that attempted to reproduce these findings. So it's not clear that uh, Ornithoskeleta is actually the, the way that paleontology is going to shake out in the end. Um, I personally am skeptical um, mostly because for a very long time, basically everything that we've been finding has been confirming Sorskia and Ornithischia as reasonably closely related groups, especially if you look at very, very, um, very basal uh, prosauropods or sauropodomorphs, if you will, like Platyosaurus or even earlier things, they look a lot like theropods. But then again, the problem there is that theropods look a lot like just basal dinosaur. So, <sighs> That's part of the problem there. Um, but I'm not saying that Ornithoskeleta is not, that that hypothesis is wrong. But right now, I don't think it's sufficiently supported that it's time to abandon Ornithischia and Sauruschia yeah. as the, the common terms that we're going to use. Um, basically, I don't tend to discuss Ornithoskeleta with people who aren't really big dino nerds because um, you're not going to find it in most books. It's going to be confusing for most people, um, and it has yet to really overturn the previous consensus. Although it might, and it, you know what? If it does, great. Yeah. Although if it does, it does technically mean that under current definitions, um, sauropods would no longer be dinosaurs. So, it, would they be like that? Would they be in the dinosaur morph or dinosaur form category still? Or uh, yeah, I believe they would be in the dinosaur morph. Although, don't quote me on that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. Science is weird like that. I always thought it was weird, funny, and funny that 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 bird dinosaurs came from the lizard hip. Not they came from the bird hip side. They came from the lizard hip side. Well, I I do think it's important to if you look at the hips of the quote unquote bird hip dinosaurs, they don't actually look that much like the hips of birds. Um, basically, the reason that they were called bird hipped is because like modern birds, um, both the ischium and the ilium project uh, posteriorly. But birds have extremely unusual pelvises. But the other thing is, as you look at theropods getting closer and closer to birds, so things like, you know, um, uh, Deinonychosauria, so that would be the troodontids and the dromaeosaurs, they're having pelvises that are pointing, like the, the, uh, the ischium is either pointing pretty much directly down or it's slightly tilt towards the back and you get closer and closer to like, you know, Paravian dinosaurs and you get um, ischial projections that are farther and farther backwards until you get to the point where you get to some of the basal birds and they're pointing backwards pretty much parallel with the, uh, the ilium. And then eventually you get to the point where the, uh, the ischial projections actually start to separate from the middle line to help uh, with the laying of relatively large and hard eggs, large compared to body size. Um, 
<clears throat> and then, you know, they get to sort of the modern condition where the ischial um, projections just kind of go posterior, but they also kind of flare out laterally. Um, uh, so do we have other questions? M m mostly, m mostly joke. I think mostly joke questions. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, uh, so how do we, like I guess clay to know, but how, how do we know which with dinosaurs inside the clay are like like this like the stegosaurus branch and the triceratops branches and the uh, the uh, God, the sauropod clay? You know, how, do you just know them from? Uh, I guess I guess that's complicated. We get in the bones, the past bones, and that uh, more genetics like, in the, like we can nowadays. Is that how we know what this, this, this by the bones that what clays that they were in? Uh, it's primarily the bones. We have some soft tissue data for some groups, but it's it's very rare that you get much soft tissue from a, a fossil. Although it's becoming more common as we're learning better how to spot it. So. There is that, but uh, yeah, it's primarily based on skeletal characteristics. So, you know, we'll say, okay, well, this is a thyreophorin and you'll say, okay, why? Well, and you say, well, it has these, you know, um, bony dermal structures that are characteristic of thyreophora, whether it be hard scutes or plates along the back or what have you. Uh, and then you'll, you know, come to this and you'll say, well, this is a uh, ceratopsian. Like, well, will help prove that. And you say, okay, well, it's got a rostral bone and it's got, you know, these particular, um, this particular jaw arrangement where it's got this projection of the dentary that up into, you know, up above the skull and all these things like that. Or you'll get to like theropods and you'll say, well, I mean, clearly it's a theropod. Look at the feet. It's got the three main toes and the dew claw. Look, it's got promaxillary fenestrum, um, stuff like that. So it's, it's primarily, yeah, aspects of the skeleton help us figure this out. And, um, it's really all we have to go on for non-avian dinosaurs because we don't have their genetics. We have very little soft tissue information in general. Um, yeah. And uh, it's not, it's also not perfect. You know, there are, we can't always resolve the phylogenetics of dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs without a fair more, a fair few more polytomies than we would like. And a polytomy is basically just um, where when you have your cladogram or your, phylo your phylogenetic tree in cases where you can do those, you can't resolve of three or more taxa, which are more closely related. And so they just form a single node with more than two descendant branches. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, that's why I do, I do with sometimes that we could get uh, the, some, the soft tissue had, some of the soft tissue dinosaurs that we can get had some leftover DNA remnants so we could confirm, cross confirm, Cross confirm what we what we know. Well, one of the problems is um, uh, scientists like Dr. Mary Schweitzer have, in fact, found uh, positive results when staining for DNA in some dinosaur fossils. But the problem is, it's not in long enough strands that we can actually sequence it, and it also for that reason we can't actually prove that it's dinosaur DNA. It, yeah, it might be like bacteria bacterial. Right. DNA. So, or, or fungal or who knows what, right? Cause all the stain does is say, Oh, if it stains co this color, there is DNA in here somewhere. So we, yeah. we're unlikely to ever actually get a non avian um, yeah. genome sequence. Now we have done some protein sequences with some recovered um, molecular artifacts of collagen. And um, those have been remarkably bird like, although there is still some people saying that it might've been contamination at the lab. Maybe, um, but yeah, we're, we're probably never going to get the genetics of a, any non-avian dinosaur. Um, but we also have, say, chicken source becomes a reality. Could we genetically engineer it to give it the Velociraptor claw? Almost certainly yes. Or genetically engineer it to get bigger, like a T-Rex. Um, the bigger part is a bit tough because, in order to get really big, it requires more adaptations than just isometrically growing. Because so, that we might have to. Do I guess maybe for that we might have to do do a little oh with the word uh not genetic uh, God, we can't, can't, God, it's a simple word oh artificial selection maybe um even artificial selection might not be great because I mean just take a look at um 
at animals that we've bred to be unusually large, right? So like look at um, look at Great Danes. They have really bad hip and knee problems. Um, it's just it's just endemic to the to the breed. It, it's it gets really bad. Um, like and hip dysplasia is common in many large breeds of dogs. Well, I guess and, that's anything where you you cross you you start crossbreeding them more closely related, then they get, they get more genetic problems. I guess. Well, so there's there's two things. There's one is inbreeding, and the other one is that um, unlike natural selection, artificial selection tends to ignore things that isn't in the scope of what the selectors are focused on. So if I say I want the biggest dog possible, if the, these dogs are later in life having you know their their cartilage and their knee just wear completely out and they're getting hip dysplasia, that doesn't stop me from breeding the largest ones together. Yeah, we we do more what we like we like to look at and stuff. We're, we're natural selection, like how they better survive out in the wild. Yeah, so it's I I don't think we could in a reasonable amount of time, like any one person could live to see it, get from a chicken sized chicken source to a T Rex sized chicken source. Could it eventually happen? Yes, but I think the resulting animal would not be very healthy, and I would suggest that we not do it. For the same reason that I don't think we should continue to breed brachycephalic dogs. If it were up to me, every pug would be neutered. Is that the one of the flat nose and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Look, I get it. They're cute, and they're fun, and, you know, I, I have met plenty of pugs that I liked, too. However, if it were up to me, animals that are that poorly built as For a result of breeding should good. all... They yeah, should all be sterilized. They should be killed. At least maybe you breed them with more long nose dogs that try to get their noses. Maybe. But uh, many of them can't actually breed naturally anyway. Uh, uh, like, I, I, I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> um, oh. So, oh. Okay, my other before question is, uh, so, so theropod, the theropods and the the sauropod, the sauropods are more are, are more branched together, most like closely. Unless ornithoscelida is the accurate okay. hypothesis, as as far as we know right now in the science we know now. So, all right. well, that's the thing. It's yeah. it's not entirely clear if the ornithoscelida hypothesis is correct. So. The conventional um, answer to the question would be yes, sauropods and theropods are more closely related to each other than they are to um, ornithischians. But that's currently a bit up in the air. I tend to say yes, I think so, but I can't say that with huge amounts of confidence. Well, what really, in, in, at the thing about science, we, I guess we do a lot of stuff, but you now. It can change. It can new information can, can learn can come out, come out, you know. And right. Well, that's one of the great things about science is when science finds out that something that some conclusion in science seems to be wrong or at least incomplete. Science is like, well, okay, we'll, we'll you know switch on that one. So that's one of the reasons why when the ornithoscelia paper was published, it wasn't just dismissed people engaged with it. There were people who said, okay, well, that's unusual. Let's try to do follow-up studies. Let's try to get a hold of their data. What happens if we add in more taxa? What happens if we select a different uh, sampling of taxa? What if we weight characters differently? Do we still get the same results? Um, and the answer was sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, um, like any field of science. Ongoing process. Yeah, paleontology is an ongoing science process. And because um, data points are hard, so hard to come by in paleontology. You know, you just have to kind of rely on luck to some extent. Um, it's always going to be, there's always going to be up in the air things, you know. Um, but we've also come a long way since even just 20, 30 years ago. Like 30 years ago, uh, no one thought that we would ever know anything about what color a dinosaur was. And we now have pretty decent color data for a number of dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, and this is before other other podcasts about dinosaurs and stuff, but I did like like I did not know that, that the asteroid asteroid hypothesis or theory 
is now was was so re so recent was so recent like like when I was growing up in the eighties wasn't it, it, I mean it was still I haven't found it yet but you, but I but now you, I think that I I, was, I thought it was always a thing it was like it was until like the late eighties early nineties. Um, so <clears throat> it wasn't as well supported until then. It was well. It had been a, one of the ideas floated around as a possible explanation for a while, um, but it wasn't until then that they actually, you know, the crater in the Yucatan was actually found complete with, you know, all the shock quartz and it was correlated with the, um, oh, now I'm blanking on the name of the element, uh, iridium, the iridium, um, iridium spike, layer. yeah, at the KT boundary. Um, and then there were the shock quartz and the iridium layer are the, the big things that solidified this along with finding an actual impacts crater and noting that globally, um, instances of shock quartz and, uh, iridium get higher, the closer you get to the crater. And the fact that <coughs> <I'm sorry. coughs> in places where the, um, the KPG boundary is clearly visible, which is not everywhere, but in places where it is, it correlates very tightly with this iridium layer. And uh, that was sort of the, the nail in the coffin. Now, other things were going on at the time. Um, there was some flood basalt eruptions around that same time in India. Um, and I think also a little, some in Russia. And so it was already not a great time. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I heard that uh, Lisa, Lisa, that, I don't know the rest of the world, at least, at least in uh, uh, the North America where the crater hit had the most Im impact at least, the the impact had the most the well, the impact had the most impact. That yeah, those were already uh, kind of going kind of like not as diverse as they used to be. Uh, well, it's a little iffy. Um, there seems to be less diversity in the fossil record in the late Cretaceous than there had been earlier. But another problem is that might just be because there was less fossilization happening, which is one of the things we always have to be careful about in the fossil record, right? Uh, because you don't find something doesn't mean it wasn't there. Yeah, kind of like yeah, Eric comments on that too, uh, where, where the, on the human side, was more aired, we had more fossilization of, of the human side brands, but on the chimp bonobo brands where it was more jungle-like, it was harder to get fossils. Right. Uh, another example would be um, if you look at the Morrison Formation, which is where you find animals like uh, Stegosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, um, stuff like that. There's virtually no small animals and very few herbivores, but they must have been there. But the Morrison Formation is really bad at preserving small bones. So there would have been a lot of stuff that existed in the actual paleo environment that is currently, you know, shown to us in the Morrison formation, but we just don't know for certain what those animals were. Well, that's an, uh, uh, because Allosaurus, Tegosaurus, and all that, those, like that. I don't think about the Jurassic Park movie series. Like it was, they, they, at least as far as I know, they had very few Jurassic dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jurassic dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, you got Stegosaurus, um, you've got Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and Brachiosaurus, and I think that's basically it. Pretty much everything else in there is Cretaceous. So you got the Parasaurolophus, you got the Gallimimus, the T-Rex, the Velociraptor. Oh, um, Dilophosaurus is Jurassic as well. well but, I, think, um, I guess Jurassic was just more catchy. Park was just more catchy than. Cretaceous. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. In fact, actually, in the book, um, someone mentions that, and uh, the Mr. Hammond in the book says. Oh, I know, but Jurassic Park is a better is a better name for a theme park, and it's like okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I I I skimmed through the book once. Thing that's like, I think in the in the book they switch places. The the the, the, the grandkids switch places or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the boy. The boy was the computer genius instead of the girl. <laughs> Like I said, that yeah, I won't dispute it. I, I just don't remember it very clearly. Um, so Eric Virthaler asks, "What is your favorite dinosaur?" Uh, Meliagris, uh, most underrated dinosaur. 
That's tough. Uh, Eric says that his is Megalosaurus is vastly underrated. It was the first dinosaur ever scientifically classified. So my thing with Megalosaurus is that it's it's cool enough, but like ultimately it's kind of generic. Like I, it's cool that it was the first, or it's it's essentially tied for first uh, with Iguanodon. But like I don't know. It just there's not much about it as an animal that stands out to me compared to say, you know, Carcharodontosaurus or T-Rex or um, Velociraptor as it actually was like all these have a thing. And Megalosaurus is just kind of like, mm, I'm a theropod guys. It's like, yep, that's true. Uh, so let's see most underrated. Dino- I'm actually just going to go ahead and go back to like the Alvis Alvarosaurus. Like Mononychus needs more love guys. Give Give Alvarosaurus or Mononychus some love out there. They're, they're really cool. And they're adorable. Um, but let's see. What else? Um, I think people just point and laugh at E. Uh, it's, it's a much cooler dinosaur than I think people are actually giving it credit for. Um, so there's that. Uh, but I also think that some animals are a bit overrated. Like... Um, I think Triceratops is a little bit overrated as far as like Ceratopsians go. There were, there were some really cool Ceratopsians over there. And um, when it comes to late Ceratopsians, uh, Triceratops is just kind of, just kind of there. Oh, by the way, got my, got my glasses on. I had these for my, my one year old niece's zoom birthday party. Oh, so, fun. Yeah. She, my niece turned one uh, Saturday. I so far I've only met her via 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 FaceTime or Zoom because <laughs> of the thing, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that's that's our current time, son. Yeah. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> off topic again. I, I saw this funny funny little clip uh, on Facebook or whatever, but. This like like when you grow up in the COVID era, this, this little like little toddler girl was, was every, pretending that pretending everything was a hand sanitizer and she was wiping her hands. Oh man, Ugh. I'm lucky. I bought four liters of hand sanitizer before the whole COVID thing even happened. Uh, yeah, yeah, me not sanitizer, but it's funny. It's funny about a a, 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 a few months before the lockdown ha- happened. My, my I was at a bulk store, Sam's Club, with my with my, my one of my other nieces, more more grown up one. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a late birthday present. Like like here, have some to- toilet pa- a big box of toilet paper. Okay, okay, my cool. And then a, 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 a few weeks later, that's when the whole toilet paper craze happened. So I already oh goodness, that thing was stupid. So I was already pre prepared before it happened. <laughs> Didn't even know about it. Uh, so I. Uh, So, so as we go, yeah. So you've done this before. You've had a lot of debates about this, about this topic, but now we're getting closer to the, the bird side of the dinosaurs. And that's and that's necessarily closely in the in the theropod section, right? Yes, uh, birds are definitely theropods. So as we go down, they are um, tetanurans. So that is a group of um, theropods that merges in the. Uh, early Jurassic uh, means stiff tails, and they're characterized by, um, in the earlier members, uh, stiff ligaments going between the vertebrae of the tail that help stiffen it. And then um, later, more derived type neurons that starts to ossify into hard bony elements. And then in birds, uh, they actually take it to the point where they, they shorten and fuse the vertebrae at the distal end of the tail into what's called a pigostyle. Um, then more specifically, they're, um, let's see, they're allosauroid tetanurans, so they're closer to allosaurus than they are to ceratosaurus. Then within that, I mean, there's a bunch of these, but they're in the Salurosaur group. Now, originally, Salurosaurs were were just kind of defined as the small theropods. That is no longer the case. We now have actually some pretty solid evidence as to who Salurosaurs were and weren't, and some of the large theropods were Salurosaurs, like T-Rex. Um, but T. Rex is on a very different branch of the Salurosauria than uh, birds are. So you get getting closer to um, 
birds are getting mana raptorans, which means uh, <clears throat> hand snatchers. And these are all animals that had this musculature and uh, limb anatomy where they were able to reach out with their forelimbs, grab objects, and then clutch them up against their body. This is primarily for prey restraint. Um, so then you get into the Eumanoraptorans, which is a slightly smaller group that excludes a few things, like I think Ornithomimids or something, maybe uh, Ornithochirids too. But then um, now you're getting into things like um, Paravian animals and uh, the Dromaeosaurids and the Troodontids. So that's sort of Deinonychosauria. Then, so there's been a little bit of debate as to exactly how Deinonychosauria and Paravians kind of fit together. And there have been some arguments that uh, Paravians are actually Deinonychosaurians. That's not currently where the majority of researchers are leaning. Uh, most researchers would say that um, Deinonychosauria and AV split away from each other before the split within Deinonychosauria between Troodontids and uh, Dromaeosaurs. So, so where did where did your your Brent's Brent off? Remember way back over at Allosauroidea? Yeah. yeah. The other group is the Ceratosauroidea. And the Ceratosauroids uh, lead primarily the biggest group of, uh, that is, they lead to Carcharodontosaurs and um, <coughs> the group that includes uh, everyone's favorite Carnotaurus, and I'm having trouble thinking of the name of it. So, so uh, are theropods the main brand that didn't go back to bipedalism? Oh yeah, the common ancestor of all theropods is almost certainly a, a biped. I mean, but, but, yeah, but I think maybe I think maybe some on the other brands didn't go back. Some doesn't go back. They they stayed bipedal too, but I like it. So a lot of them went back to quadrupedal brands. Like sauropods did the the uh, Stegosaurus brands. That they're, the, the oh, and with Isabellosaurus, that was the group to which uh, Carnotaurus belongs. Sorry, I couldn't remember. Uh, yeah, so theropods don't really have, as far as I know, any really quadrupedal um, uh, members. Um, for some time, it was thought that maybe Spinosaurus might have been a quadruped. Um, and I've actually had the discussion as to whether or not a quadrupedal dinosaur was reasonable. Or sorry, not dinosaur, theropod uh, was like something that could have existed. And um, I get a lot of people who say no and then don't give a good reason. And the best reason I've heard is that uh, the, f the arms are too inflexible. And then I just point out, okay, but, you know, none of the actual workers in the field, and because this is usually a discussion that um, I'm having with people who aren't quite professionals. And I point out, no one objected to the quadruped um, spinosaurus for biomechanical problems. It was just lack of evidence and it would be kind of weird. And um, so I don't think there was anything that could have prevented it. But one of the things is that um, basically for the entire group of theropods, they always maintained relatively predatory niches, which if you look at the quadrupedal dinosaurs, one of the things they all have in common is they're primarily herbivores. They are being quadrupeds to, um, because they're gigantic guts, they need to eat plants yeah. and digest plants properly, shifts the balance of, um, or the point of balance or the center of mass. I, I, yeah, well, I, I guess when you're, I guess, I guess when you're, uh, uh, Herbivores, that is running to to catch your 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 prey of plants isn't that necessary? Right. Yeah, the plants aren't going to run away from you, and uh, most of your well, some herbivorous dinosaurs like uh, ornithopods um, and heterodontosaurids, who might or might not be ornithopods, uh, while they didn't maintain a very swift build and the ability to run fast, um, many others settled on just being gigantic and unpleasant to mess with. So for example, that's your things like uh, your ceratopsians, uh, your uh, sauropods, your thyreophorans, like stegosaurids and ankylosaurids and stuff like that. So they, they either grew uh, armor protections or, the, or they grew they, they grew supersized. Or both in some cases. We actually have armored um, titanosaurs. So we, there's even a, at least one sauropod that had a clubbed tail similar to an ankylosaurus. Although it was derived differently. So it's only superficially like a uh, Nikon source. But, but speaking of the of green size and the hollow bones, is that was, was that deep in the archosaur branch or more on the uh, dinosaur pterosaur side? No, that's deep into archosauria. We have a lot of um, 
So the process of sort of extensions of the circular, or the, sorry, the respiratory system invading a bone is called uh, invagination. We have a lot of that um, skeletal invagination in archosaurs going on both sides of the Pseudosuchi and um, Avametasarsalian split. Now it ends up being more extensive in dinosaurs and pterosaurs than it was in most other archosaurs, but it is definitely something that is pretty deep in archosauria. And and and, and, and that's basically why that their side of the brain, their side of the family can grow a lot bigger than like the mammal side with, with the more solid bones. Uh, that's part of it. Another part is just also that the the respiratory system in archosaurs is much more efficient. Um, so. And, and, I guess, and plus the fact that they are still egg laying and and live birth kind of kind of of bigger things kind of takes a little bit longer. Well, it's not as much of an advantage as you would think, because um, so let's say you lay an egg, right? That egg needs to physically contain enough food to bring that embryo to term, Definitely. which means you have a much bigger upfront cost. So, for instance, if you're going to be pregnant. You don't need to have all the food to bring a, a baby to term right there with you. You can continue to eat and supplement the growing embryos with your current diet as you're going. So um, <clears throat> there's that. Um, also, one of the things is that this means that even some of the largest dinosaurs re laid relatively small eggs. So, uh, for instance, a sauropod egg generally wasn't much larger than say like an ostrich egg, even though a sauropod is going to grow up to be huge compared to an ostrich. Is that I mean, really as a juvenile, you're going to be pretty darn vulnerable compared to an adult. Is that why the, 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 the uh, why you see people talking about how they brought baby dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah, that is basically why. And I get it. It does help with the, the space problem. It doesn't solve the space problem, but it helps. But another problem that you get is that um, babies are generally have a much, much higher metabolism just so they can grow. So pound for pound, they actually eat a lot more. And in the space of a year, a sauropod is going to grow a lot. So even if you bring on an egg, you're going to need a very, very large enclosure for your baby sauropods by the end of a year plus at sea. I guess plus, plus the, the I think the main problem of, of that is either babies or eggs. How they say that it's genetically inclined, but like like most babies, unless unless they're unless they're like one of the things that don't have parents. But dinosaurs, since dinosaurs are more like birds, I guess that they they maybe they do herds or something. But like like how they're gonna teach their babies how, what to do growing up unless like one of the independent. Animal, animals. Like well, it's, we know that many dinosaurs had extensive parental care, and for those species, that would be a problem. Um, you don't get to learn how to be a member of your species if you don't grow up with other members of it. But on the other hand, there probably were many dinosaurs that didn't really have extensive parental care. Um, sauropods probably among them. So it is, yeah. And actually, you can get this problem uh, with animals today. So for instance, sometimes people will adopt a little baby chimpanzee and raise it more like a human baby than a chimpanzee. And uh, almost every single time they end up giving this animal up to some, you know, ape sanctuary because quite frankly, you cannot handle a post pubescent chimpanzee in your house. It could very well kill you. Like it's not the kind of animal that you want in your house. I know it looks cute and tiny and adorable as a baby. And it acts a lot like a human toddler for a long time. But once those hormones kick in, um, yeah, it's going to be a bad time. If you think having a teenager in the house is destructive and annoying, um, try a chimpanzee teenager. It's going to be a lot worse. And they're going to be strong enough to literally rip your face off. So, but then unfortunately, those chimpanzees have trouble getting along with other chimpanzees because they never learned how to. They never, they never learned how to socialize with members of their own species. Now, it's an extreme example with primates because so much of primate behavior is learned. But it yeah. still occurs to other things. For instance, um, sometimes you'll get birds who uh, end up being primarily raised by something outside their species, especially in domestic settings, right? Like people will hand raise chickens or ducklings or whatever. Or sometimes you can get weird situations like um, a chicken will adopt some ducklings mm -hmm. and they tend to have trouble with uh, intraspecific interactions because they don't, they weren't socialized 
within their original species. So yeah, this would be a problem. But or uh, actually, it was a theme in Jurassic Park. It was a theme in the book that didn't come across in the movie. Is that even if you clone a dinosaur and you have a population of these dinosaurs, they have not been properly socialized to be members of whatever species that is. Yeah, that, that, right. Right. I guess that's the thing between that. Uh, it's, it's a, it being instinct and and race behavior, like like can that would that duck know to natural know to, that water can they can float on, they can go on water if it, if it, as a chicken mom or they did not even go near water chicken something. Generally, um, ducks that are raised by not ducks still do have an affinity for water and they'll just naturally seek it out. Uh, that seems to be instinctual, but where they'll have trouble is trying to socialize with other ducks. Uh, yeah, kind of like. Kind of, I guess, kind of like how how the sea turtles they naturally go to the water after the, after they hatch. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're they're drawn, and actually they're they're not even drawn to by water. What they're actually mostly drawn by is uh, light, and they actually the the timing of when they're born actually usually corresponds to moon phases and where the moon is going to be on the horizon. And that's actually one of the problems with um, modern beaches is that city lights often draw sea turtles in the wrong direction. And so there've been a number of attempts to try to fix this. For instance, um, I know in Hawaii, there've been a few attempts to get people to turn out the lights in various buildings, even like, you know, big, big buildings um, around the time that the turtles are predicted to be hatching. Um, I've heard of some people putting up large, like vertical sheets of black fabric or wood or something like that to try to shade the beach so that the uh, sea turtles start going towards the ocean. Um, so yeah, it's it's also sort of like uh, when insects swarm around a light, it's because they usually use the moon to navigate and a light, which is so close by and so much brighter, confuses them. They don't, it, it short circuits their navigational systems basically. Um, so yeah, there are instincts and it is going to be virtually impossible to get an animal away from its instincts. But um, there are also learned behaviors that most animals have, or at least most uh, amniotes have. I mean, you know, certain things are much more like a pre-programmed robot. So like, like when you get, like when you, when you get more on the, uh, the amphibian and chordate side. Well, I mean, Amniotes are chordates, but that's what I mean. You know, I mean, but yeah, yeah. So it seems like amphibians don't do as much socializing, um, and their calls seem to be mostly instinctive. Um, in fact, uh, they're so instinctive that the mating calls of some frogs is the only way to distinguish between species. And even when they're not raised among other conspecifics, they'll still maintain this characteristic mating call of their species. Uh, so. But, but that's not true for mating calls in birds. Mating calls in birds don't correspond very tightly with genetics. And in fact, if you take a bird from one region to another region and raise it there amongst other birds of the same species, it will grow up with the local uh, accent, if you will. Just like if you take, um, you know, if someone is born in China but comes to, say, the United States at the age of one, when they grow up speaking English, they're not going to have a Chinese accent, even though their parents probably will. Uh, yeah, yeah the, I heard that the best time to teach a, a baby, teach, teach people languages is when they're still in the infant or toddler stages. Yeah, uh, that's that's really true for social behaviors for, for a lot of species. The younger that you start out socializing with members of your own species, the better off you're gonna do in social settings with that, with members of your species. And that's especially important for social species, which we know many dinosaurs were. So, so I guess if you want your kids to be fluent in multi-languages, teach them <laughs> when they're still yet, talk to them when they're still young. Well, it's, it's tricky actually. Kids resist um, learning multiple languages if they can. Okay. So um, like for instance, um, if they notice that their peers all speak, say, English, right? Because this is a common phenomenon in a lot yeah. of countries. And their parents only speak a certain language at home, but they notice that their parents actually do speak English because maybe they, their parents use English at the shop or, or whatever. The kids may, in fact, start refusing to use whatever language the parents want them to use at home. Okay. And um, Or if they notice that um, 
some people have tried to do it where uh, one parent will only speak one language to the child and only accept responses in that language. And the other parent will only speak another language to the child and only accept responses in that, ang in that language. But then when they talk to each other, they'll usually default to one of those two languages. The child will usually default to that language and will start now often, this is not universal, but may start to refuse the other language that they've decided that is not the one that the parents use between each other, because it's a lot more work to learn two languages yeah. simultaneously than it is one. Sure. I, I was going to. I was going to ask when you, if you if you ever had kids, are you going to teach teach your kids both English and Klingon? I, I very much doubt it. I don't see. Um, yeah, I don't see much much point in having a, a kid learn Klingon. Um, actually, there was someone who tried to get his kid to grow up um, as a multilingual, grow up multilingual with Klingon as one of the languages, and he actually did use the technique of um, he only addressed and accepts. And accepted responses in Klingon from the child while the mother uh, used English. And while the child did start to learn Klingon and was able to use it, that was very clear that he did not like using the language. Yeah. And um, eventually he started refusing to respond in Klingon and then eventually essentially forgot the language. Uh. Although it was a bit early to try that experiment anyway. At the time the experiment was done, which I believe was like the mid 90s, um, there really wasn't all that much in the way of vocabulary. Like at that point, Klingon didn't have a word for table. And it's like, come on, how are you gonna try and, and talk to your kid and there's not even a word for table? It was, still a, it was still a basic language at that point, I guess. Yeah, so we've had a lot more uh, vocabulary come in in the decades since, uh, cause the guy who created language, Mark Okrand, is still very active in the community of people who learn Klingon and he takes requests for new words periodically. Uh, but so back to back to dinosaurs and birds, right? Uh, topic, off topic there, but so uh, was it in the Jurassic time or the Jurassic or the Cretaceous time that that birds fully became a not say a separate clade but more of its own wool division? So birds are definitely around from the Middle Jurassic. Um, now. The birds that were around in the Middle Jurassic weren't a whole lot like the birds that we see now. Um, so, and uh, yeah, Maya says, I have a lot of friends that don't speak their native language. Uh, they understand it perfectly, but when asked, uh, will you say they don't think their grammar is good in that other language? Um, so I think you might mean the, because the native language usually refers to your first language. It's the one that you speak most commonly, but I, th I think I, I get what you mean. Like, you know, when they grew up in a Spanish speaking house or something, and uh, they primarily speak English, and they don't try, they try not to speak a lot of Spanish. Um, that's actually fairly common in language. There's this thing called the expressive receptive gap. You're always able to understand more than you're able to express in any given language. And that's even true for your native language, usually. Um, and part of that is just like inferences, like recognizing uh, root words and affixes and stuff that you recognize on the, when they're coming in, but you don't know them already in your brain as a lexical term that you can then pull up and use. Uh, and the same thing is going to be true for grammar, right? Like the nuances of grammar might not matter that much in understanding the gist of a sentence. So for instance, um, if you're if you're primarily an English speaker and someone speaks to you, say, in Spanish, you're probably not going to pick up on the exact uh, semantic difference between, say, like the subjunctive and the declarative moods. But you'll probably still get the gist of the sentence. But then when you try to produce similar sentences, you will probably screw up which mood to use because you're not super clear on the distinction. Because uh, it's, 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 it's a distinction that English rarely makes and only makes in the most formal registers. Um, but I tend to have a formal way of speaking, so sometimes I use a subjunctive mood where other people wouldn't. But anyway, um, yeah, so we get birds in the Jurassic. And by the Cretaceous, especially the late Cretaceous, many of them are, I mean, you could look at them and, and you would recognize them as members of modern groups. So for instance, um, we have both ground and waterfowl at the, at the end Cretaceous. So you would look at something and you say, well, that looks like a grouse or, or a ptarmigan or something like that. Or look at something else and you're like, well, that kind of looks like a goose. In fact, you'd probably just say that's yeah, probably just a goose. And um, like, like, and some, it, it wasn't like all one clade, but it happened in several different branches, I guess, where they, they, again, they, they had they they lost their ability to fly, 
<laughs> yeah, flightlessness has evolved numerous times in birds. Um, so the common ancestor of all birds would have been a, a flighted animal. It would have been able to fly um, probably not as well as most modern birds. Um, it probably was more morphologically similar to like the Tinamu, which is the only um, paleognath bird that still flies. And it's not a very good flyer. It has only a weakly keeled sternum and um, it's downstroke as a result is just not that powerful. That's a, that's a thing on a lot of animals that they go from one to the other to back again, like from, from the water to land, back to water again, from, from quad to by the quad again, then from them from ground to flying back to ground again. Yeah. Um, although some transitions are more difficult than others. Going from not flying to flying is difficult. That's why it's only happened four times. Uh, whereas going from flying to not flying happens all the time. Um, so one of the things is um, flight is expensive. It takes a lot of energy to lift your mass off the ground. And I don't care what you do to try and optimize that. It's still going to be a very costly activity. So if you don't need it, it's actually pretty advantageous to get rid of it. This is why, why a lot of island birds lose that ability. Mm -hmm. Because there are not, um, there's not as heavy a predation selection. So when you don't need flight to escape from predators and you don't really need it to find food because there's plenty, it just kind of makes sense to get rid of the flight because it's yeah. just so expensive to maintain the gigantic muscles and even the brain power. Like a huge portion of a bird's brain is taken up with things like balance and being able to sight and see where what level is and uh, sensory data from the wings and the feathers that give information about exact how much trim it should have and the exact shape its wings should take uh, at this particular time. And they're making these tiny little micro adjustments and um, exactly how extended their wing are all the time combined with the flapping and all of this. And uh, if you don't need that, it actually makes a lot of sense to just chuck it. So that's why you get dodos, which are just pigeons that can't fly, or were pigeons that can't fly. Oh, we get a bird, dinosaurs, and stuff. So were they branch off on the side, the theropod side of the dinosaurs, when their arms, were, I guess, I would say, say more useful, but uh, I'll say how dinosaur arms, like, like, like that. I'll say they're useless, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to say this. Uh, maybe had, they had longer arms. So uh, birds belong to a group of uh, theropods called Manoraptorans, which uh, means hand snatchers. And they actually had um, very robust forelimbs that actually had a lot of the same articulation that modern birds use for flapping. So the same motion with the with the arm that um, say a velociraptor or something like that would use to spring forward with its claws and clamp down on prey and then pull it up to the body is essentially the same motion that a bird uses for flapping. So first the arms come up and out and they splay out to the sides and then they close down rapidly and then they pull back as they as you know, the, the elbow and the wrist both articulate to, you know, a closed position. And then if it misses, then the animal tries it again. So the arms come out and back and up again. And so the only thing birds are really doing are they're just extending the vertical range of that upstroke. And so, yeah, they're, they're actually descended from very, very um, four limb dominant uh, animals. And um, also Eric asked me what made me choose a Ceratosaurus as, as my avatar. Uh, it's the fanciest dinosaur. Uh, the Morrison Formation, uh, and that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. They, they, were, the, they were the dinosaurs, they were the rich, they were the rich dinosaurs, apparently, because they, they were the, the hats and stuff. Yep. Uh, but, uh, so, I guess in, I guess in, in, the, on the South American island for a long time, the, the dinosaurs were still the top predators for, um, actually, there have been a lot of places where um, dinosaurs remain top predators for a really long time. For instance, in South America, dinosaurs remain the dominant predators up until well into the Cenozoic. Um, you know, the, the terror birds were the dominant yeah. predators in South America so, uh, until... Because yeah, they were more isolated, I guess, that South American island. Yeah. Before, before, the North, before the North American crash. Yeah, basically. 
Uh, and also, dinosaurs remain um, very high-end predators in a lot of environments. I mean, look at eagles. Very few things predate on eagles. What's eating eagles? I mean, basically nothing. They're, they're essentially apex predators. Now, they're not killing the same game as mammalian apex predators like lions or, or wolves or something. But they're still basically at the top of the food chain. I, I, I got the thing. Go, but all right. So tomorrow, you want to advertise your show for tomorrow? Yeah, sure. So um, tomorrow at 6 p.m. my time, which is uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be doing Kent with Bent. Um, Kent with Bent is my regular Tuesday show. It happens basically the same time every week, uh, except second Tuesdays in the month where I do Eric with Erica with Guts at Gibbon, uh, again, at the same time, though. And so, yeah, we just basically point and laugh at uh, Kent Hovind. And um, basically, Kent Hovind is so dumb that I can debunk him without much effort while playing a drinking game that usually ends with me being reasonably drunk. If your eyes close and one hand, one hand tied behind your back? Yeah, basically. It's... Kent Hovind is... <laughs> He's such low tier that, like, yeah, it takes virtually no effort to debunk everything he says while drinking. So, um, if you were the cast Lion King with dinosaurs, what dinosaurs would you cast as the characters? Oh, um, that's... <clears throat> hmm. So, I'm not sure, actually, because one of the things is that I would, I would want to know, like, do I have to keep it to a specific time period? Does it have to be just dinosaurs? Um, so, I think a better question would be, if I had to put the Lion King in a different time period... What would I cast? And um, yeah. one of the problems like, is that the, the whole idea of a pride of lions, where you have this tight social cohesion with a, a strict hierarchy, it's not clear that there were any dinosaurs like that. Um, we don't really have any good evidence of pack hunting because a pride of lions is just a pack. I mean, let's face it. Um, so we have evidence that sometimes uh, con specifics would mob a prey, uh, a prey item. So, for instance, we have instances where um, we, it seems like allosaurus from multiple directions would all mob onto a single uh, sauropod, but it's not clear that this was coordinated. It might just have been opportunistic. Like there's a bunch of allosaurus in the area, and they notice one is going for a sauropod, and they figure I'll do it too. Um, as opposed to forming permanent packs that have coordination, so you get the you get that problem where like what is a good analog for a lion, which is a highly social yeah. apex predator, and I don't know that there is one in dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that. So I saw, it reminds me of a video I, I saw where I guess this coyote took down a, a deer or something, or it was kind of thing, and it was and it was eating it. Then this wolf came, came along, got the coyote and the deer both for dinner. Yeah, wolves will kill coyotes. Um, they are not fans of coyotes. And but the other thing is, coyotes will raid unprotected wolf dens. So. Uh, despite the fact that they're very close related and they can interbreed, uh, Canis lupus and Canis latrans do not get on very well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah well, apparently, before they intercept, when they got rid of the wolves in the uh, Yosemite maybe area, the coyotes, once the wolves were gone, the coyotes took, took over. Yeah, uh, like that, that's actually again. happening throughout a lot of the United States with where the wolves have been largely killed off. Um, for instance, um, I have family in Massachusetts. And when I was a kid and I was growing up in Massachusetts, we didn't have coyotes. They have coyotes now. So. Because um, the, the, the main predators are gone. <laughs> yeah. They basically, um, humans just devastated wolf populations throughout North America. And um, coyotes couldn't fill in that area as fast as, wolf, as the wolves were dying. But now that they're mostly gone throughout most of North, North America, coyotes are spreading in. Because yeah. if you leave a, a niche vacant, it will be filled. And yeah. interestingly, the um, the eastern coyotes that we're getting in the eastern United States are not exactly the same as the western coyotes that you get in like like near where I live, like in uh, yeah. New Mexico, Arizona, and places like that. The eastern coyotes actually have significant amounts of Canis uh, lupus uh, DNA, both from wolves and dogs, and so they're larger and they're less afraid of humans in the east. And yeah, we can talk about this more dangerous. We can talk about this uh, next thing, but it might. Th th uh, and dinosaur thing talk about I wonder how that happened in like in the dinosaur area where there was a mini predator and then a more top predator and if the top predator is away the mini predator like ooh it's my land now mm -hmm. yeah I mean it's 
you see it all over the place. The same thing uh, will happen basically anywhere where a big predator is gone. And a lot of times it can happen as a result of humans. Humans do not like big predators in their territory for understandable reasons. You know, they mess with your livestock. They might eat you. Yeah. But I guess what they don't know is with the big predator gone, the, the little predator is like, oh, they, they become the threat. They become the threat then. Like, right. Now we realize that. But sometimes, sometimes like it's worth it. Like, uh, like England doesn't have really native predators much larger, larger than foxes, right? And my guess is that if you were to ask a medieval peasant whether or not he would rather have a place that's full of wolves that could hunt his sheep versus a place that's full of foxes that can only really hunt his chickens, he would choose the foxes over the wolves. Yeah. And did, is that, did you see, did you hear about the uh, trying to breed the foxes like dog program? In yeah, the, the silver foxes in Russia. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I got this might. So that was a cool experiment. Uh, it was actually done for the, the fur trade. The idea was supposed to be, let's get some tang foxes that will be easy to raise for fur, uh, much like minks. So minks are a species of mustelid. They're sort of semi-aquatic. They're not quite as aquatic as most otters are, but they really like to swim. Um, but they're also okay at climbing trees like most weasels are. Um, but there's a semi-domesticated variety of mink that is tamer that is used in the fur trade. And so this idea was in Russia, we're like, hey, let's do the same thing with the red fox, with the silver morph, because the silver fur is, is valuable. It's more valuable than the red fur. So um, yeah, they were actually able to very quickly induce a lot of um, changes that made them tamer, but also interestingly had a lot of genetic parallels to the way that, that dogs are distinct from wolves. So for instance, a lot of these foxes ended up with like floppy ears or curled tails, things like that. Um, they also retain more juvenile features like dogs do compared yeah. to wolves. Which makes uh, you it but also makes you tended to ruin the fur. Yeah, yeah that's what side effect. I was wish you think I, I, I know that they did they did different things, but with uh co like not COVID evolution, uh con convey it. I can't I can't keep forgetting the words, simple words. Con congruent evolution, uh converge evolution. If they can ever make like great dane type foxes or chihuahua type fox foxes. I mean, hypothetically, um, one of the problems, though, is that, uh, so if you look at laws, there's a really strong status quo bias with what's legal and what's illegal, right? So, for instance, um, if caffeine were discovered today, that stuff would be super illegal. My Instead, uh, we don't even have an age limit on it. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, Five-year-old caffeine, and no one really cares. Yeah. My podcast will be an underground podcast right now. And so one of the things is, though, that um, similarly, laws about what animals you can and can't keep are based on what animals were basically reasonable pets 500 years ago. And so in most places, foxes are not classified as animals that you can keep as pets. Most places have rules against keeping wild animals and foxes count, even if they're domesticated, because the law doesn't care. Yeah. So that one of the problems with the fox becoming a new common pet is that it's illegal in a lot of places to own a domesticated fox, even if, even if it is legitimately one of these domesticated foxes that is yeah. fully domesticated and no less tame than you know a, an actual dog. So I don't think we're gonna get those, but yeah. I do think that um, I will answer Eric's question, and I think that'll be the last one because I gotta get going. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna, for, for, I was gonna say, I remember my question first of all. It reminded me, of, it was like earlier, it reminded me. Of, so you remind me of your your tweet yesterday about raising things about G, about GMOs, uh, how we, we took the the like the pigs, mm -hmm. the cows, and the corn from yesteryear to what we have now. Yeah, yeah. Modern pigs are just domesticated boars, and boars do not m much look or act like domesticated pigs. So the same okay. thing for, for corn is it's descended from the wild teosinte grass, and they are very different organisms now. Okay. And yeah, so. We've been genetically modifying our food organisms for tens of thousands of years. It's not new. It's just now faster and more targeted. And how, but, close, how close are you to your 50th, 50th episode of Kent with Bent? Um, it's, we're on 49 tomorrow. Wow. So next week is the big 5-0. Yep. Um, yep. So let's see. Uh, am I a fan of walking with dinosaurs? Generally, yes. Uh, of course, it has not aged super well 
um, the the special effects are now kind of they're, they're just not aging super well. And also some of the reconstructions we now know are a bit off. And in fact, the Allosaurus was terrible. The Allosaurus in Walking with Dinosaurs was actually a worse reconstruction than the Jurassic Park Allosaurus. Which is not, normally you cannot say that the Jurassic Park had a better reconstruction of anything than any mm -hmm. documentary. But it's actually the case for the Allosaurus. But generally speaking, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I still have a lot of uh, nostalgia for that series. I'm, I still watch it every few years or so. But, I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I, prefer, I, prefer walking, I prefer The Walking of Monsters. That was also cool. fun. Anyways, but anyways, thanks for being on here. Thanks for all the, uh, our, thanks for all the chat people. Uh, Eric, Ian, James, Maya, even, uh, even, I guess even Kenny for being in the chat. But anyways, uh, go to the Dapper channel tomorrow, same time. Uh, it, you, you want same to play? bat time, different bat channel. Yep. As we go, as we look close to the 50, as I always say, never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. We'll see y'all next time. Bye. Yep. And with Sorry. that, <laughs> if you just do it, he'll turn out okay. Hey, everyone, it is Hello. with Caffeine with my two special guests. Introduce yourselves, please. Uh, I'm Nestle Twit. Wait, hold on. So I'm Derek Dino. <laughs> I, uh, I have a channel, it's called Dapper Dino. I do things about all sorts of stuff, mostly creationism, dinosaurs, languages, sometimes weird new age stuff. I've been doing a lot of that lately, is weird new age stuff. That's me. All right, I, I, um, I go by the name of Neslik, and uh, or you can call me Ness for short. And I, I have been a frequent guest here. I've also talked with Dapper Dino, so, uh, so uh, uh, previously on nuclear energy, and I help Jackson Wheat uh, for uh, making scripts for his videos. So, if you want to like uh, uh, watch some of the work that I have in involved in, then please go check out uh, Jackson Wheat's channel. Um, uh, I am not currently seeing this as live on YouTube. Is everything going all right from the oh. YouTube end? I do not know. Huh. Because uh, I'm currently seeing it as waiting for Vandalia 1998, but that could also just be me. Because sometimes no, it's it's me my... too. Let me reset. Ah, uh, me too. Yeah, I oh no, maybe <laughs> have to do it all over again. Yeah, uh, or, or maybe not. Uh huh. I do not know. That's a good question. <laughs> but I I see oh. a I, I see a notification where we do. See, uh, oh, see, see it now. Thing. Streaming. Yeah. Oh, apparently we're streaming World of Warcraft. Okay, that's weird. According to stream elements. Oh, I, I, I see. I see it now. Uh, it, it's it's there. I see us. I, I also hear us. Yeah, it's 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 cool. cool. Okay, that's. <laughs> So we were live, but uh, uh, so for some reason my page didn't refresh uh, for to catch up. Yeah, but anyway, Coco, I think we can go ahead with the, the main topic. All right. So, all right. It's just weird. My my, my PC is still not showing it, but whatever. Because <laughs> if you say say it's live, we're live. So uh, our topic today is is languages. Yeah, which is a it's a pretty big topic. Yeah, well, um, before you. Say, so I wanted to, wanted to say that like last week we talked about the speciations of living living things. Today we're mm -hmm. gonna talk about the speciation languages. Yeah, well, there's there's actually a lot of interesting uh, commonalities between biological evolution and uh, language. Um, probably the most interesting of which is that uh, languages form family trees in essentially the same way as living things do. And so rather than having genes, you know, they have things like uh, words and morphemes and grammatical features <clears throat> that vary over time and also in different places and they change as time progresses mm -hmm. and so when you have a group of speakers that is separated from another group of speakers of the same language they'll start to vary in different ways and if they don't come back into contact soon enough they'll drift away to the point that, two, that the two populations can't immediately understand each other without learning the other person's mode of speaking, at which Ow. point you essentially have two languages. And also, it's microevolutionary, mm -hmm. and it's not 
design from the top down. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, a, it's a something we also, also talked about backstage uh, before, like uh, you have uh, the, some of the design languages, like uh, you have languages like Klingon, and also some of like the uh, languages which were designed for the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, folklore. So, and those languages turn out to be very, very simple in their uh, grammatical oh. Constructs. The Lord of the Rings ones tend not to oh. be because they were designed oh, right. to feel like natural languages. Oh, that's right. actually one of the interesting things is that if you were... So there's this hobby that exists, and sometimes it can be a bit of a profession. Like there are some professionals at this, but it's called conlang, which stands for constructive... Conlang stands for constructive language, right? So any language which is the intentional result of a group of humans or one human creating a language that is not just the result of a group of speakers simply communicating, is a constructed language. Now, most of them are created by one person, but some of them have been created by groups. Um, a big one. Two that um, people might know about are the related Logland and Logban, which were both created by groups to be a inherently logical language. Mm. So they, their grammar follows closely with various rules of formal logic, um, which basically means speaking a sentence in Lojban is a lot like just saying out loud, like you ever see that like uh, logical like Ruby and algebra? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Lojban sentences. They must be fun at parties. <laughs> they do have parties where everyone speaks only Lojban. I am yeah. going to go, but <laughs> no, neither am I. <laughs> but, um, so, but one of the interesting things about this is that unless people try really hard to, to not make it this way, constructed uh -huh. languages tend to be very regular and fairly simple. And natural languages tend to be full of irregularities and very complicated. And yeah, you can even see this in a counterpart of invented chess forms, that um, the, the, the actual natural chess game has a much broader range of variety than the, the variants that have come on. And by and large, the variants that are invented over the years don't really take off. They, 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 they played by just the person that invented them and then they disappear. There's a whole bunch of great chesses, a large, in large chess boards and the like that uh, went in that realm. Also, uh, Depper, uh, I, like, when I hear uh, RJ of Andalia, I, I hear them very loud and clear, but your voice seems to be a bit of uh, so, uh, like uh, uh, softer by comparison. Like, I don't know if you can move closer to your mic or maybe I'm going to see what I can do about that. I, I, I guess I can still understand you, but the you are, dinosaur is down yeah. in a bucket. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it sounds like you're uh, down a well a bit. Yeah. I apologize for being yeah. slightly late because my discussion with John Richards on his show went long. We we had a delightful time on there, and and uh, so I was just barely. Oh, I got another show out going two o'clock. Do I sound any better now? Yes. Oh, okay. much better. Okay. Well. Much better. Yeah. yeah. Now, now I have a question. Uh, the human genetics started over in Africa. Is that what the human language root is too? <clears throat> so the answer to that is probably with a whole big old question mark. So one of the problems that we have is um, languages evolve much, much faster than organisms do. And so we are now at the point where human languages have diverged to the point that it's probably not recoverable after a certain point which groups are related to others. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, are Afro-Asiatic languages related to Indo-European languages? Are Indo-European languages related to, uh, you know, Sino-Tibetan languages? Yeah. Are Sino-Tibetan languages related to Austronesian languages? And the answer is just, I that sounds very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Any any commonality they may have had before is now basically gone because of, of yeah. how, how many changes yeah. that has been And yeah. worse, we don't know how far back in the hominid lines language structures go right. because it's mm -hmm. software. So we don't know. I would be gobsmacked if the more sophisticated tool makers in the hominid lineage didn't teach their kids how to do the tool making using language of some kind. Yeah. So, now, there are some skeletal features that you can associate with language use uh, in yeah. a human-like fashion. One of them is um, humans have a particularly high and sort of vaulted uh, hard palate, and that's to help make sure that the, the tongue has room to go into different locations so that you can make distinct speech sounds. They oh. also have a particular... 
Yeah. yeah. They also have a particularly shaped uh, hyoid bone that allows for fine control over the vocal apparatus. So you can do fine control of pitch and, you know, you can make all sorts of different quality noises. And so yeah, those two things have some osteological foundation. Yeah. And, and we do see those the things. End, they yeah. can tell from the Neanderthals to some extent what, what pitch range they could hear as well as what they could say. Which was a bit different than uh, Homo sapiens. Yeah. Oh, so it's, aren't, aren't they just human beings? That's what Ken Ham says. Yeah. So it looks like language probably goes back at the at the latest, I would say, is probably Homo habilis. But it's probably earlier than that, too. Uh, there were yeah. probably Homo erectus languages. Now, one thing is, it's the difference between a, commu a communication system that isn't a language and that is, is a bit of a gradient. Yeah. Like, so, on, like on, some <clears throat> le on some level, even mon uh, some monkeys may have a very, very rudimentary form of language. Like, yeah, yeah. What, like what one type of sound says, oh, there's a snake in the ground, and one type of sound says, oh, there's a, uh, a very dangerous bird in the sky or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we talked about yeah. this a little bit last week too. Like, language is one of the first steps in like pre 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 zygotic speciation because you can't talk the same language, you might not want to mate with each other. Yeah, so that does happen, although <laughs> um, English, so English came about from a lot of people, Norse and Anglo-Saxon, intermarrying and interacting and the language mutating into an entirely new form. That took place over just a few centuries. I'll also say that there's a lo very large portion of the human population today shares Genghis Khan as a direct ancestor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I want I bring, Very I bring few up. of his children were fathered with women who spoke his language. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, RJ, wrap me something up. I, I'm talking about later. I, I definitely want to talk about English later. But first of all, Dapper. Yes, that's me. How do we know that all these languages weren't all America created 4,000 years ago in front of a tower? At Babel, yeah. <laughs> well, so <laughs> there's an interesting thing. You could actually make predictions based on the idea that all modern languages or modern language families, well, that's one of the other questions is we don't actually have a model for this, right? So yeah. did the language families arise at Babel as the uh, you know various proto-languages? Well, that creates some problems. One of them being that we know that the proto-languages had diverged before Mesopotamian civilization came around. And how do we know this? Well, because we have records of multiple Afroasiatic and multiple Indo-European languages around at the time of the Sumerians and the Akkadians. So, get a little bit of a problem there. Further, we actually would expect to see if all the languages originated from somewhere in Mesopotamia, which is where everyone <clears throat> who cares to try is placing the, uh, the Tower of Babel, or Babel, or whatever, I don't know. Uh, if that were the case, you'd expect to see various little branches of these language families spreading out from there. Instead, the history of the world shows that various language families spring up <clears throat> roughly in a particular place. For instance, Sino-Tibetan languages spring up in um, Central and East Asia. Austronesian mm -hmm. languages come around in areas around like Indonesia and Australia, right? And you, you, yeah. Asia. We did also expect to see some kind of like a genetic bottleneck. Like for example, uh, in America, you have less uh, uh, the diversity in uh, uh, dialects compared to in England, where uh, in uh, English is much more ancient compared to the uh, in America. Yeah, and has been interacting with uh, uh, invading cultures and that that have different language traditions. Uh, that's been very complicated. The thing that we can also verify the Babel argument doesn't work because the creationists make no attempt that I've ever seen of, of really showing all those other language systems. They just get hung up on Indo-European and then their brain shuts off. <laughs> Which is interesting because Indo-European, so there's a few weird things there, right? You, creationists really like, seem to like Hebrew, but they are very, very, very foggy on anything to do with Semitic languages, right? Like. Ask the average creationist to name three Semitic languages. Good luck. Uh, I mean, Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Yeah, Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Forget <laughs> about, no, forget about Arabic. Forget about Hebrew, medieval Hebrew, and modern Hebrew. Only two of those are real. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's 
that's one of those things where like it, it's sort of like um they they basically don't actually do any real work on figuring out the kinds beyond yeah, and- what seems like it might fit in the arc but like how did the he- semitic languages diversify into like hebrew canaanite syriac aramaic tigrinya gaz arabic akkadian you know? uh, is, is, is Canaanite also a separate language from Hebrew? But I, I thought like uh, the Hebrew was uh, the okay, so that's, me. Okay. Yeah, that's a little especially, bit weird. Especially it's, now, with, since they since oh, oh is Hebrew I just, that the, the Israelites came from within the Canaanites now. Right? Yeah. So Canaanite is a stratum of language that we can identify in the archaeological record of Canaan. And it does seem to have some genetic link to Hebrew, but it's not clear if it's a direct ancestor or if it might be like a cousin that then Hebrew speakers adopted the alphabet from, it would have to be a close cousin, right? Yeah. So, and, and that actually is mirroring the ambiguity as to just exactly how the Hebrews are or are not connected to that larger Canaanite culture to begin with in, in terms yeah. of the origin. You can't go by the little fairy tale cartoon that's in Genesis. <laughs> so yeah, that is, um, a part of that thing there. And also, um, another thing is that the Babel narrative kind of comes out of nowhere. So other places in Genesis earlier, you actually get these um, these genealogies that seem to indicate that according to this narrative, the sons and grandsons of Noah are going out and spreading into different parts of the world, right? Because mm-hmm. people identified with known locations in the ancient world are identified as being, you know, the grandson of this guy named this thing, and it, their na- the name of the grandson yeah. is similar to the name of the people who he, you know, is the progenitor of, right? But then afterwards, you get this new narrative, and it says, like, oh, everyone was gathered together in the plain of Shinar. And it's like, wait, didn't we just explain how everyone got to where they are, but now they're in Shinar all at once? And did God just happen to confuse the languages along genealogical lines? Mm-hmm. And the genealogical lines also correlate pretty well to language family lines. And so it's like the whole thing doesn't really cohere into a single story very well because, spoiler alerts, Genesis wasn't written as a single book. It's a compilation yeah. of earlier works and oral histories. It, it would be as though we were hearing a narrative that said, and Alabama moved to Idaho and smite uh. the Washingtonians. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, off to- kind of same topic, but same topic. Um, people, you know how they say that they have so many gener- people generate it. They say g- generations after the ark that they, 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 they try to have the population you know spread out. Gene- uh, like so many people, people every so often years, you know. But isn't isn't after the ark? Don't people aren't people still living like like five hundred years now? Still. Four, oh, initially, or five years? yeah, yeah. They 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 hang on. It's only, and creationists write tediously silly papers, you know, that graph off all the various patriarchs and what the age oh, drop goodness. off as they gradually turn into like 60, 70 years old over time. It, it, but how can they as, still, as like, the like, mythology starts disappearing. And, and, and I was like, how can they have like so many people in Egypt, like 500 people in Egypt built the ark? You know, if, if oh, they bred like rabbits. 500, five, but people are still living 500 years apart. So it can be like 20 generations, but uh, you, 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 can't, actually have a, you actually have a complete contradiction. At the, yes, they can figure out uh, how to get the present population from just Noah and the kids, and they can extrapolate all that. But then they have too few people to do all the stuff that we can see going on in the world. So actually, they have to have a very high growth rate of the population initially, which then starts yeah. slowing down. Otherwise, we're up to our armpits in people uh, by our time. Like so again, they're not they're not being biblical literalists because you know people are still, people don't have kids to like to like what three hundred four hundred. Oh, at this and point they still. can't they can't be. Uh, one of the little points that that Jackson and I are, are mentioning in the new book is that there are multiple versions of the various genealogies in the Bible and various dates that are given of them as to how old they live and when they had kids and so forth, and you can arrive at different dates for creation. For the Tower of Babel, for the Exodus story, for the flood, depending on which you do. And in fact, over time, some of these things have ranged, you know, like, like hundreds and a thousand years variation as to what they did from biblical analysis, because the Bible is not a single tidy little document. And, th- and creationists know this, but they don't highlight it a lot. They like to give the impression that the version that's presented at Answers in Genesis or ICR is the only true one. No, 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 no. There's not, that's, that's dicey. 
multiple versions of the infallible truth. Yep, yep. I, I'm so, shocked, shocked to hear that. Back to, back to languages. It, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, do languages have like like a ring species of effect, like like in biology? Uh, yeah, they're called dialect continua. Yeah. So a dialect continuum will be a, a now they tend not to actually form into rings, just like ring species tend not to actually do this. Yeah. But you will get areas where people in, say, neighboring sections will all be able to understand their neighbors on either side, but when you get too far away, you'll start to be unable to do that. And actually, this happens in a lot of the uh, northern countries that speak Germanic languages in uh, Europe. So, like, Swedish and Danish and Norwegian form actually a dialect continuum where you can walk between those different areas that speak these languages, or in some cases take quick ferries or things like that, and always going be going between two places where the people can understand each other, but getting to places where the, the previous two places that you went to now can't understand these next three places you're going to. All right. Yeah. So like, it's like, like, said, so it's like, like so there's three cities in a row, and the middle city can understand both cities on each, uh, each of its side, but the, the two cities on the side can't, can't, can't understand each other? Yeah, that happens in real life. It's usually not a city. It's usually not as easy as, you know, one, mm -hmm. two, three cities. Uh, Although in some parts of China, it is. Radically Many cities in China. Because of the fact that we have media. Uh, first radio and, and sound film and then television and all the rest. That's that's accelerated the process of language amalgamation and, and diluting and, and disintegrating older language, uh, language variation. Um, uh, years ago, it's been like 40 years I, I visited Atlanta, you would have heard the way I talk as the average language that you would be hearing in Atlanta until you go into a store or somewhere and suddenly you start hearing the more classic Georgia dialect. And I have no idea how far that's that's progressed now because people population shift and, and things have moved so much since then. Uh, so, Ness, you have anything to say? Oh, uh, I, I like, uh, and I know nothing about that, no, but I, I had a question about like, uh, uh, about the depot of the Uris is about like uh, there, there is little or almost no commonality between very uh, uh, this language like this there's, there's almost no commonality between Indo-European and the African languages but uh, I, I was wondering like there are some some words for example the word that we use that we use as, as infants to refer to our mother and father like mama and papa these are mm -hmm. very universal at, or maybe not uh, entire universe but i see i hear the same words used in like japanese yeah to refer to the mother and father yeah so there are actually um there are a few hypotheses about this currently as far as i know and it's been a little while since i checked into this so things may have changed you know check the literature yourself but um when last i looked into it the the leading hypothesis was basically that these a sequence of you know two bilabial stops whether nasalized or not followed by an open, unrounded vowel is just very, very easy for a, yeah. an infant to say. And it's very easy for them to make both mm. of those. And it's not clear why there's a tendency for the nasalized bilabial stop to be uh, associated with the mother and the non-nasalized to be associated with the father. And it's interesting to note that um, Papa and Baba all both occur with similar frequency for father in many languages. Um, so, so, so sometimes they are switched between... Uh in different languages like uh, they are switched yeah. sometimes but there it does seem to be a tendency for the nasalized to be associated with the female parent and the non-nasalized stop to be associated um, with what, the male what, what does it mean na nasal eyes oh. oh so mama is nasalized because the the m you divert some of the airflow through your nose oh oh nasal oh I, I, now i know i understand yeah nasalized. yeah hmm. so it's not as far as i know it's not very clear why there seems to be that tendency it also isn't necessarily the case that there really is that tendency that could be a sampling error um so well, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. a, it, a it, lot it of problems is, comes is nasal, oh, sorry is, is the nasal nasalized more easier to pronounce than the non-nasalized not really no uh, but it's an no. easy distinction for a, a baby to make is to either do that or not yeah some words do have kind of of uh, structure as to how they relate to things, and this can even relate to gibberish. The famous one being the Takeda and Maluma, at, you know, um, uh, gibberish words that if you ask somebody, you know, if you uh, uh, what a Maluma is versus a Takeda, and you have like a roundy thing versus a very angular thing, uh, that people across cultural uh, boundaries and languages would call 
uh, the, the angular one a Takeda and the uh, rounded one a Maluma. Yeah, yeah, that, there are similar experiments. Um, there's there are a number of uh, things that are seem to be cross cultural, um, sort of like sound <sighs> associations and stops and closed or fronted vowels tend to be associated with sharp or smaller things and um, fricatives or or glides or uh, open or rounded vowels tend to be more associated with big or soft or rounded things. But there are notable exceptions. For instance, in English, Damn. the word small is all made up of words that you would associate with big round things. And the word big is, uh, you know, all associated with things that you would think yeah, of probably, as small and pointy. The study on here, uh, Steven Pinker has written on a lot of this stuff, uh, John McWhorter uh, more recently, and uh, about the kind of deep roots and structure of language yeah. uh, that uh, we're instantly hampered by the fact that we can't know what a Neanderthal said, if anything. We can't know right. what a, a Homo erectus might have been saying, and, and even early humans, but we, we don't know what their language could be. We, so everything has to be done by paleolinguistics burrowing backwards from extant languages and paying attention to the population and biogeography of those populations and trying to look at neurological studies as to what goes on in the brain. There's an awful lot of ongoing work to work out. We know that nouns and verbs, for example, are processed in specialized areas in the brain and, and why that's turned out to be the case and what kind of structural contingencies have dictated forms of language independent of what people want to do to them consciously. Uh, that's still ongoing research. So we just got to put question mark, question mark, question mark. Yeah. I, I, well, I wonder, is there maybe a uh, hierarchical relation between like words and grammar? Like, for example, in, in the uh, uh, organism taxonomy, like some traits are more ancient, more, more widespread and therefore more ancient than in others. In a way, and, and I it's suspect also in language. Some yeah. of it has to do with the sequence in which sensory information is processed. Uh, one of the examples Pinker uh, would point out is that we would say a big red ball. We would not say a red big ball. That there's kind of ways that we cluster things together in adjectives and that, that may be clues to how we process information in the brain that get up an internal hierarchy going. One of the areas that I think will be fantastically useful if it can ever be broken figuring out what, if anything, is linguistic about cetacean communication. Because they are a different line from us little primates, and yet they have seemingly very sophisticated communication, things that may very well be built on such a completely different grammatical internal structure because of the evolutionary history of their brains that it's really an alien language. And if we can crack that, that would be illuminate why our language system developed the way it did. Well, before I get to my question, uh, AJ, anything to say about this topic? Uh, is my audio okay, guys? Is it? Yeah, yeah. I hear you fine. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, cetaceans, they uh, communicate with echolocation, right? Or, or whale songs, like, um, is that what you're talking about? Or Well, it, it, it's partly, the one is that you can't whisper. Everything is public. But the other mm -hmm. issue has to do with the fact that they have um, uh, something we can't do uh, is, is, you know, we can't walk up to somebody and hum at them and see inside their body. And so there's a whole bunch of structural dynamics that are going on. Their brain never completely shuts down. They don't, it, half of the brain sleeps in dolphins and, while the other's awake. Uh, and the, the, the structure of how their language structure would be going, that we can't seem to get past the hi, I'm Susie uh, name card category. And I suspect if there's a complex language structure there, it's because it's built on such a completely different sensory processing that it's weirdly alien to us. For example, it would be as if I came up to you and said, hi, the Titanic is sinking, I'm looking away from you, means different than if I look you in the eye when I say that, that there could be a, a, a spatial a context that is utterly unknown in the language processing that we have that would make it extremely difficult to deal with. The thing that's mysterious about our language, independent of whales and cetaceans, has to do with why it's grammatical, why nouns, verbs, direct objects, that languages, most languages, and, and, and uh, Dapper can, can uh, clarify this if I'm making a mistake on there. My understanding is 
is that it looks like early languages are highly inflected in the way that Latin and the German still is and all that with cases and all of that. But what's the language we're mm -hmm. speaking is a weird mutant that is a word order language. It's not inflected in the way our ancestral forms of it were. Anglo-Saxon and all the root languages were highly inflected. We've dropped all of that. So we've mm -hmm. mutated. We're, we're, we're speaking a very atypical language. Well, I, I think it's interesting to look at it as a language, but when humans developed uh, Morse code, I mean, that's easy for us to understand because you have like dots and dashes, but with a, a whale communication, it's just like these long uh, whale calls that are so loud. I think submarines can, can even pick them up on their uh, their radar or their oh, sonar. Oh, yeah, they're, they're meant so to be it, heard over a long distance, and, and there's a clear social contact. And I don't think all whales do singing of that sort all not all whales do echolocation so we're also talking about very specialized subsets here whereas one thing that is universal for humans we all do language well uh humans we not only communicate with language but also with our, our facial uh expressions and uh, body movements and hands and i'm not sure uh, if whales are communicating from like you know uh, two miles away they they kind of oh, lack again, that, yeah so. it's a very different dynamic and by the way that that talking with your hands thing is not accidental that an awful lot of what they have learned about the core brain systems that are used in language processing they are actually hitchhiking on the ones primates use for hand gestures not vocal calls that's kind of a sidebar. So there's a, an argument that it can be made that aspects of language may have come from mime and gesturing, not acoustic signaling. Well, I'm. Mean, who is uh, doing the potato oh, chip? Oh, oh, money, that's you're Sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Do, do when whales? Uh, I mean, I would assume that they call to uh, try and let a mate know that, like, hey, I'm, I'm nearby. Can they tell if it's a male or female from just from the sound? Like, do we know? How much do they well, actually I, I, know? I'm about, not sure about that. I, I don't know. Are we are we just I, like I don't in the dark? Anything or, about it. Like, do we know anything about about their sort of language, or are we just kind of guessing? I think the whale's song, in the case of humpback whales, is much more likely to be not a sexual display. Hey, I'm a mate. Uh, that's done close quarters. Uh, it's it's they're singing some history poetry something that's that I don't think is having much to do with. Uh, hey, baby, come on over. <laughs> right. I think we should return to the uh, human languages. Uh, yeah. uh, but speaking um, of the yeah. human languages, um, are different dialects like the different dialects of languages like the like the equivalent of subspecies in animals? Kind of. Um, yeah. So, yeah. One of the problems is that it's hard to define a dialect, and it's also equally hard to define when you have two languages, and. What we call a dialect and what we call a language sometimes depends on things like uh, geopolitical concerns more than it does yeah. linguistics. Generally speaking, linguists will say that if two people cannot communicate in a common method of communication with reasonable understanding so that they actually mostly understand what the other person is saying, there might be a few missed things, then they speak different languages. However, we have real world examples of a single language where that is the case within the dialects in terms of what everyone calls languages and dialects. So for instance, um, someone from Marrakesh speaking their native Arabic cannot have a conversation with someone from Baghdad speaking their native Arabic. It will be just as difficult as someone from Madrid speaking their native Spanish speaking to someone in, say, Romania speaking their native Romanian. It just will not work. Yeah. Like, um, like, like you know that my uh, aunt passed away earlier this week, right? Yes, we'll my condolences. Thank yeah. you. But when they came oh, up a few years ago, and, and when I was ten, you know, sometimes the way they they they, they, they lived, their family lived in Tennessee, and the way they sometimes the way they talked is I'm like what, and it's two, <laughs> two, two days away. I'm like, well, hey, well, yeah, well, and, that... and the dialects were so specific, that it's it's changing within our lifetimes. But certainly when I was younger, that the dialects were so specialized that linguists could tell exactly where you were from. Uh, by how you talk, because they, they were so specialized that they, there was no such thing as the southern accent. It was Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, that they all had their own particular little sub uh, details. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Texas, but I don't really think I have like a southern accent. But I know in the yeah, UK, it's, it's changed you, you can, dramatically from, from the time yeah. frame as people have moved around and everything has become televisionized. 
I am speaking mm -hmm. what has become the standard Western American generic dialect, and everybody else is now quaint locality kind of things. And and this is and it's probably no coincidence because Washington State was settled relatively late in the game and didn't have a lot of baggage, and so people came in in the, the whole Western area is from people moving and consolidating and transforming so quickly that the language is jump-starting in a way and simplifying and tidying and changing in a way that that wouldn't happen in a lethargic rural environment where you're only learning mm -hmm. the language of the people immediately around you. Yeah, I know in the United Kingdom, you can really tell if somebody's like from South London or if they're Scottish or I know it's very yeah. distinct over there still. Which in is, a yeah, relatively I, small area, the, the, yeah, I, I, the size of yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I heard like the, like in, in, over in England, just like just like the, like in, over in Africa has more genetic diversity than we have over here, but in England they have more like language diversity. The, the, yeah. language and, and it's also a class thing like they have oh, something I, like uh received pronunciation where somebody can tell mm -hmm. if you're um wealthy or if you grew up like going to a uh you know a underfunded public school just based on your dialect uh, you how talk. you speak yeah. but De 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 doesn't, doesn't, yeah. doesn't the african language all have also like very uh high diverse uh words like because they are more ancient right or not so first you can't really say that there is an, an African group of languages. Uh, Africa is mm -hmm. a very complex area right. linguistically, partly because yeah. it is in fact such an old area in terms of human uh, habitation, but also because it's gigantic. Um, mm -hmm, people right. don't realize just how big a landmass Africa is. But um, it's a so continent. <laughs> on the one hand, yes, Africa has some commonalities that tend to go across, but one Let of the things that is, down. there's a, is a continent. There, so there's this a phenomenon. <laughs> I can't talk. There's a phenomenon in linguistics called aerial features or aerial, aerial linguistics, which is uh, the spread of features of a language not through genetic descent, but through spread across an area of on the surface of the Earth by contact. Right. So you can think of this if you want to keep with the analogy to biological evolution as horizontal gene transfer. And, and even so, some latitudinal gradients. Aren't there examples of where as languages move north or south? That there is a tendency to, to change some of the consonant pronunciations in the thing just naturally independent of the language those studies are not uncontroversial is what i will say about ah, okay that. Uh, thank, thank you for the note <laughs> yes those are the, the answer to those is a it's a very interesting thought to think about but it's a very big <laughs> maybe <Yeah>. maybe <laughs> don't um, so, slap jim uh, uh, so go, go on go on dapper that, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So one of the things that has complicated with uh, African languages is there's actually a really high amount of aerial features that occur in certain areas in Africa, but then the un the languages that are acquiring these aerial features themselves then seem to be a bit more closely related to each other than perhaps they are. So there's actually a whole lot of work in Africa trying to tease together which languages are actually genetically li uh, linked versus which ones are only similar because of aerial features. Versus in some cases, perhaps, are some of the languages that are now seen as long-standing natural languages actually Creoles that started from a trade pigeon? Maybe. And I so. think you also have to factor in colonialism. Co colonialism. Yeah. You do yeah. to some extent, although um, the, so the non-Indo-European languages in Africa, the various native languages, weren't really in contact long enough with um, colonial empires from a linguistic standpoint, to have erased much of that um, yeah. character that and, linguists and, and could use to tease out My these. understanding is that language travels more on economic lines than political. So you can run the state, if you like, and try to impose your language on it, but it won't have any as big an effect on how the language actually operates and what people are buying and selling and who is making the stuff they're buying and selling. It was certainly the case with, with English where very few French words entered the language when they were being run by French-speaking Normans and the like and Plantagenets mm -hmm. did as they started to trade with the French in greater areas in the 1300s. So that is a, a tendency. Languages do tend to follow trade more than they follow mm -hmm. um, political power. So for instance, um, there have been quite a few dynasties in Chinese history where the rulers did not speak any Han Chinese language as their native language. And in fact, there have been times in 
various Chinese dynasties where Mongolic or related languages or sometimes even other types of languages have become the official court yeah. and governmental language of China. And they never really had much penetrating power among the ethnic Han Chinese in terms of getting them to speak these languages. However, there have been cases where um, certain polities have been interested enough in suppressing native languages that they've more or less wiped out some of them. For instance, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Irish Gaelic is not on the com is not coming back. Sorry, to, sorry to spoil it for all those guys who are big fans of, you know, Irish revivalism. It's not going to happen. After well, and, decades and look at of India, where where the the British Raj English became functionally a handy language that they could bypass their local dialects that have continued to operate. So they have their own local languages, yeah. and everybody <clears throat> speaks English because that way you can communicate with everybody. Yeah, so that is another thing that, that can happen. Um, the, the Irish example is actually one where you've essentially replaced the language. Um, yeah. Because that is, when you get to the point where everyone speaks one particular language and it's the easiest language to speak, people tend to stop speaking other languages at home even if they're their native language. And so that's the situation that you have in a lot of places where uh, English or Spanish are replacing native languages. So, for instance, in uh, places like Mexico or Brazil, you get Spanish and Portuguese edging out many native languages. It's actually the case yeah, you that still have some antiquarians and local populations. Right. You still have Mayans <clears throat> uh, speak, spoke in the uh, Yucatan area. You have uh, Native Americans here who still do their native language, although in, in many cases, a lot of them are worried about the fact that the main speakers of them are the grandparent that's about ready to die off. Yeah. In, in the, by the end of the 21st century, there probably will be fewer than a dozen uh, native languages left in North America, which actually have yeah. native speakers. Mm. Well, I, I, know South, I, I know South Africa, they have a very distinct uh, uh, sort of English accent that almost sounds British. It's like, I'm from South Africa. South African is also the derivative of my uh, native language. The Dutch. Well, and the su the Southern American dialect is, uh, and again, uh, if if I'm making a goof up here, uh, a dump on me, Dapper. But my my recollection of it is that it's a, an amalgamation in part of the particular regions in I England where a lot of people came in Cornwall and others, and mixed in with the African languages of the various slave hold uh, peoples that they enslaved. That they were the ones, the mammies that were raising the kids and all of that. That that generated structure and dynamic of what we call that southern dialogue so that is is broadly true although it is also the case that um african-american uh language use in the southern united states did remain fairly distinct from general use by uh mm -hmm. white uh americans in the southern united states even after uh slavery which is one of the reasons why uh, people speaking african-american vernacular english in very disparate parts of the country will all sound very similar to each other, but people speaking local dialects that are in common use among uh, the white population can have significant differences even just across state lines that are for adjacent states. Uh, part of that is that there is, there, differences in language don't just come from regional dialects. There are also uh, dialects that can come from things like social class or standing or even profession. And so, um, speaking yeah, in, like, a, yeah, in a dialect, in yeah, so speaking yeah. in a dialect associated with a different group of people that are in the same region, but have a different identity, whether it be cultural okay. class or whatever, can tell other people information about you without you needing to express it. So it can actually be useful. So for Florence instance, Olivier style <clears throat> Shakespeareese is actually Oxford, Cambridge, English. It's a, right. it's a very narrow social class and so, and i've seen a thing where they reconstructed what shakespeare would have sounded like in london in the 17th yeah, century and that it sounds more like cockney um so for example in the southern united states if you were to speak in the way that most uh white people at the time were speaking you would be associating yourself with that group and that could send different messages for instance if you're visibly white it could simply be sending the message that hey i'm a white person even if legally because Remember, during much of the history of the United States, they had legal definitions for who counted as white. Yeah. And many people who looked white didn't technically count. But if you spoke yeah. in a manner that identified you with white people, you could often pass as a white person and then use the various facilities and uh, businesses open to white people. 
On the other hand, <clears throat> if you were, say, a black person and you started to speak in the way that most of the white people were speaking, depending on what on what the situation is, that could be seen as a challenge to the upper class, if you will, of the time. Or it could be if you're, say, a professional who owns a business, it could be that you're trying to you know, integrate yourself into the wider economy and that might have a more positive reaction because you're um, kind of indicating that, hey, look, I have a business or I'm you know, this professional and I'm, I'm with you guys. That might generate a positive reaction there. And that kind of thing happens all throughout history. Like you said, we have the received pronunciation taught in the upper class British schools but that's not any My fair lady, a play right. and movie. That's exactly what it's about. You are, and, and people perceive you to be how you speak. Right. There's, a, there's also an interesting, uh, like we mentioned about how, uh, like uh, different words or different aspects of languages tend to be traded between different languages. Like for example, in, in English, there's an interesting pattern to see in the, na the, the names we give to animals and the names we give to the, uh, the the meat uh, that we uh, have, like, for example, yes. in my in my in my language, when when we refer to let's say the cow, we refer, we refer to the, the to the meat as cow meat. We don't refer to a different yeah. name like beef, like beef, for example. In in English, you go to yeah. the you basically you, you go to the zoo and you speak English, but when you go to the restaurant, for some reason, you start speaking French. Right, but, yeah, well, exactly. I think that beef yeah. uh, you, mm -hmm. you can uh, familiarize. I think isn't beef from the French beef? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that remind yes. that reminds me of my next thing I'm going to bring up. You mentioned the horizontal gene transfer earlier. Is there a difference between the English language pre-Norman invasion and post-Norman invasion? Oh yeah. Yes, um, it's basically the difference between Old English and Middle English to a large extent. Yeah, and um, it's one of the great transformations of language structure. Uh, Anglo-Saxon is a Germanic language, but then again, the, the, the Normans were speaking French, which is basically an odd distillation of Latin uh, that's knocked in. And, and then what really kicked things off was the fact that um, uh, there was a wonderful series that was done way back, I think in the 1970s or 80s, on the origins of language that was done on PBS. And they were, they were investigating this whole issue. And if, if a somebody from a Norse settlement and a Saxon settlement wanted to buy a horse or sell one, what did they say? Well, they had a lot of common vocabulary, fair to, uh, for horse, but, but was it fair to, fair to, uh, because they, they would have different cases to describe more than one horse. Are you selling well, two horses, one horse? Uh, and so it was just easier to, to get rid of a lot of that in, and mutate into a new language structure. And it, it took place comparatively. If you move from Chaucer down to Shakespeare, the sea change has already taken place. Yeah, a lot of the grammar changes um, were very. There were very few grammar changes from Chaucer to uh, Shakespeare, as compared to say from the writer of Beowulf to Chaucer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and some of the uh, like the common explanation I hear for uh, why English has, has a different name for the meat than to the animal, like like beef and like beef pork compared to a pig and uh, cow. And it, it's, it's, well, it's probably the case like when the uh, like the, the, the farmers, the uh, the ones who were, who were in charge with uh, the, uh, raising the animals, they refer to them in the English vernacular. But when the nobility uh, who, who enjoyed uh, eating the actual meat, they they more uh, often sp spoken yeah, uh, perhaps but the, the, yeah. the, the major factor is english is a word thief language there is no language on earth that steals words from other languages with such abandon as english which is why english language dictionaries are so much bigger and it, mm -hmm. it, uh, than everybody else and it makes pronunciation a pain because we've stolen from so many different languages with so many different pronunciation modes and modified them that there's it's hard to get a spelling convention the i before e except after c is because we've stolen a bunch of french words that are spelled differently than english also yeah, there are more exceptions so that are rules and words that follow it. exactly <laughs> um well i will say that english does have an unusual capacity with that although it is not unique in having that capacity there are in fact uh languages out there where um the majority of the words used in that language actually come from languages that are not genetically related to it. Yeah. So, um, 
for instance, there are a number of uh, Mongolic languages where the it's very clear they're Mongolic because they have sort of the, the classic Mongolic language structure. So they're highly agglutinative and they have a similar constant inventory and such. But many of them have replaced more than half of their basic vocabulary mm. with Sino Tibetan or uh, Slavic words. Is it precisely origins. because they've been so what? migratory? They're constantly bumping into other cultures? So migratory and also spent so long um, in close trade contact with other groups. And also ah, because economics again. <laughs> it's been a very, very, very long time since any Mongolic speaking population has been in political control of their own state. Uh, can you yeah, find that? What I love said, uh, it was like their lutinative. What, what was that? About the agglutinative? Language? So, yeah. So agglutinative is, uh, there are, now the, like most things in language, the borders around these terms are fuzzy <laughs> and oversimplified. <laughs> these are oversimplified, but there are three kinds of ways that languages tend to encode grammatical function in words. The first is isolating. English is actually a fairly isolating language. English does very little inside of a word to tell you what the grammatical function of the word is. Mostly it just is like, oh, we have a plural ending and we have a few verb endings here and there, but mostly words just stay the same in English. Uh, now, say the Han Chinese languages are extremely isolating. They, in fact, I believe Mandarin has one morpheme in the entire language that is actually affixed directly onto a word rather than being a standalone word. One in the entire language, which is very unusual. The next one that you get to is... Um, you can get to agglutinative languages in which you take a whole bunch of suffixes or prefixes or sometimes even infixes, which is rare, but it happens, and you shove them together and you get a big old word, right? So mm. uh, in the real world, uh, Turkish is probably the most well-known agglutinative language, but the Mongolic languages are also highly agglutinative, as are the other Turkic languages that aren't Turkish. Uh, it, it, oh. like, it, it's also like, uh, interesting to note that even, even though uh, people in uh, Turkey are often associated with uh, uh, Arabic because they are mostly Muslim, but Turkish is actually not an, an Arabic or closely related to Arabic, right? Turkish language. Yeah, Turkish is not very closely related. It's not related at all, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, so now there's the other thing that you can do where you have, um, and now the, the word is escaping me. What is that? I'm sorry, I'm having a bit of a, a brain fart. Dino brain fart. I know. Oh, well, while you're in fart mode, oh, I'll, I'll offer my favorite example sorry. from English oh, to I, the German. I figured out the real issue of... Oh, if, oh, if, if you get down. Yeah. So there's, there's also fusional where uh, you take a whole bunch of different concepts in grammar and you smush them into one little affix, right? So in, um, in Spanish, you have uh, a verb like comir, right? To eat. But if you say como, that indicates first person singular subject on the verb, as well as present tense simple aspect, which covers habitual as well as continuous aspectual cases, at least in the present tense for Spanish. And it also tells you the mood. It's the indicative mood, not the subjunctive mood. So that one letter gives you all of that. Whereas if you were speaking, say, a Mongolic or a Turkic language, each one of those little functions would probably have its own extra suffix or prefix. So, real fast, so, so VB, mm. you wanted to come on, we're talking about the English language. You, tell me you, you wanted to talk about? Oh, yeah. Um, so I commonly study old English history, so I just wanted to come in about the English. And then when I got here, we'd moved on. <laughs> Oops. Well, hey, we can go back to English. It's a yeah. language that I know fairly well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting how how um, our modern dialect actually comes from multiple different Old English dialects. That's true. Uh, like, like our word speak is the West Saxon dialect. Everyone else in Old, Eng in Old English would say spreka. Um, oh, that, that, that's actually the same uh, word that, that uh, we use in Dutch. Like, we, we, uh, like when we... They say talk, we say spreken. Yeah, yeah. spreken in German. German. Yeah. Yeah, but for some reason in uh, Wessex, they dropped the R and lengthened the E. So speka, and that eventually becomes speak in modern English. Um, our word I comes from East, it was either East Anglian or Essex dialect. 
uh, because every in Northumbria you have eek. Um, in ev well, in German, it, else. it's eek. Oh, they just shortened. They lopped off the stuff. So, so a language can evolve by removing side features and cleaning it up, tidying it up, shorthanding it. Well, in East Anglia and Essex, uh, the word was actually e. So uh, the K it's had German. become it's German. Yeah, the K had almost become just a, a H instead. Um, and everywhere and it else, even it happens in German, where where they they habitually spell words with a th in them, but they don't pronounce th. It's pronounced as a hard t. Well, to be yeah, fair, that's that. That, that sound right there, the um, the dental fricative, is one mm -hmm. of the rarest sounds in all human languages. It's a ridiculously the, stupid sound. Yeah, yeah. The, Greek, the Greeks have a, a and Castilian uh, Spanish, I guess, has it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. When I speak Spanish, uh, I say gracias instead because I learned from a Span Spaniard. Well, one, so one thing I like about instead Spanish. Of gracias, uh, uh, I like about Spanish that it has over the English language is that it has the feminine and masculine uh, uh, nouns, and that makes it a lot simpler to learn the language versus English. Uh, well, English used to have them back in the day, but they got rid of them because of the confusion between all the competing uh, figures. Uh, as to the word thief thing, my favorite one that I learned when I was learning German is that uh, what we would call armistice talks. Armistice is just glommed onto from French. They just stole the word. In German, they had to be fussy and have a proper German word. So they have often still on Real fast, does someone want, does someone out there want to be a guest star? I, I, I hear I hear some uh like I don't some I hear dog for I want to be on camera. I wouldn't oh sorry that that must be my dog maestro. <laughs> he, he howls a lot. <laughs> Der Hund Correct. Oh. Uh, Speaking oh, I, of gender, one thing that's interesting is um, – actually, there's two things that are interesting about languages cross-linguistically with regards to gender. One is that um, many languages have gender systems that do not fall into masculine, feminine, and neuter categories. Now, one thing that you'll sometimes hear language speak or teachers say is that um, the gender in languages like French or Spanish, it's arbitrary and has nothing to do with you know, male, male or femaleness. That's a lie. And here's how you can tell it's a lie. Because words for humans have an extremely strong tendency to align with the gender of the referent. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important thing. And what tends to happen for other words is they get, um, you, they get associated with a gender based on how they sound, right? So if there isn't an obvious actual gender to associate with a referent, like a table or a chair or something, if there's something about the word that makes it sound similar to the way that you attach, um, you know, endings or something to make a word for a human, masculine or feminine, it ends up falling into that gender. But another interesting thing is many languages have gender systems that, yeah, nothing about masculine, feminine or neuter. They, uh, for instance, Swahili has about 16 genders, none of which are masculine or feminine. Um, and the uh, Navajo has, I think, somewhere around six noun classes, which are technically genders. And again, none of them are. What, one of what them are they? What humans. are they focusing on? What are the systematic criteria for what what is one gender versus another? Say in Swahili. So in Swahili, you have a whole bunch of different things. Um, there are genders that indicate uh, as a sort of general grab bag for inanimate objects. There's mm -hmm. uh, gender indicating things that are particularly dangerous. So certain kinds of snakes or other type of things fall into this particular gender. There's a gender for. Um, general animate objects that don't fall into other like the utilitarian classification system. Yeah, it's a kind it's, of not only is it a heck of a utilitarian classification system, but also because Swahili uses double marking on verbs, but doesn't mark for a grammatical case on nouns, the gender system is important to determining what words are the subject and object of sentences in Swahili. Because in Swahili, you double mark verbs for the person and gender in first, or sorry, not in first, in both second and third um, persons for both subject and object. And then the actual nouns in the sentence or pronouns are simply put in there where the speaker would like them for various uh, like dialect or uh, discourse level phenomena. 
But the way that you disambiguate which one is the subject and which one is the object or the indirect object is by paying attention to which genders were used on the marking on the verb and what they correlate mm. to in the sentence. So if you were to try to ignore the gender system in Swahili, it would quickly become incomprehensible. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned pronouns right now. So I, I, wanted, I want you to settle this for me because I was watching mm. a clip from Ben Shapiro where he says that the word oh, no. them or they has never been a, a, a singular pronoun. And uh, I'm like, that's that not is incorrect. True. Yeah. So they, okay, so this is a bit of a weird, complicated distinction that it's, it's way beyond what you normally get in English class in school, right? They has for centuries been used as an option for a gender indeterminant singular third person pronoun, which is one of the reasons why people will often feel uncomfortable calling a particular person they know about they because the actual use that has been typical in English is you can use they for a third person if you don't know and, the and gender. And that's how I've used it for all my life. Right. So for centuries now, this has been an option for if you're saying some indefinite person of irrelevant gender, right? So like you can say like if someone wants to come into the bakery, they can buy this loaf of bread, but I'm not going to sell it to them from you know the street. The reason you're if using I, if I were in, in scholarship, this is why it came in because I'm from a scholarly world. If you have a paper by K. Smith, do you say he or she or they? Because you don't know the gender. Right. On the other hand, it is yeah. an extremely new idea to use the third person plural, what's normally the third person plural pronoun, to refer to a particular individual whom you should generally be expected to know the gender of. Mm. Yeah. So it, uh, that I, is, in fact, a highly unusual and novel feature that some people would like to introduce. But the reason there's pushback is because it is, in fact, a new use of that pronoun. So when people say, oh, it's never been a single people. pronoun, you're yeah. wrong. Yeah, 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 I just realized that you're right. Some names are gen some names are can be gender neutral, like Andy, like, like, sort, sort of for Andrea or Andrew. Well, there there are people who are gender non-conforming who want to use want to be called yeah, they as their true. pronoun, and you have people like Ben Shapiro who want to push back against that because they're conservatives and mm -hmm. they're trying to say that oh, this yeah. has never been used as a, a singular pronoun, but it's just not true. Language is part of so, how we perceive <clears throat> the world; it's how we communicate, and any shifts in it scares the shit out of people. There's there are people that I know in the atheist community that just bristle when they hear somebody say ax instead of ask and i'm going excuse me a it's a dialect feature b it's popped up in language over and over again it's not something that was invented by black people and and the, the, there's a way that your tongue gets tangled up when you're saying some of these things yeah. or nuclear versus nuclear you know languages mutate just settle on it it's okay it's not yeah. the end of the world it's always going to happen shut up and don't be a prey so I, I do want to I do want to add a little bit to the the whole they as a singular pronoun and Ben Shapiro's objection. Basically, Ben Shapiro is right in one way and wrong in another. He is very wrong when he says that they has never been used as a singular pronoun. However, he is correct that the attempts to use they as a pronoun for particular individuals who are gender nonconforming is in fact not the way that the word has been ever been used historically. So, but well, it's not because it wasn't single, well, singular. It's because it didn't refer to particular individuals. It could like, only like, refer. Like it, 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 yeah, it, it used to be used like if you didn't know the gender, then you said you said they. But if right. you knew the per if you knew the person, you like then then it's In either fact, yeah, it's either he, usually, or he or she. But yeah, it usually couldn't even be used if you knew yeah. the person, even if you didn't know the gender per in particular. So, for instance, Ooh, if you encountered stupid stuff in the chat. <laughs> so, for instance, oh, no. Historically, if you encountered a particular person that you could identify, but for some reason couldn't easily dis distinguish their gender, for instance, maybe, um, I don't know, you're, you're living in a village in Europe and it's like the one African trader who comes by with a mask over his face. You or actually might person. use he or she or just default to he or something, but you still usually wouldn't use they, even if you didn't actually know that particular person's gender because it's generally been needed two things. You need to first not know the gender of the particular person who's you're referring to, but also you generally can't know who the particular person is. 
And so that is when English historically has used they as a yeah. singular pronoun, at least semantically. Grammatically, it's still usually used with plural or, uh, verbs. So for instance, um, you would still say they are, even if you're using it as a singular pronoun semantically. Grammatically, it remains plural, which is another reason why it feels weird to use it to refer to individual people who you know as a particular person, even with the gender nonconforming, where it's not easy to use he or she. So mm -hmm. there oh. is a really good reason why it feels weird to most English speakers to refer to, like if yeah. RJ was like, please use they to refer to me. Most English speakers would yeah. have a very hard time remembering yet, to do that. 20 years from now, nobody may give it a thought. And to show you That's how fine. things have changed, raise your hand if you've heard of, of course, the, those on, on, on Africa can't do that there. Uh, if you know the word humongous. Mm -hmm. Humongous? When did that come into play and where did it come from? A few decades That's ago. A Who question. knows? Nobody knows. But I can remember <laughs> when it occurred sometime in the early 1970s. When I was growing up, there was no word humongous. Starting around 1974, I started hearing it peripherally. By the 1980s, everyone was saying a word. Somebody, somewhere, said the word humongous to somebody out of thin mm -hmm. air, and they liked how it sounded. Well, I, that rat wasn't big. That was a humongous rat. They liked the thing, and it took off, and it mutated and shifted. That's what happens with A. That's what happens with anything else. And and whether if you don't like it, but other people use it, just get used to it, kid, because well, it's, it's what's going to happen. What's like the word uh, gay? Like... Like back in the '60s, it was a yeah, it was words like, change meaning. It's like, it's like like the, the Flintstone songs, the Christmas songs, you know, gay men oh, happy now stuff. All gay apparel, totally different meaning. Now. <laughs> and then the so friends, I, yeah. Now it's like <laughs> I do want to answer the question from uh, Kenny Hornerson, who has <laughs> asked, "Do you know what evolution means?" Means yeah, to lie in Latin. I, I uh, hope it, you would do that. It, it does not. In no, fact, no, the doesn't. word the word derives from oh, the Latin horrible. verb evolvere, which is you know, that's the infinitive. The lexical form would be um, evolutio, which, so there's a weird thing about Latin where the lexical form is usually the first person singular present tense simple aspect, uh, declarative mood. It happens in Greek too, <sighs> whatever. But, but you yeah, know, it means to Eddie, unroll. Don't yeah. profess to do research around people who have actually done research. I, right. I, I, I think he was just pulling the lag, but yeah, I don't, don't take him seriously. So, so no, no one yeah. should. No. <laughs> there, the, the problem is that there are there is more than one word for to lie in Latin, but none of them are. No. Um, yeah. Evolutio. That like that's that's not. Oh, I. So. I, 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 I Evolutio about, sounds like a character from Shakespeare. Well, I, yeah. I, I had a question about like how how different languages uh, uh, do counting. Like uh, in English, you have like uh, like uh, 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 after nineteen. You basically oh, the French, the yeah, weird you, the French. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I was going. I was going there. Yes, I was going there. But yeah. <laughs> in the like, in English, you were like after uh, ninety, you have to just twenty one, thirty two, and and, and thirty two, thirty three, and such. Yeah. But in in French, after sixty, it becomes really weird. Like yeah, and I, I I don't know why it becomes like that. Well, I think, so I think I do. in some respects it comes. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead and yeah, take yeah. it. So Latin primarily used a uh, base twenty counting system. Bingo. And so um, the base 10 counting system was adopted ultimately from farther east. So basically it was largely invented in India and then spread into the Europe yeah. via the Arabs. And so what ended up happening is a lot of languages in Europe kind of adopted the decimal system. They certainly use it to write their numbers, but not all of them really adopted it in terms of speaking. So that's why you still get things like in French, you can say things like sixty seventeen, which means seventy seven. Yeah, and and, and eighty is like four twenty, four times twenty, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, couple of them, four twenties. Well, yeah. you know what's weird? Four twenties like, and nineteen. Uh, That's ninety nine. Yeah, if you're doing like the business. the places that people come in in a race, like uh, after like second, it makes it makes sense. But you have first and then second which doesn't really make sense but then you have third fourth fifth which actually like Don't match expect up with languages the numbers to make like sense. three it's, it, <laughs> yeah it's, but, it's also yeah. it's also the case like in my like sometimes i get this uh because of my native dutch language i get this often switch around like for example when we say 41 we say 140. Mm -hmm. 
Weirdness like that is typically where languages and amalgamating things without bothering. It's just because how people speak. The yeah. languages operate as social interactions, and they have a, a, a drive and inertia that operates to some extent based on the, our physical capacity to say certain kinds of sounds and what we're expecting to hear. And they just flow along stochastically, mutating, shifting over time as to what's convenient or not. We bring words in, we drop them out. Uh, ain't uh, got uh, passed in as a terrible, oh, you must never say that. It was just an old English contraction for am not, but it, it came to have connotation from the, the prissy little word police in the 19th century. And and these things happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the em embrace the flow, man. About the difference in counting system between Dutch and English. Like, like we say 140 and you say 41. Like which one did the switch or did we did the switch maybe? Um, so now maybe the venerable B can back me up on this because it's been a little while, but I seem to remember mm. that there were multiple options for combining um, larger and smaller numbers in Old English. So a lot of times you would end up counting by dozens and saying yeah. like a dozen and six or six and a dozen or a dozen and a half. Then other times you would end up counting uh, more or less by tens. And in many cases you could say one and 20 or you could say 30 and one. Or and, 20 uh, blackbirds. That's kind yeah. of a fossil in there. But the German is the same way. Yeah. It's ein und 40, uh, not uh, 40 uh, kind. But speaking of that, uh, I hate to say this, but Kitty brought something I want I, I wanted to talk about. You know how French is French is like a, a like a like a root of uh, of Latin, right? But but mm -hmm. weren't the Franks a, a German Germanic tribe? How yes. does, the how Latin replaced oh. Frankish. I mean, yeah. So the thing you have to remember about the Roman Empire is that for a lot of its extent, um, Latin was the language to speak if you wanted to the get the lingua franca. Done. Right. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you didn't speak Latin, you weren't going to get very far. And the other yeah. thing was, it was recognized across at least the Western Roman Empire. If you could speak Latin, you could get by pretty much anywhere, even after the fall of Rome. And so one of the Just things that Greek happened is that... used to be farther east. Right. That, was it. that played exactly the same role. So if you were in the Western Roman Empire, in any of the areas that had been conquered for a few centuries, Latin was the language that you should probably learn. And just like it happens in some cases where we have native languages and areas being displaced now by, say, Spanish or English, uh, it's one of those things where it's easier to speak Latin with everyone. Everyone knows Latin. Many of them speak it better than they can speak Frankish because that's just something the old people speak at yeah. home. Oh, and all the Christian services, all any any things that would be done would all have been done in Latin anyway. Interestingly enough, less true in the East. Yeah, in yeah, the there's East. More, more variation in there. And then it became, a, well, it, you had a pent-up demand for a native language uh, Christianity in the West. And so that started to hit in the Reformation times when it was just really hot stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and imagine and having yeah. an English language Bible or having liturgy conducted in English. Yeah, I, I, or, I, remember, or native I remember from the, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, popular fictional novel. Like the, the, the Da Vinci Code mentions that English used to be heretical in the, for the, for, According to the church, well, right? uh, maybe, there was maybe, a guy that maybe was maybe yeah. in yeah. in Henry VIII's England for uh, wanting to have uh, for publishing an English language version of the Bible. Well, that was, that was probably yeah. Be yeah I was, I was, was just going to say, I feel like we're forgetting about religion when it comes to language and how it spreads. Yeah, I, I, I said that was probably before he decided to leave the Catholic Church, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, he'd already separated from the church. Oh. Oh, no, the English remained the the, uh, the the Church of England mode was Catholicism light, and it sort of became the Episcopal Church uh, over in the United States. Uh, and it was only quite a ways down the road that that more puritanical streak, which is why they had a, a revolution um, of the uh, a Puritan style thing during the Commonwealth period in the next century. It was it, it was a tough, tumultuous period. And then they were they were throwing off black loons uh, over here to the United States who were escaping from Britain because they didn't have the freedom to suppress people according to the religion thing. And but, so we're partly due to the flotsam and jetsam thrown off uh, by all the religious squabbles that were going on in England. Of course, guess how com or guess how popular Puritanism was, was with the average, uh, you know, English countrymen. Not exactly. very. That's why they had to leave. Yeah, they couldn't stand them. And, and, yeah. and they, they were just as annoying over here when they settled. Oh, yeah. In fact, Rhode Island was started 
because some woman got exiled from her Puritan church. I thought was and she brought a whole community with her. I thought it was Connecticut. Or am I thinking of something else? Oh, I might be misremembering. Yeah. Well, I, 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 they I, both I, were, I think. But yeah, it's funny how the Puritans left England for uh, they couldn't for religious freedom, and no, uh, no, no. as soon as they got there, they're like, okay, they, no, they, they wanted yeah. their they no. wanted their religious freedom, which included no, no. the ability to suppress they, everybody else's religion. They didn't want religious freedom at all. They wanted their own religious hegemony. There's yeah. a big difference. Mm -hmm. No one involved here wanted religious freedom. They all wanted religious he hegemony. They just wanted it to be their preferred religion. They were they were Christian Taliban. Well, I mean Maryland a little bit with the Catholics. They they actually did set up. Oh yeah, later Mormon. on there were pushes towards religious liberty because in both Europe and in the New World it was seen that oh yeah you can't really persist with a very strict religious hegemony, especially in a group uh, where. It's easier with something like Catholicism, right? Where you can have a an authority that you can point to, and you can be like, "Look, this is the official thing of this the church." But when you get to to Protestant ideas, where everyone's supposed to be able to read the Bible and it's supposed to be clear, and they're supposed to be able to understand it as you know the, the clear teachings of God, except every Protestant comes up with different conclusions about the te clear teachings of God. That's where you get thousands and thousands and thousands of little tiny splinter sects, yeah. which is not a thing in, that really happened up until century, the Reformation. In the 19th century in the United States, Protestants got on the take prayer out of schools bandwagon because as more and more Catholics came in, many mm -hmm. places, if you went for the majority, they would be reading from the Catholic Douay Bible, and they didn't want that. And oh, so the they the, the, the horror. And the Americans United for Church and State bunch started out as an anti-Catholic group, and then got on a more libertarian, freethinker mode. Uh, and uh, uh, in part because of the shift in position about that uh, Catholic vote. It's ironic now that we're in a new era of strangeness because the majority of the people on the Supreme Court are conservative Roman Catholics now. But well, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's funny that you talk about, you know, the, the, they're, they're the ones that went bring prayer back to school that never left, technically, except for, except for you know, officially, but they're the ones that took on in the first place. I mean, not the individuals, but yeah, it was, there was a, a movement among Protestants to get rid of um, official school prayer. But it is also true that, yes, you are allowed to pray in school in the United States. Yeah, and still are. Yeah. In, 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 oh, you know, yeah. If you want to do that yeah, on your own, uh, that's fine and dandy. You just don't do it during school time. We're busy doing the school thing. Yeah. Uh, that was Madeline a position Murray my mom just... had. Uh, of my own personal memory in public school here in Spokane, Washington, in the uh, late 1950s. And in very first grade, my mother, who was not religious, but she wasn't anti-religious per se. She didn't really care about it. Uh, but she discovered that I was being trotted down to a local church for like a half hour for some religious instruction. And she went ballistic. She said, no, excuse me, if I want my kid to learn religion, I'll decide that. That's not your job. I'm sending my kid to school to learn stuff. So she had me pulled out of that. And I had effectively a second break during the day because I would be spending the time by myself up in school <laughs> not going down to the sky pilot, as she would call them, uh, to uh, hear their religious indoctrination. <laughs> and that was the 1950s. Right. It would be very hard to get away with any of that now. Yeah, uh, there's been too many court rulings yeah. on that, although I'm sure people in the uh, Mike Pence uh, worldview uh, would like to change that. Well, I had a question about the, like a particular word in the Indo-European uh, languages like the in Latin, you have the, the word for God is Deus, and mm -hmm. uh, this is related to the word for Zeus and also mm -hmm. for J Jupiter. And if you go if you go all the way back to the Proto-Indo-European ancestor, you get to Deus Pater, which basically means uh, the Sky Father, right? Yeah, yeah. that Sky Father archetype is very common in Indo-European language or Indo-European cultures, I should say. Yeah, so really, it's like it's really like uh, if you look at the uh, like the uh, the Greek god, like Zeus, and also the the Roman god uh, Jupiter, they are, and mm -hmm. not not only are they they have the same, like the the the, 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 the character of the god, like the Zeus is the sky god, and uh, Jupiter is also the sky god in Roman, but even the names themselves are related uh, etymology. Etymolo how do you say you it? You show uh, me yeah. a religion that yeah. doesn't borrow profusely. Etymology, <laughs> etymology yeah, they are related I'll show by you etymology. A religion yeah. nobody believes in. 
they are, they are, they, they, even the names are related by etymology too. It's it's actually kind of weird that the Germanic people, uh, their version of Deus Pater is Tiu in tu Tuesday, but he didn't have the same place as Zeus or Jupiter. Yeah. Although the, the, the closest analogy I can think of in in Germanic uh, religion is like uh, Odin or not? Is or maybe I'm like mistaken thinking like maybe Odin isn't not, not even related to Zeus, right? Uh, well, no. Odin Odin is more of a wisdom god than yeah. Than... Now, now uh, qu 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 oh, oh, quick question: uh, Is there a, like a equivalent or a difference between? The way spoken languages evolve and written languages. Ooh, one, one, one or... Well, a lot of English spelling preserves archaic uh, pronunciation. Yeah, for instance, the the knight, like the the warrior, K N I G H D. Yet none of those were silent letters originally. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, yeah, it's, it's, and what, what is made odd, English is so different now from German because we really easily drop any of the phonetics, whereas one at least nice thing about German is relentlessly phonetic. And so when they borrow words like psychiatry, they literally pronounce the words. So it's a psychiatry. Uh, we, we say uh, psychiatry, yeah, of course, yeah. We also, we also yeah. say that, yeah. Whereas we, we'll, we'll take that French approach, which just dissolves word, uh, consonants and the like, but we'll eliminate and mush stuff together again, and, and it takes on a life of its own. So it, it must make English very intimidating for foreigners to learn because yeah. of that, that weird vocabulary that seems so inconsistent and squishy. Yeah. Like for this, for the longest time, I might remember history wrong here, of course. I'm not, I'm only an amateur, but like only like, like monks and scribes could write and like like transfer like say the Bible or whatever, and they, they usually wrote in Latin. But it was like that's, that's, pretty... that's not really that's yeah. a bit of a myth that uh, literacy was generally only restricted in uh, medieval Europe to uh, okay. clerics. So now thought... certainly, the, so the thing is, in the Middle Ages, in the medieval period of the Middle Ages, whatever you want to call them, to be literate meant to know how to write and read Latin. Mm -hmm. However, nowadays we don't define it that way. If you can write and read any one language we consider you to be literate. By that definition, almost everyone in medieval Europe was literate. Uh, we have lots of examples of medieval graffiti, uh, letters to family members, quick little notes, shopping lists, yeah. uh, things like that. So virtually everyone could read their own language. There usually wasn't a, a codified spelling system, but uh, there was usually a, a fairly small number of way to use the various letters of the Latin alphabet to represent, say, your English language or the Cyrillic alphabet, you know, if you're in medieval Russia or whatever, right? <clears throat> and so we have a lot of examples of writing from common folk in the archaeological record and even in some historical documents. Uh, right, so, so it's that, that's, yeah. that's more of a myth than an actual yeah. fact. That was more Whoa. true in, era, in times like the Bronze Age when most writing yeah. was done by highly trained scribes in very yeah. complicated systems. That and, used a lot of and we're and often... Stuff. Uh, guilds uh, in the case yeah. that if you knew how to write and writing was power, you were the ones that wrote the sacred scripts to get the pharaoh into the afterlife in the Book of the Dead, you guarded that enormously. And after all, it, to the extent that writing in Mesopotamia, for example, was developing as contracts and, and record keeping and the like, if you could read and your other person couldn't, you could cheat easier. So there, there was a, a lot of incentive to deal with it. Where yeah. things really transformed was the development of printed books, which greatly expanded the range of things, and people could learn to read on a scale that they couldn't when you well, didn't have easily available <clears throat> books. Kind of, because one of the things was that um, even in the late Bronze Age and through the Iron Age, general ability to read at a basic level was becoming more and more frequent. So, for instance, mm. um, by, by well before, say, the Hellenistic period in Egypt, most people could read and write demo demotic. And even during the um, the late period, which is before the Hellenistic period, most people could read hieratic. Mm. And so you could get commoners who would scribble down notes in hieratic, which is a very simplifi simplified cursive form of hieroglyphics. But most of them couldn't read 
the monumental inscriptions yeah. written in the full hieroglyphics because the the simplifications were really so far separate. Yeah. Right. So it really is, and also we have things like um, we have like late Bronze Age, early Iron Age inscriptions in places like uh, Mesopotamia and Canaan that are basically just like local graffiti or um, requisition requests from local forts to you know some central authority that are written by just some soldier. Yeah. So it's really the case that writing and reading is actually a fairly widespread phenomenon through a lot of history in a way that we don't yeah. really think it is. But the thing is, the reason that you have this scholarly scribe class is because often they were writing a language that other people didn't know or using a writing system that other people didn't yeah. know. So in Egypt, everyone was basically speaking Egyptian. Yeah. But only the scribes could write hieroglyphics because only they were trained in the thousands and thousands of signs. Or you have uh, situations where, like, okay, anyone, any old person can, you know, write, scribble something in Gaulish. But if you want to have a contract written up, it's going to be in Latin. And you're going to need a scribe for that because you don't speak enough Latin. Yeah. I, th I think a counterpart uh, to that Egyptian context would be China, where yeah, that, there was kind of a great okay. deal of uh, literacy and, yeah. and in feed the whole bit of the Sung Dynasty's um, uh, civil service reforms was that literally any Zhou Shmo or Wang Wu from the countryside could mm -hmm. take civil service exams uh, um, all, and even their texts would be copied over by professional scribes so you couldn't tell from the handwriting necessarily that they were a local, although yeah. the phrasing and thing would probably give them away because of that. I, I, I think uh, Nadia wants to say, yeah. I, Go ahead, Nadia. I don't think you want to ask something here. Yeah, yeah um, back to the Egyptian stuff. And th we all know about the. There's, you know, talking about the, the, what people call the two dark ages. We all know about the quote dark age after the fall of Rome. People Which call didn't it. exist, by the way. Yeah, but then there well, also. also uh, yeah, let's call it a dim age. Yeah, but I also heard uh, look, about it's uh, it's a dark age. age. It's a dark age if you really like monumental architecture and it's really not aqueducts. A, well, <laughs> but it's really not a dark early, age in most other areas. Yeah, but I also heard about in uh, early Anglo-Saxon England. It definitely was. Uh, that's, that's fair, but but let's yeah. Yeah, 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 well, they were out in the suburbs. That, that, that's right actually there. a place where only monks could uh, read and write. Uh, and you don't get real uh, reading and writing amongst the pop, uh, populace until Alfred the Great. Oh yeah, but I also heard about an earlier dark age after the after the fall of the Bronze Age, yeah. where writing and stuff became like a little less known after that, that time. So <clears throat> there's the late Bronze Age collapse, which results in first its cause is a little bit iffy. There's the traditional story that the quote unquote sea peoples come in and ravage everybody. But the chronology doesn't seem to really line up very tightly. And also the late Bronze Age collapse seems to have happened at slightly different times in different places. But by the end of this period, most of the international trade routes between the major yeah. players oh, of Bronze Age... Well, there like, there's a climatological impact of that as well. The, possible volcanic eruptions. There's a whole yes. bunch of factors that, that have been dragged. Was it, was it 11,000 BCE? Right? So, it was around that time, yeah. Well, like yeah, I said, yeah, though, I, 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 I've, I've heard that it's, it's, uh, climate change may be the cause or so, something, yeah. Yeah, yeah anyway. so what current thinking is, is that a lot of these sea peoples were probably being displaced by some kind of climatological phenomenon. And then that was them trying to find new places to live was increasing the problem with the climatolo climatologically caused, you know, problems in the actual settled empires. But anyway, by the end of it, you did have a significant decrease in literacy, um, but generally speaking, you didn't lose literacy in any of those locations. So there were still people who could write in Greek or Etruscan or you know early Latin or, or Egyptian, Egyptian. Yeah. right? So they they didn't. Yeah. It was never actually lost the the knowledge of how to write. Um, and uh, Atheist Junior asks a question about why oh. um, old yes, English, F, which by the way, F, not F, old F. English. <laughs> That, that happened yeah, in modern English. Yeah. So basically, yeah. there just used to be a version of S that was the long S. And it was tall, but it also usually descended. So it was basically bigger than most capital letters. And to modernize, it looks a little bit like an F. Uh, and the small S that you see was usually used at the end of words, um, which is actually a similarity that that kind of writing has with, say, uh, Greek. So sigma has two forms. It has a little circle with a tail off to the right. If it's in the yeah, middle all an F is a, is a is a fancy stretched out S, and you still see it in 
the Declaration of Independence where the double S is spelled SF or FS. Yeah. Old English is only from the time that the Anglo-Saxons were invading England to about uh, 1100. So, Yeah, Shakespeare is modern English. It's early modern English, but it's modern English. There's a there's a word inventor, boy. Shakespeare just and and spelled his own name in eighteen different ways, and that's you know it just drives people nuts because of how fluid they were. Because a lot of the conventions for spelling hadn't settled in yet, and so what it came comes to be with printed books and newspapers and dictionaries eventually that starts crystallizing and forcing the language into the approved forms, yeah. the standard spelling, the correct versions that then give people fits uh, in subsequent times because that, you know, you're not supposed to do it. So we talked about how English went from Old English to, to, the, to Medieval English from the Norman invasion. How did they get from Medieval to the modern English we have now? So going from modern or sort of middle to modern English is, it's actually not a very there aren't that many interesting stories, honestly. It's <laughs> mostly just ordinary language change. So you get things yeah. like, um, you get, you know, semantic shifts happen as they just do. You know, words can change in meaning, like we talked about earlier with some words. Um, you get, the, one of the most important changes is the great vowel shift that happens, where a lot of what were long vowels in earlier forms of English start to become diphthongs, and a lot of the short vowels end up changing in quality and so you give get some a whole... give a couple examples of that so everyone would get the gist. So, <laughs> so sorry. Oh, go ahead. Dean. So, like how in West Saxon it's speka, eventually that long e becomes speka, and then you get, and then you drop the u uh at the end, and it's speak. Stuff like that. Um, let me think of another one. Do you have any dapper? So one is that um. The E sound in earlier forms of English often becomes I in many words. Yes. So, um, for instance, it, the word uh, knight, like we talked about, like the guy on the horse with the armor, the yeah. I in that word was originally pronounced as an E, and you would pronounce all of the, all of the sounds. So you get knicht is the older version of how you pronounce that word. But then you start to drop the K because it's a little tough to say. The H sound starts to go to an H, and then it drops out entirely in most cases in, in modern English. And then one of the last things that happens is you go from neat to night with a diphthong. Knights are neat. Yeah. Neat, um, neat, neat. So it used yeah. to be, is it, it used to be say, uh, pronounced knicht or knicht? Yeah, knicht. Yeah, knicht. 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 It's, it's yeah. A, it sounds a lot, of, a, a, lot, a lot like the word uh, knecht in my language. Mm -hmm. There's a good reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Frisian and English are usually um, grouped together, and I know Frisian is pretty close to, uh, at least geographically, to Dutch. Right. <laughs> it's much closer to English linguistically, although it depends yeah. on whether or not you want to count Scots as a language. Lots of Scots speakers like to. Theoretically, <laughs> each language as a population blob would be an adaptive landscape with various vowel and consonant pronunciations in a distinct language form. And as it's shifting around, you would see the things rising and falling and merging and structuring in, in that higher level mathematical concept as the languages are shifting and mutating. And it's it's an exact counterpart of what's happening at the genetic level in, in the evolutionary process. Yes, there, is, there is one big difference, though, which is that generally speaking, in uh, evolutionary biology, when you're using uh, like fitness landscape modeling, Mm -hmm. The fitness landscape is usually something that is extrinsic to the organisms trying to navigate it. Yeah. That's not so true in language. It's not actually clear from linguistics whether or not any particular language is better yeah. suited to an environment. So, yeah. for instance, if you were to completely take, the, say, the population of France and the population of some other country with a similar population, right? Let's say, I don't know, I'm just going to pretend that Uruguay has a similar, well, let's go with something less... Indo-European-y. Uh, let's go with uh, Vietnam, right? And you had a machine that you could just swap their languages like that. Hmm. And somehow you could change all the street signs at the same time into, you know, so now France, everyone speaks and reads Vietnamese, all the signs are in Vietnamese. And in Vietnam, everyone, although odd that I picked a former French colony, but whatever, who cares? <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, everyone now speaks fluent French. All the signs are in French. All the books are in French. They don't even remember the old language. It's not clear that people would do worse in France speaking Vietnamese 
yeah. or the people in Vietnam would do worse speaking yeah, French. I, I, I know. agree. That they, I don't think languages have an adaptive and selective element. And of course, they don't reproduce in the way that an organism does genetically. But, but that, uh, it, right, it's it, a very different it, dynamic yeah. there. But uh, that. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, uh, so if I may interject for a moment, like I, I uh, it, about the word uh, knecht, uh, the old word for knight, I, the word in Dutch knecht actually means servant. So the, the meaning has also changed uh, over time, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> that was the original old English meaning too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, servant. It, it, cha it changed during feudal times when knights, uh, you know, they were actually servants of the king, but, you know. Yeah. Well, they also became the local lord. Yeah, but yeah. with real fast. But with that, that brings, brings, brings up the, the two last points I want, I want to talk about before, before we have to wrap it up for Dapper's big, big, big event. But, oh yeah. Um. Uh. Well, again, like genetics, like how, like a like they say, no, never get birth to it. Like like how a, a like a wolf never gave birth to the first dog, like like the, a Latin user never gave birth to the first Italian speaker. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, mm -hmm. uh, the if, you, if you were to trace somebody speaking the languages in England a thousand years ago down to the present, there would be no point at which people communicating don't understand each other. And yet we reach the stage where the language being spoken in that first group versus the language that's being spoken now is significantly different. Yeah. Hey, hey, it, uh, well, Dapper, an interesting you, exercise if it were possible. Oh. Did you say that um, <clears throat> Thailand had a similar population to France? Um, what country did you say? I picked Vietnam. I don't actually okay. know if they have similar populations. I, was, yeah, I just decided I, to ignore I, that qualification. I was curious, so I Googled it, and Thailand and the United Kingdom have almost the exact same population. Sorry. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, oh, I was going to say a thing, and then I... Uh, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that just completely erased my train of thought. <laughs> uh, hey, it was something a, about a fun activity. Like oh, yes, a fun England. activity. A fun activity, if it would be possible, would be to take a sample of just some random speaker of a language for every decade, right? So you get mm -hmm. someone from the 2010s, they get to just say something in English. Then get someone from, you know, the the you know 2000s, the 90s, the 80s, go all the way back. And the thing is, anyone could almost certainly understand the, um, the samples, probably five or six samples ahead and behind them. But you start getting to like 10, 12, 20 samples, and yeah. suddenly that comprehension is going to just drop off. Mm -hmm. And so you get this diachronic continuum as opposed to like synchron. This is another interesting linguistic term, everybody. Diachronic is when you're taking a look at language or system of languages or dialects across time. Synchronic is when you're taking a look at them as they exist at a single point in time. Hmm. But you can get a diachronic continuum of intelligibility. So for instance, um, most modern English speakers, and by modern I mean living, have a bit of trouble getting through the King James Bible, and they probably are going to make some mistakes. Similarly, they have a few more mis troubles with uh, Shakespeare because it is a bit earlier. Most modern English speakers can't get through Chaucer at all. They need help from a translation. And, and back to but, Beowulf, get a stick. Yeah, I was going to say Beowulf. <laughs> right. But on the other hand, if most modern English speakers have no trouble, say, reading the, uh, the Constitution of the United States. Right, it's right. a little funny. They use a few weird words here and there, and the phrasing yeah. is a little off. But it's very hard to find a modern English speaker who couldn't understand it adequately, except right. in the well, government. Hey, oh, <laughs> have you ever tried to read a clockwork? And it's orange? no coincidence. I don't know of mm -hmm. anybody in the creationism field who would believe in the Tower of Babel distribution thing who has contributed or is currently active contributing in any way notably in the field of linguistics. No, it, it's, I've not even, I haven't even heard of a young earth creationist attempt yeah. at linguistics beyond a young earth attempt at ethnography, which is not the yeah. same thing. And so answers research journal, you know, you get stuff that's sort of buzz past it at 80 miles an hour, but it, yes. it's all completely useless. Well, and the thing is that they're all trying to do ethnography. None of them are trying Which, to do linguistics. 
Yeah, and, and they can never they can never make it fit because their model is chronologically wrong. Yeah. So yeah. you're like so so you're basically you're you're kind of saying just like how genetics didn't evolve didn't come from uh, Mount Ararat, languages didn't spread out from the <laughs> Babylon. Fable. Also yeah. true. Now I <laughs> do want to um, address a, the the most recent comment by Creo Debunk, who says simplicity and ability to express could be selective features. The answer there is uh, basically no and yes. So <clears throat> languages that are significantly deficient at um, expressing ideas that the speakers need to express will either change or go out of fashion in favor of other languages that are spoken in the area. <clears throat> Sorry, but simplicity is really not one of the, it's not a, a feature for languages. It's a bit of actually sort of a, a bug. And one of the reasons for this is that languages tend to be redundant. And um, so for instance, you might find yourself um, trying to talk to someone from across a clearing in a forest while there's noisy birds or something, right? And if every single bit of your sentence needs to be clearly heard in order yeah. for you to be understood. What happens if you're not hearing all of it? The, the right, you're gonna have a lot of signal loss. Right. Whereas so, we know in cocktail parties that, that about half of the, the signal can drop out and you can still follow the conversation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that languages tend to do is they all tend to have a somewhat similar amount of redundancy. So words are different enough from each other that they tend not to be mixed up if they are, uh, except in cases where they're used in very different contexts. Like most homonyms don't persist unless the, the different contexts where you use the homonym are very, or homophone are very different, right? Or you should have like a gene duplication analogy, like, uh, oh, like yeah. similar words, but then they, they mutate over time to become more distinctly different. And basically. yeah. But the other thing is you can't become so redundant that it takes too much effort to actually express and parse any given um, communication. So that's why you don't tend to have languages that do strict word order plus case marking on nouns, plus double marking on verbs, plus agreement with, you know, gender so person be, on all of the- So it'll be a that they will, that, that they'll right. add in new nuances to mm -hmm. communicate things that maybe you couldn't communicate as well with before all without any intentional design to it and trim down stuff like ramming vowels together and trimming things that takes a little bit easier and making it easier to, to speak. Uh, just just yeah. think of all the people that live in cold climates that tend to have a talking form like this because it's much easier if you don't have to move your mouth very open because you're gonna get a blast of cold air. Now there's an, there's an interesting um, series of case studies in whether or not languages will stay at low levels of complexity, or in other words, stay simple. And it's when uh, pigeons become creoles. So a pigeon mm. is a hybrid language that develops f through the need of groups of people to interact closely when they don't share a common language. And it's not very easy for either group to completely learn the other language. Usually this means that these languages are fairly different. So we have a whole lot of these <clears throat> pigeons that developed, especially in the Caribbean. You get English and French and sometimes Spanish-based pigeons that developed between um, primarily it, slaves and European slave owners. Is, is, is it also the same case with uh, like Afrikaans? Like we have a Dutch colony in uh, South, South Africa. So Afrikaans is less of a Creole and more of simply uh, Dutch after lots of contact with mm -hmm. local mm -hmm. African languages. It's still basically Dutch, but it's a very, I, can, very I, can, I cannot Dutch. understand. I cannot understand it. So yeah. <laughs> but what I mean though is like it did not so, take on a, it. So when a Creole forms, one of the things that happens is you vastly simplify the grammar. That's one of the, something that didn't happen to Afrikaans. So that's one of the reasons why we're pretty sure it's not a Creole at this point. But so when a pigeon forms, you have this contact, and so you'll vastly simplify the grammar. It'll become much simpler than either language is. In fact, it will often take the simplest grammar from one language in one area. And then another area, it'll take the simple grammar from the other language and just smush them together into the stock simplest version of the grammar. There's rarely any kind of complex morphology. Sometimes plurals, you don't even bother marking plurals. Or if you do, you do it by simple means that aren't even as complicated as adding a plural suffix. Sometimes you just do reduplication. Like you wanna say uh, wheels instead of wheel, you just say wheel, wheel. That's more than one wheel, right? <laughs> more than once. Yeah. So, um, but then when a pigeon starts to get native speakers, an interesting thing happens. It becomes a Creole and it develops novel complexity 
in ways that didn't exist in either language. And that's because the native speakers find it useful to have more complex speech to express more complex thoughts. So it's, it's without the linguistic having, bottleneck that then right. forms the substrate for a naturally evolving language system. Yeah. Right. And so in these cases, you could say that the fitness landscape has this weird thing where you're not complicated enough. Get more complicated. And they yeah. do. So all yeah. of the currently existing Creoles are more complicated than the pigeons they originated from. Oh, yeah. Well, as much as I would like to talk a little bit longer, but, but the rap... So we have a schedule to oh. keep here. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, but, yeah. But, I, I, I have something but, else. One last thing to mention, if I if I may, I want to ask something about the the la uh, how language influences our perception of colors. Like, like hmm. you have, uh, like you have uh, in in some languages, they don't make the distinction between green and yellow, and especially blue. Blue is an interesting case because some languages, blue and green. Yeah, yeah blue yeah. and green. Yeah, yeah, yeah blue, like blue, some languages have a blue. And blue is one of the latest uh, words to be acquired, and blue is actually related to the word black because blue was once considered a shade of black, basically. So there's actually a, a rule of thumb for what basic color terms languages will have. Now, basic color terms are the kinds of things that you would learn in like kindergarten or third grade. We're not talking about things like, you know, umber or burgundy or periwinkle. Those are not basic color terms. Those are sort of sophisticated yeah. jargon yeah. terms. Color swatch at the, at the paint <clears throat> store. Like, right. like, like the word cyan, it's not commonly used, cyan. Right. Yeah. Now, in languages, not every language really has to have color terms. Sometimes people can just say that it looks like an object, and then they can be trying to convey color information, right? So mm -hmm. if you're like, oh, uh, it's like a rose, or a fire truck, or a fire hydrant. Well, I'm telling you it's red, because those are all things that are red. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you're going to have color terms, the first two that you get generally are white and black. And yeah. anything that's dark in color, you call with the dark word black. And anything that's light in color, you call with the white. The next thing that gets split off tends to be something for red. Yes. The next thing that gets split off then is tends to be uh, a green and blue or a yellow can split off. And then after both of those have split off, then sometimes you can get words like orange and then sometimes you can get words like brown. And finally, sometimes you get languages that split off blue from green. Yeah. It's it's really weird. Like it's also it's also the case that like not only uh, do is, is the language different, like our perception of the colors are different too. Like for example, in Russian they have two common words for two shades of blue, and they can distinguish these colors more readily than yeah. uh, English speakers. I, I do want to answer that question for Atheist Junior because that's a great question. And the answer is yes, but you don't call it a dialect. The personal way that any given person uses their language is always unique to them to some degree and is called an idiolect. I have my own idiolect. RJ has his. Vandalia has yeah. his. Everyone has I their mean, own idiolect. In, in any Hogan's language. case, we can ask since the, the mm -hmm. idiot part. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more related to the id as in first person type things. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, English like, has cyan. I like that word. Cyan is commonly used. Yeah, cyan is not generally cyan. considered a Cyan, cyan. Yeah. But so cyan is is not what is not an generally used as a as a basic color in English. For instance, toddlers don't don't learn that word. Yeah. Um, when you're teaching, you can think of the basic color terms as the kinds of things that you would teach like a two-year-old when you're trying to teach them their colors. And so in English, basic color terms include white, black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and brown. Yeah. Those are the basic color terms in English. The gray is the maybe ring. in there. You might learn gray as a basic color term, but cyan is generally not in there. No. Um, and then the other things like, you know, indigo. auburn or burgundy or indigo. 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 Yeah, the rainbow color. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a um, turquoise. It's also, it's also not a basic. Yeah, interesting to see how the how our perception of even the colors change when we uh, yeah. learn new uh, color, uh, names for the colors. Well, one one interesting thing you can see there is English speakers usually have trouble determining the exact hue of colors like cyan uh, or uh, turquoise. So yeah. colors between blue and green, English speakers are terrible at figuring out. They just kind of see them all as sort of bluish green blob. Well, and remember, colors are context sensitive as the blue or gold dress matter. Uh, yes. Demonstrate. 
Yeah. And it's also like it's also the, uh, one of the reasons why uh, I have heard that why blue become becomes very late is because blue the color blue is very rare in nature. It is. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Basically, most... it's it's sky, and yeah. then artificial colors. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. water. Yeah. 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 Well, sometimes well, water. Well, well, to wrap this uh, up real fast, let's we'll talk about well, we, we still have an, an actual created language and how it it, it it might have evolved from its origins. Klingon. Well, so Dapper. the future evolution of Klingon is an interesting topic, and one of the problems is that Klingon is not likely to get a population of native speakers in the foreseeable future. And in that, if since that's the case, since everyone is learning it from a written authority, yeah. or occasionally that the, the author who wrote the of written authority comes out and adds some new stuff, but it still ends up coming from a single source. So it ends up being a language that is learned from books and not naturally. It's sort of the way people now learn Latin, right? Latin, yeah. other than gaining new words, hasn't changed a bit since basically classical Latin, except for the pronunciation, because a lot of people like to pronounce it like it's uh, Italian, because they're in Italy, and it's the Catholic Church. Um, yeah, no one speaks it right anymore. <laughs> right. Other than that fact, Latin really hasn't changed at all in over a millennium. So Klingon is in a similar situation where there's no one, there's not a group of people who just speak it as their everyday language at home with their kids. They grew up speaking it. However, if it did happen, there are some odd aspects of Klingon that I do think would change. Uh, one is the way that it handles comparatives and superlatives. It's extremely clunky and kind of stupid. And um, <laughs> I don't want to get into the way that it does it because it takes a while to explain, which is one of the reasons it's clunky and stupid. I personally <laughs> think that that is one of the first things that would change. Um, there's also a, there's a grammatical particle that is, a, it's technically a pronoun and it refers to the previous sentence and uses the previous sentence as the object of the current sentence. And it, the, the particle is eh. And it's not used when the following sentence has the verb to want, nech. And I think that that is something that might expand in a future version of Klingon with native speakers to other verbs that have to do with state of mind. So like uh, which means think. I think that verb might stop requiring that pronoun to refer to previous sentences. So um, I think that might be a thing that would change. Um, I've heard people argue on the basis of supposed ancient Klingon that the double marking system might further simplify. I don't think that's actually very likely because uh, Klingon is pretty dependent on the double marking sentence, the double marking system for verbs where you mark both the subject and the object of the verb for person, number, person and number. Um, there is one exception though. There's a prefix lu, which indicates third person singular object and third person plural subject. And it's the only case in where you have both third person subject and object where you use anything other than the null prefix, which is just nothing. You just don't have one. So I think that's going to go away. It's actually one of the things that is um, most, it's one of the most common quote unquote mistakes among people who speak Klingon is to forget to use the Lu suffix. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but that's a lot of them. Yeah, so could, could if an English speaker is speaking Klingon, if an English speaker, can an English speaker speaking Klingon understand, understand a Spanish speaker speaking Klingon? Yes. Yeah. I, I usually don't have trouble parsing out the Klingon of, say, uh, the most common other language to approach Klingon from is German. And I usually don't have any problem have, there. Yeah, they will have accents. Oh, yeah. they often will. Um, yeah. For instance, English speakers usually don't get the Klingon R sound right. It should be rolled, so it should be. Um, you oh, know. Is it then, it's, then it's more, more easier for me because we roll the R's very, uh, yeah. very much in uh, Dutch. So yeah. the the Klingon R is a trill, so it should be rech rather than rech. But a lot of native English speakers will go with the English sort of approximate R, which is incorrect. Um, the other thing is English speakers are more likely to drop certain sounds like the, um, which is a, um, with the, a velar. But the inventor of Klingon was an English speaker, right? So his native language yeah. was English. However, yeah. he spent most of his professional career as a linguist mm. at, during his academic period, uh, studying actually native American languages in South America. And so that influence actually comes through oh, into Klingon. So, uh, one constant in Klingon is a, a fricative, which is a alveolar stop followed by a lateral release fricative. It's all in voice, so it's and that is a very unusual sound, 
but it occurs in quite a few languages in South America. Uh, also, the verb system, which uses uh, heavy use of double marking, is also common in the same languages where that sound is common mm -hmm. in South America. So, <laughs> Klingon has a weirdly South American flair, mm -hmm. and um, the reason that he did that was specifically because outside of South America, things like that are extremely uncommon. Mm -hmm. Because he, he, he really wanted to make his language uh, al sound alien to the uh, English English audience. Yeah. His his only uh, the only thing this guy is by the way his name is Mark Okrand. I don't want to keep just saying this guy. So Mark Okrand, Doctor Mark Okrand, uh, when he was first hired on to do Klingon, he had already worked on Vulcan in uh, the Star Trek Two. There are some lines that were spoken in, in Vulcan, uh, but those were actually um, ADR. They were originally spoken on set in English, and then he was brought in to develop a way to ADR over those lines that would still match the mouth movements. Oh, it, when Spock and, and uh, Savek are talking? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that's that's that was Mark Oprah. Like, that's that's so Mark, like one. No, no, two. Was, That's two. Okay. Because I, I remember in Star Trek 1, they are talking, uh, when Spock was doing the uh, Cole Lamar thing, Oh, there, there was a little oh, bit of Klingon. Yeah, that, but I, 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 I think that had very, I mean, a Vulcan, but I think that had very, very little. It actually went more seriously in the second. So, film. I, I believe that the Vulcan and Klingon in Star Trek One were actually created by uh, James Doohan, because James Doohan actually hmm. had a had a bit of a background with dialect coaching and language and stuff. So, yeah. so what Mark Okren got as his prompt for Klingon when he started working on uh, Three was. One, it has to be guttural because it was described as guttural in the script. And of course, guttural is one of those non linguist words where you say it to a <laughs> linguist and they're like, well, that could mean a whole lot of things, but I'll pick some <laughs> of them. And that's what it'll mean. Uh, but also that it was harsh. Again, that doesn't really mean anything in linguistics terms. Yeah, that, that was Mark Lennard of uh, uh, Klingon in the first film. Yeah. So the, the other one, though, was that he had to use those lines from the first movie, those had to still make sense. So if you learn Klingon now and you watch Star Trek The Motion Picture, the Klingon lines are proper Klingon, even though at the time they were just gibberish syllables. Um, but yeah, that was basically his entire prompt was harsh, guttural, and make the lines from the original movie fit. And that was it. And he was like, okay, well, hey, uh, let's make a language. And so <laughs> he, he actually made very little beyond what was absolutely necessary for the script. So he would receive the script, and there would be lines that are like, these lines are in Klingon. And so if he didn't have a word, he would make one up on the spot, write it in, write down his word somewhere. And it wasn't until the publication of the Klingon Dictionary sometime in the 80s that he actually filled up a dictionary with more words. And even then, it was only a few hundred. And since then, Klingon vocabulary has grown to now it's, uh, I think it's around three or 4,000 words, which is about as big as many languages are. Yeah, well, Honestly, Tolkien English. did kind of the same thing with Elvish, didn't he? Because he just loved writing it. Yeah, basically. So, yeah, um, that's sort of the external, real-world history of, of Klingon as a language. And now there are there are Facebook groups and websites and Discord servers, and uh, there are even some Twitch streamers where you can go on and chat to them in Klingon. Mm. Nice. So... Uh, they are, they are fans, yeah. Anything coming up on on any of your challenges you want you want to talk about? Or you, you're, are you doing? Well, my next big thing is I'm going to be having a debate against Flat Earth Aussie on um, Modern Day Debate. Oh, and then I'm, condolences. Yeah, eh, it'll be it'll be fine, I think. Then I'm going to be doing uh, an after show after that. Um, Tuesday, I'm going to do like a belated birthday slash 5K subscriber thing. I'm basically I'm just going to be live for a while. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have like stupid videos to look at. We're gonna have uh, have topics. We can <laughs> talk about linguistics and stuff like that. And um, Spe if in fact spending some spending some brain cells for uh, right research. <clears throat> now the other uh, thing is, if in fact the um, Doctor Dino Cantoven versus um, Doctor Stern Cardinal debate goes through, which is supposed to be on that day, I will probably mm. stop the stream for the duration of the debate. And then I will see if anyone wants me to have an after show for that debate. Of course, if it doesn't happen, then who knows? Maybe I'll just keep streaming. Yeah. If Ken, um, yeah, Ken keeps having technical difficulties. Yeah. Uh, Thursday is going to be a, uh, a scripted video. I have two currently that I haven't released. I'm not sure which one is going to be the one that I release on Thursday. I might consult with my patrons as to which one they think that would, they would rather have up. 
Um, which means, if you want to say, just join the Patreon. Oh, um, wink, 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 nudge, nudge. <laughs> that also would all that would actually also include my channel members because I'm going to ask on the the private Discord server that is for channel members and, and patrons. Um, yeah. Other than that, I mean, the next Saturday I'm probably going to finish up the uh, Spirit Science History. I was originally going to do that today, but then I realized I'm on this and I'm on a debate and I'm going to do an after show. There's only so much streaming I oh. want to do in one day. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got confused. Okay, my bad. <laughs> Yeah, hey, about you, so, RJ? You think coming up on your channel? Oh, uh, all the usual Wednesday. Uh, we've got a, a fun and games coming up on that, uh, and mainly I'm now knee deep in uh, just uh, working on uh, finish the behemoth section of the uh, new uh, rocks book and uh, moving on to Leviathan. <laughs> and uh, about me, like I don't do much my channel. I help Jackson Reed with his videos for scripts, but I I I do have one video where I. Like uh, uh, made a, a uh, remixed version of our nuclear energy talk with yeah, uh, that, that was a good thing. Yeah. I, I like the the chapters and the visual aids was yeah. very useful. So if you if you want to, of, of course, I will always recommend checking out the original too. But if you want to uh, see the video in a more uh, concise or more uh, compressed manner, then. Uh, Go check out yeah. my video on nuclear power. Somebody yeah. could do something on Louis Gohmert's uh, suggestion that we could move the Earth's orbit to deal with climate change. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be really easy. Just just find a really big planet to swing by us. Or do it like you did, like this. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, AJ? Anything coming up on your, ch your channel? He's not here right now. AJ's been oh, wrapped. Oh, he's been at AFK for a long time, huh. I think. Maybe. Oh, I, yeah. And what about you? Um, what, what well, about you, VB? I have. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back. back. No, I uh, have some uh, some interviews. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I have an interview coming up with uh, Robert Reed, and then in August, I have uh, Hemet Meta, the friendly atheist, coming on my Ooh, channel neat. for an interview as well. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a good uh, good video, definitely. So I'm excited know about, about you, that. What about you, VB? Anything up your channel? Do you have anything? I'm currently working on my first ever video. It's gonna be on the fall of Roman Britain. Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm I'm anxious to see that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, I, I I if we had more time, I, I'd ask you if you. Well, Dapper, if we have more time, I ask you you not pronounce my closing statement in Klingon, but probably don't have, probably need time to learn how to do that. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would. The pro one of the problems is most phrases in English can be translated in a couple ways in Klingon, and I would have to think about which one uh, would be most appropriate. But I'll tell you what, I will think about it and get back to you, and then later you can you can have it in Klingon. All right, well, in the meantime, I guess let's talk uh, to say in English, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. I'll see it. We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Uh